Now we present Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. The Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Transcribed for you by Canon Towels, famous for color, for design, for durability. Among towels, America's number one best seller. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. But before we set out on tonight's adventure in mystery and drama, here's a word about dramatic values. Hurry, 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 hurry to the greatest May towel sales in history. Famous Canon towel sales. Packed with value, big, beautiful buys, terrific bargains. Don't miss them. Get to your store now and get in on these great money-saving events. Canon Towels give you the most for your money in beauty, value, lovely color, and design. Canon Towels absorb more, wear longer, stay lovely longer. No wonder more people buy Canon Towels than all other towels combined. Get the most for your money. Get Canon. Big, fluffy, thirsty Canon Towels. As summer comes, you always need more towels. Now's the time to get them. And the towels to get are Canons. Right now in these big Canon Towel sales. See them in your newspaper. Get to your store quickly. Get in on the big, big, big Canon values. It has been said many times, of course that wherever there is danger in all the far-off places of the world, there you will find Ken Thurston, the man called X. And rare it is when Ken finds time to sleep even one night in his own Manhattan apartment. And rarer still when he sleeps there uninterrupted. Well, Ken Thurston speaking. Mr. Thurston. Home. Oh, pig. Only by living such a good, clean life do I get so lucky. Oh, sure. What time is it anyway? Well, here it's one time, mm. there's some other. Who knows? Mr. X, you gotta help me. I hope you what? Why do I have to do it at 5 a.m.? So long, you call me later. Mr. Thurston, wait. Wait, nothing. Go get some sleep. But you don't understand. I just run into a dead man. Oh, fine. Now get yourself a hotel room and sober up. But it's true, Mr. X. He just got in from Honolulu. And I met him accidentally in San Francisco. And then he brought me down here. And you know who it is? It's George Korloff. Jo- George Korloff? Oh, Korloff's been dead for six months. That's what I told him. But he says he can explain the whole thing. Mr. Thurston, I'm scared. I think he's planning to give me the business. Where are you calling from? Where are you now? Who knows? It's a big house that belongs to somebody down here at... Hang on. Operator. I'm sorry, sir. Your party has hung up. Operator, this is Ken Thurston. Oh, yes, Mr. Thurston. Will you trace that call, please, and throw me at the bureau right away? Well, when you come right down to it, Ken, there was never any actual proof that Karloff was killed in that plane. I know, Chief. It was more a matter of reasonable assumption. Right. But the plane did crash at sea. There's no question of that. Records washed up along the California coast for weeks afterward. But apparently Karloff didn't crash with it. Unless you don't think Zellschmidt's trying to pull a fast one of some kind, Ken? No, I don't think so. I'd say Koloff just outguessed us. Well, we aren't the only ones he outguessed. Walked into that Los Angeles aircraft plant wearing a phony beard, handed them a forged letter, and flew off in their latest model test plane. Their top secret job. Yeah, and he's been doing things like that for years, Chief. One of the slickest boys in the whole espionage business. Well, at least he slipped up on that job. Maybe. Huh? I got a hunch that that plane crash was part of Koloff's plan. But it wasn't an accident. But what could he gain by it, Ken? The plane itself was the only thing that... Uh... Hello? Yes, he's here. Just a second. It's 
for you, Ken. Thanks, Jeff. Ken Thurston speaking. This is Long Distance Operator 74, Mr. Thurston. I have the report you requested on that call. Yes? The call was placed from the residence of a Countess de Grazia in Carmel, California. Countess de Grazia, Carmel, California. Thanks very much, Operator. Hmm. Let's see, I can fly down. I can fly to San Francisco. I can hire a car there. Drive down to... Ken, who's the Countess de Grazia? I don't know. At the moment, she's apparently Pagan's hostess. Hmm. That's quite a house party. Zell Schmidt and a dead man. A former dead man, Chief. There's a big difference. Call you from Carmel. Should I let you out, or would you rather beat the door open? Mr. Just relax, and I... Well, so that's the game. What's the news? Oh, we're out of here. All right, just as soon as I disconnect this booby trap. There. Your friend, the Countess, seems to have some unusual ideas of hospitality. Countess? Hey, Mr. Ace. The only one I saw was George, the double-crossing crook. He was supposed to pay me $500 to keep my mouth shut. I mean to... Uh... Well... You never wear much good at blackmail, Pagan. <laughs> Mr. Thurston, that's where... But... Never mind, never mind. So he lured you down here from San Francisco and then locked you in a broom closet. Where is he now? Who knows? I haven't heard a sound for the last hour. I guess he... No. Well, let's take a chance. Countess de Gracia residence. Hello, is the... is the Countess there? Not at the moment, but I'm her business agent. Could I help you? Why, uh, yes, this is the Eureka Travel Agency. Would you tell the Countess that I have a reservation on the Lurling to Hawaii tonight? I'd be happy to. I'll have her ticket at the pier office. Oh, and the ship sails in four hours, you know. Yes, I know. I'll tell her. Thanks a lot. Come on, Pagon. i got a car parked out in front. Where are we going, Mr. Thurston? Hawaii. Oh, I'm fine now that... Hawaii? In a car? We may. If we don't get up to San Francisco before that ship sails. <laughs> The way I figured, Mr. Thurston, this Korloff guy just wanted everybody to think he was dead. That's the way it figures. You mean I'm right? Well, you can't always be wrong. It's against the law of averages. The only thing I can figure is why... Oops! Hey, are we trying to break a speed record or something? No, we're trying to find out whether that car back there is following us or... Hold on! Well... They're sure sticking to us tighter than a wet bathing suit. I know. And I think it's the same car that was parked down the street from the Mr. Countess. Mr. they're going to pass us. Wish I could get some speed out of this thing. Look, there's a car coming. They're crowding us. Crowding us in. Crowding us. Come on, us. Pagan. Hey, uh. Hey, on, where are you? <gasps> Hello. Can you come down and give us a hand? No. Just let me get my place in, get out of the truck. Fine. Pagan. Pagan, can you hear me? I saw your lights go over the bank. Stop my truck as quick as I could. Is anybody hurt? I'm all right. I guess my friend's knocked out. Here. Here, help me lift him up. Right. Okay. Now. Another oh. uh, car passed me doing 80 or better. What'd they do, sideswipe you? I guess so. Happened pretty fast. Yeah, turn the light on his face. Hmm. Cut in the forehead. It's not bad. Yeah. A compress will stop the bleeding here. Let me get one here. One sure thing. We can always count on you boys in an emergency. Well, when you spend most of your time on the road, you get used to helping people. Never know when you need help yourself. There. You'll be all right in a few minutes. You heading towards San Francisco by any chance? No, I'm going south. 
I'll take you as far as Salinas Junction, though. Good, I can phone from there. You, uh... Got an important date of some kind up in Frisco? Oh, fairly important. It's with a countess and a dead man. Uh, huh? We're saving for Honolulu together. If I get there in time. Uh, what? Simply can't do a thing about it in spite of your credentials, Mr. Thurston. Ship sailed 20 minutes ago. That's that. Do you know whether the Countess de Gracia was on board? She was. I escorted her to her stateroom personally. Did you arrange a reservation for a man named George Koloff? No, only for the Countess. I wish I could help you, Mr. Thurston, but it's just too late. Ship's probably moving through the Golden Gate right at this minute. Well, that's fate, Mr. Thurston. Uh, maybe it's all for the best anyway. Those characters are pretty tough cookies. Uh, let's go get some sequel, eh? That's a good idea, Pagon. Only I'm having mine on board that ship. I just told you, Mr. Thurston. Never mind. Do you know where I can charter a fast launch in a hurry? Well, yes. Good. I... Now, I'm going to put a call through to New York on this phone. You use the other one there to get the Lurleen by radio phone. I'll talk to the purser if you can get him. Or if not, the captain. Now, hurry. <laughs> Mr. Thurston, you mean we got to climb all the way up to the deck on that little ladder? Yeah, now wait, Pagan. Don't get caught between the launch and the side of the ship. Way to the launch, right into the swell, and grab the ladder, Mr. Thurston. Right. Watch it, Pagan. Get ready. Here we go. So long, boys. Thanks for the lift. I don't know why I didn't desert while we were still on dry land. Climbing up ladders in the middle of the ocean. People... Trying to kill us? Oh, relax, Pagan. Now you'll have another chance to blackmail Koloff. Hey, I never thought of that. Here, let me give you a hand. Thanks. That's it. Well, now we seem to have quite a welcoming committee. Well, it's a little unusual to break the schedule, slow down the ship, and take on passengers. Yeah, I imagine, sea. yeah. Uh, but uh, I've had radio calls from New York, Washington, the Maritime Bureau, even from the owners of the line. Well, I pulled all the rank I could think of to get aboard, Percy. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name's Blake. Uh, I've arranged a pair of cabins for you, assigned your table, and... Oh, here's one of your table companions now. I was afraid I would have to make myself obvious, Mr. Blake. Uh, g Countess, uh, uh, this is Mr. Ken Thurston, uh, Countess de Grazia. I've been looking forward to this, Countess. Really? Well, I must say it is a little unexpected on my side. Oh, you have to admit that neither of your two attempts was particularly clever. Touché. Uh, I didn't know that you had met. Only indirectly, Mr. Blake. Yes. And now that we do come face to face, we are outside the 12-mile limit. Uh, fortunately. Which means, of course, that we can make our own rules. Tell me, how's George? Cola? Oh, <laughs> I think you are going to be a highly entertaining dinner companion, Mr. Thurston. I'll try my best. Maybe we'll find we have a lot of things in common. Like airplanes and espionage, ghost stories and George. Oh, yes, especially George. We'll continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. What the fireplace was to early American homes, the television set is to modern American homes. It's the center not only to your life, but your living room. So be smart. Insist not only on RCA Victor million-proof television, proven in well over two million homes, but on RCA Victor million-proof television in a console cabinet. You have your choice of a breathtaking variety of RCA Victor console models. Every one a furniture masterpiece, worthy to occupy the most important place in your living room. Period models like the Regency in the Rutland and the Hillsdale, which look like treasures straight out of an 18th century palace. Classic models like the Provincial, whose simple dignity makes it equally fitting for cottage or castle. Streamline models like the Modern, a clean line, functional beauty on a swivel base. See your RCA Victor dealer tomorrow for your RCA Victor television console. And to you and your family, in every sense of the word, happy looking. And now to continue with The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. 
An international espionage agent named George Korloff, supposedly dead for six months, is seen in a San Francisco bar. And the resulting chase finally leads Ken Thurston to a cabin aboard his ship, now one day out of Honolulu. Also aboard is Korloff's confederate, the Countess de Grazia. But so far, the quarry himself has not been found. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. X, I don't even care if we never find that character. Oh? What's happened to your enthusiasm, Pagan? Enthusiasm? I've looked at passengers all week until I'm green in the face. And so what if I did find him? You wouldn't let me blackmail him anyhow. So that was your reason for trailing him down to Carmel? Well, why not? He, he's a crook. No. Yes, he is. Now, we dock in Honolulu tomorrow, and as far as I've been able to find out, Koloff isn't on board. Why not? Oh, don't ask me. He admitted to you that he'd just come from Hawaii. And as soon as he talked to the Countess, she headed for there. Just doesn't make sense that he wouldn't go along with her. Doesn't make sense to me either way, Mr. Thurston. I don't think that stolen plane crashed accidentally. I think Koloff planned it that way. But why? And where does the Countess come into it? Why this trip to Honolulu? Unless... Unless what, Mr. X? It's a possibility. Let's see, the purser 272. I wish I knew what you're talking about. Hello, Mr. Blake? Ken Thurston. Say, I wonder if you can meet me in the baggage hold in five minutes. Uh, yes, it may be very important. Goodbye. Let's see now. The Countess de Grazia's baggage should be in cubicle 17 right here ahead of us, Mr. Thurston. Of course, she has a pair of wardrobe trunks and some other luggage with her in her cabin. I know, and it'll be tough to get into it. I'm hoping we find something here. Find... Find what, Mr. Thurston? I don't know, Pedro. Oh, here we are. Now, her things are right against the bunker here, I believe. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, these two steamer trunks and uh, this wooden case. Uh, well, the trunks could be legitimate. But this wooden case... Heavy, too, Mr. Mr. Blake. Have you got anything but use to pry the lid off? Well, uh, one of these steel cargo workers ought to do the job... Uh... Uh, don't say we, though, Mr. Thurston. My orders to cooperate only go so far. Oh, thanks. Maybe a wild goose chase, but it's well trying. Oh, I wish somebody would tell me. What are we looking for? I did tell you, Pagan. I don't know. Well, let's see what the Countess is taking. To... It looks awful complicated. Uh, oh. Do you know what it is, Mr. Thurston? Yeah, I know what it is. One of the latest models of the new robot stabilizer for jet fighter planes. A top military secret. Well. So that was Koloff's game. What do you mean? He wasn't after the whole plane, only this stabilizer. He must have taken it off, parachuted into the water with it, and left the plane to crash into the ocean. I wonder if the Countess owns a yacht. As a matter of fact, she does, Mr. Thurston. I heard her discussing it with one of the other passengers a few evenings ago. Uh. And she probably has a prospective buyer for this thing waiting in Honolulu. Only what's happened to her partner, Paul? Look, Mr. Thurston. This name on the outside of the case. Leo Bornlin, Honolulu. Yeah, she's keeping herself covered. Hmm? In case of trouble, she can claim she never saw the case before. I think I'd better find out a little more about the Countess. Well, the ship's radio is yours, Mr. Thurston. Anytime you want to use it. Thanks. Meanwhile, I wonder if I could borrow about a dozen of those steel cargo wedges. Well, champagne. They are going all out this evening. Last night of the voyage, Countess, is the customary captain's dinner. And the last one we shall have together, Mr. Thurston. I'm going to miss these delightful little uh, conversational interludes. Oh, I thought they'd be more like passages at arms. But clever. And clever men are so rare. Why, I am sure you must have fathomed all of my darkest secrets by now. I don't know. I'm afraid you beat me there. I imagine you know much more about me than I know about you. Well, I, I was born of impoverished but piously honest Ukrainian peasant stock. Yes, and I... at the age of two, you were kidnapped by a roving band of gypsies. You have found out. But it was only after narrowly avoiding being sold in the slave market in Algiers that you decided to become a spy. Oh, dear, I had no intention of telling that part. And it was then that you adopted the name Countess de Grazia. Ah, the Count was quite old and an awful bore. I poisoned him for his time. Oh, of course. <laughs> Uh, let that be a warning to you, Mr. Thurston. The poison, you mean, huh? Oh, 
I'm tasting the wine very carefully. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry to bother you, Mr. Thurston, but I thought this radiogram might be important. Oh, thanks, Mr. Brick. Do you mind, Countess? Not at all. Go right ahead. Thanks. Hmm? Uh-huh. Well, excuse me. What? Aren't we going to go on with my history, Mr. Thurston? Uh, I don't think so. You see, it's quite unnecessary now. Good night. <laughs> I'm starved, Mr. Thurston. What a low-down trick to leave me here alone, this cabin, for a whole hour and ten minutes. Well, we flipped a coin to see who ate first, Pega. I know, but... Using your double-headed nickel. Yes, but I thought I had the one with the double tails. You didn't, though. Here it is. Oh, I picked pocket. Mr. Rick, sometimes I think you, you're as bad as, as, as that countess cookie. No, I doubt that. And according to this radiogram, she's not a countess. What do you mean? That's only one of the aliases she uses. She manages to hold passports from three different countries. Been suspected of espionage over and over and never been convicted. Oh, well, you may as well go on down and eat, pig. I'll take care of the baby in the closet there. Boy, you only have to tell me once. All the great food they got on this boat, the only chance I... The only chance I... Mr. Rex, door's locked. I see. Well, back away from that porthole. Hey, somebody shot the nozzle some kind through the... That's a live steam hose. Here, into this closet. Quick! I don't get it, Mr. Thurston. What was the idea? The idea was to scold us if we... Yeah, there it goes. Steve, I knew I shouldn't have come to this boat. Come on now, here. Help me stuff some clothes in the cracks around the door. Get the hot Mr. Rex. It's going to, it's going to get hotter. <laughs> we won't last two minutes in here unless... Mr. Hot, you've been too... Mr. Thurston, I think... I think I'm... you... You may be lucky... Hotter and hotter. Uh, help! In here! Where? Here they are. Now give me a hand. That's it. Drag them out into the air. Boy, it's hot in here. That's it. Now. Mr. Thurston. Mr. Thurston, can you hear me? Uh, uh, that's you, Blake? Yes. What happened, Mr. Thurston? Somebody tried to boil us with a steam hose. I can't understand it. <laughs> Nobody th- but the crew would know where to find a hose, and, and they... The said... crew? Well, of course. What? I double-checked every passenger on board, but I, I didn't check the crew. Help me up, Mr. Blake. Let's go. This is Mr. Hawkins, our chief engineer. Mr. Thurston, Charlie. How do you do? I told you about Mr. Thurston's authority. Oh, yeah. Well, anything I can do to help. Well, what we're doing is checking the crew, Charlie. We've pretty well covered the deck gang already. Looking for a man named Korloff. Korloff. No, no, there's nobody by that name in my bunch. Well, you're probably using an assumed name, Mr. Hawkins. In fact, um, how about Bornlin? Leo Bornlin. Bornlin. (laughs) Oh, yes, yes. One of my oilers is named Bornland. Good. He's working down there now in the number two injector pump. Uh, you want to talk to him? He's the right man. I want a good deal more than just a talk. Oh, well, come on. I'll show you where he is. Oh, uh, watch your step. These deck plates get kind of slippery with oil sometimes. Oh, sure. Oh, there you are, Mr. Thurston. He's not working in the galley. I looked over the whole bunch. I think we found him, Pagon. He's the man here in the engine crew with a name the same as the one on that wooden case. He ought to get light. Trying to make a climb bake out of us. Well, that's born in yonder, bending over that pump slide. <gasps> that's him, Mr. Thurston. That's caught. Yeah. Well, the rest of you better wait here. Wait. Uh, he's seen us, Mr. Thurston. Oh, look out, he's got a gun. Call off, drop it. I'll drop it. Get back all of you. Call off, stop. Oh, he's running around behind that pump. Yeah. Call off, drop that gun. Oh, Right into the slide valve. Come on. Uh-huh. Oh, that pump, Mr. Thurston. Look, it didn't even slow down. Let's go on deck and get some fresh air. <laughs> Once you didn't make an overstatement. Hey, what's that glow in the sky? 
Way up ahead there. Honolulu, I imagine. They're due to dock at midnight. Oh, so that's why there's parties going on all over the ship. Hey, maybe we're to go and celebrate too, Mr. Thurston. Some other time, Pig, huh? Oh, cheer up, Mr. X. Everything's solved now. And so what if that Karloff's dead? He he had it coming. And that phony countess. Hey, what are you going to do with about her? Nothing. Nothing? You mean you're not going to run her in? I wouldn't do any good. I've got no evidence on her. She's beaten a lot tougher cases than this. Oh, but but you can't just let her get away. Oh, I doubt very much you'll get away, Pagan. Ten to one, she has a buyer for that stabilizer waiting for in Honolulu. Well, maybe so. She'll collect a good deal of money from him. Yeah, well, sure. When he opens that wooden case and finds there's nothing in it but steel cargo wedges, well, I think he might be a little vindictive. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. And in the meantime, we take the real stabilizer back to the United States. The real stabilizer, huh? Oh, it's a valuable piece of military equipment, all right. It's a good thing it didn't fall into the wrong hands. But the way this shaky world goes wobbling around off balance, I don't think the real stabilizer has been invented yet. Now, there would be a cause for celebration. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. If you suffer from pains or headaches, neuritis or neuralgia, you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you've received an envelope containing Anison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anison this way. Try Anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. Here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. Those you heard in tonight's cast were Joan Banks, Will Wright, Peter Leeds, George Neese, Harry Lang, and Carlton Young. There's enough intrigue in next week's story to fill a book, and Ken finds himself right in the middle of it. And, sat on his back as usual, will be Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Transcribed for you by Cannon Towels. Famous for color, for design, for durability. Among Towels, America's number one best seller. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music composed and conducted by Felix Mills. Tonight's story was written by Les Crutchfield. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station... This is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. Now we present Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. The Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Transcribed for you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By Canon Towers, famous for color, for design, for durability. 
among towels, America's number one best seller. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. No matter what you now take for headache relief, we urge you to try Anison for the incredibly fast relief these tablets bring the next time you're suffering from a headache. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take Anison for this wonderfully fast relief. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison at any drug counter in handy boxes of 12 and 30. Economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Prince Haiti, like many cities of the world, is a mixture in sharp contrast of the old and the new. An up-to-date airport serves its commerce, and modern business buildings line its streets. But deep in the jungle, and even in the plantations outside the city, the drums of voodoo still sound their pagan rhythms in the night. And again, the well-dressed man who steps from a limousine at the entrance of the government building is a product of the new. But the thing that awaits him is as old as terror itself. Call for me here at three, Ronaldo. Good morning, Your Excellency. Oh, good morning, Dr. Weimar. Lovely day, isn't it? Yes, it is a perfect day. Uh, tell me, sir, have you... Look up, Your Excellency. Huh? Zombie? No, wait. I... No, no. Oh. Hey, Get out of here. Let me through here. Excellency. Let me through. You... Your Excellency, I... Hey, you filthy... <laughs> Your shooting was not very well timed, Captain Andre. Eh? Uh, what do you mean, Dr. Weimar? I mean, perhaps it should have been ten seconds sooner, or else not at all. Five assassinations in three weeks, and every one of the victims of government official. I just phoned the Haitian consul a few minutes ago, Chief. Says the whole island's in a turmoil down there. Well, what gets me, Ken, is this business about zombies. The walking dead. Why, it's right out of a dime novel. It's ridiculous. All right, Chief. You don't believe in zombies, and I don't. But a lot of the natives in Haiti do, and that's the point. Oh, I know there's still plenty of superstition left in the world, but this whole thing just doesn't make sense. I've seen it done before in Ceylon, the Sudan, India. It's a matter of hypnotism and drugs. It creates a perfect assassin with no thought for his own safety and only one idea in mind, to kill. But Why? Assuming somebody is doing this in Haiti, why? Well, all the victims have been government officials. It looks like an attack on the government itself. Yeah. And the little hot spots have a habit of turning into big ones. Sure. Serbia, Spain. All right, Ken. Go to it. Somebody stands to profit by this. The problem is to find out who. And the answer? Well, I guess I better look for it in Haiti. So long, Chief. Are you Mr. Ken Thurston? Why, oh, yes, that's right. Captain Andreas at your service, sir. Oh, how do you do? I've been assigned to escort you to General Brock. General Brock? The general commands the Department of Police and Military Affairs. Oh, yes. Tell me, have there been any new developments? No, sir. Not since His Excellency the Finance Minister was killed in front of the government building two days ago. As I understand it, there hasn't been one of these zombies captured alive. That is correct. 
They're like mad dogs. One cannot take chances. Oh, it might be worth taking a chance to be able to question one of them. Well, so far there's been really no opportunity to capture one of them. I see. These affairs happen so fast that... that... What is it, Captain? This man coming towards us, he's a special investigator hired by the consul in New York. A terrible nuisance, really. Permit me to introduce myself, sir. I am Jose Cacahuate. My car. South American agent for North American van lines. Hmm. From Tucumcari to Tallahassee, Chattanooga to Cucamonga, we haul anything, anywhere, anywhere. All right, Pagon, take off that phony beard and come up for air. I can't take it off. I'm in the Secret Service. Well, that's one branch of government you you should know all about. You've been running for them for several years. Mr. Thurston, that's my bread and butter you're stepping on. What are you doing down here, anyway? Why, I'm investigating this zombie business. Whatever that is. Oh, sure. Well, well, now, my theory... Do you happen to have any ideas as to what may be behind this mess? Well, nothing definite, Mr. Thurston. There is a general feeling that the plantation owners may be responsible in some way. The plantation owners? Why? Well, they've had very little voice in the government in recent years. Control has been in the hands of city politicians, so naturally... And did you become a political commentator, my pet? Marla. But... Marlo, this is Ken Thurston, Miss Bassard. How do you do? And Mr. Zell Schmidt, you know, of course. Sure. Hiya, babe. Oh, you horrid little man. Andres, I'm terribly sorry to break in on you this way, but I did want to remind you about dinner this evening. Well, I'm not sure, Marlo. General Brock has assigned me as liaison to Mr. Thurston. Well, then by all means, bring Mr. Thurston, too. You will come, won't you? Well, I... Oh, please. If you like Creole cooking, you'll love Haitian food. All right. You found my weak spot. Good. Andres will bring you out, Mr. Thurston, and I'll look forward to showing you around my plantation. I don't mind confessing that it's a relief to have you here, Mr. Thurston. I'm a man of action myself, and the mystery leaves me floundering. Well, this is all a mystery to me so far, General Brock. Possibly these case records may help a little. Well, I hope so. I hope so. But they don't make sense to me. Five men in a row struck down on the streets without any rhyme or reason to it. Oh, I think there's a rhyme and a reason. A matter of finding them. Well, I hope that happens soon, sir. One more murder will mean martial law, and then the whole business will be dumped right on my shoulders. Yes, I see what you mean. General Brock. Have you considered the possibility that one of your own men may be involved in this? That's ridiculous, sir. Police and army are absolutely trustworthy. Well, I know that's the usual theory, but... I can vouch for them to a man, sir. Something else, General. This idea of the plantation owners being responsible. Is that a possibility? Well, possibility in theory, I suppose, but not in fact. Why, some of them are my best friends. Fine people, all of them. I see. Well... I'll look over these records and talk with you later. Well, I dare say we'll find time tonight at dinner. You're coming to Miss Broussard's, too? Yes, yes. Fine girl, Marla. Wonderful person. Wonderful. Well, good luck, Mr. Thurston. Call on me if you need any help, sir. Thanks, General. I will. Hey, over here, Mr. Thurston. Well, secret agent Zellschmidt. Still wearing the beard, I see. I need the money, Mr. X. How did I know what I was getting into? When I heard they were having trouble with zombies, I thought somebody was watering the liquor. Well, what do you think now? I think I'm scared. Good reason to be, too. The chance of being turned into a zombie at any moment. Oh, don't say that. A glassy-eyed, mindless idiot with no intellect or... Hmm, come to think of it, I guess you're safe at that. Mr. Thurston, I... Pagan, what's the tie-up between Malabusa and Captain Andres? Well, who knows, except he, he follows her around like a moonstruck calf. A lucky dog... She wraps him around her little finger. Why, Mr. Thurston, she's practically got him hypnotized. And this is my only guest whom you haven't met. Mr. Thurston, Dr. Weimar. I knew a Dr. Weimar in Vienna before the war. Carl, I think his name was. My brother, Mr. Thurston. He is uh, no longer living. Oh, I'm sorry. Psychiatrist, wasn't he? Yes, with a specialty in hypnotherapy. Oh, your field too, Dr. Weimar? It was, originally. My practice here, however, is primarily medical. I see. Listen, everyone. 
It's such a lovely night that I decided we'd have dinner on the veranda. Oh, wonderful. Oh, very good. Wonderful. Wonderful. We'll go out through the side doors there. General Brock. Yes, my dear. Would you and Andres like to leave your firearms in here? Oh? I'm not really so dangerous, but you have to be armed. Oh, on the contrary, my dear. You're so completely dangerous that mere firearms wouldn't do us the least bit of good. Oh, please, General Brock. This way, Mr. Fiskin. Thanks. Ah, oh, you're right. It is lovely out here. I wouldn't trade it for all the rest of... What? What's the matter, Mr. Thurston? Nothing. I was just listening to the drums. Oh, yes. Voodoo drums or signal drums. Opinions vary. Mala, you excuse me? Oh, yes, Granaloo. Is approval with you if me go now? Of course, Granaloo. I'll see you in the morning. Good night, Miss Mala. She's been with me for years. Devoted. A wonderful woman. But where's she going? Oh, she has a little house of her own in the bush. Uh. Holds voodoo ceremonies in it, I'm quite certain. A lot of natives still believe in it, you know. As they do in zombieism. Yes. So shall we sit down? Uh, you on my right, Mr. Thurston. Thank you. Andres there. Well, thank you. And you on the other side, General Brock. Uh, thank you, my dear. Dr. Weimar over here. Uh, by wait. The... Look. Why... Yes. But what's the devil? His eyes, glassy, fixed. It's a zombie. Now, now get back. I can hold his attention. Swing this chair. Inside, Captain Andres. Get our gun. Just one swing now and... Good timing, Mr. Thurston. He's knocked unconscious. Stand back, everybody. Where is he? Where did he go? No, Captain. Put down that gun. No, don't. Oh, Andres. Why? There was no need of that, Captain. The man was unconscious. It wasn't a man. It was a zombie. You can't take chances. You... Well... You were a little hasty, though, weren't you? You have to kill zombies. It's the only way to... The only way it's to... It's all right, Andres. You come in the house with me now. Oh. You did the right thing, my dear. You were right, of course. Mr. Thurston, the boy, was hasty, but... Confounded, you don't understand the pressure all of us are under out here. Maybe not, General Brock. But I don't understand why you never captured one alive. Well, yes, I know, but... Oh, confounded, I, I'd better go see what's eating the phone. Mr. Thurston, am I correct in assuming that you noticed the same thing I did? I saw something, Dr. Weimar. Fantastic, though. Is it? Good night, Mr. Thurston. Good night, Doctor. All right, Pega. You can come out from under that table now. Well, I, I'm only hired to investigate these zombies, Mr. Thurston, not to fight with them. Well, so that's what they look like, eh? Some of them. The other one here tonight looked different, though. Other one? Sure. Captain Andres. Huh? Didn't you notice him when he ran out here and shot this man? He had the eyes of a zombie. continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Now for some news of a special event. News that deserves and gets a fanfare. Now, right now is the time to get famous Canon towels. Big Canon towel sales are booming all over town. They're packed with value. Don't wait. Get to your store today and get in on these great money-saving Canon sales. Canon towels give you the most for your money. Canon towels absorb more, wear longer, stay lovely longer. You'll need more towels for summer. Get famous Canons now. The big, fluffy, thirsty towels in every size. Bath towels, hand towels, and washcloths to match. Complete ensembles. Eighteen beautiful colors to choose from. More people buy Canon towels than all other towels combined. Get the most for your money. Get Canons. Get them now. Right now. In the big, 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 value packed Canon towel sales. And now to continue with The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zelschmidt.
five assassinations in three weeks, and the island of Haiti is swept by a wave of terror. One word is whispered over and over on the plantations and through the dark hills. Zombies, the walking dead. Ken himself was an eyewitness to killing number six. And now he and Pagan make their way cautiously through the midnight bush, heading for the hut of a voodoo oracle, old Granaloo. What do you want with this Granaloo woman, anyhow? Just checking. That zombie came out of the bush about a minute after she went into it. And she may be a voodoo leader. She's devoted to... Wait a second. Huh? There she is in front of the hut. Jeepers, creepers. Let's get out of here, Mr. Thurston. Please come on up here where I can see you. Oh, it's too late. Come on, Pedro. I've been waiting for you, Mr. X. Uh, why, Granaloo? My people out there in the hill, they ask what will be done to save them from this terror. And I have not known what to tell them. And what will you tell them now? That you have come. You knew I would come. And you know who I am. How, Gunnaloo? There is still much knowledge in the jungle that has never yet been found. Have you found the answer, Mr. X? Yes, I found it. But I don't know yet how to deal with it. You will. My people will be very happy when I tell them. I thought there on the veranda that your pigeon English was all put on. One must play many roles in this life, Mr. X. Yes, I know. I will speak to my people now. Good night, Benelou. Come on, Pedro. Wait for me in the car, Pedro. I'm going to stop in at the house. Mr. Thurston, wait. No, no, the gun isn't necessary, Mr. Thurston. I wasn't waiting here to threaten you. The thing is, I'm... Well, I'm scared. Yes, I can understand how you would be, Captain Andreas. You see, tonight is the second time something like that has happened. You mean shooting first and thinking later? It's not like me, Mr. Thurston. I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. Do you want to understand it, Captain? Yes. No matter what the answer is, no matter what I... I I've got to find out. All right, listen. Come with me now and don't say anything to anyone. Stay at my hotel tonight. And in the morning, we'll go see Dr. Weimar together. I... I don't trust Weimar. You don't have to trust him. Trust me. Uh, uh, uh. He's rather far under the drug now, Mr. Thurston. Uh-huh. And the trance, too, is about as deep as I care to take him just now. Uh-huh. Well, it's entirely up to your judgment, Dr. Weimar. I'm a little... Well, it's a little out of my field here. Then I think we might try for some of the phrases, some of the commands that were given him when he was hypnotized previously. Do you agree, Mr. Thurston? Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. Captain Andres, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. And do you understand who's here with you and what's happening? Yes, sir. Your Dr. Weimar, Mr. Thurston, is here and you've hypnotized me. A part of me is asleep, a part of me is awake and listening to you. You called it... Uh, uh, Dissociation. Yes, sir. Now, the awake part of you, Captain Andres, is the part I'm talking to. It's the part that remembers. Remembers everything, including the last time you were hypnotized. Yes, sir. I remember. What were you told at that time, Captain? I was... I was told to kill zombies, take no chances. How were you told? What were the words? You can hear the command now. What is it, Captain? Uh... What is it? Kill all zombies after they've killed. Kill all captured zombies. Forget you were told this. It's almost Forget as though a woman were talking. You Forget. can't always be sure, Mr. Forget. Thurston. I can't remember anything. He's been given a lot of commands to forget. Forget. It's going to take quite a lot of work to get it out of him. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to leave him in your hands, Dr. Weimar. I've got an appointment with General Brock. <laughs> Those case records that Mr. Thurston no use to you at all, so it seems, sir. Eh? Well, not much anyway, General Brock. No. Oh, I've got a few hazy ideas, but nothing really worth mentioning. Yeah, that's too bad, too bad. I've managed to stall off martial law until tomorrow morning. That's about as far as I'll be able to push it, however. Well, that still gives me some time. Time. That's the enemy I've fought all my life. Action's the thing. Which accounts, I imagine, for all these trophies on the walls. Eh? Oh, oh, the animal head, yes. 
Collected in Central Africa over a good many years. Nothing any fool couldn't do. But, uh... Here is a trophy for you, Mr. Thurston. Oh, yes. What is it? Polished quartz? No, it's rutile. Beautiful job of cutting, isn't it? I attached it to this watch chain so I could swing it. Like a pendulum. Watch it glitter. Glitter this way. Back and forth. Back and forth. Notice the fire in it, Mr. Thurston? The play of lights deep inside the stone? Yes, it's fascinating. I could watch it for hours. Glittering. Scintillating. Shifting. Changing. Patterns of light as it swings back and forth back and forth yeah yes I see makes me drowsy sometimes sleepy my eyes get heavy like yours are now yes heavier and heavier sleepier and sleepier. So sleepy you can't open them. Sleep. Sleep. And now you're sound asleep. Yes. Sound asleep. You can't open your eyes, Mr. Thurston. You're sound asleep. I'm sound asleep. Asleep. Good. Mr. Thurston, you're a fool. Yes. I'm a fool. Hypnotism is such a simple art. You ought to learn more about it. Now, I'm going to give you some orders, Thurston. Commands. And then I'm going to wake you up. You won't remember being hypnotized. You'll forget all about this. But when the time comes, you'll carry out the commands. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. All right. Now, listen... I'm having a little dinner party at my residence this evening. The same group that was out at Mala's last night. And during this dinner, at my signal, you're going to draw your gun and kill Dr. Weimar. Do you understand? At your signal, I'm to kill Dr. Weimar. And here is the signal. I'll say, doesn't it seem a little hot in here? The signal, you'll say... Doesn't it seem a little hot in here? Good. And now I'm going to wake you up, Thurston. At the count of three, you'll be wide awake... and you won't remember any of this. Understand? Yes, sir. All right, then. One, two, three. Ah. Natives of that particular area polish the stones by some method all their own. I never could discover how they did it. That's very interesting, General. Well, I guess I'd better get back to work. Oh, by the way, Mr. Thurston, I'm having a little dinner party here at my place this evening. I'd like to have you join us. Fine, what time? Oh, let's make it eight o'clock. All right, General. I'll see you at eight. Before I came here tonight that I'd keep the dinner conversation off that subject. And here we go again, talking about what? Zombies, naturally. Uh, would somebody please pass the salt? Well, it's a little hard to ignore a subject that's caused six deaths in a row. What have you found out, Mr. Thurston? Any results yet? Well, it depends on what you mean by results, Captain Andres. None, at least, that have led to what General Brock would call action. Well, unfortunately, I'm being forced into action. Martial law goes into effect at 8 o'clock tomorrow, orders of the cabinet. It's the old familiar pattern, and a bad one. Armed guards everywhere, a curfew, law courts closed, bulletins, orders, and force. Yes, yeah, it's an ugly picture, Dr. Weimar, for most people. For most people? I'd say for everybody concerned. Not necessarily, Marla. I came down here with one idea in mind, to look for the person most likely to profit from this zombie terror. Well, I found that person pretty quickly. It wasn't really much of a problem. <clears throat> I, I say, doesn't it seem a little hot in here? The problem was deciding how to deal with the situation. Mr. Thurston, doesn't it seem a little hot in here? Not to me, General Brock. But what I said was... Doesn't... I know what you said. 
I also know a few things about hypnotism. Ooh, Enough at least not to fix my attention on a shiny pendulum. All right, Captain Andres. General Brock, I have here a presidential warrant authorizing your arrest. But Captain Andres, I think. Look! Thurston is a zombie. Your gun, please. Look, don't you understand? Thurston is a zombie. No, you, Listen. General Brock. Dr. Vime, I've worked on the captain for five hours today. Your number one mop-up zombie is unzombified. All right. This way, General. I... March. I... All right. This way. Dictatorship by way of martial law. Was that his idea, Mr. Thurston? Of course, ma'am. It's an easier way than revolution. Oh. Well, one thing at least. There won't be any more of those zombies now. No, maybe not the kind he was creating. But there are other kinds. They're fighting and killing and dying all over the world. Millions of them. Mindless and blind, they... They follow just one command. Kill, destroy, kill. And yet who's really to blame? The zombies themselves? Or the men who create them? Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. That word is Fairfield. And RCA Victor's superb new Fairfield is the last word in console television. It's better looking in every way. Better looking television. RCA Victor television that has been quality proven in over two million homes. It's 17-inch television with clear, bright pictures. Steady pictures that are locked in place by RCA Victor's exclusive eyewitness picture synchronizer. Better-looking cabinet, too, for in the Fairfield, RCA Victor stylists have captured all the charm and dignity of the classic design. Every line, every detail of this fine furniture piece exhibits the craftsmanship for which RCA Victor is famous. And its beautifully figured doors can play such an important part when the set is not in use. Yes, the Fairfield is better-looking in every way. So next chance you get, step into your RCA Victor dealers. See and hear the exciting new Fairfield. You, too, will discover that the RCA Victor Fairfield is better looking in every way. Now, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. The folks you heard in tonight's cast were Barbara Fuller, D.J. Thompson, Will Wright, Lou Merrill, Stan Waxman, and Bill Conrad. Next week, a man and a girl and a plot that send Kane halfway around the world on one of the most exasperating cases he ever tackled. And speaking of exasperation, of course, Leon Belaska will be there as Pagon Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Transcribed for you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By Canon Towels, famous for color, for design, for durability. Among towels, America's number one best seller. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music composed and conducted by Felix Mills. Tonight's story was written by Les Crutchfield. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as the Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. The Man Called X, tonight starring Van Heflin, who is taking over during Herbert Marshall's illness. The Man Called X is a regular Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by... The makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. 
and by Canon Towels, famous for color, for design, for durability. Van Heflin in The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. When we ask you to try Anison for the relief of pain due to a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, we are not asking you to try a new or unproved method. For there are many people listening in now who have been introduced to Anison tablets by their own dentist or physician. You who have received Anison this way know the effective, incredibly fast relief these tablets bring. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy to take tablet form. People by the thousands are using modern Anison today instead of other ways. Doesn't their experience seem worth following? Try Anison the next time you suffer pains from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You will be delighted with the results. Ask your druggist for Anison today. Anison is spelled A N A C I N. A heavy fog lies over the British territorial waters off Hong Kong, east of Kowloon Peninsula, as a British gunboat feels its way slowly through the grayish white blanket. On its quarter deck, the commander and a man from British intelligence watch the swirling lines on the radar scope intently. You've raised something all right, Commander. A junk or sampan, judging by the size, Inspector. Then the information supplied to us by the American Bureau was quite accurate. Well, I would suggest we close in before leaping to conclusions, Inspector. Commander to number one battery. Unidentified target, 500 yards. Left, 270 degrees. Two rounds gunfire. Over. Thank you, Inspector. I find it difficult to believe that we'll come up with anything. Mr. Ken Thurston has worked with us very successfully before, Commander. But from what you say, his colleague radioed from San Francisco. Now, do you believe that a man halfway around the world can possess information about these waters that we don't have? I do. Inspector, I'll give odds that all we'll stop is some illegal fishing. Or an innocent houseboat, perhaps. What were you saying, Commander? So, my friend, you have received word from the British in Hong Kong. Yes, Mr. Lee, they picked up a sampan full of illegal medical supplies. Serums, plasma, antibiotics. It's running from Hong Kong into Red China. I still don't understand how you knew about it, Mr. Lee, and got in touch with Jim here in San Francisco. As my friends Jim Kendall and Mr. Thurston know, Mr. Chief, the House of Lee owns the largest Chinese pharmaceutical business in the world. We have branches in every major Asiatic city, including Hong Kong. That's right, Chief, and the black market stuff on that sampan came from the House of Lee. Wait a minute, Jim. You mean it was hijacked from the Hong Kong branch? Stolen? Uh, no, no. I fear my manager there is deliberately placing our stocks of precious life-saving medicines into the hands of Red China. Who is your manager there, Mr. Lee? I think you know him very well, Mr. Kendall. His name is Sammy Lee. Sammy oh. Lee? A relative? My son, Mr. Chief. Uh, oh, sorry. I beg of you, my friends, help me to learn the truth. Oh. Well, it's hardly the Bureau's business, Mr. Lee. And Hong Kong is British territory. But, Jim? If you made a crack like that to Ken Thurston, Chief, do you know what he'd say? I'll send you some jade from Hong Kong. Transpacific Airways, flight number 207 for Honolulu, Wake Island, Guam, Manila, and Hong Kong. Now ready at gate two. 
Trans-Pacific Airways, flight number 207. But, Mr. Kendall, you've simply got to take me along I'm with you. I'm sorry, Pagong, But sorry. you don't know how invaluable I could be uh, to you in, in Hong Kong place. I, I, I got cousins who got cousins there. I'll even pay for my own ticket. Yeah, uh, that ain't the way I heard it. Well, that, that is, if you could advance me just, well, a slight consideration first. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Kendall. I'll go to the window and... Hey, this is only ten bucks. I can't buy no ticket with no, this. That's for helping me with my bags. So long, Pega. But, Mr. X, I, I mean Mr. Kendall. I mean... Hmm. How do you like that? Turns me down flatter than a flat jack. I bet if Mr. X wasn't sick, I'd go along. Your <sighs> pardon for interrupting your most worthy thoughts, my friend? Huh? Perhaps, my dear Mr. Selschmidt, your transportation to Hong Kong might be arranged after all. Uh, it could. Hey, who are you? Uh, my name, sir, is Chen Wong, and I am in need of a capable uh, assistant in my business. Inasmuch as you expressed a desire to visit Hong Kong, and my business happens to be located there. Well, you understand, Mr. Wong, I, I, I'm a pretty busy financial type executive. Yeah, the thousands of dollars invested. I, I couldn't work for peanuts. Oh, uh, would uh, this aid you in arriving at a decision? Uh, oh, that. Let me see. Uh, ten, twenty. My stocks and bonds, of course. Fifty, sixty, seventy-five. A, b- a big merger coming up with that Las Vegas Street Cherries and Jackpot Company. Eighteen, ninety, one hundred. You know something, Mr. Wong? Oh uh, yes, Mr. Sesame. I'm hired. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to the house of Lee. Well, <laughs> thanks. Is there something we could do for you, sir? Uh, yeah, I'd like to speak to the manager, please. The manager? Yes, Sammy Lee. Is he in? May I ask who you are, sir? My name's Jim Kendall. Oh, I'm sorry, but Mr. Lee is not in at the moment. I am Marlis Tai Sing, his assistant. Could I not be of help to you? Oh, I'm afraid not, Miss Tysing. I'll um, I'll just hang around and wait till he gets back. But but you you cannot do that, Mister Kendall. Why not? Be- because be- because Mister Lee ha- ha- has left Hong Kong uh, on a business trip. Where'd he go? Uh, I do not know. Well, I thought you said you were his assistant. I am. And he left without telling you where you could get in touch with him. I yes, that is so. Because his business concerns sampans operating off of Kowloon Peninsula carrying illegal cargoes, huh? Who are you? I've already told you. You know what I mean. Who are you? An answer, quickly. Well, wow, that's... It's not very courteous, is it, uh, Marlitz? Answer me, Mr. Kendall, before I... You'd better put that gun back in your sleeve unless you want a witness to your intended homicide, huh? Oh, good afternoon, Marlitz. Lovely day, is it not? Yes, positively lovely. Well, my dear, has my order arrived yet, eh? Has it? Your order, Dr. Harvey? Oh, come now, Marlitz. Don't tell me you've forgotten it again. Oreomycin, streptomycin, chloromycetin. (laughs) <laughs> Should have a familiar ring by now, my dear. You're interested in antibiotics, Doctor? For what manner of medicine isn't these days, sir? Well, now, is the ship from Singapore docked yet? Well, I'm afraid not, Doctor. But it's three days overdue, my dear. I, I know, Doctor. We'll notify you the moment it arrives. I hope so. Frankly, I'm almost beginning to wonder if it shall arrive. What do you mean? Why, with all this talk about the fortunes being made, running serums and antibiotics into red China, <laughs> if I didn't know Sammy, I'd almost suspect him of being in the black market. Oh! Uh, wait a minute. They get, they get her, they get her, sir. Got her. Uh, George. <sighs> Fainted dead away. Now, what on earth could have caused that? Well, I would say that it was your crack about Sammy Lee and the black markets. Yes, of course. How stupid can I be? Should have known better. It was bound to upset her. Why? Oh, don't you know, old boy, Marla's is Sammy Lee's wife. Are you? Are you, Mr. Kendall? Uh, Oh, no. Hello, Mr. Kendall. Ha! 
Surprised to see me here, eh? Hang on, how in the devil did you get here? Oh, there are still some people in this world who depreciate me. Yeah, like Mr. Cheng Wong, for instance. Chen Wong? Yeah, my new business associate. Believe me, it's a wonderful job. I already got a paycheck. Before or after you told him that I was working with a man called X? Before, naturally. I'm no dope. I wouldn't have... Uh... Oops. Uh, uh, that's what I uh... thought. Come on, Pagan. Huh? Where are we going? Have a little talk with your new boss, Chen Wong. <laughs> So, Mr. Kendall, you believe that I hired the estimable Pagan Selschmidt merely to obtain information concerning you. Any other explanation, Chen Wong? No, no. You are quite correct in your surmise. It was rather expensive, but well worth it. Why? The activities of uh, Mancor X and any of his associates are always of interest to one such as me. Particularly when they may well be in direct conflict to my own. Are they? They will not be for long. Well, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. You see, I am well acquainted with the fact that you are making inquiries concerning Sammy Lee and certain activities regarding pharmaceutical supplies. So? So your interest in these matters will cease within 12 hours. What makes you think that? Oh, it's quite simple, my dear sir. Within 12 hours, you shall either have left Hong Kong or you shall be dead. Hello. Mr. Kendall? That's right. This is Marlis Tai Sing. I have some news about Sammy Lee. Good. What is it? He wants you to meet him at our warehouse in the dock area within half an hour. He has some words for you. Hmm. Any idea what it's all about? No, Mr. Kendall. He said only that it concerns disgrace. The disgrace that has tainted his father's house with red. <laughs> What's this all about anyways, Mr. Kendall? Why did we come chasing down here to the docks like this? To learn what business your ex-boss is in. Huh? The Chen Wong guy? What's he got to do with it? There's the warehouse just ahead. Well, uh, suppose you ask Sammy Lee about that. I don't get it, Mr. Kendall. All I know, I got no job, no money, and now... Hey, that car. It's coming right up behind those crates. Fast! might have a point there, Pagan. Come on. You mean you're going into that warehouse after all that? Why not? But, but that car just pulled away from this joint. Maybe it was the Sammy Lee who tried to bump us out. That's what I want to find out. <laughs> There's nobody around. So what's that bell ringing like that? Burglar alarm. Huh? Now, come on, let's try the back. There's nobody here either. So why don't we give this joint a brush up and get back to that hotel before the rain gets any worse? Rain? What in the devil are you talking about? Oh, sure. The roof is leaking. I just got a couple of drops of that from the back of my hand. Look. Here they... Uh-huh. Mr. Candle, those drops there, they're not rain. Hey, you're right, Pagan. Look up there on the hook of that pulley. On the hook of this foot? <gasps> yeah. Oh. Sammy Lee. We'll continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. RCA Victor has done it again. Yes, now you can easily own America's all-time top favorite tunes on RCA Victor Red Seal and popular single records, 50 all-time greats. 
Your choice of any or all of the greatest selling titles of them all. A star-studded collection of such wonderful music you'll want to hear it over and over again and again. RCA Victor's 50 all-time greats brings you hits from past and present. The most memorable music from both the classical and the popular fields. Fats Waller sings, I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter. Leopold Stokowski conducts his symphony orchestra in the Blue Danube Waltz. Iturbi plays Claire de Lune. And Vaughn Monroe sings, There, I've Said It Again. Yes, these are just an inkling of the many titles contained in RCA Victor's 50 all-time greats, recorded on 78 and 45. Be sure to treat yourself to these wonderful favorites, beautifully performed for you by the greatest stars on RCA Victor's roster. See your nearest dealer tomorrow about RCA Victor's 50 all-time greats. Recorded by RCA Victor. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X. Tonight, starring Van Heflin, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Acting for Mr. X, Jim Kendall is in Hong Kong, attempting to break up the illegal traffic in American medicinal supplies being smuggled into Red China. A Chinese pharmaceutical firm, the House of Lee, is apparently involved. And now, in a private office at the House of Lee, Jim Kendall is talking with Marlis Tai Sing, widow of the murdered Sammy Lee. Yes, Mr. Kendall. It was Chen Wang who was responsible for all our sorrows. Chen Wang who tried to blackmail Sammy into giving our supplies to Red China. What pressure did he use, Marlis? The most effective pressure of all, Mr. Kendall. Threats against my life. Oh, I, I begged Sammy not to do it. I would have taken any risk rather than to give aid and comfort to the enemies of my people. But it was no use. He agreed to work with Chen Wong. Yes. And now he's dead. Mm. Well, uh, maybe you can carry on for him. Carry on? Yeah. We need proof against Chen Wong. Suppose you tell him that you need money badly now that uh, Sammy's dead. And that you'll help him the same way Sammy did. That is, if he'll cut you in on the black market. And you, Mr. Kendall? After all, you are Chen Wong's most important target now. What are you going to do? Pay a visit to Dr. James Harvey. Dr. Harvey? What, what, what could he possibly have to do with this affair? That's what I was wondering. I found his card lying on the warehouse floor underneath Sammy's body. to have you drop in, Kendall. Delighted, though. I must say you don't look as though you required my services. A picture of health, my boy. A picture of health. Did you say that about Sammy Lee, too, Doctor? Yeah, Sammy Lee? I don't quite get the connection. Sammy's dead. Oh, surely you must be joking. Why, I examined him not three weeks ago. Not a blessed thing wrong with him, I swear to that. He was murdered, Doctor, a little over an hour ago. Murdered? By George, that's difficult to believe. Most difficult. Is it? Well, then maybe you can explain a few things about the bloodstains on this card of yours. Card of what? Yeah. Right. George, it is my card, and those stains do look like blood, for a fact. Where'd you get this? It was lying on the floor underneath Sammy Lee's body. It doesn't mean a thing. Of course, you realize that. No proof that I shot him. Matter of fact, it's not really proof of anything. No. No, but it might be interesting to learn just how it got there. And, uh, how you knew he'd been shot when all I said was that he'd been murdered. You'd like to clear that up for me, Doctor? Yes. I think it's high time that I did. I'm with British Intelligence, Kendall, working on the same thing you are. The smuggling of illegal goods into red China. Mm, Now, that could be just a little too pat, Harvey. True, but perhaps this will convince you. You work with a man called X with the Bureau. You wirelessed our office from San Francisco with certain information. It enabled us to pick up a sampan carrying contraband off Kowloon Peninsula. Does that convince you? Mm -hmm. Well, it should, shouldn't it? Uh, by the way, uh, were you anywhere near the warehouse tonight? Why, no. Why? On my way up there, I exchanged a few shots with somebody in a car. I thought you might have known something about that. Why should I know anything about it? Well, it was just an idea. I saw your car parked outside here, a couple of bullet holes in the body. Good night, Doctor. <laughs> I 
I'm afraid it was a bad mistake for me to see Chen Wang, Mr. Kendall. A very bad mistake. He didn't go for your story, Ma. Oh, he laughed at me and told me to inform you that your time has run out. He means to kill you. Oh, that's bad. He means to kill all of us. Hey, that's bad. Let's get out of here oh, quick. Come on, now relax. I've got a call in for Dr. Harvey. Oh, you believe that British intelligence will be able to help us then? Well, if he'll cooperate with us, I think we'll have a chance, Morris. <laughs> Chen Wang, he's here, he's here. Quiet, you idiot. That's only the phone. Oh. Hello. That's right. You're sure of that? I see. Okay, thank you. Who was it, Mr. Kendall? British intelligence. Well, well, what did they say, Mr. X? I mean, Mr. What did they say? What did they say? It was short and to the point, Pagan. They don't know any Dr. James Harvey. But... But why do we have to go back to that Lee warehouse like this? Don't you realize that you're taking my life in your hands? I just want to check on a shipment of antibiotics. And who? What shipment are you talking about, Mr. Kendall? When Dr. Harvey was so interested in. Three days overdue from Singapore. But it is still overdue, and we have received no word as to when it will arrive. Maybe you didn't, Marlis, but somebody did. I saw that shipment in the warehouse this afternoon. Let's go in. I still do not understand what you hope to learn here. As long as we're still in Hong Kong and alive, Chin Wong's going to be worried. He's worried. So, if he wants those serums and antibiotics from Singapore, he'll have to work fast. That came from the back of the warehouse. Now, come on, let's see what's going on there. Mr. Campbell. Look. Yeah, yeah, Chin Wong and his men. What? But what are they doing with all this crazy... That's the Singapore shipment. They're moving it out. We've got them. Oh, yeah? Yeah, there's a phone in the office. British intelligence will be out here in five minutes. Come on. I would not advise trying it, what? Mr. Kendall. Look. Well. She's got a... <laughs> Our little game is over. Your time has run out. There is nothing further you can do to stop us from taking that shipment and the two of you into Red China. I trust you find the cabin of our little ship quite comfortable, gentlemen. We might if you'd put that, that thing away. Then. Oh, merely a slight precaution. We will rendezvous with the gunboat in a few moments. The medicinal supplies will be transferred aboard. Then the commissar of the gunboat will decide what is to be done with you. <laughs> you mean there's a choice? If he believes the People's Republic can make use of you, you will be taken to the mainland. If not, you will be disposed of at sea. But, but that puts us right between the devil. Well, that's more of a break than Sammy Lee got, Pagan. You must have planned this for a long time, Marlis, making Sammy fall in love with you and then pulling that fake blackmail gag on him. Yes. What was that? We have reached our rendezvous, Elschmidt. That rocket was fired to inform the gunboat of our presence. It will be alongside in a few moments. Look. Look, baby, before it gets here, uh, couldn't we make a deal of some kind? <laughs> the People's Republic does not make deals, Zerschmidt. We take what we need, whether it is antibiotics, serums, or your lives. We... That sound. What is it? Mr. Kendall. Just the gunboat. But they fired a shell at us. Sure, a warning to stay put until they come alongside. Warning? One of our gunboats would not fire a warning at us. That's right. Then what are they? British. It is a British gunboat. With Dr. Harvey aboard, Marlis. What? Harvey? He's the one who called me at the hotel to give me a go-ahead on our plan. But you said it was British intelligence reporting that Harvey was not... Chen! Not so Jen! fast, Marlis. Come on, out. Take that gun. Oh, oh better, huh? Ollie, what's happening here? Drop that gun, Chen. Oh, Kendall! 
Now the cabin door, Peg, on fast, fast. Yes, yes. You, you better. You better. All right, Marlis. Now, if you want something to do until Harvey gets here, we'll just fix up Chen's shoulder for him. Maybe that'll keep you out of trouble. Well, I thought that part by see you. <laughs> Boy, oh. Well, we cooked their geese all right. Don't have to worry about them trying to steal anything again. No, I'm afraid you're wrong, Peggy. Huh? As long as Marlis and Chen and those like them are still around, we've got plenty to worry about. You heard what she said. They'll try to take anything they want. Antibiotics, lives, even the world. Our star for tonight, Van Heflin, will return in just a moment. But first, here is a word about dramatic values. Listen. Listen closely. Don't miss this. It's important. <laughs> Canon, the world's most popular towels, are waiting for you now. Right now, in big, value-packed, money-saving Canon towel sales. You'll need more towels with summer on the way. Here's a real opportunity to stock up at prices that will save you money. There are big, beautiful buys in Canon towels of every size and type. And a wide choice of lovely colors and designs. Canons give you the most for your money in every way. In real value. In lovely color. And in beautiful design. Canon towels absorb more. Wear longer. Stay lovely longer. Canons are big, fluffy, Thirsty towels. No wonder more people buy Canon towels than all other towels combined. Be sure you get the most for your money. Get Canons. See your newspaper for these special Canon towel sales. Get to your store now and get in on the big, big, big Canon values. Now here again is our star for tonight's program, Mr. Van Heflin. As Herbert Marshall would say, thanks for being with us. And, uh, by the way, my thanks to Will Wright, and Viola Vaughn, Eric Snowden, Ben Wright, Tony Barrett, and Harry Bartell. Now, next week, our story takes us behind the Iron Curtain to a gloomy fortress called Stalin Plus Seven, where an innocent American has confessed to being a spy and a saboteur. And I don't mean Leon Belasco, who will be along, of course, as Pagan Zellschmidt. So, uh, please join us, won't you, when we next return with The Man Called X. Good night. Called X is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Canon Towels, famous for color, for design, for durability. Among Towels, America's number one bestseller. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. Van Heflin is currently seen in the United Artists production of The Prowler. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. Called X, tonight starring John Lund, who is taking over during Herbert Marshall's illness. The Man Called X is a regular Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. 
and by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. <laughs> John Lund in The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. Here's a word from RCA Victor. Five in one. Five superb instruments in one great combination. That's what you get when you invest in RCA Victor's new television radio phonograph combination, the Rutland. Yes, here in one beautiful cabinet, you'll find big 17-inch RCA Victor million-proof television. Television that brings you clear, bright pictures. Steady pictures that are locked in place by RCA Victor's exclusive eyewitness picture synchronizer. You'll enjoy the latest and greatest RCA Victor AM and FM radio plus two superb automatic record changers for recorded music at all three speeds. Yes, five superb instruments. And yet, because you pay for only one sound system, only one cabinet, their cost is far less than what you'd pay for comparable console instruments. So when you invest in a television set, insist on the best. Insist on RCA Victor Television. See and hear the Rutland. And the many other fine RCA Victor Television sets... Available now at your RCA Victor dealers. The news came over the press service teletypes early on a cheerful June morning. It was only one short paragraph in length, but its impact had immediate worldwide repercussions. Dateline, Bucharest, Romania. Theodore Johnson, American businessman, arrested in Harsovia last week by Vladimir Boric of the Romanian Security Police, has confessed to being an American spy. Johnson's trial will be held in the People's Court in Bucharest one week from today. And within one hour after the news broke, within the offices of the Bureau in New York City. Something's got to be done about it. Fast. Ted Johnson is as innocent as you are. Sure, Bill. I know... But this involves the internal security of another country. It's not the Bureau's business. Chief, it's the world's business. They forced that confession out of Johnson to whip up war hysteria against the United States. I agree, Bill. I agree 100%. But there's nothing we can do. We can prove to the world that Johnson's innocent by getting him out of Romania. What? You know, Ted Johnson's wife tried to call Ken Thurston. With Ken laid up, I took the call. She told me Ted was in Istanbul, Turkey, on business... Bill, as long as you're working for the Bureau, you've got to stay out of it. Chief, you ought to read your mail a little more carefully. Huh? My mail? Yeah. One of your agents has just resigned. A fellow by the name of Bill Pringle. Bill, you... I'll see you around, Chief. That is, if you ever get to Istanbul. Believe me, Mr. Rex. I, I, I mean, Mr. Pringle. You're one plenty, plenty smart cook you're taking me along. Yeah. Nothing I don't know about that Istanbul place. All right, Pagan. How about digging out the characters who handle the underground escape route from Romania? That's a cinch. When it comes to the underground, I... Huh? Yeah. There's an underground escape route in every country behind the Iron Curtain. For people who'd like a taste of liberty for a change. I want you to find out how they get out of Romania and into Turkey. But believe me, Mr. Pringle, it's, it's as good as did. <laughs> I got friends who'll tell me anything. For a slight consideration, of course. Oh, shall we say, uh, uh, a hundred bucks? Okay. Absolutely not. I wouldn't consider it for a penny less. I, huh? You mean you'll pay? Sure. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. But why do you want to know about the, this escape route? We're not coming out of Romania. That's right, Pagan. We're going in. could not have come to a more perfect, a more wonderful person with whom to discuss your difficulties, my darling, Mr. Pringle. I am Baron Laszlo Tagore at your service. I'm glad to know you, Baron. But of course, why should you not be? 
Uh, now, why is it you have come to visit the magnificent Valentagori? Well, Can't I... I do so hope that it has something to do with money, my dear Pringle. I simply adore money. It has so many uses, you know. Baron, I want to talk to you about Ted Johnson. I understand he was doing business with you here in Istanbul. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Darling, Mr. Johnson, what a ghastly thing to happen. So unfortunate, so sad, and so unremunerative to me. What really happened to Gori? He was inconsiderate enough to have himself seized by the Romanian security police before concluding our affairs. I had not made a profit of even a single piaster out of him. It was really terribly inconsiderate. Yeah, very. How did it happen he was arrested in Romania when his business was with you here in Turkey? My darling Pringle, all I know is that Mr. Johnson came to me regarding certain silks and perfumes he wished to purchase. I would have made a huge profit on the transaction. But then, before giving me a check, poof, he vanished. So, we have disposed now of Mr. Johnson. Tagore, we haven't disposed of anything. Now, look here. Oh, how I... sweet of you to be so forceful. Uh, but you must realize that he will go on trial in Bucharest, confess his crimes in court, and be hung. Poof. Just as simple as that. But, of course, there is nothing anyone can do for him now. Not even the magnificent Balantagori. Please remember that, darling. That's right, Mr. Pringle. If you want any dope about people escaping from Romania, the place to go is the Konaksim Cafe down at the docks at table number 53. Konaksim Cafe, table 53. Then what? It's simple. Tell whoever sits down with you that, that you want to go fishing. So, you are interested in fishing, Mr. Pringle? That's right, Miss... Uh... Call me Saria. Okay, Saria. Right now, I'm looking for a guide. Know of any? Well, there are all kinds of guides, Mr. Pringle. What kind of a catch are you after? Oh, a big one. Oh. Like the one they landed near Harsovia last week. Name of Johnson. The catching of such a prize is up to the fishermen. All that the owner of a boat can do is take him to the proper fishing grounds. Well? I will have my own boat ready to leave in half an hour. Arriving at our destination, Mr. Pringle. Arriving? I don't see nothing out there in the darkness, but but darkness. The Romanian coast, are you? Yes. Thirteen kilometers southeast of Constanta. The coastline here is deserted. You should have little difficulty in making your way to the railroad. Good. The Constanta Bucharest Express leaves at nine in the morning. All right. From then on, it will be up to you. Well, thanks for everything, Sarah. No thanks unnecessary. Just leave the boat at once. We are in constant danger every minute we remain here. Sure. Come on, Fagan. Oh, look, Mr. Pringle. Why, why don't I just give you a letter to my cousin Vasily in Bucharest? Oh, come on. Okay, okay. Oh. Only a fellow could catch his death of what he's doing things like this. Oh. Well, well, I hope you're satisfied now. There goes that luscious cookie saria with, with the boat. Oh, we've jumped right into the frying pan. Hold it, Fagan. Huh? Somebody moving in that brush over there. Shut up. He thinks we're over there. Let's get going. This is Vladimir Polek of the security police. I command you to have that one. Security police? Yeah. Somebody must have tipped him off. Now they'll be on our tail all the way to Bucharest. I should have had my head examined coming along with you this way. How long do we have to stay on that board of this throttle trap train anyways? We'll be in Bucharest in a few minutes. And so, so we'll be in Bucharest. So what? It'll only make it easier for that Vladimir Boric to, to latch on to us. Not if we can get to Mikhail Andescu first. Huh? Mikhail Andescu? Who is he? 
Ken Thurston and I worked with him in the resistance during the war. Now, what's a friend of yours doing behind Iron Curtain? It's the same thing he was doing then. If there's a prayer of saving Ted Johnson's neck, he'll know the people who can help us. Oh, so, so who cares? Can they help us save my neck? <laughs> Good afternoon, comrades. As loyal patriots of the People's Republic of Romania, I know you will not mind sharing your compartment with a brother. A brother? Why not at all? Come in. Thank you. I would not trouble you this way, but I understand that two enemies of the state are traveling with us today. Oh, I hadn't heard about this. What's going on? Oh, there is nothing to fear. Naturally, those of us whose identification papers are in perfect order have nothing to be concerned about. Oh, but your pardon for not having introduced myself earlier. I am Vladimir Borek, head of the security police. Se- se- security? Of course. Two such loyal subjects of our great republic do not mind the slight inconvenience of showing me your identification. Merely a matter of routine. You understand? Sure. I'll be glad to, Comrade Borek. I have my papers right here. <coughs> oh. What did you want to come in for? Now he'll be sore on us. And I'll bet he's got plenty of stooges aboard with him. That's right. So... Come on, out this window, Pagan. Huh? Fast. Huh? Well, we still got a chance to find Andesco. <laughs> You, you sure this is that Andesco's house, Mr. Pringle? They haven't taken it away from him, it is. Huh. But, but there's nobody's answering. Oh, he must have gone to a movie or something. He must have proved... <laughs> Welcome, my darling, Mr. Pringle. Welcome to Bucharest. Tagori. But of course, my dear person. Oh, what a wonderful pleasure it must be for you to see here the magnificent Baron Tagori. Skip it, Baron. Where's Andesco? Oh, yeah. Yes, the poor, unfortunate Michael Andes. Where is he? He was most indiscreet. How stupid of him to allow himself to be executed by the security police. Executed? Ah, oh, but do not be sad. Is not the magnificent Baron Tagori here to greet you instead? And that must be most reassuring to you, is it not, my darling? <laughs> We'll continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Every day you hear more and more about an incredibly fast way to relieve the pains of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. It's Anacin. A-N-A-C-I-N. Now, the reason Anacin is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anacin contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30. Economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Ask for anison at any drug counter. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, tonight starring John Lund, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Bill Pringle has secretly entered Bucharest in an effort to rescue Ted Johnson, who is being held for trial as an American spy. At the home of Mikhail Andesco, a member of the underground, they are greeted, however, by Baron Laszlo Tagori, former business associate of Johnson's, who tells them Andesco has been executed by the security police. Yes, my dear gentlemen, it was most thoughtless of Mikhail to disappoint you this way. But the Baron Tagore shall do his magnificent best to make you feel at home. Please, to enter and accept my hospitality. All right, Tagore. 
Now, what's the pitch? How sweet of you to ask, my dear Pringle, but there is no one I would rather speak about more than myself. Uh, first, however, I should like you to meet some of my friends. Uh, this is Anton Barsak. Gentlemen. And here we have the taciturn Leonid. And as for the last member of this most distinguished gathering... Look, look, it's... it's... Yeah. How did you get here so fast, Sarya? Well, when Vladimir Borek men attacked you the landing place, I ran to Laszlo. He flew over from Istanbul, picked me up, and we continued here to Bucharest. Oh, you're not most magnificently pleased, my dear Pringle. Yeah. Yeah. I'm beginning to think I am, Tagori. Maybe Andescu is gone, but looks like he left a pretty good organization behind him. Yes. We helped you get into Romania, Mr. Pringle. We'll help you to get out. With Ted Johnson? What a superfluous question, my dear boy. But of course with darling Mr. Johnson. That is where Johnson's trial will be held, Bill. In the People's Court, Stalin Platz 7. Stalin Platz 7, huh? Looks more like a fortress than a court building. It is. The headquarters of the security police are there. And it is where Johnson is being held prisoner. Have you learned the name of the trial judge? But of course, my dear Pringle. He is one Andras Prinkipo, known to his most flattering enemies as the Butcher. Prinkipo? Huh? Unfortunately, we have been able to ascertain nothing detrimental about his service to the state. Maybe not, but there's always... Pagan's cousin, Vasily. Oh, but how would our dear Mr. Zellschmidt's cousin help us in this matter? If Prinkipo has ever been mixed up with anything crooked in Romania, you can bet your life a Zellschmidt will know about it. <laughs> We are here, my friend. Stalin Plot 7. Good. It's now uh, 10.15. The mm -hmm. trial started. Pagan. A few minutes before they recess, at 11.55, have the car at the side entrance. Huh? It's your neck if you don't. I... Oh, I'll be there, Mr. Pringle. Well, how about it, Laszlo? Everything straight in your mind? My beloved friend, I can already see the pained look upon poor dear Judge Principo's face when he enters his chambers after a trying morning upon the bench. <laughs> Not no, all right, all right. Let's go in. I can now fully appreciate the wonderful enjoyment experienced by the man in the circus who places his head into the mouth of the lion. The Baron Tagore shall be forever indebted to you. I'll take a rain check on that, Laszlo. Where are Prinkipo's chambers? That door with the security police guard standing in front of it. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm quite relieved to see that he is one of our men. Mm. Where's the side entrance? In the short corridor that runs to the left. Good. We should be able to... What is it, my friend? Look, that woman leaving those offices up ahead. Hmm? Isn't she... Oh, I lost her in the crowd around that corner. As much as it pains me, my darling Pringle, need I remind you that this is a time for affairs of action, not of the heart. Whose offices are they? The den of that most vicious of all the Romanian foxes, Vladimir Borek. Surely you do not wish to visit him at a time like this. No, no. Just wondering why Sarya would want to visit him. What? You believe that woman you saw of us? Oh, oh, no, 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 my beloved friend. Sarya is making our final arrangements at the airport. You are mistaken. You better be right, Laszlo, because if you're not, well, it's too late now. Let's go into the courtroom. You admit then, prisoner, that you are guilty of the crimes against the state with which you have been charged. I do. You confess them freely of your own volition, without duress. I, I confess them freely. Very well. The accused will please state in his own words the actions that led to his arrest upon those charges. I, Theodore Johnson, a citizen of the United States, was officially assigned the task by my government of entering secretly into Romania... My objective was to perform acts of sabotage against the People's Republic 
and to learn what military and state secrets I could. Incredible. Even to me, it is incredible. incredible. I've seen them do it before. They make zombies out of their political prisoners. They always... What is it? Vladimir Borak. Going up to the bench. Talking to Prince Kipo. The fox and the butcher failing to observe the rigid protocol of the people's court? Hmm. A paradox, my beloved friend, is it not? Well, they wouldn't be doing it unless there was a pretty strong reason. Oh, start heading for the door. The proceedings of the people's court in the matter of the American spy Theodore Johnson will now be recessed. Remove the prisoner. Come on, come on, let's get out. Yes. Frankly, you know, it is most distressing to me to be involved in such an undignified flight. But apparently your eyesight is keener than my sense of suspicion. That woman you saw leaving Borek's office... Yeah, she was, Sarya. And she sold us out. Of course, Sarya sold them out, Principo. Why are you so surprised? Did she not obtain Johnson for us so we could use him for our propaganda purposes? But, but, my dear comrade Borek, it all seems so incredible. A plot to kidnap me, to obtain the release of the American. How did they intend to carry out this fantastic plan? They had not informed Sawyer of the details. That is why I made you halt the proceedings so abruptly. Here, in your chambers, under my personal protection, you will be quite safe. Don't be too sure, Borek. What? Comrade Borek, this man... Pringle. Yes, my darling comrade Borek. And you would be most foolish to attempt to reach for any weapons. This one of mine is equipped with a delicious silencing mechanism. You cannot frighten Vladimir Borek. My men have this building surrounded. Without official passes, you will never leave here alive. Thanks for the advice. We'll follow it. After we get through with Prinkipo. Which, with me, comrades? What is it you wish with me? Your signature in this custodial release of Theodore Johnson. Release? It orders Johnson to be placed in your custody for further questioning before the trial resumes. Sign it. But, but that... Sign nothing, Principal. They cannot get away with this. Do you wish to know something, my darling boy? Your voice is beginning to irritate me. As much as I detest to islands, I'm afraid I must be... Oh, comrades, please! All right, Principal. The release. Sign it. No, no, no. I will sign nothing. You should have thought of that in November of 49. November 49? Yeah. Ever hear of a man by the name of Vasily Zellschmidt? Oh, Zellschmidt. What has he got to do with this? He had plenty to do with you. And a black market operation in roller bearings. Maybe you'd like to explain to the Politburo how they wound up in Yugoslavia instead of the Romanian factories they were intended for. I, I don't know what you're referring There's to. There's another little item. June 1950. A shipment of industrial diamonds. No, oh, no. That turned up in Western Germany instead of Russia. Does the Kremlin know what happened to your bank balance about that time? You have no proof. You... We've got a lot more proof than you have against Ted Johnson. The security police found a way to make him confess. I don't think they'll have too tough a job with you. Well? All right. All right, I... I will sign Help him into the car, Pagan. I, I got him. You're next, Prinkipo. What do you wish with me now? What, what? You're going to be our official passport out of Romania. Get in. Oh. Laszlo? Yes, my beloved friend. Good. All right, let's head for the airport fast. Planes are ready for us? Yes, it is, however, a Russian deal to Paul at 70. <laughs> Perhaps I should have inquired earlier as to whether or not you can fly it without me. It's their copy of our own C-47. I can fly it. Oh, sure, sure. Only how do we get past all the guards out there in that airport? The same way we got out of Stalin Plot 7, Prinkipo. He's got the authority. And when it comes to using it or getting purged, we'll get past those guards. <laughs> We've been flying for hours already. When do we get to Turkey anyways? We'll get there, Pagan. But but I don't like this flying in the clouds all the time. We could bump into something or something. We'd bump into a lot more if we flew above them. 
according to the radio, every fighter plane in Romania is up looking for us. Ooh, don't, don't say things like that. You give my goose pimples. Maybe I should have stayed in Bucharest with that Baron Tagori. Hey! Hey, look! <laughs> We're out of the clouds. Yeah. Yeah, there's the Black Sea. And that's Turkey, dead ahead. Oh, hurt. Oh, will I ever be glad to get down on solid firma. Ah, oh, well, I guess we can relax now, eh? Not quite. Huh? Look back. Up there to the left. Those planes. They're diving down on yeah, us. Yeah, two jet fighters. Russian built MiGs. Ooh. Ooh, we gotta do something. Try hanging on to your hat. The first one's making his pass now. Ooh. Ooh. I'm dead. Not yet, thank God. Give the second one a chance. Oh, oh, oh that did it. That, that did it. Oh, relax, you idiot. They just hit our engines. They, they were going to crash up into the Black Sea. That's what I hope those MiGs will think. Then maybe they'll... Hey, yeah. They're heading back to Romania. Hey, you mean we're not going to crash? I'm going to try for a landing. Beside that Turkish destroyer down there. If we can make it. Well, well, what do you know? We made it. Yeah. Looks like it, Pagan. And that destroyer will pick us up in a minute. Look. Look that Mr. Johnson slept all through it. Oh, the poor guy. Boy. What they did do to him there in Bigomania. Yeah. But he'll be all right once we get him back to the States. Too bad we can't say the same about the others. Huh? What others? The millions who are still behind the Iron Curtain. Prisoners of their people's republics. Drugged by propaganda, tortured by their fears of the secret police. <sighs> I wonder how long it'll take to make them well again. Now, here to tell you about next week's program is our star for tonight, Mr. John Lund. As Herbert Marshall would say, thanks for being with us. Oh, and by the way, my thanks to Will Wright, Lillian Bayef, Parley Bear, Frank Gerstel, Stephen Garay, Lamont Johnson, and, of course, Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Next week, Ken Thurston tangles with a grain black market in India. That's right, Mr. X himself. Because next week, Herbert Marshall will be with you again. So join him, won't you, when he returns as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. John Lund may now be seen in the Paramount production of The Mating Season. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in the life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. Now we present Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X, the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by... 
Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. Plus, no unpleasant aftertaste, and that's the biggest plus in cigarette history. By the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. Science discovered it. You can prove it. No unpleasant aftertaste when you smoke Chesterfields. The biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered this fact. Of all cigarettes tested, Chesterfield, and only Chesterfield, leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. You can prove it. Smoke a pack of Chesterfields. They're always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered it. You can prove it. Buy Chesterfields today. India, long a land of mystery and enchantment, one time center of oriental splendor, is still upon occasion a place of violence and danger. And especially is this true when man's great enemy, hunger, walks the streets. For hunger breeds death. Night has fallen over Bombay Harbor, and the only footsteps heard on the mole are those of watchmen and police, and a few beggars too hungry to sleep. Watchman? Watchman? Uh, now, where the devil can he be? Hmm? What's this? He's been killed. Stabbed to death. Another one. I wonder if they took the grain in the warehouse. 200 tons of wheat for... Uh, never mind the flashlight, Inspector Dimi. The warehouse is empty. Roger the color. What are you doing here? A very good question, Inspector. One which might apply to you as well. Why, I... I belong here. It's my duty to protect the harbor warehouses. What's more, it's no affair of yours. Hunger is the affair of every human being in Bombay. People are starving by hundreds, by thousands. Ah, but no Raja has starved. Remarkable how one never sees a hungry Raja. Is that not so? Hunger is relative, Inspector. And even more remarkable is your singular habit of always arriving just after a robbery. Well, if it is impossible for one to be everywhere, how can I know where... But why should I offer you explanations, Roger Dakala? I have work to do. It's pretty much the same story all over India, Chief. But the worst part of all is the Bombay district. Yeah, it seems to be, Ken, judging from these reports. Dozens of warehouses in the harbor area have been robbed during the past few weeks. Black market is running wide open, offering grain and other food at 10 to 20 times what it's worth. Mm. People are starving, and the food committee is helpless. That could lead to a bad situation, couldn't it? It's leading to it right now, Chief. When people get hungry... Oh, well, you know, anything can happen. And frequently has. All right, if you're trying to convince me it's our job to stop it, I agree. So, where do we go from here? Bombay. Or at least that's where I'm going. Yeah, but what I mean, I Ken... know, Chief. Leads, angles, ideas. Well, I... I don't have any. What about the Bombay police? I shall find out their theories when I get there. Well... All right, go to it. One good thing, at least. I haven't seen Zell Schmidt around lately. This is one time you won't have him in your hair. Oh, <laughs> Don't be too short of that. Hmm? I'm just talking to Miss Brooks. She says Pagan stopped in last week when I was 
down in Mexico City, wanted to know if the Bureau had been getting any information from India. But what for? Why the devil would he be interested in India? Gee, big on an old hand at black markets. If there's one operating anywhere in the world, you've heard about it. <laughs> can see, Mr. Thurston, the harbor front circles off to our right for more than a mile. An immense jungle of piers, wharves, storage yards, and warehouses. It is a tremendous problem to guard it properly. And guarding it is your responsibility, is that right, Inspector Remy? Yes. Perhaps too much of a responsibility, judging by recent events. Ah, it's a busy area, all right. Congested, crowded. Exactly. Without such conditions, the robberies would not have been possible. So, shall we go back to my office? Fine. You need more police, Inspector Remy? India needs more of everything, Mr. Thurston. Food, money, and police. Which makes it worse that food is being lost. Any idea who's back of this black market and relief grain? The same. You would call it a gang that steals it, I believe. Gang? Mm. Here we are. After you, sir. Thank you. It is only my surmise, of course, that a single gang is responsible, but they use the same technique each time. Make a quick, brutal attack, usually at night, and haul the grain away on trucks. Have there been any arrests? A few peddlers have been questioned, no results. If they know anything, they're afraid to tell it. Oh, well. Maybe the best plan, then, is to start at the top. At the top? Look, Inspector, suppose a a big-time operator arrived in Bombay and wanted to break into the black market. Wanted to buy some stolen grain. Now... What's the first thing you would do? Yes, I think I understand, Mr. Thurston. If such a man were unknown in Bombay, he might go to the Cosmo Club. The Cosmo Club, eh? And he might permit himself to be uh, overheard talking about his plan. What kind of a place is it? An underworld front? Not so far as we know, but it is sort of a crossroads for notorious international personalities. I see. If nothing else, Mr. Thurston... A chance to meet the uh, hostess of the club would justify your visit. Uh-huh. Her name is Karma. Beautiful, mysterious, and... Uh... <laughs> uh, but go see for yourself. Thanks, I will. By the way, Inspector, do you happen to know whether a man named... Uh, Pagon Zellschmidt has arrived in Bombay during the last week? Zellschmidt? No, Mr. Thurston, the name is totally unfamiliar. A friend, perhaps? Well, he's beginning to worry me. After all, this run of luck can't last forever. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Well, you couldn't be anyone but Karma. Why, yes. How did you know? Oh, I've heard about you. Beautiful, mysterious. Thank you. Um, my name is Ken Thurston. Welcome to the Cosmo Club, Mr. Thurston. Your first visit? Yes, I'm here on business, in a way. I was told that this might be a good place to arrange for the purchase of some grain. How odd. This is not exactly a market or a warehouse. Well, I understand there's more grain outside the warehouses than inside. It's the outside kind that I'm interested in. A hundred tons to start with. I'll pay top prices. Mr. Thurston, it's possible, of course, that someone here in the club has what you're looking for. I would not know. I serve excellent food, generous drinks, and I keep silent. That is my rule for staying in business. In Bombay, at least. Well, it's a good rule anywhere. My problem's different, though. I'm trying to go into business, not uh, stay in. I wish you the best of luck. Wait up. If you'll excuse me now, the waiter will take care of you. Thank you. Just step this way now, my oh, good... Oh, there you are. Mr. Thurston. No, I knew it was too good to last. Oh, you should talk, Mr. X. You come all the way to India just to loss up my game again. What game? <laughs> the black market? Uh, sure, as soon as I found out uh, who is the big wheel behind... Oh, what am I saying? Nothing I couldn't have guessed. <laughs> but I, I was only joking, Mr. Thurston. <laughs> oh, sure. Now, come on, how about a table? I'll give you the best one in the house. Now, come on, follow me. 
What uh, have you found out about the black market, Pagan? Oh, you could put it in your head, I know. Know anybody who's mixed up in it? I got suspicion of one guy. Here you are, sir. Thank you. He's sitting at the second table from you, uh, the one next to the window. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a big shot around town, the Raja Dakala, or something like that. That's so. Uh... Yeah, he's always snooping around asking questions like you are. Probably trying to get started in the black market. Like I am. Sure, that's exactly what... What? Uh, waiter, you know where I can buy a hundred tons of hot grain? But, 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 but... Well, that's a great answer. But, but, but Mr. Thurston, the I should ever live to see the day. Well, now that you have, suppose you bring me a scotch and soda. Sure, coming right up. By the beard of my father, Mr. Thurston has finally turned crook. Pardon me for barging in. My name's Blake Kramer. I'm Ken Thurston. Sit down, Mr. Crane. No, thanks. I'm on my way out. Where would you be planning to sell that grain, Mr. Thurston? Not uh, locally, if that's what you mean. Know where I can get it? It might be arranged. Where are you staying? Alexander Hotel. Fine. I'll get in touch with you. Good night. So long, Mr. Kramer. Ah. Uh, there's a phone call for you, Mr. Thurston. I'll plug it in here by the table. Hagan, do you know anything about that man who just left, the one who was sitting with the Raja? Blake Kramer? Only that he charges everything here and never leaves a tip. Boy. Uh, here's your call. Thanks. Ken Thurston. Inspector Ramey, Mr. Thurston. What's up, Inspector? Another robbery. They just cleaned out the grain warehouse at Pier 39. I'm over here now. Pier 39? All right, Inspector. I'll be there in ten minutes. Uh, so it was, Mr. Thurston. Uh, did you... So long, Pega. No. Wait. They used the same technique again, Mr. Thurston. A gang of 15 or 20 men and half a dozen trucks. They cut the telephone wires there at the end of the block, then they slugged the watchman and two police guards, took 30 tons of wheat from the warehouse. And uh, no witnesses, Inspector? To all intents and purposes, no. Well, what do you mean? Some of those beggars there under the lights undoubtedly saw the gang leave, but they regard the whole thing as just a piece of good fortune. Good fortune? What are they doing here, anyhow? A sack of wheat fell off one of the escaping trucks. Most of it is gone, of course, but they are sifting the dirt for any grains that may be left. Oh, poor devils. Mm. Inspector, do you know anything about a man named... Uh... Blake Kramer. Blake Kramer? No, I've never heard of him. Who is he? He's my one contact so far with the black market boys. Beyond that, I don't know. Well, there's a call box there by the warehouse. I'll check the name of my office. Thanks. Are you? Mr. Thurston. Where are you? Over here, Pagan. Boy, what a sucker I am. Leaving a soft job at the club and running around the foggy docks. There's only one reason you'd do it for a buck. Oh, Mr. Now, Thurston. what about Blake Kramer? Well, I followed him out of the club, like you said, and, and, and he got in a taxi and told the driver to take him to the Burda. Oh, the Burda? Yeah. It's a slum district over south of the harbor place. Good, good. Now at least you know the general area Mr. where... Mr. Thurston! Yes, Inspector? The office has a report on Blake Kramer, all right. A recent one, in fact. Oh, what do you mean? Ten minutes ago in the Burda district, knifed to death. continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Here is something you should know if you ever suffer from the sudden pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. It is a way to ease the pain, often within a few minutes. A way that is incredibly fast and effective. It's Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people were first introduced to Anison through their own physicians or dentists. But today, these tablets are in such widespread use that all drug counters have them, and anyone may enjoy their benefits. Next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, by all means, try Anison. You'll like the convenience of Anison tablets, and you'll be delighted with Anison's incredibly fast action. A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. 
Ask for Anderson by name today at your druggist. And now to continue with The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. A wave of robbery and terror has swept the harbor district of Bombay, and while people starve in the streets, the stolen grain is sold openly on the black market. The police are helpless, and now Ken Thurston's only contact, a black market operator named Blake Kramer, has just been wiped out by murder. There's something slightly out of focus, Inspector Remy. That murder shouldn't have happened. The murder was probably committed by the black market gang, and yet... Kramer was a member of the gang. That's right. Doesn't make sense. Unless... Yes, Mr. Thurston? There's one explanation, of course, but that eliminates... Uh, could be. Inspector, will you call your office? Ask them to trace back on Kramer? Find out when he arrived in Bombay and so on? Yes, I'll be glad to, Mr. Thurston. What do you think, Mr. X? Who's behind it? I don't know, Pagan. Maybe we're about to find out now. What do you mean? How will we... Oh. Permit me to introduce myself, Mr. Thurston. I am the Roger Dakala. You do? Another warehouse robbery. Looks like it, doesn't it? Ah, yes. And more grain gone to the street with no women. Street with no women? Perhaps Mr. Kramer could take the time to explain it to you. I doubt it, Roger. Reed is going to be busy attending a funeral. A funeral? I don't... His own. He was murdered tonight. Ah. But they pity. Kramer was a friend of yours? No. Merely the sort of acquaintance one meets in a public club. Ah. But Inspector Rini is returning. It is best, perhaps, that I leave now. Is he another acquaintance, Roger? Do not trust the Inspector, Mr. X. Good night. Mr. Thurston. He knows who you are. It looks like it. Well, what did Roger DeCala want, Mr. Thurston? Oh, he stopped by to give me a little advice. So? Do not trust him. More advice. Inspector, what I need is information. I do not have it to give, Mr. Thurston. Then maybe I'd better dig up a little. Come on, Pete, on this go. Now, let me get it straight, Mr. Thurston. I'm supposed to find this hack driver who took that Kramer character out to the bird this evening, right? That's right, Pago. And then what? Hang on to him until I come back out of the club. Now, go to it. I'll only be a few minutes. Well, good evening, Mr. Thurston. You are going to become a regular customer if you are not careful. Yes, I might as well arrange for a monthly charge account. Sorry. It's the same rule for everyone. Cash on the line. Part of your system for staying in business in Bombay? It works. I'm still in business. Would you like a table, Mr. Thurston? Uh, no, thanks, Tom. I'm only here for information this time. Oh? Information in general or about something in particular? Both. Anything in general about three particular men. The Raja Takala, Blake Kramer, and Inspector Rini. Well, Inspector Rini has never been to the club as far as I know. The other two are occasional customers. That is all I know about them. I see. Part of the system again? Hear yeah, nothing, say nothing. That's quite right, Mr. X. Well, the last bit of information I needed. Surely you were aware of your own identity. But not aware that everybody knew it. Everybody but Blake Kramer, that is. It's too bad he didn't. Because that's why he's dead. I don't get it, Mr. Thurston. As far as I'm concerned, this is nothing but a wild goose. Uh, what are we going to do down here in this birder place? Look for a street with no women, Pega. Hmm. What's the point of that? I'd rather go back to the Cosmo Club and pitch towards karma. No, there is a point. And how come this ten-pound sack of wheat you got there? What are we going to do, plant it? In a way. Is this the place, driver? Yes, sir. The man named Kramer left my vehicle here and walked south. Boy, those alleys are dark, Mr. Thurston. Dangerous, too, I bet. Well, they were for Kramer. His body was found about a hundred yards from here. 
Come on, let's get out. Just stretch our legs a little, huh? Yeah, they might call it that. Here you are, driver. Thank you, sir. May good fortune guard your path. Thank you. There you go. I'm just uh, hand me that sack of grain. Sure. Here you are. Are we going to plant right here in the road? No, exactly. All right, driver. Good night. Hey, Mr. President. Hey, he's driving away. I know. Come on. Come on what? Stop him. He's going off and leaving us. And let's start walking. Down those dark alleys? Well, you can stay here and wait for me if you like. Well, that's more like a... Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not going to stay here. Well, here I am again. No choice. How much farther, Mr. Thurston? I've got cold shivers in my back waiting to get stabbed any minute. You don't need that. My feet hurt. Well, you came to India to be a big operator on the black market, didn't you? Who's operating it? And why do we have to walk down four dozen alleys to, to do it? Anyhow, I don't think you, even you turned crooked, Mr. Bates. Don't so be too sure, Pagan. I'm carrying a ten-pound sack of black market grain. Yeah, but you've got an angle of some kind, yeah. Oh, I wish we'd hurry up and, and find that street without any women. Oh, we've already found that. This is it. Huh? Haven't you noticed in the doorways of these huts? Everywhere else at the bird are the women and children, but not here. But maybe they've gone to bed or, or something. They hadn't in the other alleys. Oh, sure. I well. Oh, who are these guys, Mr. Fish? The men who live on the street with no women. Yes, but, 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 but. Keep walking, sir. Straight ahead. He's got a gun. Then we better do as he says. Come on. Excellent advice, Mr. X. No sudden moves, if you please. You will enter the last hut on the left. All right, fine. Who, who, who are these guys, Mr. Thurston? Grain robbers, hijackers, black market boys. They, they live here? No, no, no. The huts are used to store the grain. What's in that last hut? Probably the head of the black market. The head? Who is it? Good question, Pagan. Who do you think? Mr. X. Your gun, please. Thank you. Both of you will enter. I wait here outside. Go on, Pagan. Mr. Thurston, if I get out of this alive, so help me, I'll... I'll... Good evening, gentlemen. How are you, Carmen? You seem to have walked into a little trap, Mr. X. Trap? Mr. Thurston, that Roger is in with her. He's the one who, who mentioned the street without women. But it's a lie. Hey, she, I mean, her. No, 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 Pagan. I think the Roger is trying to stop the black market. He's been handicapped, though, because Remy doesn't trust him. You mean the inspector's not in with, with her either? No. Just Blake Kramer. While he was alive. Quite true, Mr. Thurston. I had to eliminate Blake because he kicked himself off to you before I could warn him who you were. Yeah, I kind of thought it might be that way. It's too bad you didn't think it sooner. Before you came here alone. Oh, I did. Remember your no-credit rule? Why didn't it apply to Kramer? <gasps> That's right. He was charging all the she drinks. Say, say. And yet you came here anyway. Why? To stop these grain robberies. Stop the black market. Stop you. That's a high ambition for an unarmed man surrounded by 30 of my boys. Maybe. And did you plan to carry the grain away with you, Mr. Thurston? Is that the reason for the empty sack? Empty? Uh, what do you mean, empty? Why, no, why no, it's... no, she's right, Pig. On the sack is empty. Karma, you're under arrest. Oh, come now, Mr. Thurston. After all, I am... Monsieur, people have come. Thousands of them, they fill the street. What are you saying? They have found the grain in the huts. They come this way. Our men are fleeing. They can't. Stop them, do you hear me? No use, Missy. Thousands of people. I go now. Maybe they can away. Karma, you're under arrest. You did this. You did it somehow. Yes, that empty sack had a small hole in it. So it left a trail of grain all over the burdo. A thin trail, of course, but for starving people it was plenty. Well, Karma, we're outside on the street. All the people you've robbed and starved. Would you like to take your chances with them? 
Oh, come along with me. They would kill me. I would not have a chance. You know I would not. The break me into the house, Mr. Thurston. They're taking the grain. Hey, look. They're tearing those shots to pieces. And why not? The grain belongs to them. Yes, you're right, Karma. You wouldn't have a chance. No. You didn't have a chance from the start. From the moment you set out to profit from starvation and misery and death. Good name, the street with no women. Because you're no woman. You're... Oh, come on, let's go. Our star, Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. Out on the beach, ready for fun. Then suddenly your portable radio grows weak. Don't let it happen to you. Install fresh new RCA Victor batteries, radio engineered for extra listening hours. Your portable radio is ready for top performance and long-lasting power when you install leak-resistant, climate-proof RCA radio batteries. Radio engineered for extra listening hours. Sturdy, dependable RCA batteries will deliver a powerful portable radio signal under the toughest service condition. See your RCA radio dealer or serviceman for a complete portable radio inspection now. If your portable needs new power, insist on RCA radio batteries for extra listening hours. Attention, electronic engineers. Right now, RCA has career openings for experienced engineers. If you're a qualified radio electronics engineer, RCA offers you lifelong opportunities. Just send a complete resume of your education and experience to Radio Corporation of America, Box 1, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. Your resume will be kept confidential. Here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And I do want to express my gratitude to two of my good friends, Van Heflin and John Lund, who did such a lovely job while I was away. My thanks, too, to those in tonight's cast, Will Wright, Gene Tatum, Bob Griffin, Lou Merrill, and Dan O'Hurley. Next week, the deep, impenetrable jungles of the Amazon River, where Ken tangles with one of the most subtle threats to peace in the world today. Not so subtle, of course, will be Leon Velasco's page on Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, where next I return, as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Chesterfield, always milder, better-tasting, cooler smoking. Plus, no unpleasant aftertaste, and that's the biggest plus in cigarette history. By the makers of Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Les Crutchfield. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. Now we present Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X, the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by... The makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste.
Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. When we ask you to try Anison for the relief of pain due to a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, we are not asking you to try a new or unproved method. For there are many people listening in now who have been introduced to Anison tablets by their own dentist or physician. You who have received Anison this way know the effective, incredibly fast relief these tablets bring. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy to take tablet form. People by the thousands are using modern Anison today instead of other ways. Doesn't their experience seem worth following? Try Anison the next time you suffer pains from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You will be delighted with the results. Ask your druggist for Anison today. Anison is spelled A N A C I N. It began in a dank green world of fetid, rotting vegetation. A world of oppressive heat, of loathsome insects, and of even more loathsome disease. Strange that that should have been the setting for a silent, deadly battle for the souls and minds of men. So Dr. Maddox's been murdered. That's right, Ken. Sorry to hit you with news like that about an old friend on your first day back from Calcutta. Where did that happen, Chief? In a little village called Belterra, up the Amazon River in Brazil. Hmm. What was he doing there? Establishing a new medical clinic? Yeah. You knew, of course, that he was working with the Institute of Inter-American Affairs, cooperating with the Brazilian government. Yeah. Trying to stamp out disease, malnutrition. So somebody killed him. Chief, it's an old pattern. We've been running into it all over the Americas. Wherever we're getting strategic materials. And it's not coincidence. You think Dr. Maddox's death is tied up with a plan to sabotage our defense efforts? What do you think? Hmm. Maybe you're right, Ken. After all, rubber is a pretty vital material these days. So are human lives. Oh, well, you'll hear from me, Chief. From Brazil. <laughs> Lucky you got here when you did, Mr. Thurston. The boat going up river to Belterra is ready to leave. It's a pretty sudden trip for you, isn't it, Dr. Northrup? I understood you were scheduled for a return to the States. I was, but they had to have a replacement for Dr. Maddock in a hurry. I'd been his assistant, was familiar with the territory. Oh, well, that makes sense. One of the few things about this affair that does. Look, Thurston, I'm going to be frank. You came to me with some pretty authoritative letters from the Institute and the Brazilian government. So I'm taking you along with me. But I don't like any part of it. Why don't you? Because there's liable to be trouble on the Amazon. The native rubber workers aren't very happy with North Americans right now. Somebody could get hurt. You sound pretty solicitous about my welfare. I don't give a hang about your welfare, but I do care about those poor devils in the jungle. Hag-ridden for centuries by disease and malnutrition. There's a full-time, 24-hour-a-day job waiting for me in Belterra as a doctor. I won't have any time to play wet nurse to you. Why not wait until you're asked? Sometimes a man facing a gun doesn't have time to ask. Is that a threat or a warning? Let's call it a statement of fact. There's the riverboat. Are you still coming with me? After the fascinating picture you painted, how could I turn back now? Okay, Thurston. Let's get aboard. I'll let the captain know we're ready to shove off. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Thurston. What? Welcome on board, my amigo friend. <laughs> Bet you're happy to see me here, eh, Mr. Ray? Hey, what, what are you doing here? 
Well, naturally, when I heard that your old friend Dr. Marek got himself bumped out, I, I, I just had to offer my sympathy. So you called the Bureau and called Miss Brooks into telling you where I was going. <laughs> well, can I help it if, if she likes my ass? Ah, okay. But this trip, you're on your own. Oh, sure. And all expenses, including burial, come out of your own pocket. Well, Natch, believe me, Mr. Thurston, I'll be happy to pay for my own burial. Yeah. The natives up the river are shrinking heads again. They are? Might be interesting to see how, how yours turns out. Hmm, come to think of it, it might be an improvement. Well, thank you, Mr. Huh? See you around, Pagan. Oh, sure, sure. I'll see you. Shrunken heads. See how mine turns out. Might be him an improvement. Oh, 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 Mr. Rex! <laughs> There's our clinic, Thurston. Everything seems peaceful enough right now, Northrop. Oh, sure, sure it does. Hey, uh, maybe there won't be no trouble uh, over here after all, eh, Mr. Thurston? The Amazon jungle doesn't announce its deadliness, Selschmidt. It, uh, it doesn't? Rhea could be dead inside there, and the setting would be just as serene. That's a cheerful thought. Who is Maria? Maria Costello. She was Dr. Maddox's nurse. And she's been up here alone ever since Maddox was killed? Maria has a way with the natives. Unfortunately, the same doesn't hold true for you. Hey, what about me? Not even my Uncle Ahmed was in here. That's from the clinic. Come on. Be right with you, Mr. Thurston, as soon as I tie my shoelaces. No, no, I will not like to kill my filio. My baby, I will kill you all first. Kill you all. That is nonsense, Luis. We are not trying to hurt your son. Only to keep him from dying. Maria, what is going on here? What were those shots? Vilas. No, Dr. Northrup. It was not I. Our old friend Luis was a bit upset. I had to take his gun away from him. There are other pistolas, Senor Villas. You cannot take them all. If my baby dies, you all die. You understand? You all die. Mm. Sounds like he meant that. I can assure you that he did, Senor. Uh... My name's Ken Thurston. Uh, Thurston, this is Ferdinand Villas, manager of the rubber plantation. Uh, Senor. And this is Maria Castello, my nurse. Senor Thurston. Do you always find the practice of medicine here as exciting as this, Senorita Castello? Oh, I cannot understand it. His wife brought their infant child here. He was due for his smallpox vaccination. And then Luis broke in with that gun, threatened to kill me if I even touched the child. But you've certainly vaccinated children here before. Hundreds of them. Well, there must be explanation for this. The natives here have developed a great distrust of all Americanos del Norte, Senor Thurston. They say that they are bringing death to the Amazon. Death with their shiny medicinal needles. That's superstitious nonsense, Vilas. Where are the mother and child now, Maria? In the examining room, Doctor. It is really most urgent that I vaccinate the child. A smallpox epidemic has broken out up river. All right, Maria. Take care of it at once. Very well, Dr. Northrup. I do not think that was very wise, Dr. Northrup. Oh? Why not, Senor Vilas? You superstitious, too? Merely realistic. Luis is the head man of the village. If anything should happen to his child, I'm afraid there will be a great deal of danger to all of us. Hello, Maria. Huh? Oh, <laughs> it is you, Senor Thurston. You mind if I share the river bank with you? Please do. Thanks. You seem a little tired tonight. Too much work at the clinic? Oh, no, senor. The work, I love it. It, uh, it was this afternoon, I think, that upset me. Oh, that's understandable. Oh, but that is just the point, senor. It is not understandable. Oh, why not? The natives were never like this before. Sullen, hostile, threatening. They, they worship Dr. Maddock. What caused the change, Maria? His murder? Are you certain you do not know, Senor Rex? Uh, well, I didn't realize Pagan was getting around that fast. Oh, you mean the strange little man who came up river with you? No. No, he did not tell me. It was Dr. Maddock. Dr. Maddock? Yes. The night before he was killed, he spoke to me about you. He said that you were the only man he knew who could handle the situation down here... 
and that he was going to write to you concerning it. That's all he said? That was all. But uh, I will make a guess as to what he had in mind. Okay, go ahead. Someone is stirring up the trouble among the natives. Someone who is interested in preventing Raba from reaching the United States. Someone who wishes to turn the Americas against each other for the benefit of his own country. Who is he, Maria? I do not know. Hmm. Care to make another guess? Mr. Thurston! For you, Mr. Thurston! Ah... It is late, senor. And I'm tired. Mr. Thurston, are you out here somewhere? That's all you have to say, Maria? That is all. Mr. Thurston, are you... Uh, oh, there you are. I was wondering. Oh, hello, baby. Good night, senor Thurston. Ate a vista. Hey, what's your hurry, baby? Why don't you stick around a while and... Hmm. How do you like that? A brush up. <laughs> After the way she went for me in Lisbon. Lisbon. Oh, sure. I ran into her during the war. Boy, she knew more military secrets. Uh, a regular Hatamari. Is that you, Senor Thurston? That's right, Vias. I thought you'd gone back to the rubber plantation. No. I wish to speak with you first. About what? Northrop tells me you came here with papers from the Brazilian government. Is that true? Go on. Someone in authority must persuade Maria and Northrop that their tactics with the natives will lead only to disaster. They are antagonizing the natives. The incident of the baby this afternoon is a case in point. Well, somebody's got a cart before a horse, Phyllis. The natives were worked up before this afternoon... Before Dr. Merrick's murder. That is unimportant. Is it? What matters is that they are worked on. To such a pitch that the slightest spark will bring about an explosion. And if anything happens to that baby of Luis, believe me, Senor Thurston, our lives will not be... Senor. Came from that hut. Come on. But that is Dr. Northrop's hut. Yeah. Here. There he is, Senor. A wound in the shoulder. Northrop. What happened? That... Luis Mendoza shot me. Luis? You are certain? I saw him clearly enough. He gave no warning? Did not say why? No, nothing. You're wrong, Northrop. He did tell you why. Look. Here beside the door. Madre de Dios. What is it, Thess? Venus, what are you staring at? Luis Mendoza's baby. Dead. We will continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. Tagliavini, the great Italian tenor, toast of two continents, can be enjoyed whenever you choose to hear him on RCA Victor Red Seal Records. Yes, now you can hear the superb new album, Neapolitan Folk Songs, beautifully sung by Talia Vini, and brilliantly recorded by RCA Victor in all three record speeds. This wonderful album is available now at your record dealers, and it will be a magnificent addition to your record library, these Red Sea records, you'll want to own and play over and over again. You'll hear Talia Vini's warm lyric tenor in all its natural magnificence as he sings these beloved, sun-drenched Italian folk songs. Taliavini's incomparable bel canto has never sounded better than in his unforgettable performance of the album Neapolitan Folk Songs. Taliavini has been hailed by critics the world over, acclaimed by audiences everywhere. Now you can buy his exciting new RCA Victor Red Seal album. Ask your RCA Victor dealer for your album copy of Neapolitan Folk Songs, sung by the one and only Taliavini. <laughs> Return to the man called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Ken Thurston is in a small native village far up the Amazon River, trying to determine the motive behind the murder of Dr. Maddock. But even more sinister than the surrounding jungle are the unseen forces at work there, fomenting hatred against the United States, threatening to disrupt the rubber production. 
plotting a native uprising that will mean death to all the foreign devils who've trespassed there. It is now some 15 minutes after the attack on Dr. Northrup and the discovery of the dead native baby. But it is not possible, senores. I tell you that smallpox vaccine could not have killed that child. That's not entirely true, Maria. But there's always the remote possibility of faulty body chemistry, lack of normal antibodies. I think you are being very professional, very scientific, and completely unrealistic about the entire situation, my friends. You mean the attack on Northrop? And what's liable to follow? But of course, that attack was a warning that the natives are rising against us. That is what matters, not how the baby died. You're wrong, Vilas. Wrong? How can you doubt that we are all in danger now? I don't. And the way the baby died proves it. What kind of double talk is that, Thurston? Did you or Maria examine the child's body? I... no. We were too busy with my shoulder. You should have. The vaccine wasn't the cause of death. It was botulism. Botulism? Yeah. The deadliest kind of food poisoning. But that is not possible, Senor Thurston. The child had not been weaned. A breastfed child could not possibly have died from botulism. Unless... That's right, Maria. Unless it was deliberately poisoned. Look, Mr. X... Why do we have to go sightseeing in a rubber plantation at this time of night anyways? Your idea to come along with me, Pagong. Go on back alone if you don't like it. I don't like that idea even better. Listen to those natives in that compound over there. I bet they're already arguing about who's going to get my head for their mantelpiece. Could be. Ooh. Hey, what's this place? The rubber plantation laboratory. Villas gave me the key. Let's go in. What are we looking for here, anyways? He just told me he'd turn part of this lab over to the clinic. Northrop's using it until they get their own built. So what? Look here. You mean those those funny glass bottles with that stuff inside? That stuff happens to be cultures. This one looks like rabbit's blood. This, yeah. Probably based on a beef broth. Beef broth. Very interesting. So let's get out of here now before before somebody comes in and looking for heads or something. Okay, there's a plantation speedboat over at the dock. Take it down river to the clinic at Monte Alegre. I'll give you a list of things to pick up and bring back here. Believe me, I'm practically there already. No sooner... Huh? Bring some stuff back. That's right. Oh, what a joke. I wouldn't come back for a million bucks. How about uh, 50? I'll take it. You must be crazy, Thurston, letting Zell Smith take that speedboat. Those natives are liable to move against us at any time. Dr. Northrop is right. You have taken away our only means of escaping from here. Looks like it, Vilas, doesn't it? Why are you so casual about this situation, Senor Thurston? What did you learn at the laboratory earlier this evening? Don't you know, Maria? How could I? Well, maybe the same way you learned I was there. When only Vilas knew I was going. Or is there another answer? Have you thought of the obvious one, Senor? That I followed you there to learn for myself what is going on? I thought of it. What the devil is all this talk about the laboratory? What's that got to do with the spot we're in? Everything, Northrop. I learned that we're not in a spot. Unless someone in this room wants us to be. That is a rather strange statement to make, Senor Thurston. Is it? Somebody murdered Dr. Merrick, then poisoned that little child to stir up those natives. Now, why? Why? Well, there is no answer. None of it makes any sense. No. No, that is not so, Dr. Northrop. There are some very obvious answers. To stop the production of rubber. To naturalize against one another. Now I see what you mean, Senor Thurston. Only one of us could have had the opportunity to do all these things. That's right, Vilas. I, I, I can't believe it. You, you two are actually serious about all this. Of course they are serious, Doctor. But they have left one thing unsaid. The name of the person who is responsible. Just who do you have in mind, Senor Thurston? Suppose the three of you work it over for a while. Oh, and uh, let me know how you come out, will you? I'm going to get some sleep.
looking for someone. Wait. Diablo. I'll that knife. Wait, wait. Let's have that one. Drop it. Drop it. Yeah. That's better. Now, suppose you tell me who. Oh. What's that? You all right, Thurston? No, sir. I hope I didn't nick you. I had to snap him off in that split second when you shoved him away. Why? Why? Well, for Pete's sake, man, he, he was trying to kill you. After he dropped the knife? But he was Luis Mendoza's brother. He, he was after you to avenge the baby's death. Oh, you're having a little trouble making a diagnosis tonight, Northrop. If he was after someone because of that, he'd have gone for you or Maria, not me. But th- th- there must have been some reason for his attack on you. Sure. Someone ordered him to kill me. Someone ordered him to... But who? I might have found out, Northrop. You hadn't been so fast on the trigger. You brought the stuff back with you? Oh, sure, sure. So pay me off and let me get out of here, will you, please? Believe me, I'm a sick man. And and the longer I'm here, the sicker I get. Then you better come along to the clinic, Pagan. I think I've got a cure for what ails you. Well, going somewhere, Dr. Northrup? Huh? Oh, it, it, it's you, Thurston. Uh, yes, uh, we're leaving. Uh, uh, Zellschmidt came back with that speedboat just in time. The natives? That is right, senor. I have learned that they intend to strike here at the clinic just before dawn. Oh. Oh, I wonder how we'll make out. What do you mean, make out? We will not be here, then. I wouldn't be too sure, Maria. Take a look at Pagan, will you, Northrop? Zellschmidt? Why, of course. Hey, why do you want him to look at me for? There's nothing wrong with me that that a quick trip to Rhea won't fix up. I'm afraid you're wrong, Zellschmidt. Huh? You mean, I I got something? Smallpox. Smallpox? Oh, oh, no, no. That's what I thought. Oh, Thought postpones that trip down river, doesn't it? Looks like it. I can't risk anyone else being exposed to him. We'll have to stay here until the infectious stage is over. But we cannot do that, Doctor. The nature. Sorry, Maria. There's no other answer. Perhaps there is, Senor Thurston. Allow me to remain here with him while the three of you go down river. I didn't know you were such a self sacrificing creature, Vilas. I am not. Merely realistic. After all, the responsibility of the plantations and the inhabitants of Belterra is mine. Suppose we let Maria go and the rest of us stick around. How about it, Maria? Do you know how to run the speedboat? <laughs> I am more familiar with administering smallpox vaccines, Senor Thurston. And I believe Dr. Northrop is about to prescribe vaccinations for all of us here. I will stay. Okay. At least we'll have the satisfaction of knowing that we won't die of smallpox. <laughs> Oh, you're killing me. You're killing me. Quiet, you idiot. It doesn't hurt. All right, Vilas, you're next. The rest of us are through. If you do not mind, I will forego the pleasure. There's no time to waste joking, Vilas. He's not joking, Northrop. What? You are right, Thurston. As a realistic man, I have a very healthy fear of Bacillus botulinus. Of course. Bacillus who? Botulism. What the baby died of. Yes, Maria. And what all of you are about to die from very shortly. What does he mean? What does he mean? Remember those beakers we saw in the lab, Pagon? With the rabbit's blood, beep broth? Well, our pal Velas was cultivating death in them. Bacillus botulinus. The vaccine. We gave it to the baby and he died of botulism. Velas must have introduced the culture into all the vaccines. Sure. He was doing a pretty good job for the country that was paying him. Stirring up anti-American feeling. Sabotaging that rubber plant production. Velas. But why did you kill Dr. Maddock? Because he was on to you? Yes, that is quite right, Thurston. I am certain you will all excuse me now if I leave. I cannot bear the sight of suffering. And they tell me that death from botulism is quite painful. Goodbye, comrades. Senor Thurston. Oh, we're going to die. We're going to die. Oh, okay, don't relax. You haven't got snow parts. And there's nothing wrong with that vaccine. <laughs> Jokes, he cracks at the time like this. Huh? No, nothing wrong. I cooked up the smallpox diagnosis with Northrop. Just to trap Velas. But the vaccine, Senor Thurston. Fresh, untampered stuff. 
That's why I sent Pagon to Monte Allegri. He brought it back with him. It worked out as you figured, Thurston. I'll hand it to you for that. But what about Vilas? He's getting away. I don't think so, Northrop. I had Luis Mendoza listening at the window. He heard enough to learn the truth. He'll take care of Vilas. Oh. You know, Vilas said he was being realistic. <laughs> but he wasn't. He was living in a bad dream. A nightmare of terror and conquest and murder. The only thing realistic about it... <gasps> Mr. Rex. Yes. Come on, Pedro. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. Say, uh, Bing, how are you planning to spend Father's Day this Sunday? Oh, Ken, Father's Day is quite a deal, you know, at the Crosby Menage. I get to sleep as late as I want to. Then the kids bring me a big breakfast in bed, ham and eggs, cereal, waffles, pancakes, sausage. Then uh, what do you do when you get up? What else? I wash the dishes. <laughs> well, I know one gift that'll be on that breakfast tray, Bing. Right you are, Ken. A carton of mild at Chesterfields. Folks, we have a fine new Chesterfield gift carton this year, and it's just the thing for Dad on Father's Day. It's got a picture of Godfrey on it and a place to write your greetings. And inside, 200 of those mild at Chesterfields. Remember, Chesterfields gives you mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste, and that's the biggest plus in cigarette history. So drop around your favorite dealers and pick up a gift carton. Sure, Dad's a great guy, and Chesterfield's a great smoke. It's a natural. For Father's Day and any day, it's Chesterfield. Now, here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to B. Benedict, Will Wright, Carlton Young, Harry Bartell, and Byron Kane. Next week, Vienna where an ex-wrestler, a beautiful girl, and a spot of printer's ink all add up to real trouble for Ken. And, of course, where there's real trouble, there'll always be Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as The Man Called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama, brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. Plus, no unpleasant aftertaste. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature on NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. present Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X, the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. Here's a word from RCA Victor. Inch for inch, your best buy in television is RCA Victor 19-inch. And your best buy in 19-inch television is RCA Victor's superb new Hillsdale. Remember the name, RCA Victor's superb new Hillsdale. And there's more to the Hillsdale's huge 19-inch screen than size itself. Bright pictures, clear pictures, the steadiest pictures you've ever seen. 
make this RCA Victor's finest console television set. Extra powerful circuits and new picture pickup on the Hillsdale ensure best possible reception. And of course, all RCA Victor television is million proof. Quality proven in over two million homes. Yes, the RCA Victor Hillsdale is impressive. It's luxurious. 19-inch console, television that's unequaled for value and performance. It's superlative entertainment, a superlative instrument. Insist on RCA Victor, and remember the name, the Hillsdale. Be sure to see it and hear it. And buy the magnificent Hillsdale at your RCA Victor dealers. Vienna is a city where the past can never be forgotten, for it constantly intrudes on the present. A lilting melody can turn the muddy Danube to a shimmering blue again, and the proud-faced statues outside the Schönbrunn Palace will briefly restore the Habsburgs to their toppled thrones. But the present can never be completely erased. It is always real and always terrifying. sits at the desk in his study, the papers in front of him unread, his fingers tapping rhythmically against the polished inlay, his white face mirrored in the glistening wood. Yeah, yeah, come in, come in. I had hoped you would come. Oh, I am sorry. I was expecting someone else. What can I do? Reports from the commissioner's office in Vienna, Ken. I've been through them, Chief. Just words. Wilhelm Mitter is dead, and all we get is words. I know, I know. But what can you expect in a place like that? A city divided into four sectors and an international zone. Well, it's practically impossible to run down his killer. And even if you did... Mm. Don't forget the Russians have been trying to close down Mitter's newspaper for the last five years. And, Chief, De Freiheit was the last great free newspaper in Eastern Europe. Yeah, I know. You've heard about the fight for its ownership. Well, I did read something. That... There's just two children fighting each other over the inheritance. It can drag on for months, years. And there won't be an issue published until it's settled. But, Ken, it's uh, not the first time a brother and a sister got into a squabble over a will. They weren't just a brother and a sister, Chief. They were closer to each other than, than any two kids I've ever seen. Oh. People do change. Not that much. I'd stake my life on it. Here. Take a look at this cable. Hmm? When will you visit Vienna again? Sign Maria. Yeah. The same within a few hours of her father's murder. Chief, I'd like to go to Vienna. Sure, Ken. But it's hardly a matter for the Bureau. After all, we Wilhelm don't... Mitter was my friend. All right. All right. I know how you feel. Go ahead. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute. What about Zellschmidt? Taking him with you? Not this time. <laughs> Are you sure? All right. Suppose you were to tell Miss Brooks that I'm leaving for, um, Hong Kong. What? Two to one, he'll get reservations on the next plane for China. So long, Chief. <laughs> Seatbelts, please. We will depart from Idlewild Airport in about two minutes. Our first stop will be Shannon, Ireland. From there, you... Oh, no. Just in the nick of time. Another minute and I'd be rolled away with those steps out. Uh, your name, please. Pagon Zellschmidt. Zellschmidt, I don't believe Don't I bother have... about finding me a seat. There's plenty of room here with my friend. <laughs> well, Pagon. <laughs> Glad to see me, huh? But listen, do you know what this character in the airport told me? He said this, this plane for Hong Kong didn't leave for another hour yet. If I hadn't seen you getting aboard one. This isn't the plane for Hong Kong. You, you mean... Wait a minute, don't take off. Let me out of here. Sit down, Pagan. But, but if I'm going to Hong Kong with you, I've got to... Oh, I get it. They put us both on the wrong plane. <laughs> what a lousy way to run an airport. Oh, forget it. Sure. But, but... Look. Yes, sir? 
My uh, friend here got a ticket for Hong Kong by mistake. Think you can exchange it for passage to Vienna? Vienna? I believe so. Fortunately, we're not overweight on this flight. He can remain aboard. Will there be anything else, Mr. Thurston? Sure, you're perfectly comfortable. An extra pillow, perhaps. If there's anything at all... No, that's, that's all, thanks. Uh, yes, Mr. Thurston. Oh, that's funny. What's the matter, Mr. X? wonder why he called me Thurston. Are you... Uh, huh? Yeah. I was careful not to use my own name when I made this reservation. I'd like to see Maria Mitter. I am sorry. Fräulein Mitter is not receiving visitors. I'd be glad to tell her you called here. Uh... Thurston, Ken Thurston. Uh, is uh, Maria expecting you? Well, perhaps you'd better ask her that. Oh, of course. Forgive me. Uh, you come inside. Thanks. I am Hugo Oblenz. Herr Oblenz? Uh, I'm a friend of Maria's, a close friend. If you will follow me down the hall to her room. Thanks. Harold Blentz, perhaps you could tell me the circumstances of Wilhelm Miller's death. Unfortunately, there is not much to tell. It was three days ago on Herr Mitter's birthday. Yes, I know. We had dinner, the four of us, Herr Mitter, Maria, her brother, Rudolf, and myself. We were all to go to the opera later, but Herr Mitter said some business had come up. He insisted we go without him. I see. When we returned, we found him at his desk, dead. His study had been ransacked. Anything in particular missing? No. This is Maria's room. Yeah? Maria, this is Herr Thurston. Hello, Maria. I can't tell you how sorry I am. I understand, thank you. Was there anything else, Mr. Thurston? Hmm? I know you must be in Vienna on business. It was kind of you to drop by, but I do not wish to keep you from your work. I'm, I'm in no hurry. I thought we might have a little talk. Oh? What about? Well, I, I got a cablegram yesterday, Maria, and thought it might be from you. So what reason would I have to cable you? Well, maybe it was from Rudolph. It then. could not have been from Rudolph. He would have no reason either. Where is he, by the way? He no longer lives here. I... I believe he's staying at the Imperial Hotel in the Russian sector. He is? I'm afraid Rudolf is very friendly with the Russians. That's why Maria is fighting him for control of the newspaper. I see. I... Oh, I may not see you again before I leave Vienna, Maria, so maybe I'd better say goodbye now. Yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Thurston. <laughs> our man, Pagan, over in the corner of the bar. Uh-huh. But who's that fancy-dressed character with him? He looks like he's going to masquerade. How can he stand up with all those medals? Yep. A Russian major in full dress uniform. What's he doing here? Well, this hotel is in their sector. They've taken it over. You mean... You mean we're... In the, in the Russian zone? That's right. Wait for me. I'll be right back. But... But, Mr. First... Oh, Rudolph? I do not believe I have had the... Thurston? What are you doing here? Don't you know? No, I do not. Well, uh, mind if I join you for a drink, then? Major Barkoff and I were just leaving. You will excuse us. Do not be so impatient, Rudolph. There is no hurry. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Thurston. I assume you are an old friend of Rudolph's. He knew my father, that was all. Wilhelm Mitter was one of the finest men I ever knew. My father was a fool. He lived in the past. He had not sense enough to see the world is changing, that we must change with it. Important things don't change, Rudolph. Do not argue with me, Thurston. 
You want to have a drink with us? Here's a drink. In your face. <coughs> Rudolph, listen to me. Listen to you, yes, yes. That's all you Americans want, someone to listen. I insult you, I throw a drink in your face, and you want to talk. At least the Russians are different. So I've heard. You want conversation, do you? All right, let me give you some. Get out of Vienna first. There are too many Americans here already. Goodbye. <laughs> they say it is we Russians who are crude and unpleasant. You see, Mr. Thurston, how untrue it is. Mm. And yet, we are here to carry out the wishes of the Austrian people, whatever they may be. So, it might be wise to do as Rudolph suggested, no? Does that come under the heading of a warning, Major, or a threat? Merely a suggestion, Mr. Thurston. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, Mr. Thurston. Yeah? You remember me, the steward from the plane? Yeah, yeah, I remember you. Oh, fine, fine, I thought you would. Oh, oh, there's a telephone call for you. I happen to see you in the bar. And Thanks. I, you can take it in that booth. No, it's fortunate I recognized you. The desk clerk had no record that you're staying here. As a matter of fact, I'm not. Oh, it's too bad. I always stop at the Imperial between flights. The accommodations are excellent. Wonderful cuisine, marvelous service, and some of the finest people... Yeah, in... sure, sure. This booth? Uh, yes. Uh, tell me, will you be returning to America soon? Uh, excuse me. Hello. Mr. Thurston, this is Maria. Yes, Maria, what is it? I lied to you before. I didn't send that cable. I need your help badly. You must try to... No. No! Maria! Maria! We will continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. You see it in the newspapers. No unpleasant aftertaste. You hear it on the radio. No unpleasant aftertaste. You see it on television. No unpleasant aftertaste when you smoke Chesterfield. It's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered it. You can prove it. Science discovered that of all brands tested, Chesterfield and only Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. Prove it yourself. Smoke a pack of Chesterfield. They're always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That's the biggest plus in cigarette history. No unpleasant aftertaste. Science discovered it. Prove it yourself. Buy Chesterfield today. <laughs> Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. In the divided city of Vienna, the murder of Wilhelm Mitter becomes a link in the chain strangling the great Austrian newspaper, Die Freiheit. And with the death of Mitter's daughter, Maria, a second link is forged. The Man Called X stares grimly at the body of the murdered girl, then slowly turns and walks out of the room. I am to blame. No one else. I am responsible Easy for it. Easy there, Hugo. You don't understand, Mr. Thurston. I told her to call you. I made her do it. I knew she was lying to you before. I could tell. Someone had frightened her. Who was it, Oblenz? She wouldn't tell. Go on. She was standing here at the telephone. She saw something through that window. She started to scream. There was a shot and... You get a look at whoever did it? No, not really. I think it was a man I ran to Maria, carried her into the bedroom. When I got back here, there was no one. You sent for the police? Yeah, yeah, at once. Uh, is this your top coat, Hugo? Top? Oh? Yeah, on the rack here. Why? No. Must have belonged to Hermita. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. Rudolf and Maria gave their father a coat for his birthday present. Let's see. Oh, sorry. But it's difficult to get anything well made in Vienna now. Maria! Maria, I heard something happen. Maria, where are you? Out of my way. Do not wait. I said out of my way. Oh, no. No!
I won't cry for her, Mr. Thurston. I'm afraid it would not be very convincing. And after what happened this afternoon at the Imperial Hotel... I know. Who were you trying to convince, Rudolph? Major Barkov? You mean he wasn't serious when he got so mad at you, Mr. Thurston? How about it, Rudolph? I thought I was doing the right thing. I was fighting for control of the paper to save Maria's life. I love her very much, Mr. Thurston. I know you do. I was sure that if she tried to publish the Freiheit, the communists would kill her like they killed my father. Is that why you were playing up to the communists? Yes, of course. Anything to save the life of my sister. The police are in the other room talking to Hugo. Before they come in here, there's something I want to ask you. Rudolph, the night your father was shot, you were all going to the opera. But something made him change his mind at the last minute. What was it? He said he had to work. It seemed strange at the time because Fledermaus was one of his favorite operas. Yes, I remember. While we were having dinner, someone came to the door and asked to see him. A little gray-haired man who said his name was Bach. Bach. Like the composer. Yeah, yeah, that's how I happened to remember it. I took his coat and asked him to wait in the hall. When I went back in the dining room and told my father who it was, he insisted Herr Bach be brought in at once. What then? When Herr Bach came in, he suddenly seemed very confused. Uh -huh. Said he had made a mistake. He had come to the wrong house. Dashed out of the room and left before I could even show him to the door. Yeah. Rudolph. Hugo says you gave your father a new coat for his birthday. What kind was it? Fine camel's hair. With a delicate plaid design. It was an import from England. I see. One more thing. This Herr Bach he was a small man with gray hair, you say. Anything else you can tell me about him? Yes, yes. He had a scar on his upper lip. Huh? He had tried to grow a mustache to cover it, but the scar showed through. All right, Pagan. A short, gray-haired man with a scar on his upper lip. A few days ago, he was wearing a camel's hair coat. Find him. <laughs> but, Mr. Thurston, that's impossible. Well, we've got to find him, and I guess the best thing to do is hire somebody in each of the different sectors. Hire? Waste all that money? When I have cousins in all four sectors and Uncle Fritzfeld in the international zone. Okay, then what are you waiting for? But, Mr. Thurston, <laughs> we haven't settled on a prize. A hundred dollars, you'll find him by midnight. Ten dollars off for every hour after that. <laughs> what am I waiting for? Well, that finishes my report. I am sorry to have had to keep you after the other authorities questioned you so long, but my government is very much interested in this case. I suggest you report to my office in the morning. Hero Blentz. But I've already told you everything, Major Barco. Major, isn't this a matter for the city police rather than the occupation authorities? Of course, Mr. Thurston, it was only a suggestion. Oh, sure. So, there is no point in my staying longer. And Rudolph, I'm sure the authorities and my sector will be glad to know that ownership of the Freiheit is now clearly settled. Any assistance we may be able Just to give... Just a moment, Major. I am publishing the newspaper myself. Huh? Without any influence from you or anyone else. What's this? Once more, the Freiheit will print the truth, as it did before my father was killed. See here. Come in. Hello, Pagan. Mr. Thurston, you must give you for a minute Sure. Well? Well, you owe me a hundred bucks. Good. That means you found the man who called on Herr Mitter just before he was killed. What's that? Hey, sh All right, Pagan, let's go. Oh, Rudolph. Yes, sir. Get on down to your paper. Give me an hour or so, and I'll have a bang-up story for you. A story, sir? Yes. You'll have to do the follow-up on it, though. Remember? Remember how Fred Walker handled the Anderson case? Walker? Yes, the American reporter, you remember. Uh, well, yes. Yes, of course, yes. I, I will follow it up. Good. Come on, pick on. Uh, he's a little room at, at the top of that stairs, Mr. X. He's, uh, he's been hiding there for nearly a week. Don't even come out for food or nothing. No. But listen. Why did you tell everybody back there all about it? I wanted to be sure the murderer would follow us. The murderer? I think I'll, I'll, I'll wait downstairs. Alone? Well, it's all right if you insist. Uh, Mr. X. Yeah? 
who was that Fred Walker, and what was the Anderson case? I am the faintest idea. Yes, sir. Go back. Huh? Get out of here, or I will shoot. Hell back. We're your friends. We're here to help you. A line. Go away. Don't you know me? Ken Thurston? Yes. No, it is a trick. He's an American. Listen, I'm walking out under the light. I don't have a gun. You can see for yourself. Well? Mr. Thurston, I... I did not know. I, I couldn't believe. You must save me. I know I failed you once. I, I failed everyone. I saved my country, but, but now I've changed. Yeah, I thought it would turn out to be you. Is this your room? Yeah, please. Get inside. Why didn't you go to the Americans when you got to Vienna? I was afraid they would hate me. Send me back to Czechoslovakia to the Russians. You ought to know us better than that, Herr Flyditz. Flyditz? But I thought this character's name was Bach. He worked with Wilhelm Mitter in the underground during the war. They all took the names of composers. Yeah, yeah. You know what happened after the war. I... I joined the party. I was secretary of the interior. Then... Then you found out you were still a Czech and the comrades didn't like it. They announced you were killed on a flight to Moscow. But you escaped to Vienna. You went to Mitter for help. He had been my friend once. I... I thought he would understand. And he would have. But at Mitter's house, you saw someone who frightened you. It couldn't have been Mitter or his children you expected then. So it had to be Oblenz. Yeah, that's right. He had worked for the party in Czechoslovakia. They sent him to Vienna to get information about Mitter. You knew he'd recognized you, so you ran away. You were in such a rush, you took Mitter's coat by mistake and left your own. Yeah. Now you will help me get to get to England, to France. I, I do not expect America, but anywhere away from the... Good evening, Mr. Thurston. Who go? Leave the gun on the table, splide it. Uh, better do what he says. <laughs> Thurston, I must thank you and your friend for finding here, splide it. We've been searching the city for days. Your men can't be very efficient, Hugo. In the long run, we are efficient, Mr. X. We have to be. Would not look well for a dead communist hero to be found in Vienna, alive, and a traitor. You can't keep it from coming out someday. We have managed so far. Herr Mitter was not permitted to publish the story. Major Barkov took care of that. And you took care of Maria? Of course. She had become suspicious. So, when I found her telephoning to you... <laughs> so, now you will all accompany me to the Russian zone. Now. Oh, now, wait a minute. Mr. Rex. Stand back. You seem to forget that you are unarmed and I have this gun. What you seem to forget is that this building is surrounded by an American patrol. American patrol? What are you talking about? That message I gave Rudolph about Fred Walker and the Anderson story was a tip-off. Walker was a reporter who always called in the cops when he tracked down a scoop. But, Mr. Rex, you said that was just Look a... Look out for yourself, Oblance. It's pretty dark, but you can see men down there. Hey, you're right. There are some soldiers, but... Well, Hugo, maybe you better come along with us. No. No. You think I will allow myself to be tried by the American military police? You're wrong. I still have a chance. Flyvitz, give me your coat. Wait a minute. Do as I say and do not move any of you. Here it is. Here. Listen to me, Hugo. There is a fire escape outside this window. It's very dark, but your soldiers will recognize the coat. I'm sure you have told them about hair flying it. That's the point I haven't. I will take the chance. They will not shoot me. Wait, you fool. Wait! Stay where you are and make no sound. Yo! Below there! My name is Flyday! Carl Augustus Flyday! I tried to tell you. Mr. Rex, the soldiers, they're Russians. I could even see that Major Barkov and all his medals. And they thought he was I? Yeah. I had hoped I could stall him and tell the Americans where to dig it here. It was our zone. Control everything. Here they come, Mr. Rex. What? Look at those Russians scattered. Yes, well. Guess we can leave now. Just it. Believe me, if there's anything I can do to show my gratitude. Sure there is. Give your story to Rudolf Mitter. I'd like to see it in the next issue of Deep Fry Hype. I will be glad to. I I think you have made Rudolf's task very easy for him, Mr. Thurston. No, I wouldn't say that, Herr Blyditz. 
It's never very easy, here or anywhere else, to print the truth. But without a free press, there's no real freedom at all. You know, Pagan, that's a pretty good name. Die Freiheit. Freedom. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. If you would like to know a quick, easy way to ease the pain of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, then by all means try Anison. Your own dentist or physician may, at one time or another, have handed you an envelope containing Anison tablets. Then you already know how incredibly fast and effectively Anison brings relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. For your own sake, try Anison. Anison is sold to you on this guarantee. If the first few tablets do not give you all the relief you want as fast as you want it, you may return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison tablets at any drug counter. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Now, here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Joan Banks, Will Wright, Stan Waxman, Paul Fries, Tony Barrett, Frank Gerstle, and Bob Bruce. Next week, Ken tangles with a couple of information passers behind the Iron Curtain, where death and treasury march hand in hand. And Pagan, oh, he'll be alone, too. Played, as usual, by Leon Belasco. So join us, won't you, when next I return, as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Frank Burt. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. Now we present Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X, the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by... Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. By the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. Science discovered it. You can prove it. No unpleasant aftertaste when you smoke Chesterfield. The biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered this fact. Of all cigarettes tested... Chesterfield, and only Chesterfield, leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. You can prove it. Smoke a pack of Chesterfields. They're always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered it. You can prove it. Buy Chesterfields today.
The startling news stunned official Washington. If true, it meant the destruction of two full years of top-secret diplomatic and military work. That the entire fate of Western Europe was trembling on the brink of destruction. But an hour after the discovery was made, when a telephone rang in a suite at the Hotel Vendôme in Paris, the man who answered it had no foreboding of the responsibility that was about to be his. Hello? That you, Thurston? That's right, who's there? Slade, at the American Embassy. Can you and the chief get over here? What's up, Slade? Operation Zero. Uh, we'll be right there. But that's incredible, Slade. Incredible or not, Chief... Two of the boys in Washington, our number one experts on Operation Zero, have disappeared off the face of the earth. And we've got to find them again before it's too late. Before they wind up in Moscow. Who are they, Slade? James Everest, David McDonald. McDonald? That's right. He's an old friend of yours, isn't he, Ken? Yes, Chief, and there's one thing I'd bet my life on. David McDonald's no traitor. Well, that's not what the facts say, Thurston. What do they say? McDonald and Everest left Washington en route to London. They were going to clean up the last unfinished details on Operation Zero, the Atlantic Defense Pact plans for defending Europe in the event of, uh, of unprovoked aggression. Uh, so? So they never arrived. They left the planet Shannon Island. Haven't been seen since. When was that, Slade? Twelve hours ago. If they're not taking the plans to Russia, we've got nothing to worry about. But if they are, well, we've got to find out. Yeah. But how? They've got a 12-hour start. They could enter Russian territory anywhere from the Baltic to the Adriatic Sea. I think we can narrow it down, Chief. MacDonald has a small chalet in France at Montigny. He spends his summer vacations there. Mm, I'm afraid your friend MacDonald's not on a vacation trip this time, Thurston. Nor is Marshal Petrov. Petrov? The Politburo's military commander? Yeah. We heard yesterday that he just arrived in Berlin, remember? Well, uh, what's that got to do with this? With MacDonald and Everest taking the plans of Operation Zero to Moscow? Suppose I let you know, Slade. From Montigny, France. Why so surprised? You knocked, didn't you? Yes, but I wasn't expecting to find you here, Miss... Um... I'm Anna Werner. Miss Werner? And if you weren't expecting me, then who? Well, this chalet belongs to a man named David MacDonald, or didn't you know? Oh, sure, but it's a cinch MacDonald wouldn't be in Montini now. Why not? Do I really have to tell you, Mr. X? Huh? <laughs> Surprise number two? Oh, frankly, yes. Well, good. It's always easier for me to work on a guy who's a little off balance. Just what kind of work did you have in mind? Oh, I've got lots of answers for that one. Suppose we talk them over inside, hmm? Maybe I can come up with another surprise or two. Oh, I bet you can. Okay. What about those answers? Well... I'm a freelance newspaper girl, and I got a tip in Paris that MacDonald might be wearing a red wolf skin under his sheep's clothing with Operation Zero in one of the pockets. So I came down here to check. And what have you found? You. MacDonald's private hangar out at the airport, empty. That makes the tip sound 24 carats. Hmm. Uh, you don't like the story, huh? Should I? Well, sure, we're going to work together. And they tell me at the airport that Max got a four-hour start on us. we better get going. Not we, Miss Werner. Oh, Okay. I'll stick around for a while. I've got a hunch. Hmm. I wonder. I'll let you know. Yes, do that little thing. Hello? This is Mr. Pagan Zeltschmidt speaking. Oh. I'd like to talk to Mr. Thurston, please. Pagan. That's right. A Pagan Zeltschmidt speaking. I'd like to... Oh, oh, it's you. Hello, Mr. Thurston. Where the devil are you? What do you want? Boy, have I ever got hot stuff news for you, Mr. X. A real scoop on that McDonald guy. Believe me, this will knock your head off. Ready? Uh -oh. Hey, what happened there, Mr. X? 
sorry, but I did promise you another surprise, didn't I? Hey. Mr. X. Mr. Thurston, do you hear me? What happened? Hey, Mr. X. Oh. Wake up, Mr. Oh. X. Please wake up. Ooh, 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 why do you have to stay subconscious uh, like that? Uh, wake up. Well, what's the up big on? That's right, Mr. X. That's right. Boy, oh. what happened to you anyways? Uh, the girl, where is she? A girl? You yeah. mean a girl slugged you like that? Yeah. What was she, a female wrestler? Oh, never mind. How'd you get here? Last thing I remember was talking to you on the phone. Oh, that was from the airport. When I heard something funny over the telephone, I, I beat it right out here. All right, Pagan. What was that red-hot news you were talking about? The chief sent me after you with it. It's about that big-shot Russian military guy, uh, Marshal... Uh... Petrov? That's him, that's uh. him. The chief said to tell you that Petrov left Berlin uh, on an airplane trip a little while ago. He didn't know where to, but but it was someplace southwestern Germany. Southwestern Germany. That's right. I told you I had really... Does that mean something? Could mean that MacDonald and Everest are heading for the Russian zone of Germany. And Petrov's intending to meet them. So what? There's hundreds of miles of borders to the Russian zone. He could be meeting them anywhere. That's right, but I have a hunch that three people know where he is. Know where it is. Everest, MacDonald, and a girl named Anna Werner. <laughs> Mademoiselle Werner, oui, monsieur. The lovely mademoiselle departed from this airport in a chartered plane not ten minutes ago. Did she file a flight plan? Pardon, monsieur. Well, did she tell you where she was going? Oh, mais oui. Her destination was Le Havre. Le Havre. But that's not in Germany, Mr. Thurston. It's, it's on the British Channel or something. Are you sure that's where she said she was going? Mais certainement, monsieur. I remember most distinctly. A very stubborn young lady, mademoiselle. I warned her that she could never succeed in reaching there. Why not? There was not enough fuel in the airplane, monsieur. That is why not. Oh. At the most, she could fly but 300 kilometers. But she would not listen. A most stubborn young lady. She would never arrive at La Havre. I see, but if you'll get me a flight map of Western Europe and a pair of dividers, I think I can show you where she will arrive. There it is, Sonneberg, Germany. The only town in the Russian zone within a radius of 300 kilometers. And that's where you think she's going, Mr. Thurston, eh? Following those MacDonald and Everest characters? It's the nearest Russian territory, and it's directly southwest of Berlin. Hey, that's the direction Marshal Petrov was flying. Trading figures, eh, Mr. X? Worth finding out. Huh? Oh, but we can't go flying behind iron curtains, Mr. X. They'd shoot us down like clay ducks. If you don't believe me, ask Grisha. Who's Grisha? A cousin of mine, he, he lives in Neustadt, in the American zone, right across the border from Zonenberg. Good. Let's pay him a visit. Sure. Uh, huh? What for? Well, he's a Zellschmidt, isn't he? So what's got that to do with it? Pagan, don't you know you can always depend on a Zellschmidt? Yeah. <gasps> But I'm operating a strictly legitimate business, Herr Thurston. I don't know how to smuggle people across the border into Zonneberg. You sure, Grisha? I swear it by the father of my father of my father, Herr no. Thurston. <laughs> He's a liar, all right. That proves it. Pagon, ah, oh, you wound me deeply, my beloved cousin. What I say is true. Smuggling watches, American cigarettes, coffee into Zonneberg. Eh, I do these things, yes. But people, never. Strictly legitimate business. Yes, oh, sure. exactly. I'm afraid there is nothing I can do for you, my friend. Oh, too bad. I thought that this, um, might... Hey, that, that's money you're showing. That? Let me see. Twenty. Forty. Fifty. Do you know something, Herr Thurston? I've just gone into another business. Strictly illegitimate. <laughs> There is the farmhouse, Herr Thurston. The two men who arrived in Neustadt just before you did are in there now. Thanks, Grisha. Wait here. Come, Pagan. You think those two men are McDonald's and Everest? It figures. 
Those pillboxes a couple of hundred yards down the road are the entrance to the Russian zone. They'll probably wait until it's dark and then make a break for it. So why don't we call in the police or, or the APs or something? I... Uh... Hey, hey, that car coming from the farmhouse, it's heading right Off the us. road, Pagan, fast, off the road. <laughs> Hey, so what's the matter with those jokers? They tried to run us down. Everest and MacDonald, heading for the Russian zone. Come on. Let me have the wheel, Grisha. But have Let me have it. Me. I, oh, 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 what are you doing now? I'm going to try and stop that car before he reaches the border. Oh, but the Russian guards have Thurston. They'll never allow you to We've do that. to force that car off the road before they can stop it. You know something, Mr. Rex? They stopped us. Yeah, looks like MacDonald and Everest made the Russian zone. With Operation Zero. We'll continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Every day, you hear more and more about an incredibly fast way to relieve the pains of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. It's Anacin, A-N-A-C-I-N. Now, the reason Anacin is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anacin contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. Ask for anison at any drug counter. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Two of the top men in Washington have mysteriously disappeared. Ken Thurston, The Man Called X, has trailed them to Neustadt, Germany in an effort to determine if they're carrying the Atlantic Pact defense plans into the hands of the Russians. But his attempt to stop them from crossing the border has been halted by the chattering burp guns of the Russian border guards. So they made it, Ken. Looks like it, Chief. No, it's too bad. Well, there's nothing we can do about those plans now. I'm not too sure about that. What do you mean? Marshal Petrov flew down to meet him, all right. Pagon's cousin, Grisha, verified that for us. I have a hunch Petrov will fly them to his headquarters in Berlin and step direct to Moscow. You'll want the honor of taking those plans to the Kremlin himself. Uh, could be. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad someone can't get into the Russian zone before he gets the plans from MacDonald and Everest. Mm. No, I see what you mean. Of course, there's nothing we can do about it officially. Oh, of course not, no. And with all the dope the Bureau must have on Petrov's headquarters, too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But the fact that we know Petrov's got a secret suite on the 12th floor of the Felsenhoff Hotel, that isn't a bit of help to anyone under the circumstances. Not a bit. And we probably know where to get some inside help at the Felsenhoff, too. Yeah, but even if we do know that the assistant manager there, Vladimir Grigorsky, has been very helpful cooperating with G2, so what? Yeah. Well, looks like I'd better get back to Paris. Yeah, uh, looks like it, Kim. Um, you don't mind if I take my time, dear Chief, look around the country a bit first? Oh, no, no, not at all. No, you've got a vacation coming. Take your time. Take plenty of time. Thanks, Chief, I will. Be seeing you. Oh. Hello, Miss Werner. Oh, well... Fancy meeting you here, Mr. Thurston. How'd and you in find... the phone booth, of all things. How did you like the eavesdropping? Oh, it was excellent. These phone booth walls are paper thin. Yeah. And how lucky for you. Is it? Yes. 
You see, I am your only hope of getting to Berlin in time. Or didn't you know your plane had been sabotaged? No, I didn't, but there'll be others. Oh, I'm afraid not. I made it my business to be sure that no others were available. You're a busy little bee, aren't you? Well, that's how bees make honey. And I expect to make a good deal of honey syndicating this yarn when it's all over. So you're still trying to play newspaper woman? Of course. Wasn't that tap on the head you gave me a little out of character? Not at all. You were obviously determined not to let me go along with you, and I was just as determined to get the story. Even if I had to... What's the cliché? Go to any lengths to get it? And you expect me to believe that, too? I'm afraid you'll have to, Mr. X. If you expect to get to Berlin on time. Well? Okay, Anna, let's go. Look, Mr. X, so that cookie Anna flew us into Berlin. Uh, that, that don't mean we have to go into the Russian zone with her. We are not big on. <laughs> well, that, that's a relief. We're going in alone. Oh, sure, that's the ticket. We're going... Alone? Yeah, we got some business with the assistant manager of the Felser Hop Hotel. Name of Vladimir Grigorsky. certain that you will find these accommodations all that you desire, comrade. However, the tenants on this floor, particularly Marshal Petrov, are very sensitive to any form of disturbance. That's why I bring you up in the service elevator. You understand, comrade? I understand, comrade Grigorsky. Da, I was certain that you would. So, the twelfth floor. This way, please. At the far end of this corridor is Marshal Petrov's private suite. This room is one he reserves for special guests. So, now I have done all that I can do, Mr. Thurston. I believe that the American McDonald will come to this room. But here, one can be certain of nothing. From now on, your actions must be your own responsibility. Thanks, Bigorsky. I'll take over from oh, here. Uh, one more thing. Uh, what about your man, Zelschmidt? I can keep him hidden for perhaps an hour, but then the manager comes on duty. Then an hour will have to be enough. If I'm not out of here by then, get Pagon back into the Allied zone. You'll phone what's happened to the chief. Very well, Mr. Thurston. As you wish. I, uh... I should like to say something, but... <laughs> what is there to say except perhaps... Uh, good luck. What are you doing here? You don't need an answer to that. You're a fool. What about the plans for Operation Zero, Mac? You'll never get out of here alive. What about those plans? You should have known you'd follow me. I... Ken, I haven't got them. I didn't bring them with me. I, I couldn't. Swallowing their lying propaganda, getting sucked into their filthy, rotten scheme. What happened? It's the old story. Jim ever sold me. I was to get copies of Operation Zero, and we'd take them to the rush. Oh, yes, I was helping to be the savior of the entire world. What changed your mind? Everest and a couple of his comrades. The night we were to leave Washington, they couldn't help boasting, and... Well, I guess I woke up. Too late then, wasn't it? Sure, yeah, sure. If I tried to break away, they'd kill me, and Everest would still be in Washington building up another sucker. This way, at least, he's been tagged for what he is, and Operation Zero is safe. Yeah, what about you, Matt? Well, what do you think? I've stalled Petrov so far, but I'm supposed to be getting the plans now. And when he learns that I haven't got them, well, it means curtains for Everest and me. But Ken, you, you've got to get out of here before he finds you. Suppose we both take a crack at it. The service elevator's only a few feet down the corridor. Come on. Ken, I Come tell you... Come on. Going somewhere, comrade. Petrov! If so, I would not advise it. You'd better follow that advice, boys. Comrade Petrov's an awfully quick man on the trigger. Well, Anna. Another surprise, Ken? No. You are just fighting a rear guard action for Everest. The only paper you could report for would be Pravda. And quite a story it will make, too. Not only have we uncovered the traitor MacDonald, but we have captured the rarest of prizes as well. The man called X, 
You haven't anyone yet, Petro. Uh, Ken, run! Run while I... Uh. You stupid fool. Did you actually believe that you could have that gun, Petro? Let go! Let go! Thank you, Anna. My dear... I told you you were a fool, Ken. Look what it got you coming after me. Oh, things aren't too tough, Mac. Are you kidding? Me with a bullet in my side and you with your shoulder in a sling, underarm guard here at the Lennonstrasse Hospital. How tough do things have to get? Kogorski knows what went on at the hotel, but you didn't have Operation Zero with you. Go send Pig on into the Allied Zone with the news. Okay, okay, so you did your job, but the end... KVD's going to pick us up today and take us to Moscow, and you know what that means? They're not there yet. We've been in the hospital 24 hours. Chiefs have plenty of time to get to work on it. Oh, sure. Sure, I suppose he's going to walk right in here and take us out. I suppose... You hear that? It's the secret police. What can the chief do now? Easy, Mac, easy. Prisoners, we are from the NKVD. You are now in our custody. We have orders to transport you to Moscow. Grigorsky. And look who else. Boy, I bet you're glad to see us, eh, Mr. X? On your feet, prisoner. You have no time to waste. On your feet. Are you both able to walk, Mr. Thurston? I'm okay. What about you, mate? I can walk off a live cold skin if it meant getting out of here. That's a cinch. We got forged secret police papers, private ambulance without waiting for downstairs. Cinch. I hope we shall have to hurry, Mr. Thurston. We may be discovered at any moment. Oh, don't say things like that. All right, let's go. <laughs> Ambulance down, Mr. Thurston. Okay. Wait. Ken, look. They are coming toward the ambulance entrance. It's Petrov. Petrov? Uh, what do we do? We have to make a break for it. Come on. You there. Why are you running? Stop those men. They are coming. Stop them. Stop them. Stop them. Stop them. Stop them. Get in, all of you. Get in. All right, Mr. Thurston, we are in. Okay, here we go. Look back there. They are still about a block behind, but gaining fast. Oh, they'll catch us. They'll catch us. They'll have to hurry, Pagon. There's the American zone. Get ahead. But look. Wooden barricades. I'm God. We cannot get through. I wouldn't bet on that, Grigorsky. Hang on to your hats. Oh, we're going to crash. We're going to crash. Not, not all of us, Mr. Thurston. What? McDonald? Yes, he. Oh. oh, the poor guy. Well, at least he died with a clean conscience, which is more than you can say for some others back home. Others? Yes. Traitors, saboteurs, trading in American lives. Wonder how they're going to feel when their time comes. How happy they'll be when they have to face their conscience and find it black and red. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. If you own an RCA Victor television set, or if you're planning to buy one, the RCA Victor factory service contract is yours for the asking. You can be assured of top performance year after year from your RCA Victor receiver. And with RCA Victor's factory service contract, you get expert, prompt service. Replacement of any part or tube, including the picture tube, for one full year. And the best standard RCA antenna for your location. 
It's the only national service of its kind in television. A wonderful, practical buy. The RCA Victor Factory Service Contract. Attention, electronic engineers. Right now, RCA has career openings for experienced engineers. If you're a qualified radio electronics engineer, RCA offers you lifelong opportunities. Just send a complete resume of your education and experience to Radio Corporation of America, Box 1, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. Your resume will be kept confidential. Now, here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Will Wright, Mary Jane Croft, Stacey Harris, Ted Von Els, Harry Lang, Gerald Moore, and Stephen Garay. Next week, Algiers. The Casbah, no less. And a plot that I'd like to dare you to figure out right up to the end of the story. And I warn you, you won't get any help from Leon Velasco as Pagon Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Chesterfield, always milder, better-tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. By the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and same station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. William Bendix stars in The Life of Riley. Enjoy it on NBC. We present The Man Called X, tonight starring Joseph Cotton. The Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. Joseph Cotton in The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. No matter what you now take for headache relief, we urge you to try Anison for the incredibly fast relief these tablets bring the next time you're suffering from a headache. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So, the next time a headache strikes, take Anison for this wonderfully fast relief. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison at any drug counter in handy boxes of 12 and 30. Economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The city of Algiers, lying as it does on the borderline between Africa and Europe, is a city of continual tension between the old and the new, 
a place where the ordinary disagreements among men may flare suddenly into violence and sweep overnight from the desert to the sea. The sharp contrast between modern Europe and age-old Africa becomes most evident perhaps at the Algiers airport, where the gleaming strata liners from France are loaded by Arabs dressed in loincloths and sandals, cut to the same pattern as those once worn in Haitian cotton. At the moment, one such plane, with its cargo and passengers aboard, moves out onto the flight strip and is quickly airborne and bound for Paris. Mile after mile, it wings westward over the rich coastal belt, climbing steadily. And finally, it turns into a long, sweeping bank and heads out over the blue Mediterranean. Then, suddenly... Where the plane was flying, there is nothing. Scattered pieces of blasted wreckage drop from the sky and fall into the sea. The streets of Algiers seethe with anger and hatred, and messages pour out by wire and radio to Paris, London, and New York. On the floor of offices high above Manhattan streets, the messages come flooding into the teletype room of the bureau, where trained specialists take them line by line, decode and analyze them, and send them on their way. And eventually, at the end of a long hall on the same floor, the report from Algiers arrives at the office of the chief. I'm sorry to have to pull you off that Bramby case, Joe, but with Ken Thurston on the sick list, well, you've worked closer with him than anyone else. Well, all I know about it is what I got from the newspapers on the way up here, Chief, and that wasn't much. Uh, we don't have much more ourselves, Joe. But Sir Hartley Manning was on board that plane, and that's reason enough to drop everything else. Yeah, no, you an advisor on North African affairs, the only man who's ever shown a chance of bringing about some permanent agreement between the Arabs and the French. Yeah. He was supposed to give his decision on the Arab farm loan in Paris today. That's why the lid's ready to blow off over there. You see, nobody knows for sure what his decision is going to be. And each side's blaming the other for his murder. I suppose there's no doubt that it was murder. No, no. The plane was literally blown to bits. It couldn't have been an accident. Joe, somebody put a time bomb aboard. Well, one thing's certain, Chief. It's got to be solved fast or there's no point in solving it at all. I know Algiers pretty well. One spark and start a blaze. There's a plane standing by. It's ready to leave whenever you are. I guess I'd better start. Uh, oh, Joe, there's uh, one other thing. I don't know exactly how to say it. And I'd rather that Ken Thurston wasn't told just... Hmm? And Joe, I just got the full passenger list a little while ago. The victims of that explosion. And, well... For what? One of the names was Pagan Zelschmidt. Pagan... Yeah, no... I've always been pretty rough on Zell Schmidt, but... Uh, well, I'm sorry. Take him. Well, all of us here in the Bureau have been pretty rough on him. And you come right down to it underneath it all. Well. Well, Chief, I'll, I'll call you from Algiers. <laughs> be so kind as to send the register here, uh, Monsieur Kendall. Thanks. I do hope that you will find our services adequate. We are somewhat disorganized, you understand, because of the tragedy. You mean Sir Hartley Manning's Oui, death. monsieur, oui. He was staying here in the hotel. I watched him walk out through his very lobby on his way to the airfield. Too bad. Only Aben Ahmed was with him and a boy who was carrying the large box which Monsieur Manning was taking with him on the plane. Large box? Oui, monsieur. I am told it contained wine from the Arab vineyards, a bon voyage gift from Aben Hamid. I see. Uh, tell me, who is this uh, Aben Hamid? I believe he is a leader of the Arab Union. He, he maintains an office somewhere in the Casbah. Casbah, huh? I well, beg I... your pardon. Are there any messages for me? Uh, one moment, monsieur. No, monsieur, there is nothing. Thank you. Uh, monsieur Garmets here was the only lucky passenger on that plane. Lucky. You know. Ah, yes, I was already aboard when a business call over the loudspeakers calls me to leave the plane less than five minutes before the takeoff. You were lucky. Uh, very much so. I don't believe I've had the oh, pleasure. Oh, uh, Joe Kendall, I'm a new arrival, Mr. Grommet. Oh, well, in that case, welcome to Algiers, Mr. Kendall. Thank you. Now, if you will excuse me, gentlemen, good evening. Uh, very wealthy man, Monsieur Grommet, most influential. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, uh... 
Hey, ju- just a moment there. What do you mean, just a... Oh. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Candle. Hey, God. I, I thought you were dead. Me? I never felt better in my life. Your name was on the passenger list of that plane that exploded. Oh, just an ugly rumor. Anybody that says I'm dead is nuts. Crazy even. Well, thank you. I was supposed to be on the plane, you understand? Only only I run into an old friend of mine at the airport and he tipped me off. What do you mean, tipped you off? Well, he said that he had a hunch I, I had no order to take that plane, so I did it. <laughs> Guess he was psychic. Yeah, that's one explanation. Do you know where he is now? Not exactly. I know a couple of joints he hangs out in, though. Well, find him, Pagan, and try to find out why he had that hunch. But I haven't got time. I'm working. Working. It'd be easier to believe you were dead. But I am... I mean, working. I, I, I'm here buying Persian rugs for my Uncle Ahmed. In Algiers? All right, they're Algerians. <laughs> so we get them cheaper. Who knows the difference? Well, it's too bad you're tied up, Pagan. I figured it might be worth, well, say, around a hundred bucks to find out. <clears throat> I'll have the dope in an hour. Where are you going to be? Back here, probably. Right now, I'm going up to the Caspar. Ah, going to see the dancing girls, eh? No. I'm going to look for a killer. Huh? More tea, Mr. Kendall. No thanks, I've been having a death. Oh, one, Splinter. <laughs> Mr. Kendall, this exchange of pleasantries has been most agreeable. But this old one has the feeling that you have come to Abu Namid with more in mind than a mere social visit. And this old one has probably guessed what I have in mind. One assumes that the man from the bureau... Mm-hmm would be investigating the tragedy of Sir Hartley Manning's death. And if I were, would you know anything about it? Only that his death was also tragedy for my people. It is possible that the loan to the farmers may not be granted now. Well, according to the rumors around the city, Manning had decided not to recommend the loan. The rumors are false. Hmm. Yes. Sir Hartley stated on the way to the airport that he had decided to urge granting of the loan with all the influence at his command. I see. Abin, uh, I'm told that you gave Manning an unusually heavy case of wine to take with him on the plane. That is true, but... uh, I have no idea how the explosive was put aboard the plane, Mr. Kendall. But I assure you that the case of wine contained only wine. There would be no reason... Please now, Father, to take the money to Billy and I... Oh, I am sorry. I thought you were alone. It is well, Mara. This is Mr. Kendall, my daughter, Mara. How are you doing? Mr. Kendall is investigating Sir Hartley's death. You mean his assassination? I hope you find the murderer, Mr. Kendall. And I hope that when you do... The crowd in the street tears him to pieces. You must forgive her violence. Mara is a modern young woman in most ways, but her blood still remembers the glint of knives in the moonlight. Yes, and I know where I would like to bury that knife. Mara, stop it. Uh, I'm sorry, Father. Mr. Kendall. I understand. But you see, hundreds of farms will go into bankruptcy. And then revolt, perhaps. And military rule, perhaps. It's a grim picture, all right. Mass bankruptcy alone is bad enough, except for the person who profits by it. Grummet. Grummet? He holds nearly all the mortgages on our plans, Mr. Kendall. See. Oh, I will get it. Yes? Oh, just a moment. It is for you, Mr. Kendall. No, thanks, sir. Pardon me, Yes. Hello? I've been hunting all over for you, Mr. Kendall. The hotel manager finally said to try this number. Are you at the hotel now, Pagan? No, I'm down at the harbor, but I'm going there. What are you doing so long up there in Kasba? Drinking tea. Tea? Did you locate your friend? Oh, sure. He says he's got the tip about that plane from his boss. His boss? Uh Uh-huh. Who does he work for? Oh, some Arab character by the name of Abin Hamid. Mr. 
Kendra. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Garland. I phoned your room a while ago, but you weren't in. I was wondering if you'd care to have dinner with me. Why, well, thanks. Uh, glad to. Uh, you'd say in about half an Fair hour. Enough, oh, fine, I'll meet you in the lobby. Three, please. Oui, monsieur. You're a monsieur Kendall, no? Right. I have just taken a friend of yours up, monsieur Kendall. Oh? I think he's very sick or something. Huh? Something is bad wrong with him. Cloth, please. Thanks. Devil could... What? Uh, Pagan. Pagan, what, what's wrong? Stop, Mr. Kemp. In the back. Here, take a look. Oh. Well, give me Mr. Kendall for getting blood all over your floor. Now, easy, think. easy now. I've got a doctor up here right away. Uh-huh. Just lie back there. Pagan. Hey, gun. We will continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. Here's a word from RCA Victor. The RCA Victor factory service contract is practical and reliable. As the owner of an RCA Victor television set, you can enjoy the protection of an RCA Victor factory service contract. You can depend on it to keep your RCA Victor television receiver in perfect condition at all times, in all ways. And you always are sure to receive prompt, courteous, and expert service by RCA's own factory trained technicians. Think of it. Hours and hours of uninterrupted pleasure. No unnecessary expense for repairs or parts. And service is available with or without a contract only to RCA Victor television owners. So make yours an RCA Victor television set. And if you're planning on buying a new one, be sure to hear and see the incomparable Regency, a magnificent television console. It's America's favorite television, featuring a big 17-inch screen in a matchless setting. And inquire about RCA Victor's factory service contract when you buy the Regency. Now to continue with The Man Called X, tonight starring Joseph Cotton with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. A plane explodes in midair over the Mediterranean, and Sir Hartley Manning, whose decision would have determined the fate of the Arab farm loan for North Africa, dies in the explosion, leaving his decision unknown. Algiers is seething with growing tension and the threat of violence, and now Joe Kendall returns to his hotel room to find Pagan knifed in the back and lying in a pool of blood. Now let me clip the ends of this bandage. There. I guess that's about the best I can do, Mr. Kendall. Still unconscious, Doctor? Well, he seems to be stirring a bit now. Wouldn't it be a good idea to move him to a hospital? No. There's really no point in it. I'll be in room 110 if you need me, Mr. Kendall. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Kendall. Hiya, Peg. I don't really mind dying. You understand? Huh? But I want you to know that I'm sorry, Mr. Kendall. For all the bad things I've done. What things? Oh, I want you to forgive me. Ask Mr. Thurston to forgive me, too. You can even forget that hundred dollars you owe me. Now, that is repentance. When you come right down to it, underneath it all, I'm your friend. Yeah, I know that. Who was it, Pagan? Who stabbed you? I don't know. It was dark... I know one thing, though. It was a girl. A girl? I could smell the perfume she was wearing. It was subtle, but exciting. Like... Like voodoo. Or... Sabu, or... A connoisseur to the last. Hmm? Uh, please. Your dear old friend is dying. Oh, snap out of it, Pagan. You're all right. Don't lie to me. I can take it, yeah. The doctor said there wasn't even any point in 
taking it to the hospital. Because there's no need to. That knife glanced along one of your ribs. You've got a bad surface cut, that's all. You're not going to die. I'm not? No. Well, in that case, where's my hundred bucks? The Arabs have always been their own worst enemies, Mr. Kendall, and this Manning affair has proved to be no exception. How do you mean, Mr. Gromit? Well, I mean they antagonized Manning in every way possible, in, in spite of the efforts of some of us to get a favorable decision for the loan. And then when it became known that Manning would oppose the loan, they killed him. You think, then, that the Arabs were responsible for the plane explosion? I believe it is the only explanation that fits... The fact. Provided, of course, that the main fact you're referring to is correct, that Manning had decided to refuse the loan. As far as I know, that's only a rumor. I can confirm it, Mr. Kendall. Yes. I, I talked with Manning here at the hotel only two hours before he went to the airfield. He told me he was turning down the loan. I see. I tried to reason with him, but it was no use. His mind was made up. Mr. Gromitz, it would seem to me that... Uh, your own interests might be better advanced if the loan were refused. Because of mass bankruptcy, you mean? On, on the contrary, I have lost money on every foreclosure I have been forced to make. And you claim to be as disappointed as the Arabs over Manning's decision. Yes, but not disappointed enough to murder him. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Well, incidentally, the airline officials tell me that you had nearly 200 pounds of baggage on the plane that blew up. Why, yes, I had to leave the plane so hurriedly that there was no time to remove it. They also tell me you've made no claim for reimbursement. Well, I've been so shaken by that narrow escape that I... Kendall, I completely forgot about it. That little shack right ahead, Mr. Campbell. On this side of the fishing wall. And next to the cannery. Pig on your friend seems to go in for atmosphere. Oh, Billy is not particular. Billy? Yeah, that's his name. Why? Because it's also the name of a man Abin Hamid's daughter mentioned. She was going to see him and give him some money. Well, that figures. Billy said he worked for Abin Hamid. Yeah, I know. Well, let's go. The part I don't get, Mr. Campbell is how come some character wants to kill me? I I didn't do nothing. No, but you could do something. What? You could testify that you were warned ahead of time that the plane was in danger. Yeah, but... Huh? And the man who warned you probably knows who caused the explosion. Oh, uh, maybe we really just had a hunch. Oh, maybe, maybe. Suppose we asked him. We can go right in. Billy never locks his dog. See? Well, you ought to know. He's your friend. That's funny. Must have gone off somewhere and left all the lights burn. <gasps> hey, look. Uh uh. I guess we're a little late. Somebody stuck a knife in Billy, too. And they did a better job this time. He's dead. But, but why did they kill why him? Why not? He served his purpose, and there was no use taking a chance on it. Huh? Hey, what did you find? A couple of bank drafts in his coat pocket. Signed by Adam Hammond. Well. But, but who's behind all this stuff? Blowing up the airplanes, killing people? Now we've got two good possibilities on opposite sides of the fence in this business of the Arab farm loan. Adam Hammond and a man named Gromit. They both claim to know Manning's decision and their claims disagree. I got it. One of them is lying. The question is which one? What was Manning's decision? Well, I, I guess that's that's something we'll never know. Maybe not, Pagan. But we can pretend to know. Oh, oh, come in, Pagan. Boy, 
for a lousy hundred bucks, I sure have to do a lot of running around. And me, sick man besides. Did you get that rumor started? Oh, sure. I'm an old hand at that racket. I planted it with the bellhops, taxi drivers, Arab guides, you know, the usual grapes one. Exactly. What did you plan? Oh, I just what you told me to, that before he went to the airport, this Manning guy had mailed the report with uh, his decision about that Arab loan thing, uh-huh. huh? and, and that the post office turned it over to you, and you're holding it unopened here in your room. <laughs> hey, are you? Of course not. I didn't think so, no, I didn't. Well... What do we do now? Nothing. We wait. You mean to see which one of those two guys tries to... Hey. Hey, there, there's a third one. You forgot about the daughter of Abin Hamid. Oh, no, I didn't. It's after midnight. I don't think anybody is going to come here. Well, at you all. could be right. <laughs> Why I'm always getting myself mixed up with this messes, anyhow. Pagan, I often wonder. Here I am, peacefully buying Persian rugs in Algiers, strictly legitimate, and what happens? Well, you nearly got blown up in an airplane. Oh, that was an accident. What I mean is, I run into you, and, and three hours later, I get knifed in the back. That's friendship for you. <laughs> a friend wouldn't make a wounded man sit up all night. You don't have to. Go on down to your room. You get stabbed again? Hmm. That, that's the kind of dilemma I always get myself into when... Smell it. She's here somewhere. Take on you, mate. Oh, gentlemen, don't move. Put up your hands, please. Oh, fire escape, huh? I was afraid you might be expecting someone by way of the door, Mr. Kendry. Hey, it's that groundwood's gone. That's right. Who did you expect? But that perfume, I thought... He wears it on his head. I know, I noticed it at dinner. This is the man who stabbed you. Killed Beely, too, didn't you, Gromitz? Certainly. After I had him tell your friend he worked for Abin Hamid, I wanted to make sure he wouldn't change the story. And I imagine the explosives were planted in the luggage you left aboard the plane. Of course. When Manning told me he was going to recommend the loan, I decided to eliminate him. It was really too easy. But, Mr. Kendall, what about those bank drafts and billies from Abin Hamid? Interest payments on mortgages, I suppose, right, Gromit? I really did not come here for a question and answer session, Mr. Kendall... I would like to have that report of Manning. Oh. Now we're in for it. Mr. Kendall, if you knew he was that one, why did you let him come in here with a gun because and get I the Because I wanted him to admit a few things in front of witnesses. Witnesses? That's right. Come on in, Abin Hamid. You will drop that gun, Mr. Grummet. I will drop nothing. Watch him. He's going out the window. Grummet, stop. Don't try to stop me, or I'll... Slip. Look. <laughs> Oh. oh, oh, Mr. Candle. He fell off the fire escape. He, he fell clear to the pavement. Yeah. Well, it won't bring Manning back. Up in Hammond. But at least there'll be enough evidence to ensure a passage of the Arab loan. May Allah be thanked. My people have a saying, Mr. Candle. That he who steals the water from his neighbor's well will fall some day from a high place. Never have I seen the saying more amazingly fulfilled. It's a true saying. He who steals the water from his neighbor's well. That's exactly what's going on today all over the world, stealing water from a neighbor's well, trying to win at somebody else's expense. And the water's always lost. Nobody gains. Why don't they dig their own wells? Our star for tonight, Mr. Joseph Cotton, will return in just a moment. And now, here's Ben Crosby with a word about vacations. Oh, Ken, when you mention vacations, it brings a tear to me eye and a lump in my throat. Poor Uncle Herbert. Well, what happened to your Uncle Herbert? Uncle Herbert loves to fish. So on his vacation, he hired himself off all alone to a secluded spot way back in the woods. Poor Uncle Herbert. He uh, forgot his fishing pole? He forgot his Chesterfield. So friends, take a tip from me. Whether you're packing to take off for the weekend or for that long-anticipated vacation, 
Pack a couple of cartons of those milder Chesterfields. When you take off on a trip like that, you, you like to go where you want and do what you want. So take along the cigarette that gives you what you want. Chesterfield. Chesterfield gives you its famous ABCs. Always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. Plus, no unpleasant aftertaste. Yep, the country's first and only cigarette taste panel reported. Of all brands tested, only Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. Vacation time, anytime. Take Chesterfield with you. Now, here again is our star for tonight, Mr. Joseph Cotton. As Herbert Marshall would say, thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lucille Meredith, Will Wright, Stan Waxman, Polly Bear, and Harry Bartell. Next week, the flying trip to Indonesia. And, of course, Leon Velasco will be along as Pagan. So listen, won't you, when Herbert Marshall returns as the man called X. Good night. Joseph Cotton may currently be seen in the Hal Wallace production, Pekin Express. The Man Called X is the Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio first, in recorded music first, in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Les Crutchfield. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, same time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. Next, join Roy Shield on NBC. Now we present Herbert Marshall as the man called X. The Friday night feature on NBC's five-show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by... RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. It's Frankie Carl at the keyboard, playing one of a medley of hits from his new RCA Victor album, Cocktail Time. In this exciting new album, you'll find 16 of Irving Berlin's best, a selection of songs that are among the greatest hits of the last 30 years. Ask for your album copy of Frankie Carl's Cocktail Time at your record dealers. Listen to it. You'll hear the smooth, danceable Carl flavor as he ripples through such romantic melodies as How Deep Is the Ocean, Say It Isn't So, All Alone, and many more Irving Berlin favorites. Yes, here, Frankie Carl's Cocktail Time, a brand new album release by RCA Victor. <laughs> Under the blazing rays of the equatorial sun, a new nation has been born. The fledgling Republic of Indonesia. Proud and strong, the young nation faces its future with confidence and hope. A confidence and hope shared by the man who leaves the government building at Padang, Sumatra. Not a chance, Chief. I just got word of it here in Singapore. He was Jim Martin, all right. Another American oil man. The third one killed in the 
Republic of Indonesia in the past two months. That's right. And this time it was out-and-out murder. No accident. What's going on there, Ken? Any ideas? Chief, do you remember the Daryl Makeda? Daryl Makeda. Oh, that World of Freedom outfit. Yeah. Sure. They were collaborationists during the war, working with the Japs. Well, they're at it again, being very patriotic about it. They want all foreigners driven out of Indonesia. And they want all of her oil to be nationalized. Oh, it begins to sound familiar, Ken. Ten years ago, it was the Japs who wanted Asia for the Asiatics. Now? Yeah. That nationalizing of oil gag makes a fine excuse to overthrow a government that's working with the Western democracies. Yeah. Wait a minute. Isn't Jim Martin's company drilling test wells in an undeveloped country in the north of Sumatra? That's right. They're taking all the risk and only asking for a royalty if they manage to tap a new field. That's why the Daryl Makeda will do anything to stop those wells from coming in. Ah. How do we keep him from getting away with it, Ken? I've already got my tickets, Chief. For Padang, Sumatra. That looks like oil derrick rigging you're unloading. They ain't sewing machine parts, Mac. You must be Brad Kelly. What makes you think so? They told me up at the office that I'd find you down here, loading equipment for the test well at Akeen. Who are you, Mac? My name's Ken Thurston. That don't mean nothing to me. What's your racket? Come on, spill it. I want to know what you can tell me about Jim Martin's murder. Oh, I get it. A company snoop. Well, you better steer clear, Mac. Why? Because Brad Kelly's telling you so, that's why. This outfit's paying me to drill a test well up at Akeen. I got trouble enough without trying to play copper. Sounds like you don't care who killed Martin. All I care about is my job. The dough I'm going to get for bringing in a well, you savvy? Sure. Just like it was back in 39, isn't it, Kelly? 39? Yep. The year the Russian oil fields at Baku were being modernized. What does that mean? They hired some outside help to do the job. One of them was an American oil super. By the name of Brad Kelly, remember? <laughs> Again. Hello, Mr. Thurston. All right, Peg, how much do you want? Exactly $163.29. <laughs> how do you know it was I wanted money? What else? And please, Mr. X, besides, you owe it to me. I what? Sure. Uh, it was pretty expensive for me to follow you here from Singapore, and I couldn't charter the aeroplane for peanuts, you understand. What aeroplane? Why, the one that's going to fly us to Mr. Kelly's oil well near Achin. Natch. Huh? You're Thurston, the man who wants me to fly him to the oil fields at Akeen. That's right, Miss Dorn. What's your reason for flying up there? Do you always ask your passengers leading questions? That's rugged country. The natives are pretty rugged, too. Traveling up there can be dangerous for a man. But not for a woman, eh? Thurston, I'll do almost anything to make a dollar. <laughs> what makes you think I wouldn't? Might be a good answer for Zellschmidt, but not for the man called X. Ah. Ah. Pagon didn't waste much time, did you, Frederica? Talks pretty freely for ten bucks. Was it worth it to you? Yes. I like to know all about the people I'm flying. Just uh, idle curiosity? No. The Daryl Makeda. Mm hmm. What's their connection with you? None, so far. That's the way I want to keep it. Mm hmm. You're not satisfied? Should I be? You'd be a fool to fly with me if you weren't. Well? Okay, Frederica, let's go. gentlemen, the Akeen oil field. Hey, somebody beat us up here. That red plane on the strip? Sure. 
Belongs to that oil man who is the boss around here. Brad Kelly? That's the Joker, yeah. Him and me are the oldest and dearest of friends. No wonder it didn't cost him anything to learn that I was the man called X. Are you kidding? It cost him exactly ten bucks. Oh? That's what I thought. Looks like ten dollars is paid on standard fee for treason, Ken. Treason? Now, what kind of talk is that? I was only trying to see that nothing happens to this oil well. I was only trying to... Ken. Yeah. Looks like you got here a little late, Pago. It's already happened. Look at that rigging. Look at it. Another 24 hour shutdown. And all because some lousy. I believe you are forgetting something that is more important, Mr. Kelly. Yes, yeah, Sungo, like what? The fact that three men were killed in the nitroglycerin explosion. What the devil do I care how many lazy natives get their heads blown off? It was their own blasted carelessness. Was it Mr. Kelly? Or was it the Darul Makeda? Now look, Sungo, for the last time I'm telling you to knock off that guff about the Darul Makeda. I don't want to hear it anymore, you get me? Knock it off. Why? You afraid there's some truth in it? Thurston, what the devil are you doing here? We didn't settle anything about Jim Martin's murder at our last meeting, Kelly. Maybe that's the way I want it. And what I said before still goes. Stay clear of me. So Brad Kelly's blowing off steam again, Singer. So it would appear, Frederica. But someday he will not find his safety valve in words. And then will come the explosion. But we forget our manners. I do not believe this gentleman and I have met. My name's Ken Thurston. And I am Sunga Tabara, Mr. Thurston. Allow me to welcome you to our kid. Thanks, Mr. Tabaran. Sunga's an oil geologist, Ken. Oh, working for Kelly? The, the Indonesian government has assigned me to aid companies such as this in whatever way that I can. It must be a pretty rugged assignment. What with Kelly and the explosions, the... Darrell Makeda? Oh, you overheard uh... What makes you think they might be behind this nitro explosion? It was so predicted, Mr. Thurston, by Negara. Negara? Yes. A girl who gives dance plays with Wayang. But uh, perhaps you are not uh, familiar with Wayang. Yeah, they're puppets, aren't they? Used in shadow plays to tell stories about the past. And about the future, Mr. Thurston. The more superstitious of my people... Believe that anything the puppets say will come true, even if my people themselves must help bring that truth to realization. I mean, they really believe that nonsense? Uh, Megara's Wayang made two predictions at her shadow dance last night. Both came true today. What were they, Sunga? They said that smoke and fire would cover the great iron tower. And stop its beating heart. The nitro explosion. And the other prediction? That a great bird of the skies would land here today, carrying with it a devil god. A devil god who would be known by the symbol X. <laughs> Hey, I don't get it, Mr. X. What's all this yakety yak about devil gods and dancers and, and Daryl Marquetas? What's all that got to do with drilling oil wells? That's what we had to find out, Pig, huh? But why monkey around with all this mishmash if you want to know who's throwing wrenches into the oil wells? <laughs> Just ask me. You've got it all figured out. Sure. It's that Sunga Tabara. Very interesting. It's got to be him. Why? That's besides the point. Anyway, if it's not him, it's. Is that Kelly Joker? Or, or, or that gorgeous geranium Frederica? It's a cinch. I don't know how I could ever get along without you, Pagan. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, but someday I'd like to have a try. Uh-huh. Here's our tent. Let's go in. Well. Huh? What's so well about... Uh, well. Greetings, great one. I bid you welcome... In the name of the holy triad of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Oh, thanks, baby. We, uh... Mm, who? You must be Nagara. That is so, great one. High priestess of the Wyan. And you are the devil god 
who have come to battle those whose selfish interests bring only destruction. What makes you think we're here for that reason, Megara? It has been so predicted by the Wayang, Great One. And whatever is said by the Wayang comes to pass. Have they told you who these uh, selfish interests are? It is to be told tonight. At a shadow play in the jungle to the north. Be there and you will see and hear for yourself. Until then, safe one. <laughs> sure, baby. Good. Bye. Oh, hmm. Boy, what a screwless character. Hey, Mr. X? I doubt it. But here. On this cot. Hey. What do you know? It's a Charlie McCarthy. It's a Wyang. A shadow puppet that tells the future. It is? Hey, that thing's look like you. That's right. Then what's what is it doing with that with that? Oh, oh Mr. X. Yeah. The hilt of a dagger pagan. Speaking out of his chest. <laughs> We'll continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. And now, here's Bing Crosby with a word about vacations. Oh, Ken, when you mention vacations, it brings a tear to me eye and a lump in my throat. Poor Uncle Herbert. Well, what happened to your Uncle Herbert? Uncle Herbert loves to fish. So on his vacation, he hired himself off all alone to a secluded spot way back in the woods. Poor Uncle Herbert. He uh, forgot his fishing pole? He forgot his Chesterfield. So friends, take a tip from me. Whether you're packing to take off for the weekend or for that long-anticipated vacation... Pack a couple of cartons of those milder Chesterfields. When you take off on a trip like that, you, you like to go where you want and do what you want. So take along the cigarette that gives you what you want. Chesterfield. Chesterfield gives you its famous ABCs. Always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. Plus, no unpleasant aftertaste. Yep, the country's first and only cigarette taste panel reported. Of all brands tested, only Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. Vacation time, anytime. Take Chesterfields with you. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zell Schmidt. The Man Called X believes that the Daryl Mercader, a subversive organization, is planning to overthrow the Indonesian government under the smokescreen of a cry for nationalization of oil. He's in the wild northern country of Akin, where the success or failure of a test well being drilled by American interests might determine the success or failure of the Daryl Mercader's plans. What kind of a sucker are you anyway, Sunga? There's no oil here. If you can sell Kelly on the idea of drilling further north on my land, we can all get rich. I'm afraid, my dear Frederica, that the welfare of Indonesia is a bit more important in my estimation than your personal gain. Okay, okay. Wave a flag if you want to. But nobody gets anything if you don't hit oil here, and you're not going to. You sound pretty sure of that, Frederica. I am sure. Kelly's drilled way below the limit of the other wells on Sumatra. And if that's not enough, ask Sunga what the test borings show. What do they show? Actually, very little upon which to base an opinion, Mr. Thurston. We must drill for many more weeks before anything definite can be known. By that time, my options will be up. I've got to start drilling on that land before then, or I can't hold the leases. Sounds like Sunga was right. You're more interested in making a dollar than in what happens to Indonesia. Sure I am. Why not? Nobody gives you anything for nothing in this world. Well, maybe we shouldn't expect it, Frederica. All right, Ken. Treat your fancy little homilies. Let Sunga wave his flag. Won't do you or Indonesia any good. You'll never strike oil here. I still want to know why you're so sure. Two words, Ken. Daru Makeda. <laughs> I don't get it, Mr. X. The oil well isn't working after the explosion, so why do we have to visit it at this time of night? It's a perfect time for the Daro Makeda to make a move. Huh? Easy now. We're almost there. Huh. See? The joint's empty. <laughs> Any bets? 
Where did that come from? Somebody working in the rigging. Oh, that's crazy. What could anyone be doing out here in this dark? They could be loosening the drill so it'll fall down the bore. They could? It would be weeks, maybe months of fishing for it before they could drill again. Plenty of time to start it and finish the revolution. Come on. Pagan, you can come out from behind that barrel now. I was, I was only going to, going to. Boy, look at that knife in his hand. Oh, you shot him just in time. I didn't shoot him. You didn't. But but. Thanks, Nagara. Nagara. I had a presentment that the Daryl Makeda might strike tonight. It looks like you were right. Good going. Hey, what gives with this cookie? She don't talk screwy like she did before. I told you that was only an act, Vega. But she's the one who, who brought the puppets to the tent. The one dressed like you, you with the knife stuck in here. No, it was not I who brought the wiring there. I found it when I came to the tent to talk with you. Huh? It puzzled me because it's apparent we're both fighting the same enemy. The Daryl Makeda. Then you know they're trying to destroy this well. Of course. Just as they're attempting to destroy all Indonesia. Huh? We'll have to discuss it some other time. Your friends heard the shots. Yes. When, Nagara? Where? I'll let you know. In the meantime, be on guard. Boy, what a luscious lollipop, huh? And plenty handy with that gun. I wonder. Are you kidding? In that dark, with everybody moving, she picks off that guy with a knife just like that. What if she missed Pega? Huh? She might have been shooting at me. <laughs> Suppose you're waiting for me to thank you for last night, Thurston, huh? The rig is operating again, Kelly. That satisfies me. Good thing, too. I'd hate to hang for as long as it's going to take me to thank any stooge the company's put on my tail. Just stay out of my hair while I'm on this job. Hmm. He's grateful, Cus, isn't he? Well. He's not alone. You won't get any thanks from me, either. I didn't think so. Oh, why not? If that drill had fallen, the company might have given up this well. Then you'd have had a chance to sell them on drilling your property. Why should I go to those lengths when I got an inside track? Sunga Tabaran? He made another test boring today. From the look on his face, it wasn't too encouraging. Is that right, Sunga? Yes, what's right, Frederick? The test boring, no good, was it? No. No, I'm afraid that it was not. No trace of oil bearing sand or shale? None, Mr. Thurston. Uh. I am almost convinced I should recommend another site for a test well. And little Frederica's got just the land for it, hasn't she, darling? I hate to disappoint you, Frederica, but the answer is no. What? There is much more promising land, geologically, to the northeast of Akin. What kind of dirty double cross is that? After what you promised me. I promise you nothing, Frederica. Don't give me that. If there's another test, well, it's going to be on my land. Kind of a theoretical argument right now, isn't it, Frederica? Not on your life. There's nothing theoretical about... Here, wait a minute. What's going on at the well? The drilling has stopped. That excitement. Ken, that must mean that... That's right, Frederica. The well's come in. They've hit oil. You know something, Mr. Rex? I'm getting tired of wandering around this oil well in the middle of the night. Why are we wasting time here now? Because Brad Kelly is not in his tent. So what? So I want to see what he's doing in the tool house. Hey, that's right. There's a light burning inside there. <laughs> I wonder what's cooking. Let's go in and find out. <laughs> How do you like that? Joint's empty. Kelly's not here. Take another look, Pagan. Behind the desk. Behind the... <gasps> Mr. X. Yeah. But, uh, but who would want to bump off Kelly? That Darrell Marquette, Arthur? Would you like to answer that, Sunga? Sunga? 
I do not mind, Mr. Thurston. Hey, you're pointing the thing at me. Tell me, how much did you learn during that telephone call you made? Enough. You're not an official representative of the Indonesian Republic, and you've got your own leases on oil lands northeast of Akin. A rather complete but hardly incriminating dossier. I wonder if the Darul Makeda would agree with you. What do you mean? You've been paid to start up revolution in Indonesia. What you were really after was to steer the test world to your own property, to cash in both ways. I don't think your bosses would like that kind of double cross. I'll spare you the trouble of telling them. By locking you in this two house, when the burning oil from the well strikes it, you'll be in no condition to talk to anyone. Burning oil? But that well is not on fire. You're quite true, Mr. Zellschmidt. But 15 seconds after I leave here, it will be. Good night, my friend. Good night, Mr. Rex. He means it. We're going to burn in here. Burn to a little pieces. Uh. It's no good. We couldn't break down the door with a crowbar if we had a crowbar. Maybe we won't need one. Stand back. Uh, I think that did it. Come on, let's try it. Huh? Try what? The door, you idiot. I fired at the lock. Come on. Mr. Rex, you did it. You saved me. That no good sanga didn't get away with a thing. Didn't he, Pagan? Huh? Giving him to me straight, Zellschmidt? Sure. Uh, it's just like I told you, Miss Dorn. He shoved me away from the tool house and ran inside saying he still had work to do. Oh, oh, poor Mr. X. Poor Mr. X is right. That uh, tool house is a cinder. It looks like your friend lost all the way around, including his life. Oh, oh don't say things like that. There's no other way to say it. Look at those flames. They... See the fire. Huh? It's going out. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It, it is going out. Oh, it's gone. But but what happened? There's the answer, Zelschmidt. Coming toward us in the fire suit. He's taking off the helmet now. Huh? It's him. How was the first? So that's the reason he went back into the tool house. To get the suit and the carbon tent equipment. <laughs> you bet, yeah. Well, well. Looks like we cleaned up another one, eh, Mr. Rex? Oh, uh, not quite, Pagan. Huh? But the well's okay again. Yeah, but there's still Sunga to Baran. Oh, that's right. I'm not so sure you had to worry about him, Ken. What do you mean? I ran into the native girl, Negara, just before this shindig started. She brought something for you. Here. Mean anything to you? Hey, it's another one of those puppet things. Yeah, a Wayang. Dressed just like Sunga was the last time we saw him. That's right. It is. It could be his twin brother, except that it hasn't got a... Hasn't got a... <gasps> Mr. Rex. That's right, Pagan. It hasn't got a head. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall, will return in just a moment. If you suffer from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anacin brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anacin contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you've received an envelope containing Anacin tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anacin this way. Try Anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. Here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to D.J. Thompson, 
Peggy Weber, Will Wright, Gerald Moore, and Hans Conrad. Next week, Ken gets an invitation to Lyon in France. An invitation to a murder. That's right. And helpful, as always, will be... Correction. Um, Leon Belasque will be there, of course, as Pagan Zellschmidt. Hello, Leon. <laughs> so join us, won't you, when next I return, as the man called it. Good night. <laughs> Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is the Friday night feature on NBC's five show festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia. The Man Called X is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Be sure to hear The Magnificent Montague with Monty Woolley, formerly heard on Friday, now brought to you as a Saturday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And until next week, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. Next, join Roy Shield. Sunday, it's the symphony on NBC. Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find... The Man Called X. Of all the weapons of modern warfare, those that have gained the greatest notoriety are the guided missiles, the death-dealing germs, the terrifying atomic and H-bombs. But perhaps the deadliest, the most vicious weapon of all, is one that we cannot see nor feel, but the impact of which can be a thousandfold more destructive. The weapon, the big lie. A widow in a modest New York apartment receives a mysterious telephone call. I got it from a guy who was drafted at the same time. He just thought you ought to know. They're sending his son overseas right away. And he hasn't even learned how to fire a rifle. I just thought you ought to know. A rumor spreads throughout a minority community in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, yeah, they're really getting a raw deal. All of your guys in Korea have been used to the sword troops. They get themselves bumped off, knocking out enemy positions... And the other boys move up without even getting their hair mussed. <laughs> Talk about a raw deal. In a small town just outside an army camp in Tennessee. The way I heard it, they don't know how good these new atom rockets will work against troops. So they shipped A and B companies out to the proving grounds last week to use them as human guinea pigs. They say the hospital's already full of guys dying from atom burns. So it looks like we're faced with another Operation Big Lie, Chief. If you don't think so, Ken, look at these reports. Dallas, New York, Kansas City, San Francisco. The same thing everywhere. Rumors, rumors, rumors. Yeah, the old story. Play race against race and religion against religion. Throw suspicion on our whole defense program. Uh, What's been done about it, Chief? I've got men assigned to every principal city. So far, they've turned up nothing. Not one lead as to where those rumors are coming from. I tell you, Ken, this thing has got me so upset that I... Uh, excuse me. Yes, Miss Brooks? A collect call for you, sir, from Chicago. Agent Jack Doyle. Oh, good. Put him on, please, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. What's going on there in Chicago? What have you got for me? Hello, Mr. Chief. This is Egon Zetschmidt speaking. Egon? What the devil are you doing on that phone? Miss Brooks said Jack Doyle was calling me. Sure, he is. What? Well, that is, I'm making the call for him, you understand. Only now, I don't know if he meant you or me. 
maybe the Bureau of Missing People. Bureau of Missing People? Sure. Who else do you call when somebody's missing for a couple of days or two? Who's been missing for a couple of days? That's right. What's right? He's been missing for a couple of days. Who, you idiot? Jack Doyle? No, this is Egon Zellschmidt. What's the matter? Don't you hear so good or something? <laughs> Zellschmidt, so help me if you don't start making sense and fast. I'm making sense, Mr. Chief. That's why I'm calling you. Jack Doyle's missing, and he told me if it happened to him, I should call you. So here I am. What happened to him? Where? How? I'm glad you asked me that, Mr. Chief. And I can give you the answer right out of my cough. What happened was... Zellschmidt. Zellschmidt, what happened there? Can you hear me? What's up, Chief? Uh, there were some shots, Ken. Uh, yes, sir. Get that Chicago operator. See if she can trace that call fast. Yes, sir. What was Egon telling you about Jack Doyle? From what I could make out of his double talk, Jack's been missing for a couple of days. Was he the man you'd assigned to Chicago, tracing down those rumors? Yes, and I haven't had a report from him for a week. And then that call from Zellschmidt. I'll get it. Hello. I have that information on the phone call from... Oh, it's you, Mr. Thurston. That's right, Miss Brooks. Did you trace that call? Yes, Mr. Thurston. It came from a public phone booth in a nightclub, the Cafe Arcady. Cafe Arcady. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Oh, you're welcome. Now, I've got one more favor to ask. Yes, sir. Your ticket's waiting at the airport. Flight 211 for Chicago. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Welcome to the Cafe Arcade. Thanks. Can I have a table, please? You have a reservation, sir? No, I didn't make one. Well, then I'm sorry. We won't be able to accommodate you tonight. Pretty crowded, are you? Very, sir. Well, I'm glad to hear the shooting didn't keep the customers away. What shooting? I heard a rumor that a few shots were fired around here early today. The rumor was wrong. Yeah, so many of them are. You sure there's no table for me, not even for, for old times' sake? Old times' sake. We've never met before. Oh, sure, we have met you. Back in 1940, we had a little run-in concerning subversive propaganda in the German-American Bund, remember? My name's De Costa, not Becker. I never had anything to do with the Bund. You got me mixed up with somebody else. Phone for a reservation the next time, mister. We'll be glad to accommodate you. Thanks, I may take you up on that. Good night, De Costa. Good night, sir. Hey, Joe. Joe, take over, will you? I've got business in the office. Come in. Good evening, Edward. Uh, what brings you into my office so early? Trouble, Mr. Arkady. Trouble? Just had a visitor by the name of Thurston. Ah, uh, yes. Thurston. The one we were told was a friend of Jack Doyle's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did he remember also he was an old friend of yours? He did. Is that what brought him here? Well, he said he'd heard a rumor about a shooting here. Ah, uh, I see. Edward, I dislike rumors intensely. When they might interfere with my business... I think maybe we shall have to do something about Mr. Thurston. Papa's arms, baby. The drinks are all ready and... Oh, oh, it's it's you. Expecting someone, Ego? <laughs> Come right in, Mr. X. All right. Now, what are you doing in Jack Doyle's hotel room? What's happened to him? Come on out with it. Well, the way it happened, Mr. X, I was stuck here in Chicago, temporarily embarrassed without funds, you understand, when I ran into him. Naturally, he was so happy to see me, he insisted I shouldn't get out of his sight. Oh, sure. Then what? Uh, he said I could use his room for a couple of days. He was going to be out on some job or something, and if he didn't come back, I was to call the chief and tell him. He didn't, so I called. You called from the club, Arcady? Sure, I was looking for him. He was always hanging around there. 
What were those shots the chief heard? Oh, so somebody got trigger happy in Mr. Arcady's office. Naturally, I ran to the rescue. And you know what happened? You got lost in a saloon across the street. How did you know? Never mind. Did Doyle tell you what he was working on? Mention anything about rumors? Rumors? I am the only rumor he's got. Uh, he wasn't working on anything. Or Why should he go looking for a job? For what? A job? Sure. I found the want ad he clipped out of the paper. I, I got it right here somewhere. Sure, here it is. Now, let me see that. How to be successful through talk. Learn how to sway people with words. See? The art of verbal mass communication. Lectures and study groups at moderate cost. See Dr. Ralph Townsend, Suite 11B, 161 North Clark Street. Dr. Ralph Townsend. Hmm. You see what I mean, Mr. X? He was looking for a job. He was looking for something at Townsend's place. It wasn't for a job. Get down. What? What was going on, Mr. X? Somebody's shooting at us, Agar. From the other wing of the hotel. But I didn't hear no shots. Did you ever hear of a silencer? Oh. But why would anyone want to kill us? I'll see if I can get an answer across the court. <laughs> Shooting? In this hotel? Surely you must be mistaken, Mr. Thurston. No, I'm afraid not, Miss Rogers. Two shots were fired from this wing of the hotel into that room directly across from yours. But I didn't hear any... Did... Did you say into the room directly across the court from this one? That's right. But that's Mr. Doyle's room. Is it? Yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Doyle is a customer of mine. I operate the lending library in the hotel... I've memorized the room numbers of all my regular customers, and I... But, but wait a minute. Why didn't he come to my room? Jack Doyle has disappeared, Miss Rogers. Disappeared? Been missing for two days. But why would anyone want to kill Mr. Doyle? Or you? I was hoping that you might be able to tell me. I? But I only know Mr. Doyle is a customer of my library. Why would you think I could possibly know anything about this shooting, unless... Unless you believe that the shots came from this room. Do you? Miss Rogers, I'm merely trying to get the answers to a few questions. You've got all the answers you're going to get here tonight, Mr. Thurston. Now, if you don't mind leaving. No, of course not. Sorry if I've upset you. Oh, by the way, Miss Rogers, do you happen to be interested in rumors? Rumors? Yes. Or in the use of words as a method of mass conditioning. Or in a study course in how to talk your way into success. Are you being serious? Very much so. But I don't even know what you're talking about. That book on your coffee table. Book? Yeah. The Psychology of Lies. Written by Dr. Ralph Townsend. Good night, Miss Rogers. Mr. X, I'm tired. Why don't we stop chasing wild gooses and on lux over a couple short beers? Not until we learn what happened to Jack Doyle, Edgar. But we've been driving around all day long, all over the city of Chicago, and we haven't learned nothing. No, I don't know. In a bowling alley, we learned that our soldiers will freeze in Korea this winter while the army sells heavy clothing for surplus. Huh? And a waitress in a Southside restaurant told us that the Kremlin has a direct pipeline into the atomic labs at Los Alamos. But, but your stories don't make sense. Of course they sense. don't. They're lies. They're so big that people believe that there must be some truth to them. We've got to stop them. Well, that's okay with me, Mr. X. But what do we do? Go to night school. Night school? Yeah. To take a course from Dr. Ralph Townsend in how to talk our way into success. Crazy, Mr. Thurston, picking locks to get in school. Who ever heard of such a thing? You're hearing it now, Ego. Get a move on. Okay, okay. So there, now what? We go in. At least they got a nightlight burning in that other office over there. I can see what we're looking for if I only knew what it was. Filing cabinets always a good bet. Let's try them. Hey, what do you know? This one's empty. This one, too. 
Say, what cooks here anyway, Mr. A? Don't let Dr. Townsend even keep his lunch in these files? Let's try this desk. Mm. Looks like we got here too late. You mean school's out that Dr. Townsend took it on a lamb? Doesn't make sense. Not unless Jack Doyle was able... Mr. X, somebody, somebody is in that other office. Yeah. Let's get this joint to brush out before he gets mad at us and... Huh? The light. He, he turned out the light. Oh, quiet. Shut! Watch it. All right, take on. Let's go in there. Oh. Where's the switch? Oh. Uh-huh. Mr. X. Yes. Jack Doyle. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Community chests throughout the country have accepted the responsibility of raising sixteen and one half million dollars extra this year for the services included in the United Defense Fund, the USO services to hard-hit defense communities, and American relief for Korea. This means that each of us must give generously if we're to expect continued help from community chest services. In addition to this extra amount for defense-related national services, normal community demands for local red feather services, such as daycare, nursing, family counseling, and recreation, are rising as the population increases and the draft and stepped-up defense production make themselves felt across the country. By eliminating many separate appeals, which would be more costly in money, time, and effort, Red Feather Campaign's joint planning and budgeting benefit the contributors, the volunteer workers, and the community, as well as those who benefit directly from those services. So remember, when you make your gift to the United Red Feather Campaigns, You are giving to 15,000 local services. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall. Ken Thurston believes a rumor factory is operating somewhere in Chicago, organized to disrupt civilian and military morale and to hamper our defense program. In the offices of a Dr. Ralph Townsend... Ken exchanged shots with an unknown attacker. And now he and Aegon have entered the private office where the shots came from and find themselves looking at the body of Jack Doyle, a missing bureau agent. Oh, I don't get it, Mr. X. Why should Mr. Doyle go shooting at us and make you kill him? I didn't kill him, Aegon. But look at him. He's as stiff as a poker. He's been dead at least three hours. Then, then who bumped him out? And what happened to the joker who was taking those potluck shots at us? There's a fire escape outside the window. Oh, that's right. He must have taken a couple of powders. Well, what do we do now, Mr. Thurston? May Hmm? I offer a few suggestions, gentlemen? And my first suggestion is for you to drop that gun. Sure. Oh. And my second suggestion is that you offer some words of explanation for your presence here and the rather unusual situation in which I find you. You, Dr. Townsend? I can conceive of no reason why I should deny it. And you? My name's Ken Thurston. And I'm Mr. Egon Selschmidt. <laughs> Thank you. Now, shall we proceed with the explanations? Suppose we make that mutual, Doctor. By your telling us why Jack Doyle was killed. And why we found him in your private office. Hardly a reasonable request under the circumstances, is it, Mr. Thurston? Particularly when I expect the answers to those questions to be forthcoming from you. And if they're not? Silence may be golden in the copybooks. But here in my offices, it might well prove fatal. Oh, he means that, Mr. Thurston. Well, do you talk or do I resort to... Excuse me, please, gentlemen. And kindly remain quietly where you are. Townsend here. I see. Thank you very much for informing me. Goodbye. It would appear you are having good fortune tonight, gentlemen. A colleague of mine in the lobby informs me that the police are on their way up. Our respective explanations will have to be given to them. I'd still like a chance to hear yours in private, Doctor. Do you think you can arrange that sometime? I am positive I can, Mr. Thurston. I am positive I can. Well, uh... 
They didn't know any more about it than I did, Chief. The tip that sent them to Townsend's office was anonymous. Anonymous tips. Murder. Filthy lying yeah. rumors. What have you got for me? Okay. First, the Cafe Arcady. Owned by Leo Arcady, ex-Russian. Came here in 39. Suspected of being in the rackets. No convictions. Huh. What about his right-hand man, Ed He's DeCosta? George Becker, all right. Former German-American board member. Served five years, less ten months. No file record since he was released and changed his name. No file record on Ann Rogers, either. But her family was checked and cleared for top-secret defense work during the war. The Quarto Manufacturing Company. And Dr. Townsend? Former psychology professor with the OWI during the war. A big wheel in psychological warfare. His record's been checked a half dozen times. It's clean as a whistle. Ah. Well, does it help any, Ken? It might, Chief. If, it could, if I could tie any of it in with engines. Huh? Yeah. Engines? Jack Doyle had a smear of diesel oil in his shoes and trousers. Ah, don't be bashful with that caviar, baby. There's plenty more fish in the ocean where that came from. And have a couple more glasses of champagne, huh? One to drink and one to watch the bubbles in. <laughs> as long as you're beating that expense account to death, you might pour one for me too, Ego. So oh, be glad to nothing too good for any friend. Oh, <laughs> hello, Mr. Thurston. Do you mind if I join you, Miss Rogers? Of course not. Please sit down. Thanks. How'd you two get together? Just a mutual attraction? I came here because of Jack Doyle, Mr. Thurston. Oh? I kept... I kept thinking of what you told me. And I remembered that I'd heard him mention the Cafe Arcady several times. It was a, a foolish impulse, I suppose. But, well, I just had to come down here to see if I could learn anything about him. And did you, Miss Rogers? I'm afraid not. Then I saw Mr. Zellschmidt, the man who'd been sharing Mr. Doyle's room. So, when he asked me to join him, I did. It was strictly business with me, Mr. Thurston. I got a hunch his cookie knows plenty, so I've been pouring on the champagne until she gives in. <coughs> Excuse me. It talks, you understand? No sacrifice too great, eh, Edgar? You said it, but... Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Thurston, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Oh, go right ahead. You asked me earlier if I were interested in rumors. Yeah, that's right. Well... Suppose I said that I've heard the Russians are sneaking A-bomb components into every major city in the United States to be set off simultaneously on D-Day. Is that the kind of a rumor you mean? Did you hear that, Miss Rogers? Here. Tonight. Remember who said it? The man at the third table to the left. Mm. Mr. Thurston, that's Dr. Townsend. Yes. Why do you want to be so helpful, Miss Rogers? Do I need a stronger reason than a man's murder, Mr. Thurston? No, I guess not. Hey, look. That Townsend joker's going into that back room. Do you think he's got business with the boss of this joint? Might be interesting to find out, eh, huh? Suppose the two of you wait here for me. I'll let you know. That's far enough. This Regretful of the manner in which Edward de Costa invited you to my apartment, Mr. Thurston. Violence was not intended to be employed. Will you accept my apologies before we begin our little talk? You're in the driver's seat, Arcady. Very well. Mr. Thurston, I am an honest citizen. You represent my wonderful government. That is why I wish to speak with you. To set my record straight with the government. Mm -hmm. Both you and Jack Doyle have been investigating something in Chicago for some time now. Is it not true that neither of you has uncovered any criminal evidence against me? Ever hear of the big lie, Arkady? Of course. Well, I heard a very choice one in your cafe tonight. Uh, I am beginning to see that I have been laboring under a misapprehension, Mr. Thurston... I thought you were here to investigate me on entirely different grounds. But let me assure you that no matter what else you may believe of me, 
No one can question my loyalty to this country. You know, you almost make me believe that, Arkady. Just one thing that stops me. These books and pam- pamphlets on your desk. Looks to me like you've been taking some courses from Dr. Townsend. I have? Why? For the simplest of reasons. I am a native-born Russian who has adopted this country for my own. I naturally wish to express myself in the best of English. Do I make myself clear? I'll give you credit for a good try. So, are there any other questions? No. Any you'd like to ask me? No. Good night, Mr. Thurston. Good night, Arkady. That's right, Mr. Thurston. That Miss Rogers took a powder, said she was tired of waiting for you. Probably combat fatigue, eh, John? Couldn't take those popping champagne corks any longer. Huh? What champagne? Corks? Oh, skip it. Come on, we've got work to do. Work? Yeah. They're going to visit a factory where they manufacture rumors. There it is, Agon. That? <laughs> That's no factory. It's nothing but an old, worn-out yard tied to the dock. Is it? Let's get aboard and see. I don't get it, Mr. X. Why are we climbing down into the middle of this old ship anyway? It was used as a proving ground for marine engines during the last war. Diesel engines made by the Quarto Manufacturing Company. So what? Remember the oil smears on Jack Doyle's pants and trousers? Huh? <laughs> Those came from the engine room. Come on. Oh. That, that lamp don't give much light, Mr. X. I can hardly see anything in... <gasps> Yeah. Dr. Townsend. Boy, dead like a doorknob. Yeah. I'd say he taught somebody all they needed to know about the psychology of the big lie, Aegon. That right, Miss Rogers? Miss Rogers? Where else would you expect to find the boss of the outfit? Oh, no. How did you find out, Mr. Thurston? Clairvoyance or sheer genius? Simple arithmetic. Diesel oil and diesel engines add up. And you helped me prove it at Arcadis Cafe. I did. Yeah. You said you hadn't learned anything about Doyle there. Then you tipped your hand when you said your reason for wanting to help me was Doyle's murder. What happened, Anne? Was Doyle killed here, then taken to Townsend's office? Yes. Then Townsend was to be killed there, too. After we moved all the incriminating evidence to the ship. When you came in off schedule, it upset things. Hey, then, what are we waiting for, Mr. X? Let's take her along to the pokey. It's not that easy, Agar. Sure, she hasn't got a gun. That's right, but the guy who shot Townsend has. The guy who... Who? He means me, Zelshman. Oh! Still up to your old tricks, Da Costa? First for the Bund, now for Ann Rogers and her bosses. Why not? I've got lots of answers for that one, Da Costa. Meanwhile, I'd better smash that lamp. Wait, hold it. Shoot it, Da Costa. Don't let him get away. Shoot it. I... Where are you, Thurston? You can't get away? Thurston! Over here, DeCosta! He's over here! Thurston. Right here, DeCosta! Oh, you... Hey, Don, you all right? How... How how can I tell in all this dark? How can I? Oh, that, that flashlight helps it. Mr. X, that, that cute cookie, what happened to her? One of the Costa's shots got her by mistake. Oh. Well, the rumor factory is finished. But, but I don't get it. If her family's got factories and yachts and stuff, what was she doing mixed up in a racket like this? That's the puzzling thing about people like her. Frightening. With everything this country has given to them, they still sell themselves on the idea that other country is better. Why can't they realize that that's the biggest lie of all? Now, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Shirley Mitchell, 
Fritz Feld, Ted Von Els, Sheldon Leonard, Dan O'Hurley, and Stan Waxman. Next week, a malicious job of sabotage in Ankara, Turkey. Sabotage that might well be a threat to the whole free world. Of course, in that category, we ought to include Leon Belasco, who will be along as Pagon Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And so until next week, and please consult your local papers for time and station, this is Jack Latham saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X, transcribed. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, adventure, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. The perpetually sunless capital of Peru was founded by Francisco Pizarro and built out of treachery and conquest and death. He named it the Ciudad de los Reyes, the City of Kings. Today, the kings have departed, and we know it only as Lima. But treachery and death never depart. They are waiting now in the study of a small modern bungalow set on a low hill in the suburbs of the city. A man opens a desk drawer and searches through it hungrily. The door opens behind him, and he swings around. Who's in here? What are you... What are you doing here tonight? I didn't know you were coming by. I was going to bring you those... Pa- uh, uh... The man at the desk shoves the pistol into his pocket and steps through the French windows. For a moment, the study is silent. And then a tall, red-haired girl runs into the room. Roger, what is it? What happened? I heard... Roger! Get get help. Your friend can't... Thurston. Man, go... Go... This is the reply we got from the Lima police, Ken. Mm hmm. Inspector Morales seems perfectly satisfied that Roger Bright was shot by an ordinary prowler. I can't believe it, Chief. Betty wouldn't have telephoned me if there wasn't something more to it. Oh, now, Ken, when a woman's husband is murdered. Betty Bright isn't just any woman, Chief. You know that. Sure. She was one of the best secretaries we ever had in the Bureau. And she knows how important our work is. She wouldn't ask me to come down there if it wasn't pretty serious. Maybe not. But I don't see how this could involve us, officially. You, you met Roger Bright, uh, didn't you, Chief? Of course. Uh, the wedding gave Betty away. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know his reputation. One of the best petroleum geologists in the business. Well? A couple of years ago, you found that big oil field up in Alberta. Since then, he's been working for Tropic American Oil, using Lima as a base. Yes, but we haven't any reports of South American discoveries by him. That's just it. He's been down there nearly two years. By now, he should have turned up something or come back home. Wait a minute, Ken. You don't think Bright's murder might have some connection with the new oil discovery? Could be, Chief. Oh, what you just guessing? Well, forget Betty said he told her to send for me just before he died. Oh. Well, there is oil in Peru, lots of it. Think what a new discovery it would mean right now, with all our trouble in the Near East. Yeah. It sure would change the whole picture. Right. And there are plenty of people who would like to keep news of such a find from getting out. I don't know, Ken. Every time you start adding up two and two like this, you seem to end up with five, but... Doggone it, you're usually right. The Peruvian police have any objection to my going down there? Morales wired us he'd welcome any assistance. Mm, you know, I, uh... I could postpone that Tokyo assignment for a couple of days. What do you think? All right, Ken. Just one thing, though. As far as I'm concerned, you're making this trip alone. Let's leave Zellschmidt out of it. Oh, Chief, if you can head Pagan off, I'm all for it. All right, don't worry about it. I'll have Miss Brooks get you a reservation on the next plane to South America. Miss Brooks, I want a ticket for Ken Thurston on the next flight to Lima, Peru. And I don't want anyone else to find out about this. Is that clear? 
Sure, Mr. Chief. I'll keep it in my head. What? Oh, no. What are you doing out there, Zellschmidt? Well, Miss Brooks had to go outside for a minute, so I'm taking over for her. Uh, did you say two tickets for Lima, Mr. Chief? <laughs> I think that's the house, Peg, on there. Yeah. There on the corner. Sure is a dirty, rotten crime, Mr. Hicks. That Betty Bright is a real nice girl. Yeah. Well, here we are. Whoever done in her husband is no better than a, than a murderer. I'm sorry. I'm not able to see... Oh, Ken. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Hello, Betty. Oh, you remember Peg, huh? Hello, Peg, Come in, both of you. Yeah. Thanks. I'm sorry everything is in such a mess, but I haven't able, been able to do much since... Sure. I understand. Oh, come, sit down. Would you like a drink or anything? I'm, well, I'm sure we have something. I, I mean, I have some brandy or... Oh, Ken, I just can't get used to the idea. I can't believe that I'm alone. I know, Betty. It's only been three days. Just three days. Seems like a year. Sure. I'm not even able to make a decision anymore. I don't know if I want to stay here or if I want to go back to the States. But I've got to stay. At least until I'm sure. Until I know why Roger was murdered. I talked to Inspector Morales a little while ago. I'm afraid he didn't have much for me to go on. No. I suppose it could have been a prowler like Morales says, but... Why would a prowler steal all Roger's maps and reports? Oh? Morales didn't mention that. He doesn't know it. I didn't tell him. Well, suppose you tell me about it then. Of course. Roger had been on a field trip in the interior. He'd been gone for nearly three months. Came back to Lima the afternoon of the... the day he was killed. Go on, Betty. It was late in the afternoon, so... so he didn't go to the office, but came straight home. He was very excited, and we went out to dinner to celebrate. Oh? Yes. He told me he'd found formations that, that indicated a tremendous oil pool. I see. After dinner, we came home. We were in the bedroom when, when Roger thought he heard a noise in the study. He went to look. Next thing I heard was gunshots. I ran into the study, and he was dying. What about these maps and reports you mentioned? They were in the desk. Roger kept all his important papers there. I didn't realize they were missing until after the police had left. And you... you did not tell Morales? No. Hmm. Wilhelm said it would be dangerous. Oh, sorry, you don't know Wilhelm. Wilhelm Zuckland. He's with the Tropic American, too. I think... I think he's in charge of exploration and discovery. Did Zuckland give any reason for not mentioning these stolen records? He said that... that if Roger had been killed because of them... That, that I'd be in danger, too, if, if I told anyone I'd seen them. Maybe I was wrong to take his advice, Ken, but I couldn't think very clearly. I I wasn't making very good sense right right after... afterwards. I see. I suppose this, uh, Zuckland has an office of Tropic American Oil? Yes, it's, it's next to Rogers. Thanks. That sounds like a good place to start. Pagan? Yes? Suppose you stay here with Mrs. Bright. Keep her company for a while. Oh, that isn't necessary, Ken. I, I can manage alone. Sure, but this way I'll know where Pagon is if I need him. Who? Huh? Sit down, Mr. Thurston. Sit down. Thanks. Ah, it is unfortunate that we must meet under such tragic circumstances. Roger was an extraordinary geologist, a real genius. And he was my friend as well. Oh, it's a tragic world we live in, hmm, Mrs. Alston. Sometimes it seems that way, Herr Zuckland. Ah, I see my accent has betrayed me again. But you see, I am not German, Mr. Thurston, no. I am a Czech. I thought I had seen my share of the world's unpleasantness, but even here in Peru it intrudes. 
You've been in South America sometime? Oh, since 1940. Uh, I escaped from Czechoslovakia when Hitler entered. I had been employed by one of the refining companies and managed to secure a position with Tropic American Oil. And here I've worked ever since. I see. Once I thought my exile was ended. Now I was prepared to return to Europe. I even purchased my ticket. But before I could sail, Masaryk was murdered, his government overthrown, and my country was again imprisoned by dictatorship. So, here I remain, perhaps for the rest of my life. Who knows? Oh, I think you'll find that tyranny usually ends by destroying itself. I hope so, Mr. Thurston. I hope so. But now, you did not come to my office to discuss my affairs, no. You want to know why Roger Bright was killed and why I advised his wife not to mention certain missing reports, no? If you can help me along those lines, I'll appreciate it. Very well. Why was he killed? Well, I am not certain. It is possible that a housebreaker became nervous, fired his pistol, and in his haste to depart took along letters, maps, and records without even knowing what they were. Or it was possible that it was not a housebreaker and that he came for the express purpose of stealing those reports. Well, what do you think? I am inclined to the latter theory. That is why I advise Mrs. Bright not to mention the theft. Perhaps it was foolish advice, but then, at the time, I, too, was upset. I'm still most uncomfortable in the presence of death. And I am very fond of Betty, uh, Mrs. Bright. Tell me, did you know Roger had found what looked like a new oil field? Uh, look at this map, Mr. Thurston. Now, here, this is the area Roger was exploring. It's a rough triangle from Camucheros to Iquitor to Tapiti. A very inaccessible region. There was no way for Roger to communicate with us while he was there. Well, it's a pretty wide area. So if Roger did find a potential oil pool, you'd have no... You'd have no way of knowing exactly where it was. Unfortunately, no. Yeah. He couldn't have made such a trip alone. Oh, no, he had a party of about 30. They were natives recruited in the vicinity. And we would have no record of their names. And if we had, they could tell us nothing. There was no one from this office with him? No, no one. Uh, we don't have a large staff and... Uh... Oh, now, wait one moment. Yes. Now, what was his name? Uh, uh, let me think. Now, I think I have it here. Yes, yes, this is it, I'm sure. Ramon Lopez. Lopez? Yes, sir, a young student geologist from Lima. He asked permission to accompany Roger. How well did you know this, Lopez? Oh, not at all, but... Uh, but here, here. This, uh, this here is the letter he wrote us. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I should consider it a great privilege to journey with you on your field trip next month. It would pay my own expenses. I would pay my own expenses, isn't it? Hoping to hear from you, Ramon Lopez... 14 Avenida Norte, Lima, Peru. Do you mind if I take this, Oakland? Oh, sure, I welcome to it. Thanks. These field trips of Rogers weren't kept secret, I take it. Oh, I... Yes, Mr. Thurston, they were. You see, the competition in the oil business is not only keen, but at the moment a matter of international importance. Yet this Lopez boy knew Roger was leaving, and when? Oh, I... Oh, I... Yes. I never thought of that. I have been very stupid... Or maybe Lopez was very smart. Open up, Lopez. Lopez. Hmm. Well, what do you think you're doing, senor? Sorry, I knocked, and when you didn't answer, you I... broke in. It is a Yankee custom to enter a man's apartment without his permission. We usually answer the door when someone knocks. May I remind you that you are not in the States now, senor... Uh... My name's Thurston, Ken Thurston. What do you wish? I understand you're a very promising young geologist, senor Lopez. I am only a student. I have had no practical experience. Oh, I thought you just returned from a field trip with Roger Bright. What are you talking about? This is your letter, isn't it? And if it is... The landlady downstairs says you've been away from Lima for three months. You came back on Wednesday, the same day Bright was killed. You have no authority to question me, senor. All right, then. Let's go down and see Inspector Morales. Wait. I, I will tell you anything I can. But I know nothing. You know where Bright went. You were with him. See. Si. And since you're a geologist, you must know where he found the potential oil field. You are wrong, senor Thurston. Huh? We found no oil field. The trip was a failure. 
Senor Bright was terribly disappointed. Oh, why lie about it, Lopez? Lie? I will not be insulted in my own apartment. Get out. You're afraid to tell me the truth. Why? Did someone get to you? Or were you planted on that expedition? Carl Lopez, what are you afraid of? I am afraid of no one, senor. And if you wish to test my courage... Okay. So, I have told you to get out. Now you will go. And so you will not come back. Oh, just a minute, Lopez. You think I am a coward. If that did not convince you... Uh, all right. You asked for it. Uh. Well, I'm looking for my friend, Mr. Thurston. It's a matter of life and death or okay, something. Okay, Pagan. I've it? got to find him. That Mr. Zuckland said he was maybe coming to see you. Pagan. Get off the line, Mr. X. I'm trying to... Oh, oh Mr. X. How's the trouble? Oh, it's awful. I I was right in those house when, when it happened. Well, what happened? I didn't see him myself, but, but she screamed and then... Oh, it was a nightmare, Mr. X. I don't even know if I'm awake yet. Ooh, blood all over the place. For the love of Mike, what are you talking about? That Mrs. Bright... That we come down here to help out. Somebody shot her. Betty? Pagan, is she all right? I don't think so, Mr. X. The doctor says maybe... Maybe she's not going to pull through. We will continue with The Man Called X in just a moment. The blood plasma reserved for the fighting men in Korea is exhausted. This condition must not continue. The lives of our loved ones must not be lost needlessly. Our soldiers in Korea are giving their blood for their buddies. Can we do less? The modern assembly line is a wonderful thing, but it cannot produce blood. We must have a human assembly line, and this is our job here at home. Call your local headquarters of the American Red Cross now. Give a pint of your blood to save a life. Now, act two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. In Lima, Peru, Ken Thurston learns that the murder of an American petroleum geologist was committed to prevent the locating of a potential oil field. And now an attempt on the murdered man's wife brings the man called X to her home, where he confers with Inspector Jose Morales of the Peruvian police. The doctor accompanied the ambulance, Senor Thurston. She has been taken to the Hospital de los Angeles Blancas. You got here before they left, Inspector Morales? See, si, but the Senora Bright was unconscious. I could learn nothing from her. This man was the only witness. I was about to place him under arrest. However, he insists that he is a friend of yours. Tell me the truth, Mr. Thurston. Oh, I suppose you might call him that, Inspector. Then unless the senora recovers consciousness, we are helpless. If you were right here, you must have seen something, Pagan. I wasn't there when, when it happened. I was in that study room where the other fellow was killed. What were you doing there? Well, I, I thought I might... Could find a clue or something. I heard a gunshot off, and I came running in as fast as I could. Oh, sure. But when I got there, whoever did it was gone. Ha! Ah, if I'd been around when it happened, he'd, he'd never get away. I guess he waited until I was out of sight. Didn't want to take no chances. Hey, Mr. Thurston? I imagine, Inspector, it'll be several hours before anyone can question Mrs. Bright. See, si, that is what the doctor said. At least that long. The wound was a serious one, so until there are uh, X-rays. Mm. Tell me, what do you know about a man named Lopez? Ramon Lopez. Why, only that he accompanied Senor Bright on his trip to the interior. Had he told you he was going, Inspector? Oh, no. Senor Zuckland telephoned the information to me this afternoon. He said your visitor had reminded him of the fact. Well, he was pretty quick in getting to you, wasn't he? Well, he seemed very eager to cooperate. Uh, do you know this Ramon Lopez? I was with him when Pagan telephoned me. Oh, well, then the young man has an alibi for the time of the shooting today. Has he? See, if you were with him. His apartment's only five minutes from here. He didn't answer when I knocked. Maybe he was there, or maybe he was just coming in the back door. Ah, I see. I shall question him immediately. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a little talk with him first. Certamente, senor. Thanks. Come on, Pagan. But, 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 Mr. Thurston, if this character is the guy who's been doing all this shooting, uh, maybe I ought to stay here in case the inspector. Huh, Mr. Thurston? Come on, Pagan. <laughs> Oh, I, uh, I'm 
looking for Ramon Lopez. Lopez? This is his apartment, I believe. Oh, you mean the man who lived here before? Huh? He's moved. He's no longer here. Buenos noches. No, no, just, just a minute. Who are you? Nieto Pacheco. Senorita Pacheco. I'm Ken Thurston. And I am Mr. Pagan Zelshman. You'll pardon me. I was about to dress for dinner. Sorry to bother you, Senorita, but Lopez was here this afternoon. I'd like to talk to him. I've told you he's not here now. He moved away about an hour ago. I've been hoping for a front apartment. When the landlady told me I could exchange mine for this one, I did not wait. The quarters are furnished, so it's very simple to move on a moment's notice. And you, uh, you don't know where Lopez moved to? You can ask the landlady. Thanks, I will. Uh, wait. Wait, Senor Thurston. Huh? I, I've been very rude. You must forgive me. I was taking a nap when you knocked. My temper is not good when I'm awakened. If you and your friend will come inside. Oh, that's very kind of you, Senorita. Hey. I don't like this, Mr. Thurston. As I told you, I just move in, but perhaps I have some wine. Don't bother, Nita. Senor Zelchman? Oh, well, as long as it's handy. Of course. Are you... You friends of Senor Lopez? I've met him. I don't know him myself. Even though we've lived in the same building, you know, we've never met. It's extraordinary, No. Yeah, very, really, especially since I happened to notice your picture on his dresser when I was here before. Oh, hey, hey, don't don't let all that oh, wine go so to waste. Sorry. Here, let me help you, Nita. Oh, gracias, I can't See through my fingers. Sure. About that photograph. Uh, you must have been mistaken, Senor Thurston. No, I don't think so. Well, there are many girls in Peru who look like me. And who would sign the picture with love from Nita? I'm afraid I cannot offer you the wine after all. I've spilled most of it. I just remembered I have an engagement. You will forgive me? Certainly. Oh, and if your engagement happens to include Raymond, tell him Senora Bright didn't die. She's at the Hospital of the White Angels, room 313, and she'll probably recover consciousness before midnight. You're wasting your time, Senor. I have no occasion to talk with Senor Lopez. Good night. Good night, Nita. Perhaps we'll meet again. I don't think so, Senor Thurston. She's certainly mixed up with that Lopez character, isn't she, Mr. X? Looks that way, doesn't it? And you think maybe he's the guy who killed Mr. Mr. Bright and, and tried to shoot his wife to death, eh? Could be. Just goes to show you, you can't... Wait a minute, Mr. X. You told her about Mrs. Bright not being dead and, and what room she's in. Oh, if she tells Lopez, how could you do such a thing? Maybe that was a little careless. Sure, boy, sure. Boy, I wouldn't tell nobody. They, they might try to kill her again. Yes. There are probably quite a few people in Lima who'd like to find out about Betty Bright. They won't find out nothing from me. I'm shut like a clam. Good. And just to show you how much I appreciate it, I... here's 20 bucks. Huh? Go on, take it. Oh, oh, sure, sure, but what is it for? Well, you could probably get a lot more than that if you told the right person about Betty Bright's room, how she is. I couldn't? Well, I, uh, I wouldn't even consider you. You said she was in room 313? That's right. Say, I just remembered. I've got a 32nd cousin in Lima. Uh, cousin Grisha. Maybe I ought to see him sometimes. No, maybe. Sure, Pagon. Take it easy. Anybody in here? Hiya, Pagan. Mr. Thurston. Come on in. But be quiet about it. Where's Mrs. Bright? Did she regain conscience and take it on the land? Oh, no, no. She's up on the next floor. But, but this is room 313, like you said. Uh, why are the lights off? And what are we doing here? Waiting. What for? Who? It depends on how many people you told about this room number. Mr. X, how can you say such a... You still haven't told me who were you waiting for? Oh, a killer, perhaps. Oh, well, in that case, let me out of here. Quiet, you idiot. But, but... Quiet. Somebody's coming down the hall again. <laughs> Make no sound, Mrs. Bright, or I would... Hello, what's this? Come on in. 
Oh, I must have the wrong room. I was looking for my patient. You came to the right room. No, 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 no. You are mistaken. I have an important operation to perform on one of my patients. Oh, is it Dr. Zuckland now? Oh, now, look here. What oh, the... cut it out. That surgical mask doesn't fool anybody. Hey, you said Zuckland. And he was right, Gladysmith. Don't move, either of you. Oh, Mr. Rex, don't move. Oh, put that gun away, Zuckland. It's too late to do you any good now. It has been useful before, Mr. X, and it will be useful again. Now. I suppose that's the same one you used to kill Roger Bright? That's right. So, you see, I know how to use it. And what about Betty? Did you get worried about whether she might know where the new oil pool is? Is that why you took a shot at her? Tell me, how did you find out about Roger's discovery in the first place? Lopez? Of course. Lopez is a loyal member of the party. I don't have to ask you what party. You said you came over here in 1940, didn't you? So? Well, the comments have kept you standing by for a long time, haven't they? That is a perfect example of our careful preparation for whatever may lie ahead. Under the program of our great leader, we are always prepared for anything. That is where you Americans fail. No, I wouldn't say that. At least Inspector Morales is pretty well prepared for you tonight. What are you talking about? After sending some of his officers to pick up Lopez and his girlfriend, he was kind enough to offer a station, a few of his best men in the next room. Just, uh, just open that connecting door and you'll see what I mean. I don't believe it. No, this is a trick. Go ahead, open the door and see for yourself. I will. Yeah, you lied. This door is locked. Then it looks like I'll have to take care of you. Oh, no, you don't. Rotten shot, Zuckland. Try this. I'll kill you. Okay, Pagar. You can come out from under that bed now. Well, I guess we showed him a couple of things or two, didn't we? Yeah, I guess we did. Hmm. Now, how would you like to pick up that phone and ask Inspector Morales to come over? Oh, uh-huh. oh you bet I will. Uh-huh. Do you want me to have him come over and pick up this, this crook? Wait. I, I, must, I must talk to you, Mr. Sarson. Hey, I thought you were out cold. Oh, put down that lamp, pig. Oh. No, don't. Don't send for the inspector. Listen to me. I have the reports. The maps which describe Bryce's covering now. Without them, you will never find that oil field again. Don't worry about that, Zuckman. We'll find it. But I can give them to you. We'll make a bargain. If you'll give me a chance to escape, and in return you will have a new oil field. Not interested. You're going to be tried for Roger Bright's murder. Of oh, what value is the life of one man? How can you weigh that against the oil and gasoline I offer to you? Think what this discovery can mean to your Western world. How can you refuse? You don't understand, Zuckland. People like you never do. But oil and gas and machinery, all the material things in the world, aren't as important as one human life. That's why you and your party will always be on trial before the decent people of the world. Okay, Pig, I'm called the inspector. And now, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lucille Meredith, Peggy Weber, Will Wright, Bill Conrad, Ben Wright, and Harry Bartell. Next week, a flying trip to, well, believe it or not, to nowhere. And if you like plot and twist and counterplot, I strongly advise you to listen, because I really think the story will keep you on the edge of your seat. Pagan, oh, sure, he'll be along in the person of Leon Belasco. So join us, won't you? When next I return, as the man called X. Good night. Starring Herbert Marshall is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's transcribed story was written by Frank Burt. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. 
And so until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, intrigue, romance, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. There was no warning, no presentment of impending disaster. The papers headlined the cliché of another impasse at the United Nations. Radio commentators announced a new gangland murder, the firing of a football coach. There was not the slightest hint that the entire civilized world might be in terrible danger. And then a telephone started to ring in a certain New York City apartment. Hello? Ken, better get down to the bureau right away. What's up, Chief? Formula H. I'll be right there. Sure there's no mistake, Chief? Not a chance, Ken. It's Formula H, all right. The key to the most destructive weapon ever conceived by man. And a set of the microfilm is missing. When was the loss discovered? I got a call from Los Alamos 20 minutes ago. Any idea who? Take your choice, Ken. Sir John Saunders of England, Charles Gomar of France, Aline Najda of Belgium. Good Lord. Yeah. Three of the world's greatest atomic scientists. All of them cleared to work with our top men. And all of them had access to those plans. What's been done about them? Washington just reported on a personal security search. And? No trace of the film. No, there wouldn't be. Well, what the devil are we going to do about it? We can't let those plans get out of the States. Why, Ken, if they fall into the wrong hands, the whole world could go up in smoke. Chief, weren't the three of them about to leave this country for a scientific convention in Paris? That's right. They were all set to take off at midnight from Washington in a chartered plane, but don't worry about that. We'll cancel the flight and hold them in custody. Why? Why? For Pete's sake, Ken. One of them's obviously using that trip as an excuse to get out of the country with those plans. That's why I think we should let him go. What? Look, Chief. It's a hundred to one that Formula H is on its way out of the States right now. None of the three has the plans on him. So what are you going to accomplish by holding them in custody? Well, I don't know, but... But we just can't let them skip the country. Why not? If I go along. What have you got in mind, Ken? We are not leaving Washington until midnight. That gives us plenty of time to make arrangements for me to take over as co-pilot on the flight. Co-pilot? I'll have until we land at Shannon Island to come up with something. Maybe learn which one it is or get some hint as to what's happening to that microfilm. Oh, but you haven't anything to go on, Ken. Nothing to work with. Got any other ideas, Chief? All right. Let's go. Hi there, Mac. You looking for somebody? Yeah. Captain Bill Allen. Have I found him? Well, you couldn't have done it better with radar, pal. You must be thirsting the new call. That's right. Hope you don't mind the last minute switch. Oh, brother, there's been nothing but switches on this flight. We're going. We're canceled. We're going again. I've even filed two flight plans. One for Shannon and one for the Savoy Bar. No, Thurston, you don't bother me a bit. Well, thanks, Allen. This our ship? Yep. Fuel check, cleared and ready to go as soon as our three VIPs get in. Just the three of them going along? That's right. Mm-hmm. Two of us and the steward will make a total of six. We'll be flying light, high, and handsome. That's why I file nonstop. Hey, looky there. Seems as if the brain's are showing up. 
Hey, Thurston, I thought we were carrying electronic graybeards. Who's that streamlined jet jar? She must be one of them, Alan. Dr. Aline Nashbell, Belgium. Well, don't tell me she's got all that and brains, too. Wow, we'll be flying the beam tonight. Are you all set to go, Captain? Well, just let them get aboard, sir, and we'll be off. Good. The plane's all ready. So if you'll all get aboard... Dr. Nasda. But of course. Here, let me help you with that bag, Miss Nasda. Well, thank you, Captain. Oh, think nothing of it, ma'am. Nothing at all. Oh, you button up after we're all aboard, will you? First and I'll see our passengers and make comfort. Sure. <laughs> passengers, did he say? That's a relief. For a moment, I thought Dr. Nasda was the only one traveling tonight. See you aboard, Mr. Thurston. Are you, you are certain that this plane is capable of making the journey, Monsieur Thurston? It does not seem very large or very strong. No need to be concerned, Professor Gomar. We'll make it easily. Ah, perhaps, perhaps. Still, it is such a long voyage and over water so much of the way. A boat would be so much safer, so much more... Oh, well, it is too late for that now, huh? Miss Farr? Yeah, as you say, the die is now cast. We, oui, it has been cast. Everything all right, Ken. Okay, here, Chief, what about you? Oh, they've been under constant surveillance. I'll guarantee not one of them is carrying the plans aboard. What about Alan? He's been checked. Not a thing on record against him. You're going on a wild goose chase, Ken. You haven't got a prayer of turning anything up. Why don't I take them all into custody before it's too late? If I can't turn anything up, it's already too late, Chief. I'll let you know how I come out. See you later. Come so on, Ken. Six X nine four three to tower, ready for takeoff. Over. Tower NC six X nine four three. The runway's yours. Let her rip. Over and out. How do you make the altitude, Thurston? 10,001. Course? 070 zero, zero degrees. Well, check and triple check. It's all a known how, as the man says. Nothing to do but relax from now on in. Yeah. Suppose I go out, check on the passengers, and have the steward rustle up some coffee. Yeah, you do that, Thurston. Only don't you get lost on the way. I'm reserving hand-holding privileges with that beautiful hunk of atomic fission for yours truly. How little know, Ellen. You just do that, Thurston. You just do that. Nice takeoff, Mr. Thurston. If the rest of the trip is as pleasant, I'll be more than satisfied. Thanks, Sir John. We'll try to keep you that way. Uh, by the way, do you happen to have the time? It's um, 12.35. Uh, thank you. Everything all right, Dr. Nasda? Oh, it is indeed, Mr. Thurston. With but one exception. Oh, what's that? Well, traveling by airplane always stimulates me. And as I do not feel the least bit sleepy, I... I am certain that some coffee could do me no harm. You have it, Doctor. I'm going back to light a fire under the steward now. Monsieur Thurston. Monsieur Thurston, some attention, please. What's the trouble, Professor Goma? That Captain Allen, he did not do as I wished. I told him I wanted my briefcase here on the seat beside me, and he has put it up there, where I cannot easily reach it. Well, that's a simple matter, Professor. Here. Yeah, Miss I have important notes, you understand. If anything should happen to the plane, perhaps I might be able to save them. I wouldn't worry about it, Professor. You'll be in Paris before you know it. Hello, Pagan. Oh, am I ever glad to see you, Mr. Rex. I've been sitting back here cooped up in this coop waiting for you to show. What's going on here, anyways? Didn't the chief tell you? And nobody tells me nothing. All I know is that I was working busy in my Uncle Ahmed's elite haberdashery emporium, and this bureau agent walks in right in the middle of a 400 spade hand with double pinnacle besides. Then you didn't see the chief? Uh, he took me out of this airplane. I didn't see nobody. And he told me to stay in here until I heard from you. Yeah, well, uh... But believe me, I would have walked right off this thing if I didn't figure you wanted my invaluable services. Yeah. And don't forget, we were playing double in space. Pagan, hmm? somebody on board this plane has got some missing microfilm. All knows where it is. I've got to find it before we reach Ireland. And you're going to help me. Oh, sure. 
Well, what do you want me to do? Hang around the passengers, drop a few remarks about scientific secrets, H-bombs, microphone. Let them know you've got a few friends behind the Iron Curtain. <laughs> the sense. Uh, then what? That's all. That's all? It'll be enough to start putting the pressure on. I'll handle the rest of it. Wait a minute. Something you wanted, Sir John? Uh, I, uh, as a matter of fact, there is, Mr. Thurston. That, uh, that coffee you spoke about. Uh, the steward will have it ready in a minute. Anything else? Uh, uh, yes. Captain Allen asked me to get you. He'd like to see you up forward. Thanks for your trouble, Sir John. Perfectly all right, Mr. Thurston. Perfectly all right. You wanted to see me, Alan? Not nearly as much as I want to see Miss Nuclear Fish in 1951 and 2 and 3. Why don't you take over here and I'll take over there? Fair enough, Bill. Oh, and you might bend your ears around that radio headset. Some friend of yours in Washington wants to yakety-yak with you for a while. Oh, thanks. Yeah, now you just keep your Geiger counters handy, chillin'. Daddy's gonna be radioactive. NC-6X 943 Thurston, calling Washington 37. NC-6X 943 Thurston, calling Washington 37. Come in, please. Hello, Ken. All clear? All clear, Chief. Talk up. Ken, you're in trouble. There's something awfully wrong aboard that plane. That's not news, Chief. Well, this is. The Washington police found a dead man a couple of hours ago. Murdered. They just got a positive identification on him. What about it? He was an airplane pilot with the name of Bill Allen. Come here. May I have a word with you in private, Mr. Thurston? Of course, sir, Dr. Naja. Please come in. Thank you. I wanted to speak with you about the steward, Mr. Thurston. Zell Schmidt, what about him? He was talking to Charles Gomara a little while ago, using your name quite frequently. If I am not mistaken, he was linking it with a certain letter of the alphabet. Is that supposed to mean something to me? I would not know, Mr. Thurston. Well, then why tell me about it? Perhaps, perhaps it is because I am a woman as well as a scientist. And like most women, my heart yearns for peace. Thank you for your time, Mr. Thurston. I hope I have not wasted it for you. Come in here, you idiot, and close that door. Oh, sure. Happy to oblige any old aeroplane pilot any old time. <laughs> now, I had a visit from Dr. Najdo a little while ago, Pagan. She told me you went up your old tricks again. Well, once a salesman always leave him laughing, you know. <laughs> well, here you are, Mr. X. Did you learn anything out there? <laughs> Did I learn anything? Believe me, I learned plenty. You know, it smells so good, I think I'll have a cup myself. Come on, let's have it. Well, don't breathe it to a soul, Mr. X, but... Those three jokers out there, they're all spies. What? That's right. I heard them telling that Captain Allen all about it. All three of them were in that atom bomb place down in New Mexico, and you know nobody but spies can get in there. Oh, fuck. Uh, well, let's taste this good old job. Huh, Mr. X? Here's mud in your eyes. Drop that cup, Jager. John, John. Ooh. Hey, what's the big idea knocking that coffee out of my hand? I'm dying for a drink of that stuff. You almost were dying for a fact. Huh? Yeah. Smell this coffee. So what? It, it smells like coffee and maybe burnt nuts of some kind? Yeah. Bitter almonds. But I didn't put any nuts in that coffee. No, but one of our friends out there put something in it. Poison. <laughs> Return to the man called X in just a moment. The blood plasma reserved for the fighting men in Korea is exhausted. Unaccountably, donations have decreased sharply in the last few months. Now, this condition must not continue. The lives of our loved ones must not be lost needlessly. Our soldiers in Korea are giving their blood for their buddies. Can we do less? Call your local headquarters of the American Red Cross now. 
Make an appointment this week to give just a pint of your blood to save a life. And now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zeldschmidt. It is known simply as Formula H, and yet it holds the key to the most powerful, the most terrifying weapon ever conceived by man. And a microfilm set of the plans is suddenly discovered to be missing. Ken Thurston, acting as co-pilot, is aboard a transatlantic plane chartered by three international atomic scientists, all under equal suspicion of having stolen the missing plans. And now, in the pilot's compartment, Ken has just become aware of an attempt to kill him with poison coffee. Poison? That's right, Pedro. But, but who, but why? Oh, but what? Take your pick. There are four to choose from. Four? Our pilot. He's a phony. The real Bill Allen was found a couple of hours ago by the Washington police. Murdered. Oh, we gotta get out of here. We gotta get out. Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Sure, why not? We can, we can... Oh, yeah. But, but we're stuck up here in the middle of nothing with somebody who wants to mop us out. What do we do, Mr. Thurston? What do we do? I don't think we'll have much to say about it. Huh? Listen, listen to those engines. The ship's beginning to ice up. What are you talking about, ice? There's plenty warp in here. Take a look at those wings. The ice is piling up fast. Another 30 minutes of that and we'll spin down out of control. We will. Oh, ice missing plants, poison coffee. That puts us right between the devil. Oh, no. Well, well, pals, it sounds like our putt-putts are playing knock-knock. What gives out there, Ice? That's right. I'm building up fast. Well, that lovely whistle bait of lean Naja ain't the only de-icer we got aboard. I switched on the de-icers half an hour ago. Something's wrong with them. They're not working. Well, now, that's a revolting thought. You got any suggestions? There's an old deserted landing field this side of Gander, Newfoundland. The ferry in command used it during the war. And there's just a prayer we can make it. Well, fair enough. I'll let our paying passengers in on the scoop, then come back and help you set it down. I got a hunch, though, that somebody aboard this flying chemistry class ain't gonna like the change of plans. You know, Ellen, or whatever your name is, I was just thinking the same thing. Flying first. Bill Allen couldn't have done better himself. I don't know about Bill Allen, but I think you could have put it on. <laughs> well, that friend of yours back in Washington tipped you off to the switch, huh? That's right. Well? Well, now, you can't chew out a guy for helping out a pal in a jam. What kind of jam? Too much elbow bending. When this flight was canceled the first time, he made for the Savoy Bar. He wasn't in no fit and condition when it was scheduled again, so I took over. It won't wash. Allen's dead. Murdered. Are you leveling, Thurston? Yeah. Well, then I'll tell you what. Let's take care of the pay and freight while I think it over. Weather ought to clear in a couple of hours, and it could be I'll have something... something mighty interesting to talk over with you by then. Some disaster would overtake us upon this trip. Did I not say so, Misery? Did I not? Oh, it's not as bad as all that, Goma. Can't you look upon it as an adventurous lark? I do not care for adventure in a nice bound wilderness, Sir John. Only in a safe passage back to Paris. What is to be done now, Mr. Thurston? I ask of you. Now, as soon as the steward and Captain Allen secure the plane, we'll head for that shelter hut at the end of the runway. You can light a fire and be comfortable in there until the weather clears. Now, those are pleasing words, Mr. Thurston. What is more inviting than a roaring fire and good company while a storm rages outside? Yes, very well, very well. If we have no alternative, let us be about it. Eileen and I will go with him, Thurston. We'll have the fire going by the time you get there. Thanks, Sir John. Oh, uh, uh, by the way, do you have the time? Hmm? 
Yeah, it's uh, 7.15. Thank you. One of the penalties of exacting scientific research seems to be a nervous stomach. And pills have to be taken on schedule. <laughs> Come along, Ellie, my dear. All right. See you later, Thurston. Yeah. Well, I got the sandwiches and the hot drinks, Mr. X. A tea, that is. So let's take a powder for that ramshack over there. Where's Alan? I haven't seen him. I guess he's still on board the airplane somewhere. Ah, but who cares? I think we'd better care, Pagan. Come on. Hey, it's cold on that board of that plane. It'll be a lot colder here if he takes off without us. Huh? Now, why would he do that? We still haven't found the missing plans. And they're more than worth a gamble with a little ice. Mr. Rex, he's not here. He's got to be. Let's try the office. This time the coffee gag worked, Pega. Poison. Captain Allen poisoned? But it does not make any sense, Mr. Thurston. It makes plenty of sense to one of you here, Dr. Najda. I'm not certain that I understand, Thurston. That man wasn't Bill Allen. He was helping one of you get some stolen microfilm out of the United States. What kind of nonsense is this, Monsieur Thurston? We are scientists of international repute. It is ridiculous to accuse one of us of stealing Formula H. I didn't know I'd mentioned what formula was missing. Uh, well, perhaps you did not. But this kind of accusation, the inquiry and searching back in Washington, I but drew the natural conclusion. Yeah. You know, Thurston, I'm almost convinced that Goma is right. If this pilot of ours was a confederate in stolen microfilm, why would he have been killed? There can only be one answer, Sir John, to prevent him from telling what he knows. Is that guesswork, Dr. Nelson? Or knowledge? Why can't we term it fundamental deduction, Mr. Thurston? Maybe we would, if it wasn't for this. Now, what in the world would that be? A charm from a lady's bracelet, Sir John. I found it on the floor of the plane, under the pilot's body. Under... Uh... Well, I presume you have some explanation for that, Aline, my dear. Well, of course. The simple truth. And that is? Well, I noticed that charm was missing from my bracelet hours ago. I must have lost it aboard the plane and someone else picked it up. For what purpose is now rather obvious? The only thing obvious about all this, Mamselle, is the identity of the guilty party. Uh, suppose we let the Newfoundland authorities decide about that, Professor. But while she is free, all our lives are in danger. They won't be for long. The weather's starting to clear now. Another hour and we'll wind up this little affair in the town of Gander. you loud and clear, Chief. Glad to hear you got the gander all right. Sure. That army jet got me here in plenty of time. But what's been holding you up? According to our plan, I expected you here hours ago. Had a little trouble, Chief. Ice. Murder. What? Auto land in about 30 minutes now. Have a private office ready for us. I'll tell you all about it then. Here's the office, Ken. You want everybody in to talk things over? It'll be simpler that way, Chief. Will you all step inside, please? Certainly. Glad to oblige, this. I am sorry, monsieur, but I cannot see the scene. All this officiousness, this delay, it's inexcusable. Why should you object, Professor Gomar? After all, I am the one who is suspected at the moment. Come along. Yes, very well. Very well. You uh, want to take over, Ken? If you don't mind, Chief, it won't take long. You all know, well, you know by now why we're here. One of you suspected of espionage, of having stolen top secret microfilm. Microfilm of Formula H. Oh, then Gomar's guess was right, Thurston. If it was a guess, Sir John. I told you, 
I but drew a natural conclusion, monsieur. So you did. And Dr. Najda told us she was innocent of the pilot's murder. Now, I'm wondering what Sir John has to say. Uh, what I have to say? Uh, what about Mr. Thurston? About your stomach pills, your wristwatch. Uh, what? A poison pellet can easily be disguised as an innocent pill. And I'm curious as to why a man who was wearing a watch is always asking the time. <laughs> I don't know what you're driving at, Thurston. Is there anything unusual about a man's watch stopping? Not unless there's a microfilm concealed in the case that's caused it to stop. Microfilm? Ken, I told you I'd wind things up in Gander, Chief. You better take him away. Well... I guess we put the wraps on this one all right, eh, Mr. X? I knew all the time it was that Sir John Saunders joker. Oh, sure. Sure, it was as plain as my nose. Hey, hey, what are we stopping at the airplane garage for? Our plane was put inside for repairs. What? But I thought Professor Gomar and that Aline Najda were taking off for Paris in a little while. They are. We have to switch planes for them. The de-icers on this one don't work. Remember. Oh, oh sure, sure, sure. Hey, it's dark in here, Mr. X. Why don't we turn on the light or something? It's light enough for our purpose. Oh, that's right, yeah. It's, uh... Hey, what is our purpose, anyway? Keep quiet, I'm sure. But, 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 Mr. X... Quiet. Oh, but we've, we've come to the end of this place. There's no plane in here. The hangar's divided into two sections. It's in the next one. Through this door... There it is, Pedro. Mr. X, look. Yeah. But what's going on there with that plate? The plate covering the alcohol tank being removed. What alcohol tank? The one used to fuel the de-icers. Hey. <laughs> Where's the alcohol? That's why the de-icers didn't work. There's something else being taken out of that tank. You see Mr. Rex, that's... that's the... Yeah. I'll take that if you don't mind, Aline. Thurston. The microfilm. Aline. But, but it was Sir John. That is... Well, I thought you... Oh. So it was a trap. That's right. We had to get proof. So Sir John played along with us. You had to feel safe enough to walk into it. I see. But... But the microfilm of the tank. How'd you know about that? It figured, Pega. She had to get it out of the country some way. The pilot was working with her. And the de-icers didn't work. You know you are not going to walk out of here alive, don't you, Mr. Thurston? Mr. Ray. Oh, put that thing away. The chief's got to hang us around it. You're all through. So. For the time being, I have lost. You lost a long time ago, Eileen. When you decided you'd, you'd try to help destroy the world. Well, someday we'll find a remedy. For what's wrong with you and a lot of people like you. We've got to find it. Let's pray that it's short of war. And now, here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lucille Meredith, Will Wright, Daniel Hurley, Howard McNair... And Stacy Harris. Next week, well, who would dream that the icy slopes of the Matterhorn would hold the key to one of the most disruptive forces at work in the world today? And no, no, I, I don't mean Leon Belasco, but he'll be along on the trip to Switzerland as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X.
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. Citizens of Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia. This is Radio Freedom. Attention, citizens of Bulgaria, Hungary, Albania. This is Radio Freedom bringing you the truth from free Europe. The truth that you behind the Iron Curtain can never get to hear in your own country. Attention, you workers in Kowlin Mines and Andrej. There is a security police... For over a year now, Radio Freedom has been broadcasting from Luxembourg in allied Europe to thousands of radio receivers behind the Iron Curtain, battling the big lie with truth, aiding the underground movements, telling the true story of the injustices, the imprisonments, the mockeries of freedom perpetrated in the name of the so-called People's Republics. But then, a month ago, the terror began to strike. In the home of a government worker in Sofia... At a meeting of underground leaders in Budapest. A party of refugees attempts to cross the Albanian Greek frontier. Here are the reports, Ken. Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland. The same things happening in practically every country behind the Iron Curtain. How long has this been going on? About a month now. And if it keeps up, well, something will have to be done about Radio Freedom. Oh, now, wait a minute, Chief. Radio Freedom is the biggest punch we can throw at the Kremlin, short of war. Not anymore, Ken. Not since it stopped broadcasting the truth. Since it started to give advice that turns into a death trap for anyone falling for it. Every one of these, the result of Radio Freedom broadcast? That's right. Huh? These people believed they were hearing the truth took the advice that was given to him and ran right into the waiting arms of the security p- p- police. I just... A few I... more weeks of this sort of thing and we'll never get those people to believe what we say again. That's why we've got to... Uh, yank that radio station off the air. Well, we can't afford it, Chief. We've got to get the truth across now, before it's too late. But what other answer is there, Ken? Suppose I let you know. From Luxembourg. <laughs> Letters of introduction seem to be quite in order, Mr. Thurston. But I am not quite certain as to the reason for your visit here to Radio Freedom. I'd like some information, Miss Stebinet. You mean concerning our operations here? That's right. Well, as you probably know, we are a group of refugees from Iron Curtain nations, interested only in helping those of our countrymen who are under Soviet rule. We are financed primarily by donations from the American people, and we broadcast the truth as we know it. How much truth have we been broadcasting during the past month, Miss Stepanek? It is rather noisy in here. Perhaps we can talk more easily in my private office. Sure. You are a governmental agent, Mr. Thurston. You've read my letters of introduction. They are not specific as to that point. They're specific about the managing director of Radio Freedom giving me information. Very well. You are interested in the broadcast that we have been having so much trouble with to the very people we are attempting to help. What can you tell me about them? Only this. None of those broadcasts has come from here, from Radio Freedom. That doesn't make sense, unless you mean there's, a, there's an outlaw transmitter operating somewhere? Exactly. Someone in Western Europe is operating an illegal station, deliberately using the same wavelengths, the same format that we use on Radio Freedom. That station is the one that is broadcasting lies, confusing our listeners, ruining the reputation we have established for bringing them only the truth. You've got proof of that? We have caught the station on the air. 
have made recordings of actual broadcasts. Does it have a regular schedule? It can usually be heard around 8 o'clock at night. Where is it located? We do not know. <sighs> Haven't you ever heard of using directional antennae to locate a broadcasting transmitter? I have. And what's been stopping you? Mr. Selston, what do you know about the Matterhorn? Why? The Matterhorn is a 14,000-foot peak of rock, snow, and ice in the Swiss-Italian Alps. There are a couple of shelter cabins on its slopes, nothing more. Yet our attempts at locating it tell us that the outlaw station is on the slopes of the Matterhorn. Ah. Yes, as you obviously realize, such a thing is a physical impossibility. In other words, the work of radio freedom is being destroyed by a radio station that does not exist. Yeah. Well, you've been most helpful, Miss Stefanek. Thanks for your time. You are leaving? That's right. But you have told me nothing of your purpose in visiting here. Why you came, what you intend to do. Let's put it this way. Radio Freedom is organized to bring the truth behind the Iron Curtain. I intend to see that it does just that. Goodbye, Miss Stepanek. Wonderful country up here, isn't it, Mr. Thurston? I don't think I've ever seen anything approaching the majesty, the regal beauty of the Matterhorn. Have you been up here before, Professor Hartley? No, no. This will be my first visit to Zermatt. But my business has taken me to many other mountains around the globe. And just what is your business, Professor Hartley? It sounds rather adventurous and romantic. <laughs> I'm afraid not, Mr. Reader. I'm a weatherman, a meteorologist. Visiting Zermatt on business or pleasure? Oh, a little of both. The Italian government is establishing a weather station on the Matterhorn. They've asked me to check it over for them. Make sure they've got it operating correctly. An Italian weather station? But you are visiting the wrong side of the mountain. <laughs> That's where the pleasure comes in. I thought I'd do a little skiing and climbing before going to work. Is that your intention also, Mr. Thurston? Something like that, Professor, yes. What about you, Mr. Reader? You up here for a bit of climbing, too? If you speak of the Matterhorn rather lightly, gentlemen, it is not a very wise attitude with which to approach one of the most dangerous mountain peaks in the Alps. Oh, that's hardly my understanding. Thousands of tourists have climbed it. And many have died trying. The cemetery at Zermatt will attest to that. Well, you make the mountain sound rather grim, Mr. Reader. Well, perhaps that was my intention, Professor. As a warning? If you wish. Why? You are not professional climbers. At this season of the year, an amateur attending the Matterhorn is facing almost certain death. I take it you are out of professional then, Mr. Reader. I have made it a philosophy of life, Mr. Thurston, to be a professional at whatever I may attempt to do. Well, we have reached so much, gentlemen. A trust your stay here will be a pleasant one. I'm certain it will be if you take my advice regarding the Matterhorn. Auf Wiedersehen. Watch your bag over here. Well, strange man, Mr. Reader. I wonder why he tried to confuse us. What do you mean, Hartley? Why make us believe he was a professional mountain climber when his business is connected with radio? Radio? What makes you think that? I noticed his baggage being placed aboard the train. He's brought a very complete shortwave radio outfit along with him. If you will please the signs, all right? Just a mine here. Sure. There you are. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to the Gabelhorn Hotel, mine here, sir. Well, oh, thanks. Uh, Eckhart? Uh, you, you called me Eckhart? Well, that's your name, isn't it? What is it that uh, gives you that idea? We've met before. I do not recall. Sure, it. you do, Eckhart. 1944, Italy, above Casino. You were communications officer in the 8th Nazi Battalion. I'll interrogate you after your capture. Oh, you are mistaken, sir. I have never been in Italy. I did not serve in the Nazi army, and my name is Abdol. Jörg Abdol. All right, Abdol. Have it your way. The war's over. Yes, yes the war is over. You will be in Zermatt long, Herr Thurston. Long enough to do a little climbing. Can you recommend a guide? 
Well, I usually recommend my own services as guide to uh, special guests. Good. Will you be free to make a climb tomorrow morning? I shall be free, but the Matterhorn will not. There's a storm brewing. Hmm? The skies look clear enough to me. One must learn not to judge by appearances in the Alps. And the Matterhorn death often strikes without warning. The kitty room, eh, Thurston? I shall have your luggage brought in. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Uh, Abdul. Hello, Mr. Fair. What the... Hey, go. <laughs> That's right, Mr. X. Plenty glad to see me, Albert. What the devil are you doing here? <laughs> what a question. I'm going to help you broadcast behind the Iron Curtain. Snatch! But it's just like I told you, Mr. Rex. There I was in Milan. That's in Italy, you understand. No. Oh, sure. And I was a little financially embarrassed for funds. Yes, so you called me at the bureau. That's right. Only you weren't there. No, but Miss Brooks was. Hey, gone, sir, help but me. But, Mr. Rex, can I help it if she goes for me and, oh, and tells me things? <laughs> anyway, here I am and here you are, and... Hey, what, what's the thing you got up, hooked up there? Anyway, eh? A portable shortwave receiver with a directional antenna. It is? But my... Are... Hey, that's right. What's right? It's Tuesday night, around 10.30 New York time. Tune it in, Mr. X. Tune what in? Oh, that program I always listen to on NBC... Boy, what a screw loose character they got on this. <laughs> you ought to hear his accent. Yeah. Right now I'm interested in catching a broadcast from the Matterhorn. The Matterhorn? There is no radio station up there in that hunk of cold and ice. Denise Stepanich is different. Attention, citizens of Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia. This is Radio Freedom. Quiet. Here it is now. Citizens of Bulgaria, Hungary, Albania, this is Radio Freedom bringing you the truth from free Europe. The truth that you behind the Iron Curtain can never get to hear in your own country. But that's not coming from the Matterhorn, Mr. X. That's the Cornball station that broadcasts from Luxembourg. I know the dame's voice. So do I, Pagan. Attention. Not Denise Stepanek. But that broadcast isn't coming from Luxembourg. It's not. How do you know? Listen, while I change direction of the antenna. On Route 5. Take alternate route So it gets louder. So what? So the directional antenna is pointing toward the Matterhorn. Attention, That's where the broadcast is coming from. Oh, but how Anton could that step in a cooker be up there in those mountains at night like this? So and, and, and where could there be a radio Anton station up there anyway? We're going to find out tomorrow. Huh? We'll take this set up the mountain with us. The directional antenna will lead us right to the transmitter. And then what? Then we destroy it. <laughs> but that don't make no sense, Mr. X. Did you hear what it was broadcasting before this music? I heard it. And I'll give eight to five that if those people in Berlin and Czechoslovakia follow that advice, they'll wind up dead. What? That's why we're going to destroy that transmitter. Make sure that nothing but the truth gets behind the Iron Curtain from Radio Freedom. Yes! Watch it! How oh, they came from out there on the terrace. Come on. But it's darker there, Mr. X. It's Come dark. on! Okay, okay! That radio said some mess, eh, Mr. X? Who did it anyway? Whoever had those shots fired to get us out of this room. So how can you find that phony radio station without this direction stuff to help you? It's going to be tough. Hey, maybe you could send to Paris or somewhere for another gimmick. Take too long. We'll have to tackle the matter home without it. Now, what kind of a joke is that? You, you could wander around that mountain for weeks without finding anything but snow and ice. Or, or maybe snow. <laughs> you better just relax for a couple of days or two, Mr. X. Oh, sure. Hello? That you, Ken? Chief, what's up? Plenty. We just got a report from Radio Freedom. Somebody's gone through their files. There's some top secret information missing. 
What's the niece step in here got to say about it? She isn't there. Nobody's seen her for 24 hours. Huh? But that's not important right now, Ken. What is? That missing information. It's dynamite. Used the wrong way, it means the end of underground movements in at least three Iron Curtain countries. Then you can bet it'll be used the wrong way. Broadcast for that fake radio freedom transmitter? Sure. It's a hundred to one they'll have it on the air tomorrow night. So what are you going to do about it? You know, Chief, that's a very interesting question. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. No one knows the extent of defense preparations our nation must make in the future, but we do know this. For this year of 1952, the bill for Army and Air Force construction alone is estimated at some $2 billion, $4 million, and it's going up. Airfields, utilities, cantonments, radar stations, communications and navigational aids, fuel and lubricant depots, these are only a part of the long list of construction projects for defense. A typical radar outpost, just one of the many needed, costs in the neighborhood of two and a quarter million dollars. Now, it's easy to see that if America is to be strong in the men and weapons of defense, she must be strong financially. And that's where we can all help, through regular, automatic purchases of defense bonds through the payroll savings plan where we work, or the bond-a-month plan at our bank. Yes, defense is everybody's job today. Be sure your dollars are on the bond wagon. Every one you can spare. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagon Zellschmidt. An illegal radio station located somewhere on the icy slopes of the Matterhorn has been destroying the efforts of Radio Freedom to broadcast truth to the countries behind the Iron Curtain. And Ken Thurston is faced with the almost impossible task of locating that outlaw transmitter within 24 hours in order to prevent it from broadcasting information that would mean the end of democratic underground movements in at least three of the Soviet satellite nations. And now, Ken is walking toward a climber's rendezvous area outside his hotel at the foot of the Matterhorn. Looks like you're about to take a party up the Matterhorn, Opdell. That is quite correct, Thurston. Pretty risky, isn't it? Making the climb at night. My clients are paying me well, and I told you that part of my business was acting as a guide. Well, you also said you wouldn't act as guide for me in full daylight. Something about a storm coming up, remember? Oh, I must have been mistaken about that. Yeah, you must have been. Well, hello there, Mr. Thurston. I didn't know you were making the climb with us. I'm not so far, Professor Hartley. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't join us. That right, Mr. Reader? Unfortunately, I do not agree with you, Professor. Why not, Reader? Don't you like my company? I don't care for amateur climbers. Yeah, I'm going to... Yes, you said that. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Reader. The route we're taking isn't too tough. The mostly flat ledges, the shoulder, and down the Echelle Jordan. I'm sure Thurston could make it with us easily enough. Perhaps, but I never undertake to guide for a party of more than two, Herr Professor. I shall be happy to accommodate Herr Thurston at uh, some other time. Mm, that seems to settle it, Hartley. How's it coming, Professor? I'm sorry, Thurston, but maybe you and I can make it in a day or two. Yeah, maybe we can at that. Good luck to you. Thanks. See you later. Yeah. For you? For you, Mr. Thurston? Boy. Have I ever got the red hot scooperoo, Mr. X? What is it, Pagan? Guess who just came into the hotel looking for you? Denise Stepinek. That's right, Denise Stepinek. How did you know? Yeah, what's more important is how Professor Hartley knew. Huh? How he knew what? How to climb the Matterhorn. If he'd never been here before. <laughs> It is as I said, Mr. Selston. I came to warn you about the information missing from Radio Freedom's files. Then why didn't you tell me five hours ago? Five hours ago? Yeah, when the last train arrived at Zermatt. What have you been doing since? Uh, that's a cinch, Mr. Thurston. She was broadcasting from that radio station somewhere up in the mountains. We heard her. That is impossible. I made no broadcast tonight. Then what were you doing for those five hours? I was trying to make up my mind as to whether or not I could trust you. Uh-huh. What made you decide in my favor? I realized I had no other choice. 
That illegal transmitter must be stopped from broadcasting tomorrow night. There is no one else to whom I can turn for help. <laughs> what a pack of lies there, eh, Mr. Thurston? Could be, Pagan, but we'll soon find out. What do you mean, Mr. Thurston? We'll give you a chance to help us smash that transmitter. Then you do know where it is. Oh, sure. You told me back in Luxembourg. Somewhere on the Matterhorn. <laughs> Mr. Thurston, how can we find any radio station of this mountain? There's not a thing up here, not even page four. Cheer up, Pagan. I think we've got some pretty good guides. Are you referring to that party climbing ahead of us, Mr. Thurston? That's right, Denise. Who are they anyways? Abdal, Reader, and Hartley. You know any of them, Denise? I know. Do they have some connection with all this? One of them must have. What makes you think that? That transmitter is going to broadcast information stolen from Radio Freedom. Somebody's bringing that information to it. And that part is heading for the Italian slope. You are right. But there's nothing over there either. Only a weather station and a couple of shelter huts. What was that, Mr. Thurston? Somebody up there fired a couple of shots. Shots? But what on earth for? Listen. Mr. Thurston, that noise. Where is it coming from? Look up there. An avalanche! It's an avalanche! Yeah, a concussion from those shots. But they'll bury us. What do we do? What do we do? That lid, grease the overhang. It's our only chance. Come on. Three people buried alive out there, and you tell me there's nothing we can do to help them. But there's nothing, Professor Hartley. Even if they survived the avalanche, that storm would prevent us from doing anything. We got to the shelter cabin through that storm, didn't we? We were nearly fortunate, Hartley. Why attempt fate? You're a fine one to talk, Rita. You realize that if you had... Oh, the door. Yeah. yeah. It's all stuck. Here. Give me a hand with her. What? That woman first. Oh, she's all right. The shock and exposure. Close the door, Pagan. Here, just put her down on this couch, you know? Yeah. There. Yeah. That's better. And you did make it. After that avalanche, I wouldn't have given a plug nickel for your chances. Well, the main body of it went past us. And the overhang of a ledge saved us from the rest. You're a most fortunate person. It's not often the matter haunts spares a victim that has marked for sacrifice. You know better than to blame this one on the mountain, reader. The Matterhorn didn't fire those shots. Are you accusing me of having deliberately started that avalanche? You got a better explanation? The true one. We could see the storm approaching from the Italian slope while you could not. I fired those shots to attract your attention to the shelter cabin. I had no idea the concussion might start an avalanche. Coming from a supposed expert on mountain climbing, that's a little hard to believe, reader. Ah, but we'll skip it for now. How long do you think this storm will last, Abdal? Yeah. Perhaps 12 hours, perhaps 24. 24, Mr. Thurston. Uh, looks like we're going to be a little late. How is the storm now, Mr. Thurston? No sign of a let up yet, Denise. And the time? 6 a.m. And that transmitter goes on the air at eight tonight. We have only 14 hours left, Mr. Selston. Only 14 hours. Boy, listen to that thing outside. Isn't it ever going to stop? Doesn't look like it. Well, storm or no storm, I'm hungry. Must be time to eat lunch, eh, Mr. Thurston? Just about, Peg, huh? Just about. Well, I'd say the storm has finally quieted down enough for us to leave here, Mr. Updahl. If there were daylight hours ahead of us, I would quite agree, Professor Hartley. But why risk traveling in for dark? It's already five o'clock. Five o'clock? 
Only three hours left. I suppose it does not make any difference now. You could be wrong, Denise. Might I inquire as to what you are talking about, Herr Thurston? Mr. Reader, we might be talking about how long it's going to take me and Pagan to get back to Zermatt. Why, you're not serious. Well, after all, Updal's right. It's uh, practically suicide. Could be, Hartley. But you never know until you try. Come, Pagan, let's go. gives anyways, Mr. X. We've been wandering all over this mountain joint, and I don't even see hide of that Zermatt place. That's not surprising. We're on the Italian slope. The Italian slope? But what are we doing over here? There it is. Just ahead. Huh? You mean that old ramshack? It's a weather station. Why do we want to go there for? No lights or nothing, and nobody's home. Hey, go on. I have a hunch things will be different by 8 o'clock tonight. longer do we got to hide out in this closet, Mr. X? Just a few more minutes now. It's almost eight o'clock. Eight o'clock? You keep on talking like this was a radio station that was going on the air or something. Uh, you know, Pagan, you might be right. Huh? Hey. Hey, Mr. X. Yes. Someone came into the next room. But, but who? Why? Quiet. Hey, what was that? Generator's warming up. Generator? There's a shortwave transmitter in there, remember? Oh, that's right. But why does anybody want to... Attention, attention. Citizens of Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland. This is Radio Freedom. Mr. X, it's the Denise Cookie out there. Quiet. Attention, citizens of Bulgaria, Albania, Hungary. This is Radio Freedom bringing you the truth from free Europe. Bringing you the true story of what is actually happening behind the Iron Curtain. And tonight we ask you to listen more carefully than ever before. In just a moment, we are going to broadcast the most important message we have ever given to you. Hundreds of people and lives may depend upon it. So please listen most carefully. All right, Pagan, that's our cue. Never mind the rest of that message. You can stop right there. First... That's right. Sorry to interrupt your little broadcast, but you're all through. But that is Professor Hartley. Where did that Denise Cookie go? She was never here, Pega. But we heard her just like we did last night. There's a recording machine. They'd make records from actual radio freedom broadcasts and play them back over this transmitter. Made them sound legitimate. Then Hartley and his pals would follow it up with their own version of the news. So, Hartley, looks like your little game is over. Not yet, Thurston. Mr. Ray! Don't try it, Hartley. All right, Pagan. Let's get him down to a doctor. Then we can start back home. And now here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Ida Rees Merrin, pardon me, Ida Rees Merrin, Will Wright, Bill Johnstone, Tony Barrett, and Ben Wright. Next week in Casablanca, Ken runs into a combination of airfields, spy rings, booby traps, and broken necks that pile up more trouble for him than, uh, well, than Leon Velasco, who'll be along, of course, with Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. 
Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. The silvery rays of the full moon caress the sleeping city of Dar el Baida, the city known as Casablanca. But their light does not penetrate into the shadows of an almond scented courtyard off the street of a thousand delights. A courtyard that was designed to give solace to lovers, that was never meant to be employed for murder. This is far enough. No one will see us here. All right. Are you ready to talk now? You know what will happen to you if you insist on being stubborn. I said, are you ready to talk? All right, take care of him. Hit him again. Hit him again. Again. You hear talk. Give us the information we want, or we'll. Stay where you are. Mission arms. We must get out of here. Come on. Cameron? Yeah, that's right. Steve Cameron. You're employed by the Samson Construction Company? Yeah. I'm a material super on the airbase, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Any restricted or confidential papers go across your desk? Oh, well, sure. Boys in the Kremlin will get plenty to find out what I know. Why do you think those jokers were after me last night? Just what did happen last night, Cameron? Uh, same thing that's happened to plenty of Joes here in French Morocco. Too many drinks, beautiful dame, and comes the dawn. Where did you have the drinks? Uh, how's that joint in the Medina called the Sword of Allah? Who was the woman? A dancer there. Never did find out her name. <laughs> Wasn't too particular at the time. Well, who was the man you met? The one who gave you the beating? I don't know. I never saw him before. How much did you tell him? Nothing. How much, Cameron? Uh, look, mister, I'm not trying to make a case for myself. I know just what kind of a jerk I was last night, and there's no excuses. Okay. The one thing I'm not, and that's a traitor to my country. You can take it from that. Uh. Well, Ken? I've heard enough, Chief. Okay, Cameron, you can go. Well, thanks. Oh, hey, uh, one thing before I blow. You mind telling me what happened when the police closed in? The woman got away. The man was shot. Killed. Yeah, thanks. That helps a little. What do you think, Ken? It's not a new story, Chief. Cameron was right when he said the Kremlin would get plenty to learn about the air bases we're building here. Sure they would. And how are we going to stop them now? Hmm. You're thinking of Darrell McAllister? Yeah. Why the devil did he have to get killed? Mac was one of the best men the Bureau ever had. He knew the risk he was running when we sent him here to Casablanca to work his way into that spy ring. So he worked his way into it and got shot to death with the police for his pain. I know. But we've other things to think about now, Chief. Yeah, you're right. Five of the most top-secret military air bases in the world being built right here under the Atlantic Pact. As long as that spy ring's operating, the Kremlin might just as well have a front-row seat. How are we going to stop him, Ken? Mac Anderson managed to get into that ring. What's been done once can be done again. Hmm. You? Why not? Oh, you've got nothing to work on, Ken. Mac got a code report back to you, didn't he? Sure, but it didn't say anything. Just two words. Golden Camellia. And we know a dancer at the Sword of Arrow is mixed up in it. So what? Where do you go from there? That's, that's easy, Chief. To the Sword of Arrow. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. Petrov himself greets you at the Sword of Allah. Well, thanks, Petrov. How about a table and a bottle of stock? But of course, of course. Here. Here. The best table we have. You are satisfied, no? It'll do. The gentleman wishes for company at the table. Company? 
Petrov does not wish his guest to be lonely. Perhaps you'll see someone you would like to talk with. Perhaps the lovely Maida, eh? Maida? Who, who is, uh, she the dancer over there? <laughs> ah, you have noticed her already, no? But then Maida makes it rather difficult not to notice her. Does she not? <laughs> you got a point. Why are you interested in having her come to my table? <laughs> Petrov is always frank. He always tells you the truth. He believes that charms of Maida will change the gentleman's orders from stock to champagne. <laughs> is Petrov right? You win champagne. If Maida comes to my table. <laughs> I promise that she will, my friend. Petrov will send them both right over. Oh. Uh-huh. Um, Arms for the love of Allah. Arms for the unfortunate Effendi. Sure, glad to. Willing to settle for two bits, Pagan? You're kind, Effendi. Most... Pagan? <laughs> well, what, what kind of a strange name is this? It's even stranger when you tack Zellschmidt onto it. Mr. Thurston, how come you knew it was me anyway? Pagan, there's not a burnoose or fake beard in the world that can hide the dollar signs in your eyes. Huh? What the devil are you doing here, anyway? Well, it's, it's a long, sad story, Mr. X. The, the saddest part being that I'm broke. You wouldn't happen to have a spare 20 bucks until your next payday, eh? And if I have? Well, <laughs> being that I'm in a, such a financially embarrassed position, without funds, you understand. <laughs> what do you know about uh, golden camellias? <laughs> a cinch. I can tell you anything you want to know about. But what? Skip it. You sure you want the 20 bucks? <laughs> the Stalin won Berlin. Just pass it over, Mr. X. A 10 and two fives will be fine. Not so fast. You have to work for it. Work? Tell you about it later. We're going to have company. But, Mr. Th- Quiet. Good evening, Effendi. Petrov says you have been gracious enough to invite me to your table. That's right, Maida. <laughs> Might be nice of you to accept. <laughs> you bet, baby. You bet. <laughs> Sit down, Maida. The champagne will be right here. Yeah. Would it not be more pleasant... And more comfortable to become acquainted over champagne in Maida's dressing room. Uh, dressing room? Why? Sure, why not? <laughs> you bet. Come on. Uh, what are we waiting for? Uh, Hamid, how you want? Huh? The invitation was for one, not two. But baby... You heard the lady. But Mr. Oh, Fris- shut up. See you later. <laughs> but, but... Ah, how do you like that? Gives me the brush up just because... Because he's jealous of my accent. Yeah, and what's that Maida cookie got to be stuck up about? I've seen plenty better fish. Even if, they, even if they do call her the golden camellia? To our future friendship, Thurston Effendi? To the future, Maida. Hmm. So, why is it you wish to speak with Maida? You must have met lonely men before. I have met enough Effendi to know you are not one of them. A man like you does not seek companionship from a dancing girl in a place like the Sword of Allah. Then let's put it this way. There are five top-secret American air bases being built around here. I happen to know a lot about them. I can learn a lot more. And information like that should be worth plenty of money to somebody. I'm afraid I do not understand, Thurston Effendi... What has all this to do with me? I want to meet that somebody. And so you come to Maida. That's right. You have made a mistake, Effendi. I am but a simple dancing girl. I know nothing concerning of what you speak. That's not what Darrell McAllister said. McAllister? Yeah. What else did this McAllister tell you? He might have mentioned the words... Golden Camellia. Well... Come in, please. <laughs> hey, but of course, my dear Maida. Yeah, I should dearly love to join you in the estimable Mr. Thurston. Well, yeah, it's cozy this way, isn't it, Petrov? Much less strain on the ears. <laughs> yeah, you have wonderful sense of humor, Mr. Thurston. Wonderful. Yeah. As you so rightly surmised, I was listening to your conversation from the other room. I found it most interesting. So? As I understand that you wish to make contact with someone who is willing to purchase certain information. Is that correct? Well, if you heard us talking, you know the answer. Uh, true, quite true. Well, do you want to buy? Oh, my dear Thurston, I have not said that I was that person. Uh, well, if you're not, I'm wasting my time. Thanks for being interesting company, my uh, No, wait a second. Ah, do not be so impetuous, my dear comrade. It is quite possible you will be able to transact the business you have mentioned. 
All right. Where? When? Just off the Boulevard de la Guerre, one might find a curio shop. It is known as Tassinaris. Tassinaris. They sell and buy all kinds of objects art at Tassinaris. And if they are told that Petrov has recommended you, I'm certain you can do business there. Now, you know, Petrov, you're being pretty obliging. Maybe too obliging. <laughs> Am I? Yeah. Isn't it a little dangerous to give a stranger information like that? Dangerous, my dear Tester? No, no, not at all. You knew about my friend McAllister. You knew about Maida. And you know of the Golden Camellias. What is there to be afraid of? Maybe a double cross? You see that chair some ten feet from where I stand? The arm is quite thick, made of strong wood. Now, despite my more than ample bulk, I can reach that chair. In an instant. A little trick I learned in the Orient, my friend. When I brought the edge of my hand down upon the arm of that chair, it snapped like a dry twig. Or like a man's neck. Hmm. No, my dear comrade Dustin... Petrov is not afraid of anyone who might seek to double-cross him. <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. Okay, Petrov, thanks for the help. I'll let you know how I come out of Tassinaris. <laughs> well, my dear. I think you're a fool, Petrov. <laughs> you are as frank as you are beautiful, my dear. Why did you send him to Tassinaris? You know nothing about the man. Ah, but you are mistaken, my dear. You've investigated him. You know who he is? Of course. That's why I sent him to Tazinaris. And he is one of us? <laughs> one of us? No, Maida, my dear. He is not one of us. Mr. Tustin happens to be the man called X. <laughs> <laughs> We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Here is an urgent message for all ship's radio officers. The Federal Maritime Administration is calling all former Merchant Marine radio officers to come back to sea. Right now, scores of ships are riding at anchor, loaded and ready to sail. Their cargoes are vitally needed by our fighting forces and by our allies. Especially right now, the need for radio officers is acute. If you have had six months merchant marine radio operating experience since January 1935 on any kind of FCC license, the American Radio Association, CIO, will help you get an emergency license to ship out at once. You will earn more than $600 a month. Former radio men are urged to write, phone, or wire to the American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City which will put you in touch with the port office nearest your home. Or go now to the American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zeldschmidt. The United States is building five top-secret air bases in Casablanca. And Ken Thurston is trying to work his way into a spy ring that is known to be operating there. Now, accompanied by Pagon, he's looking for a curio shop recommended by Petrov, unaware that the suspected spy knows Ken is the man called X. Look, Mr. X, I- I've been following you all around this Casablanca joint, and I still haven't seen hide of that 20 smackers. You haven't done any work for it yet, Pagan. What's that got to do with it? You ought to see how my expenses are piling up. Wear and tear on my sandals, the laundry bills for this sheet I'm wearing. Uh, uh, hey, why did we stop in front of this old junk shop? This Tassinari's curio shop. We're going in. But there is no light on in there. Nobody's home. Let's try the door. Hmm. What do you know? Jones and Locke? Yeah. It's the second time tonight somebody's been very obliging. See? There's nobody in here, Mr. X. Nothing but statues and lamps and... and vases and vases. Let's try that back room. Ah, uh, so that's it. So what's it? <laughs> There's nothing in here but a row of iron sinks and a bunch of cameras and stuff. These cameras shoot microfilm, Pagan. Look here. This must be the last batch of stuff they were photographing. 
Hey, overstuffed silver dollars. They're silver medallions with a gold floral design on them. Golden camellias. Uh, I'll bet they're worth plenty. Hamster eggs? Yeah, for once, I think you're right. Well, <laughs> there are so many of them, I guess nobody will mind if I help myself to a couple of... Don't touch them! But, but I just wanted to take a look, Mr. Eggs. Hey. Hey, what's this wire doing hanging on at this one? Wire? Get down, Pagan. Huh? Watch it! Huh? Please let me through. You can take your time, Mister. There's no hurry. Camera. That's right. If you're looking for your sidekick, the Thurston guy, you don't have to go inside. He's not in Tussinari's. How do you know? I was just in there digging through the wreckage. There's no bodies. Cameron's right about that, Chief. I know, man, but Ken Thurston. Ken, what are the devils going on here? What happened? That'll wait, Chief. How'd you get mixed up in this, Cameron? I'm a funny kind of guy, Thurston. I don't like to be shoved around like I was last night. So I went back to the sword of Allah to have a few words with Maida. <laughs> Only you beat me to it. That still doesn't explain what you were doing here. That's simple. When Thurston and that phony Arab left to join, I followed him. Thought maybe I could be of some help. Well, they went inside Tyson Ari's and I waited outside. And boom! <laughs> what was it, anyway? A booby trap. Wired to the pin of a grenade. Saw it in time to drop down behind some heavy iron sinks in there. Uh, somebody's sure playing for keeps in this game, Thurston. How about uh, dealing me in on your side, huh? Thanks, Cameron, but you're already in. You boys build those air bases. We'll take care of this. Uh, you're the boss. If you need a couple of hard fists and don't care if a hard head goes with them, you find me at the materials depot. I remember that. Let's get to your car, Chief. Sure, Ken. phone message, Chief. Yeah, I got it all right, but a little too late to do any good. When I reached Tazanari's, I was sure you'd been blown to Zelspit. What happened to him? He's all right. I put him to work trying to run down some information about Tazanari. Well, what about that, Ken? What did you find inside that shop? It was part of their spy ring set up, where they did their microfilm work. And they had a booby trap set for you. Yeah. Rigged to some silver medallions with golden camellias embossed on them. Golden camellias again. What do they mean? I don't know, not yet. But one thing's for sure. That grenade was set to destroy all the microfilm equipment. Destroy the... Wait a minute. That sounds like they're through with it. Their job must be over. That's the way I figure it. Oh, but good Lord. They'll be heading out of Casablanca, taking everything they've learned with them. We've got to do something, Ken, fast. I was thinking of getting an autopsy report on the cause of Darrell McAllister's death. Autopsy on Mac? For Pete's sake, why? We know the police shot him when he and Maida were questioning Cameron. How's that going to help us clean up the spy ring? Maybe I'll be able to tell you more about that, Chief. After I've had a little talk with Petrov. <laughs> so you've come back to face Petrov once again, my friend. <laughs> you are a very brave man. Very brave. But uh, foolhardy, too. I'm glad you find it so amusing, Petro. But of course, my friend. You must be very desperate indeed if you've come back here now. I take it then that Tazinari did not wish to purchase your information. We can cut the double talk, Petro, if you know who I am. Does that mean you believe you know who I am, too? It's not too tough to guess at this stage of the game. So? You gave me a warning once, remember? <laughs> Quite well. On the edge of my hand, the broken arm of a chair... Snap like the back of a man's neck. <laughs> Dad, I remember giving you the warning. Well, I'm giving you one. You and your pals have 12 hours to turn over the microfilm to me. All the information you've managed to dig up on the airbase. So? You threaten me? You call me spy? Hmm. You're right, isn't it not rather foolhardy of you to do that here? In my own rooms at this sort of hour? You won't try anything here, Petro. And why not? Because you don't know if I brought any gendarmes with me. And you haven't time to check. And remember, Petrov, 
There are other things besides the edge of a hand that can break a man's neck. A rope from a gallows, for instance. Okay, Mr. X, there's been enough shilly-shallying about these 20 bucks. How's about forking over in the line? I want to talk to Tassinari first. Ha, it's already as good as dead. You sure you found him? Sure, I'm sure. Didn't I get the dope straight from my cousin Abdul? He knows all the crooks in Casablanca. No, not a Zelshman. Well, you know how it is, Mr. X. <laughs> there's always a black sheep in every family skeleton. Hmm. Now, there's the joint where that Tassinari Joker works. It is a timekeeper's shack. Yeah. On the airbase construction job. Pretty screwy, eh, Mr. X? Why would a character running a brick a brick store want to work out here, too? Suppose we hear what he's got to say about it. Mr. X! He came from the time shack. Come on. Ooh, ooh. Oh, oh, Mr. Thurston. Yeah. Looks like we're not going to talk to Tassinari. But, but there's nobody else here. There's a door leading out the back. Oh, that's right. But why did anybody shoot him anyways? Maybe this is the answer. Huh. A broken silver chain? Yeah. The kind you could hang a medallion from. You mean somebody was after one of those, of those big, thick, golden camellia things and... And shot him for it? He wasn't shot. He wasn't? Oh, but we heard it. There's a gun on the floor over there. He must have tried to shoot whoever killed him. But but that don't make no sense, Mr. X. How did he get bumped off then? Look at his neck. Broken. So Tassinari's dead, too. That's right, Chief. Ken, what the devil's this all about? Who's behind it all? Petrov? Maida? Have you got that autopsy re report on Mechanitor's death yet? Sure, sure I have. Here it is, Ken. But I still don't see what good this is going to do us. That depends, Chief. On what? On whether he died from a police bullet or if his neck was broken. <laughs> First, Nifendi. That's right. I see you're packing. You going somewhere? And if I am? I was hoping you could explain a few things to me. For instance? What this medallion is doing there on your dresser. The medallion? <laughs> Why should it not be there? I have a dozen of the little lockets lying around. All with the embossed golden camellia? Of course. It is what you call my trademark. I give them away as favors. Then you don't mind my keeping this one? Why, uh, no. No, I do not mind. Though I'm a bit disappointed. Why? You ask only for a trinket. Are there no other favors you would rather ask of my either? No, I'll settle for this, thanks. A little more practical. What do you mean? Did you know that these things can be opened, my either, By twisting them apart? No, Fendi. You see? Two halves, hollow. And inside them, this... Okay, Thurston, you can drop that microfilm now. Oh, Steve. Hello, Cameron. I was wondering when you'd show up. You found out. Drop it. Sure. Get it, Maida. I have it, Steve. Good. Now get to the door and don't walk in the line of fire. Do not worry, Steve. I will not interrupt the proceedings. So you figured it out, Thurston. Well, you helped, Cameron. Yeah? How? Oh, you said you didn't know Maida's name and then you mentioned it later. And there was your story about Maida and McAllister trying to get information out of you. Well, it sounded legit to me. Except for one thing. The police didn't kill him. His neck was broken. Yeah, uh, what'd that tell you? That the two of you were really questioning him, trying to find out who he was, how much he knew. And when the police closed in, you shut him up for good. By breaking his neck? <laughs> Petrov's the lad who uses judo. He hasn't got a monopoly on it. 
Castanari could prove that, too, if he were able to talk. What did he try to do? Double cross you? Get away with the film himself? Yeah. He learned it didn't pay. It's like you're going to learn it doesn't pay to buck up against me. Open the door to the corridor, Maida. Of course, Steve. Now, take this gun. Stand guard outside. The gun, Take Steve? it and get out. But, Steve, Get I... out! Very well, as you wish. All right, Thurston. Now it's time for a little lesson in judo. Okay, Cameron, start teaching. But you'll have to do it in the dark. <laughs> okay, Thurston. So you smashed the lamp. As soon as my eyes get used to the dark, I'll find you easily enough. <laughs> Okay, so it wasn't you. The room's not too big. I move as quietly as you can. Can't get away, Thurston. I'm coming after you. I tell you, you can't get away, Thurston. Now! Now! Where are you? Where are you? Where? Ken! Ken! What's going on in there, Ken? Ken, are you all right? Ken, open the door! Kenny, you're all right. Ken, what the devil... Good Lord. That's all right, Chief. Cameron's inside here. Cameron? Yeah, he's the big wheel. What about my my eater and Petrov? We've got him. The microfilm, too. But Ken, what in blazes went on in here? A little judo lesson. What? Yeah. You know something? Sometimes the best defense against judo is a good hard right to the jaw. But why did you arrest it? You knew we were waiting out here. Why risk your neck like that? Cameron needed a lesson, Chief. For Darrell McAllister's sake and all the others. He thought he could fight the world. Guns. Trickery. Well, he learned it couldn't be done. Learned it the hard way. Let's hope we don't have to teach his bosses the hard way, too. Here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lillian Bayef, Will Wright, Bill Conrad, and Lamont Johnson. There's a new and very dirty racket in this country that you and everybody you know ought to be wised up to. And next week, Ken Thurston really tangles with it. Of course, where there's a racket, you'll find uh, Leon Belasco with Pagon Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return at The Man Called X. Good night. <laughs> Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. Ken? 
That's right. Who's that? Bill Thompson. Bill! Bill! Good to hear from you. When did you get back from Korea? How did you know I was in San Francisco? That's not important now, Ken. Oh? What is? I'm in a mess, and I don't know what to do. Can you get over to my house right away? Sure. But what's the trouble, Bill? I'm right up to my neck in the filthiest game that's ever been played. It's a job for you and the Bureau. The dirtiest racket... <laughs> Mr. Thurston, that's exactly what happened. I didn't even know Bill had come home yet. I was in the living room with Mr. Connors here waiting for him. We heard the shots in the den. We rushed in and we found him. Easy, Nancy, easy. <laughs> Any idea why he was killed, Mrs. Thompson? No, Mr. Thurston, I swear. There was no reason, Thurston. There couldn't have been. Bill Thompson didn't have an enemy in the world. Jim's right. It just doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. Bill just back from Korea, a wonderful new job. We were so happy. And then this... What was this new job? Well, he, he was working for a man named Weaver. George Weaver. Selling stocks and bonds. That's right. Weaver Investment Company. They put Bill on as a customer's man. Paid him a healthy salary plus commission. It was a good deal. You must have been pretty close to Bill to know all these things about him, Connors. I was. Did you work with him at Weaver's? No. We got to know each other pretty well between Pusan and Heartbreak Ridge. So he gets through all that and then comes home to... to this. Yeah. Well, thanks for your trouble, Mrs. Thompson. I won't bother you anymore right now. Well, what are you going to do now, Mr. Thurston? Try to answer a couple of your questions. My questions? Who killed your husband? And why? Y'all looking for someone? I'd like to see Mr. Weaver. Well, I hate to disappoint you, honey, but that jolly little old rascal just ain't in now. When do you expect him? It's kind of hard to say. He don't hardly ever keep what you might call regular office hours. I'm Mary Jane. Mary Jane Walters, that is. Can't I do something for you? Uh, maybe you can, Miss Walters. I'm looking for some information about investments. Tell me, what kind of securities do you handle here? Why, nothing but the best, honey. Stocks and bonds and and things like that. Did you want it? Well, now, for heaven's sake, what you all expect that is? Mice in the wall? Oh, sure. Take them. Much as I hate to do it. Here. Let me get that gag out of it. There you are. Boy, that's better. Here you go. What the devil's going on here? What happened to you? It was the dame that did it, Mr. Thurston. What dame? The one standing in back of you with, with that gun in her hand. Gun in her... Oh! Oh! Now you went and done it to Mr. Thurston, too. Well, sure enough, sugar, I reckon I did. So as I can get on about my business. What kind of business? Why, well, I got a little old job to do, sugar. Murder. <laughs> What are you doing with those ropes anyways, Mr. X? I'll be rid of them in a minute. Your girlfriend's handier with a gun than she is with knots. Uh, that female any joke ain't no friend of mine, Mr. X. Then maybe you'd better explain what you're doing here. Uh, Cinch, you didn't want my invaluable assistance here in San Francisco, so when I bumped into that, that Bill Thompson friend of yours, I took a job with him. Bill Thompson? So that's how he knew I was in town. Oh, Sure. Anyway, he asked me to watch the, the office here for him uh, to let him know when that Mr. Weaver showed up. When did he show up? He didn't. Nobody but that Mary Jane Cookie. And when I made a pass at her, <laughs> I, I, I mean, when, when I asked her what she wanted, uh, she conked me. Uh, all right, Pigon. Let me get your ropes off. You've got work to do. Work? What kind of work? Finding Mary Jane Waters. Finding George Weaver. Maybe finding murder. Well, 
Well, that George Weaver ain't home, Mr. X. So let's go. So get out your knife and pick the lock. Oh, Mr. X, what kind of talk is this? Go on, open it. Okay, okay, okay. You know, but this is this is against the law or something. So is murder. <laughs> now what? You go in. See? What did I tell you? Uh, nobody home. Take another look. <gasps> Mr. X. Yeah. Who? Who is it then? It was George Beaver. That's my guess. Y'all know something, <laughs> honey? You're right. Well, so we meet again, Miss Walters. Why'd you kill him? Now, honey, laugh. Y'all don't really believe that I'd do anything like that, do you? I found him like that when I came here to collect the money. What money? Why, the money y'all and Mr. Weaver stole off in my poor widowed sister. Now, suppose you tell us just how we stole that money, Miss Walters. Y'all know right enough. Sending her that check after her husband, Charlie, got killed in Korea. Using it as a come on so she trusts you with the rest of her money. Uh, let me get this straight. After your sister learned that her husband had been killed in Korea, she got a check from the Weaver outfit. Is that it? You know it. Telling her it was some dividends on some investments he'd made before going overseas. Had he invested money with Weaver? Well, the check sure looked like it. And Bill Thompson said so, too. Thompson? That's right. Showed up a couple of days later. Dished out a smooth line about how her husband wanted to set her up financially with more investments in case he was killed. Only he didn't have time before he shipped out. Ah, uh, the old story. Mailing a fake dividend check to a widow as a come on so they could sell her a lot of phony stock. That's what happened, all right. Uh, Thompson and Weaver walked right off with the $10,000 she got from a GI insurance. Filthiest racket in the world. Robbing the widows of men killed in Korea. Stealing their last cent of insurance. Hey, uh, <laughs> I always thought that friend of yours, Bill Thompson, was a, such a nice guy. He wasn't in on it. Oh, but you just, she just said... They that... must have been using him. Front man. When he found out what was going on, he called me on the phone, and they killed him before he had a chance to talk. <laughs> Who killed him? Weaver? Weaver's dead. No, there was somebody else mixed up in this. Mr. Big. And until we get him, or her, well, we haven't stopped this dirty con game yet. Then what you all fixing to do now? I don't know, Miss Walters. I just don't know. What worked in San Francisco can work anywhere in the country, Chief. Lest we put a stop to it. Well, maybe you're right. We'll see what we can turn up. Meanwhile, what about you? Stymied right now, aren't you? Not quite, Chief. I've still got a... Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Thurston, but there's another call on your line. An emergency call the party's in. Okay, I'll take it. Talk to you later, Chief. Right, Ken. So long. Here's your party. Go ahead, please. Thanks. Hello? Mr. Thurston, this is Mary Jane Walters. Can you get up to my sister's house right away? What's up, Miss Walters? Some man's been up there threatening her. Better come right away before you find yourself with another dead corpse on your hands. Mountain roads. Fog thicker than... Than my cousin's Grisha's head. I, is this trip really necessary, Mr. X? Why do you suppose we're making it, Pagan? But I can't even hardly see what, we're, what you're driving. Nothing but that white fog in front. We could drive right, right off the mountain and not even... You, you see what I mean? We won't even know when we'll get to the joint. Mary Jane said her sister's place has fog lanterns at either side of the driveway. We'll spot them easily enough. Oh, sure. Where are my eyes out looking for lights? And for what? Maybe just to run into somebody else with guns. Oh, quiet. Keep your eyes peeled. And... Yep. There are the lights now. So what? So we drive between them, park the car, and see what's up with Mary Jane's sister. Hey, Mr. Rex, this ain't no driver. That's a cliff. A cliff! Hang on, Peter. Hang We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Because of the increased birth rate during and since the war, an extra seven million children are going to be seeking an education. 
Right now, there are not enough classrooms or equipment or books, and above all, there aren't enough teachers. America will need almost a quarter million more elementary school teachers within the next seven years. This is to take care of the extra enrollment alone. It is over and above the hundreds of thousands of young teachers who will be required to fill normal vacancies. Today, more than ever before, teaching offers an attractive career for intelligent, imaginative young men and women who are attending college or high school. Teacher training courses are available to you students who wish to prepare yourselves. And millions of youngsters will be waiting for your services. The need for teachers has never been greater. The opportunities have never been finer. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zelschmidt. The brutal murder of his friend Bill Thompson served as Ken's introduction to a vicious swindling racket, one whose victims are the widows of soldiers who have died fighting in Korea. Ken learns that one of those victims has been threatened, and he and Pagon drive through a blinding fog to her mountain home. But as the car turns in between two fog lanterns supposedly marking the driveway, the road ends abruptly with a steep cliff, and before the car can be stopped, it lurches off the road. Take on, you're right. All right, he says. Drives yeah. me over a cliff on top of a mountain. He wants to know if I'm all right. Well, that answers the question. And we didn't go over any cliff. Huh? Oh, well, then, you did see it. We only wound up in a ditch. Come on. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Boy. Oh, look at the drop of Mr. X. Another couple of feet. Yeah. Oh, oh. What happened to the driveway, anyways? It's over there. Over there? But those fog lanterns said this was the place. How, how did the driveway get moved? It didn't. Somebody moved the lanterns. Easy as that. Oh, that's ridiculous. They could kill people like that. H- having them drive right over the... Right over the... Oh, Mr. X. <laughs> sister can't tell you nothing about those lanterns, Mr. Thurston. She just ain't here. Then uh, what can you tell me about them, Mary Jane? Or you, Connors? Well, you can't prove anything by me, Thurston. The lanterns were beside the driveway when I drove up here. How long ago was that? About a half hour ago. Ah, just driving around in the fog? Or do you make it a habit to look up the widows of soldiers killed overseas? Are you accusing me of something, Thurston? I'm looking for an explanation, Connors. Now, there's no need for the two of you to get all riled up this way. I can explain everything. That'll be refreshing. My sister was too scared by those threats she got to stay around here. She left for the airport, heading back to dear old Georgia. So you waited for me instead? That's right. And Connors? Miss Wallace called Nancy Thompson to see if she'd been threatened, too. And to get your hotel number. I was there at the time and decided to drive out here to see if I could be of any help. Huh. Well... I trust you're all satisfied now, Mr. Thurston. About everything but the lanterns and those threats your sister got. Oh, there. Some dirty old skunk called her up on the telephone. Told her to keep her pretty mouth shut about her insurance money being taken or else. A man or a woman? Well, now, it might have been a man. Then again, it might have been a woman. My sister wasn't any too clear about that. There doesn't seem to be anything too clear about this whole setup. Well, as I can tell, Thurston, you're just running around in circles. If I am, Connors, I'm bound to wind up back where I started. With Bill Thompson. And his widow. You know, I'm certain that I'm right, Mr. Thurston. There just wasn't anybody connected with the firm Bill worked for except Mr. Weaver. Hmm. Tell me, Nancy, how did Bill get into the investment business with him? Oh, he met him at a veterans organization. You see, Mr. Weaver was interested in Bill's former outfit. And then from then on, well, the next thing we knew, Bill was working for him. Uh-huh. It seemed like such a wonderful break for us at the time. And Bill was so pleased with the idea of being able to do something for the families of his buddies. Then it all turned into this, this horrible nightmare. Wait a minute. Were most of Bill's customers the widows of men who'd served with him overseas? Well, Yes. 
Well, what an idiot I was for not... Thanks, Nancy. Thanks? For what? Straightening out a circle for me. Why, sure, Ken. I'll get you a complete list of all the casualties in Bill Thompson's outfit, but what the devil you want it for? Suppose you bring it out here in person, Chief, and I'll show you. That's right, Mrs. Richards. If you get any dividend checks in the mail, any phone calls or personal visits, please call me. You'll save yourself a lot of money and grief. That's right. And thanks for your time. Goodbye. Well, that's it, Chief. The last of them. You've left that same message with every woman whose son or husband was killed in Bill Thompson's outfit overseas? Well, everyone in the Bay Area, yes. Okay. Then where do we go from here? We don't, Chief. What? We wait. What for? For the person we're after to make the next move. Hello? Yes, of course I do, Mrs. Carson. It came in the mail this morning. I see. Good. Thanks for letting us know. We'll be right over. How about it, Ken? Is that it? It is, Chief. Uh, Mrs. Saul Carson got a dividend check in the mail this morning. Who was it from? An outfit called the Thornburg Security Company. Never heard of them. No. But they're going to hear plenty from us. Everything's okay, Mr. X. I got this little dingo's attached to behind that, uh, what you may call it. Good, Pagan. What about you, Chief? Here, we got it. There. All set here, Ken. Uh, this room's really wired for sound. Those microphones will pick up every whisper. Good. How do you feel about it, Nancy? Better to go ahead? You know I am, Mr. Thurston. There's nothing I wouldn't do to get the man responsible for Bill's death. That's one of the reasons I asked you to play the part of Mrs. Carson in the first place. Yes, I know. Well, what happens now? The man from the Thornburg security outfit made an appointment with Mrs. Carson over the phone for ten this morning. Mm-hmm. When he gets here, you're Mrs. Carson. I see. Play along with him. Let him sell you on investing with him. He'll arrange another appointment to take money from you. And you'll be recording it all in the next room? Every word. And when he shows up the second time? You'll give him the money. Ten thousand dollars in marked bills. And then? We close in. <laughs> same time, Mrs. Carson. You will have the money ready in cash? Oh, yes, I'll have it ready, Mr. Thornburg. And thank you. Believe me, you'll never regret it. I know it'll turn out the way your husband wanted it. Yes, I- I'm sure of that, Mr. Thornburg. Bye. That's it, Ken. Act one. Yeah. Tomorrow. Act two. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Carson. And this is one investment you'll thank me for the rest of your life. I, I hope you're right, Mr. Thornburg. It's my insurance money. That's every cent I have in the world. Okay, Ken. We've got him. Let's right, move in. Mrs. Hold it, Chief. What for? He's taking the money. We've got the whole thing recorded. All, what do you want to wait for? I want him to get away. Well, but Ken... No, no, please do as I say, Chief. No by the time we're through, we'll wind this thing up for good. <laughs> Thornburg character isn't wasting any time getting wherever he's going, eh, Mr. X? And where's he going anyways? To pay off $10,000 to his boss. Hey, who's his boss? We'll find that out when we get there. Yank, yank! You mean if we ever get there? Trailing that character up this mountain road ain't any joke. Take it easy. He's turning off the road now. Hey, that's right. He's going into that driver with the lanterns hung on the side. Lanterns! Mr. X! Yeah. We've been there before, Pagan. He 
Eight hundred. Nine hundred. A thousand. There it is. Ten thousand dollars. Cash. Mrs. Saul Carson was a pushover. Yeah. Okay. All right, here's your cut. Thanks. Well, where do we go next? And whoever it is, I hope she's as easy a mark as that little brunette. Brunette? What brunette? Well, Mrs. Carson. If I ever saw a luscious, dark-haired baby, she was... Wait a minute, Thornbury. Are you telling me Mrs. Carson's a brunette? Well, sure. With blue eyes? Prettiest shade of blue you ever saw. Nancy Thompson. What? Saul Carson's wife was a blonde. That easy mark he used was Bill Thompson's widow. Come on, we gotta get out of here. Hey, wait a minute. I, I don't get it, Jim. What's this all about? Time for explanations later, Thornberg. Mark Thurston! That's right. Looks like your racket's over, Connors. Oh, you did straighten out that circle. Sure, with Nancy's help. She's the one who tipped me off about your sucker list. They were really pushers up for your con game. Hey, but where does that cute cookie Mary Jane fit in, Mr. Thurston? She doesn't, Pega. But, but this is her sister's home. Connors must have talked with her letting him use it. Thought it might be safer headquarters for him when I was around. It's still safe, Thurston. Don't try it, Connors. <laughs> Hold it there. You too, Thornburg. Okay, okay. All right. All right, Thurston, you win. Oh, boy, didn't you really give it to him, Mr. X? That's all that no good deserves. No. No, you can't. I got a right to trial. To the protection of the courts. Did you give Bill Thompson a trial? Did you rob the widows of your own buddies in the, in the courts? Their husbands died to preserve the rights you're trying to crawl by now. And you holler for justice. Ah, okay, Connors. You'll get what's coming to you. The American way. Due process of law. And now, here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Gene Tatum, Lillian Bayef, Will Wright, Paul Fees, and Byron Kane. The title of next week's show is The Clicking Buddha. Sounds almost cute, doesn't it? But the Clicking Buddha holds one of the most insidious weapons of destruction ever devised. Oh, and uh, Leon Belasque will be along as usual as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> Called X, starring Herbert Marshall as a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents in this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. The call came in to occupation headquarters in the Daiichi building, Tokyo, shortly before midnight. Army intelligence was immediately informed, and within a matter of minutes, the coding machines started clicking out their message for the State Department in Washington. Military police discovered body of man in Meiji Park. Cause of death unknown. Preliminary investigation indicates identity as that of missing bureau agent Ken Thurston. Please advise. Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks. Yes, sir? Have you got through to Tokyo yet? No, sir, not yet. We're still trying, but the was... I don't care how busy they are. I've got to talk to them. Now get me some action. Fast. Yes, sir. I'll try immediately. 
suppose it had to happen someday. <coughs> Ken Thurston. <coughs> now, All Mr. the Chief. dirty, rotten things to... All right, <laughs> Zellspit, what do you want? <laughs> I just wanted to tell you something, something very important about the late, dear departed Mr. Thurston. Well? As something I'm sure you never realized, Mr. Chief. What's that? I, I happen to be his one and only heir. What? Well, that's right, that's right. So many times he told me, Pagan had told me, when I go, I, I wish to leave everything to you. Now, wait a Unfortunately, minute. Unfortunately, I don't know where all his assets are. <laughs> but, uh, but if you would help me to locate them for a slight consideration, of course. <laughs> Zell Schmidt, mm -hmm. you're the most hypocritical, unscrupulous, iniquitous... But, but, but uh, just out of my office. Yes? Hello? You sound dyspeptic, Chief. What the devil business did about... Ken. Huh? That's right. Ken. But it can't be. The report of your death. <coughs> for <coughs> Colonel Brandt of G2. <coughs> oh, it's a slight mix-up in identity. Yeah. The dead man was wearing a raincoat I'd lent him a couple of weeks ago. My name was on the label. Well, I'm sorry for him, whoever he was, but... Well, I'm sure glad to hear you, Ken. Thanks, Chief. But where the devil have you been this last week? No word from you? Then that report? I, I was behind the red lines in Korea, checking on some... Oh, but that's not important now. Oh? What is? I want you to send Pagon out here right away with everything we've got in the files on Professor Charles Reynolds. Professor Reynolds? The expert on atomic radiation? That's right. You remember him? Oh, of course. The last I heard, he was working on a defense against the A-bomb, an antidote for the deadly radiation, trying to find a way to avoid certain death from overexposure to radioactive uh, materials. Yeah. You know what it means if we could have such a cure? And I think he was darn close to finding it. Well... But what's all that got to do with you in Tokyo? The man who borrowed my raincoat was Professor Reynolds. Murdered? They haven't diagnosed the cause of death yet. Hmm. Was he working in Tokyo on that antidote for radiation poisoning? That's right. With Professor Kurosudo. And if he found it, and some foreign agent had learned about it... Yeah, yeah. I'll send Zellschmidt with those files over on the first plane. Where'll he find you? Have him try Suma Ido... Hospital. Suma Ido Hospital. Yes. Reynolds joined the research staff there just a week before he died. Good afternoon, sir. Is there something I could do for you? I'd like to see Dr. Stephen Allister, please. My name's Ken Thurston. Dr. Allister is occupied at the moment. I am Nastya Karpovna, his assistant. Could I help you? I'm afraid not, Miss Karpovna, unless you happen to know the result of the autopsy on Professor Reynolds. I see. I am afraid that the information you seek is confidential, Mr. Thurston. By whose orders? Intelligence. It would be necessary for you to obtain clearance from them. Yeah. Will this do, Miss Karpovna? May I see hmm? that, please? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Everything appears to be in order. I believe you may speak with Dr. Alistair. I, I will see if he is free. Well, thanks. Pretty cautious about things around here, aren't you? If we are, it is with reason, Mr. Thurston. Oh, what reason? Hello, Dr. Alistair? There is a gentleman here who wishes to see you. His name is Ken Thurston. It is regarding Professor Reynolds' death. Yes, that is quite right. Very well, Doctor. Thank you. You may go in. The second door to the right. Thanks. You still haven't answered my question. Concerning what? Why you're so touchy about the subject of Professor Reynolds. You will find Dr. Alistair in the laboratory. Second door to the right. Nastaya said you were here about poor Reynolds. Is that right, Thurston? It is, Doctor. What can you tell me about him? I presume you have proper official approval and all that. Nastaya would never have let you in otherwise. Excellent girl, all business, no nonsense. Yeah, I noticed that. Reynolds did too, quite taken by her ability. Matter of fact, they spent more time working on his experiments than she did on mine. Those experiments of his, Doctor, they concern the effects of radiation and how to counteract them, eh? Oh, you're familiar with that, eh? Yes, quite right. Reynolds had a theory that the lethal effect of overexposure to deadly radiation could be stopped completely. His goal was a compound that could be given hypodermically. A pretty radical concept, wasn't it? In my opinion, yes. And I can assure you he hadn't got anywhere. Hadn't found an antidote for radiation poisoning. 
What makes you so certain about that, Dr. Aniston? The autopsy report on his death, Thurston. Professor Reynolds died from overexposure to some radioactive material. Something pretty important must be going on here in Tokyo, eh, Mr. X? All this dope on that Professor Reynolds, names and dates and stuff. Pagan, those letters printed on the outside of that file spell secret and confidential. (laughs) Well, it was a long trip on the plane, Mr. X, and I I didn't have nothing to do, and... uh, uh, What are we stopping here for? It's where Professor Reynolds lived. Come on. Hey, what's that black box-type box you're carrying? A Geiger counter. It is? What do you want to, to count Geigers for? It's an instrument for detecting radioactive material, you idiot. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> I knew it all the time, Mr. Thurston. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> mm. No, nobody home, Mr. X. But I'd be happy to see if I could uh, pick that lock open for you. For a slight consideration, of course. <laughs> hey, where did you get that key? It was Reynolds. Intelligence department gave it to me. Oh, what a dirty trick. Boy, look at all this joint. What happened here, anyways? Somebody must have been looking for something. Like what? Maybe a formula to prevent death from radiation. What? Let's look around. Hey, I- I'm hearing a funny noise, Mr. X. It's this Geiger counter. There's some kind of radioactive material around, but it's not in this room. Let's try the bedroom. Yeah, it's in here, all right. Sounds like it might be... Sure, the bed. Pull off the bed clothes, Pagan, and the mattress. Huh? Pull them off. Oh, sure, sure. So they're off, so what? Look there, at the bed spring. Hey... Hey, there's something tied to it. See? That little metal packet. Don't touch it. <laughs> That's what killed Professor Reynolds. That little thing? That little thing is a hospital capsule of radium. Radium? A night or two of sleeping in that bed exposed to those rays would be enough to kill an elephant. You mean Professor Reynolds was murdered? Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, it's only the phone. Hello? Do I have the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Ken Thurston? That's right. Who's that? My name is of little import, Mr. Thurston. If you have determined the case of Professor Reynolds' untimely death... And if I have? Then perhaps you will be interested to learn that, in a manner of speaking, Professor Reynolds is still alive. Alive? What the devil are you talking about? Who are you? The answer to all that you seek lies in the clicking... Buddha, Mr. Thurston. Clicking Buddha? I shall be happy to turn it over to you if you will but call... Hello? What's happened there? Hello? The Buddha, Mr. Thurston, it was... Hello, what's going on there? Hello, hello? We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Here is an urgent message for all ship's radio officers. The Federal Maritime Administration is calling all former merchant marine radio officers to come back to sea. Right now, scores of ships are riding at anchor, loaded and ready to sail. Their cargoes are vitally needed by our fighting forces and by our allies. Especially right now, the need for radio officers is acute. If you have had six months merchant marine radio operating experience since January of 1935 on any kind of FCC license, the American Radio Association CIO will help you get an emergency license to ship out at once. You will earn more than $600 a month. Former radio men are urged to write phone or wire to the American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City, which will put you in touch with the port office nearest your home. Or go now to the American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City. Now, Act 
two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. When Professor Reynolds, working on a cure for the deadly effect of atomic radiation, was found dead in Tokyo, Ken Thurston suspected that some other country was after the professor's formula. And now, Ken is at the Suma Ito Hospital talking with Dr. Stephen Allister. If what you say is true, Thurston, then Reynolds was deliberately murdered. That's right, Doctor. But who could have had the means, the opportunity to murder Reynolds in that bizarre fashion? I thought you might be able to tell me. I? Yeah, you've got radium here at the hospital, haven't you? Naturally. But so have every other major hospital in Tokyo. Yeah, I know, but Professor Reynolds wasn't conducting his experiments at other hospitals. Yes, that's a point. Nastaya, my dear, would you mind coming into the laboratory for a moment? Thank you. Nastaya has charge of the vault where we keep all the radioactive material. She should be able to give us a check on whether radium from here was used as the uh, deadly weapon. You wish to see me, Dr. Alistair? Come in, my dear, come in. Yes. Tell me, Nastaya, is there any radium missing from the hospital supply? Missing radium? Hardly, Dr. Alistair. No sure of that? Perhaps you would like to check our supply vault personally, Mr. Thurston? If you don't mind. Of course not. I will wait for you in my office. I'm afraid we've hurt the poor girl's feelings, Thurston. But I'm certain that one result of all this will be pleasing to me. What's that? Removing Sumaido Hospital and its staff from your list of, shall we say, suspects. You'll have to be a lot more cooperative to make me believe that, Doctor. You're joking, of course. I've been waiting for you to mention the one man who really knew about Reynolds' formula. Professor Kurosudo. Kurosudo? Yeah, the man who was working with Reynolds on his experiments. Well, you're certainly thorough enough, Thurston. How'd you know about Kurosudo? I've done some checking. But what's more important is why you didn't mention him. I wish to protect the hospital from any further notoriety. How does that figure? Professor Kurosudo is missing. And has been ever since the night Reynolds was found dead. in which we keep our radioactive materials is down here in the basement. I trust that you do not mind the inconvenience. Pretty dark in here, isn't it? Easily remedied, Mr. Thurston. There is the vault. Do you wish to make the check by yourself? Oh, I don't mind you making it with me. As you wish. You see, we take no chances on... Losing any precious radioactive materials. You don't take any chances on accidents from radiation leakage, either. No. The entire vault is made of lead. And the Geiger count in the wall gives immediate warning of any exposure. Yet, for example, if I should open this drawer containing radioactive iron... Mm, yeah, thanks for the demonstration, but it's the radium I'm interested in, remember? Yes, of course. It's in that drawer at the back of the... <gasps> the lights! They have gone out! Yes, Accidentally or with malice of forethought. There is an emergency switch just outside the vault. I, I will have them on again in a minute. <laughs> Nastaya! What happened out there? Nastaya! Oh, if I don't find the lights. Ah. I don't care how busy Mr. Thurston is. I'm going to talk to him right away, even sooner, maybe. You're right, Mr. Zeltschmidt. He'll be more than interested in the radium he left you to guard at Professor Reynolds. You're certain that it's gone? Certain, I'm certain. And you didn't see who attacked you? Well, believe me, I didn't see nothing but stars. Now, there's Mr. <gasps> Nastaya! Oh, oh. Nastaya, what oh. happened here? Lights went out. Somebody took hold of me. I 
Must have fainted. Thurston, where is he? In the vault. Vault? Good Lord. The radium drawer's open. Somebody's... Give me a hand, Zell Schmidt. We've got to get him out of here fast. Of Professor Reynolds' house is missing. That's right, Mr. Thurston, but but it wasn't my fault, honest. No, no, of course not. And I imagine your radium inventory is right up to snuff, Alistair. It is, Thurston. I just checked it. Of course, we don't know whether it was that way when you entered the vault or was replaced while you were unconscious. Yeah. So where does it all this put us anyway, Mr. Thurston? Simple, Pagan. Right back where we started. <laughs> Now, Mr. Thurston? That's right. Now, this is Colonel Brandt, intelligence. Oh, yes, Colonel. What do you have for me? Well, we finally traced that phone call, the one you received at Professor Reynolds' apartment. Good. Where'd it come from? A small cottage out in the suburbs on Matsuma Road, 183. 183 Matsuma Road. That's right, Mr. Thurston. Oh, uh, by the way, you want some of my men out there with you? Not this time, Colonel. If I find what I think I'll find, it's already too late. I don't get it, Mr. X. There is nobody home at this cottage joint. What are we wasting time for? I'm looking for something, Pago. Uh, like what, for instance? Oh, a cure for deadly radiation. Professor Kurosudo. A clicking Buddha. What? It must have been Kurosudo who called me on the phone. And he mentioned a clicking Buddha. So I'm looking for... Yeah, that's right. Right about what? Look at this. What, the dead little shelf in the wall? Yeah, some of the Japanese keep their household gods on them. But it's empty. There's nothing on it but, but dust. That clean ring in the dust says it hasn't been empty long. And a miniature statue of Buddha, a couple of inches high, would just fit in there. <laughs> so what? Uh... So I've got one of the answers I'm looking for. Now, if I can not... Mr. Rex. Came from that closet. Come on. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh, Mister, oh, Mister Ace, he's all shot full of holes. Yes. Oh, who was he, Mister Thurston? Answer number two, Professor Kurosudo. I presume that there is some legitimate reason for forcing us to attend this. It's meeting, Colonel Brandt. No one forced you, Miss Kapovna. It's merely a request. Request? I'm afraid I feel the same way about it that Nastaya does, Colonel. We've had enough interruptions lately to our work at the hospital. Well, it's unfortunate that you feel that way about it, Dr. Alistair, but it couldn't be helped. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Colonel, and you, Nastaya. Dr. Alistair? I might have known you would be involved in this, Mr. Thurston. We're all involved in it, Nastaya. The entire world. Professor Reynolds' formula? That's right, Doctor. We all know that he and Kurosudo were working on a treatment for atomic radiation. Somebody wanted his formula and killed him to get it. Only the formula wasn't found. What makes you think the killer didn't get the formula from Reynolds? Because Kurosudo had it. But unfortunately, he was tracked down, killed, and then the formula taken. And the killer happens to be in this room. Mr. Thurston, you're making a very serious accusation. I hope you've got the proof to go with it. I don't need any proof, Colonel. The killer's death warrant has been signed by Reynolds and Kurosudo. That doesn't make much sense, Thurston. Those men were radiation experts. They had a top-secret formula. Doesn't it make sense that they protect it? Protect it? But how? Simply by putting the formula in a radioactive hiding place. Radioactive? Sure, by exposing the hiding place to radium. Then whoever stole the formula would be carrying death around with him without knowing it. But... You said the killer was in this room. Then, oh... That's right, Pastaya. There's certain death from radiation staring one of us in the face. You still haven't proved anything, Mr. Thurston. Okay. If you insist, Colonel. 
Bring it in, Pagong. Oh, you bet, Mr. Thurston. Got it right here with me. All ready to count Geigers and stuff. A counter? Yeah. And if the killer thinks I was bluffing, well, wait till I switch it on. You hear that? Listen to it. Every one of those clicks is a heartbeat. Racing toward the end. There can be enough radiation tearing through somebody's body right now to cause death in a matter of hours. Destroying blood, tissue, muscle. Listen to it. Listen to it. Here! Get it away! Get it away from me! Take it! Let me out of here! Before it's too late! Let me out! Let me out! Dr. Alistair. Yes. But he's getting away, Mr. Thurston. Not far, Pega. The MPs are waiting. Oh, that, that little statuette he took out of his pocket and threw at us. That silver Buddha. That's right, Colonel. You'll find Reynolds' formula inside. Open it up. Open it? You're crazy if you think I'm going to get anywhere near that thing. It's deadly. It's all right. It's harmless. Harmless? The way that Geiger counted acted? Yep. Yeah. Colonel, Alistair's game was one of the dirtiest in the world. Selling out his country. The lives of human beings for a handful of phony money. Well, I'd like to think that in some way I paid him back in his own coin. But I, I don't get it, Mr. X. What's that got to do with that Geiger counter clicking like crazy? That little statue of Buddha isn't radioactive. Huh? But Pedro, the radium dial of my watch is. <laughs> And now here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Alma Lawton, Will Wright, Peter Prouse, and Peter Leeds. Next week, Italy. And raging floodwaters that leave in their wake a terrible threat from the east. Along with death, devastation. And, oh yes, and uh, Leon Belasco, he, he'll be along too. As usual, as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return... As the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. was the worst to hit Italy since World War II. The raging waters of the River Po, swollen by torrential rains, overflowed their banks and brought death and destruction to thousands of Italian families. And when the flood receded, it left in its wake hunger, disease, a desperate people. And the minds of desperate people provide fertile ground in which to plant the deadly seeds of revolutionary propaganda. Listen to this, Ken. Americans go home. Fascist American pigs. Capitalistic, warmongering Americans. Ah, read the rest for yourself if your stomach can stand it. No, thanks, Chief. I've heard enough. But how do you account for it? You'd think that after all we've tried to do for those people, money, flood engineers, food, relief shipments, that, well, you'd think we'd get something a little better than, than this in return. I didn't know we were asking the Italian people for anything. No, of course we're not. We don't want thanks. We're only too glad to help, but but confounded we don't want any kicks in the teeth either. 
Chief, that wave of un-American feeling is coming from the flooded areas. The people there are hungry, desperate. Sure they are. But that's no excuse. We're sending them help. But are they getting it? Why, of course they... Hmm. You mean the village of Chiori? Yeah. Our main relief distribution center. That's where most of the propaganda's coming from, isn't it? According to these reports from Bob Cunningham, our relief administrator, it is, yes. And Cunningham also reported that he's been having trouble there. A warehouse full of relief clothing burned to the ground. Boats bringing American food upriver have been hijacked, disappeared. Hmm. Sabotage? That's my guess. But why? Doesn't that propaganda give us the answer? Yeah. Sure it does. Italy's been a prime target of the Kremlin for years. A disaster like that flood is made to order for them. They'll do anything to capitalize on it, to... to... What are we going to do about it, Ken? Suppose I let you know, Chief. From Giori. to Giori, eh, signor? That's right. And uh, you are Americano? Yeah, why? Alberto, do not think it wise for you to journey to Giara, signor. No, not the wise. Well, why not, Alberto? The signor has not heard of the flood. Sure I have. What's that got to do with it? Yeah, to make a travel in this country very dangerous. Very dangerous. You don't seem to mind it? Oh, Alberto Rienze, I've driven this bus from Milano Airport to Chiori for many years. He knows this country like the palm of his hand. For him, it is not dangerous. But for an American passenger, it is, huh? Si, senor. The uh, senor wishes Alberto to turn back to Milano. No, thanks, Alberto. Perhaps the senor will believe senor Cunningham. Robert Cunningham, the relief administrator? He will be able to convince the senor how dangerous it is for Americanos in Chiori. Only a fool would not listen to his argument. What argument's that? Senor Cunningham is a dead murder. arrive. The relief headquarters. This where Cunningham lived? See, si, and where he died. Yeah. If the senor wishes to change his mind, Alberto's boss is always for hire for a return trip to Milan. Thanks, Alberto. I'll remember that. Arrivederci. Arrivederci, senor. Hmm. Buongiorno, senor. Good afternoon, signorina. Oh, you are Americano. Yes, I. I am Teresa Rienza. Who are you? My name is Ken Thurston. You related to Alberto, signorina? What is it you wish here, senor Thurston? Speak quickly. I'm quite busy. Oh, it's hardly a friendly greeting. No liberty-loving Italian would ever descend to friendship with fascisti Americano. Well, some of your country were friendly enough in 1945 when we were relieved you of a nasty little man named Mussolini. Oh, that was only because they did not know your true intentions. Oh? What are they supposed to be? You helped us fight the fascisti only because you wished to enslave us in turn. To fatten your own purses at the expense of the blood and tears of the Italian oh, people. Oh, come off it, Teresa. You know better than that. I know it is true. Then what are you doing here? Work at an American relief station. I do not work here. Cesare Torlini has appointed me administrator since the unfortunate accident uh, to Senor Cunningham. Who's Torlini? The new mayor of Chiori. Does he feel about Americans as you do? He's the one who opened my eyes to your capitalistic wallmongering. A wonderful man. Yeah, I'll bet he is. So Torlini has decided to take over operations here since Cunningham was murdered. Is that it? Well, someone has to take charge. There's no one else in the village who could be trusted here. Is that your idea, Teresa? Bill. Or Tolini's. I thought I told you not to come around here again. Oh, it wasn't to see you, my sweet. 
I've got business with Thurston here. Oh, who are you? Bill Desmond. The guy they're holding for Cunningham's murder wants to see you. To see me? Why? Says he's an old friend of yours. Name of Pagan Zellschmidt. That's right, Thurston. This uh, Zellschmidt character saw you drive into town from his cell. He's on permanent vacation in the village Huskar. How come, Desmond? Well, they find him hiding in a storage room right after Cunningham's body was discovered. No better evidence than that? What else did they need when they started yelping that he was an American? What gives with Americans here, Desmond? I can answer that with one obscene word. Torlini. Torlini. He's the big wheel in the Hate America crusade. You named it. What's he got for ammunition? American promises made and not kept. The uh, relief shipments? Sure. Yeah. This was going to be a big deal. America's helping hand. Food, clothes, material for new homes. Well, Cunningham arrives and sets up a relief organization. And then nothing comes through. It's burned, lost, stolen. So Tolina tells the people who Americans are a bunch of grafters and liars. And their only salvation lies in the East. That's it. Right out of the Kremlin's book. Only he's giving him proof. He's supplying him with food and clothing out of his own warehouse. And the crates are all stamped, shipped from Moscow. I see. Yeah. Well, there's the uh, village pokey, Thurston, as far as I go. Hope I got you squared away on the lash up here. Except for one thing, Desmond. Oh, what's that? Where do you fit into the picture? Simple. I used to be Cunningham's right hand until he fired me. Huh? What for? Stealing relief shipments, selling them on the black market. Well, so long, Thurston. See you around. But I'm innocent, Mr. Riggs. Believe me, I didn't have nothing to do with Mr. Cunningham getting bumped out. The people of Chiori say it differently, Pagan. Oh, it's a frame. I, I, I was just an innocent standbyer. I, I, I swear it by the father of my father of my father. All right, father. all right. <laughs> when you decide to tell the truth, let me know if you're not on the gallows by then. No, no, Mr. Riggs, please, wait. No. Don't leave me on the perch in this pokey. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Honest. Okay. Let's have it. It was all my uncle Ahmed's fault. He sent me here. For what? Oh, to help the poor starving people to, who got bailed out by the flood. What? Oh, sure. He figured they'd be hungry. would give them food to eat at cost. Black market cost, you mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, there were certain expenses involved, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened? Well, that no good Torlini threatened to run me out of town. So... So I went to, to see that Cunningham gives her for a job. Only somebody had just bumped him out. And I was just looking around to see if there was anything worth stealing. I, I, I mean, I mean look, looking for clues. Uh, uh, when the police character walked in. Okay, Pagan, I'll go talk to Tolini. And believe me, getting out of jail will only be incidental. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Thurston. Thank you. <laughs> So, Signor Thurston, you are here to see me concerning this man, Sir Schmidt? Among other things, Signor Tolini. Mm-hmm. Then let us dispose of the minor difficulties first. He's free to go any time you wish. Hmm? Well, then you don't think he killed Cunningham? Hmm, naturally not. I kept him in jail merely to chastise him. For attempting to operate a black market here? Precisely. The people of Chiari have no need for black markets or relief. They know where to turn for help. And that's not to America. As you say, Senor Thurston, it is not to America. You know, Tolini, there's something pretty strange going on here. So? What do you have in mind? American relief shipments will run into a lot of trouble getting through. Unfortunate accidents, Senor Thurston. Then how come your crates of food and clothing shipped from Moscow haven't met the same accidents? You believe this concerns you? I like to get answers to questions that puzzle me, Tolini. Yeah. See, si. and uh, do you have other questions also? Yeah, such as? What happened to the American relief shipments that were stolen? Who killed Bob Cunningham and why? What could be done about the anti-American propaganda here? Uh, Senor Thurston, 
The people of Chiari have learned that their destinies are entwined irrevocably with that of the Soviet Union. Uh. Therefore, I would advise you to leave this village at once. And if I don't? The consequences of attempting to halt the march of destiny are not always pleasant. Senor Cunningham was one who learned that lesson. You could most easily be another. Well? Sorry, Tolini. I kind of like this place. I think I'll stick around. <laughs> We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. The price of prejudice is high. In America, we pay for racial and religious prejudice in the currency of smashed principles, disrupted unity, and weakened democracy. Unreasoned hatred eats away at the very foundation of our country, the Constitution, which guarantees equal treatment for all. Don't let yourself be a target for un-American ideologies. And when you do hear the vicious words of group hatred, speak up against prejudice and for understanding. The men who wrote our Constitution knew that freedom and prejudice cannot exist side by side. If you choose freedom, then help to fight prejudice. And now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. A vicious wave of anti-American feeling has swept over the flood-battered village of Chori in Italy. Ken Thurston believes it is all part of a far-reaching plan to turn the people of Italy against the Western democracies. Boy, it sure feels good to be out of the clinks again. <laughs> well, where do we go now? Milan? Rome? Venice? We're not going anywhere. Oh, that suits me fine, Mr. X. Any place just as long as we're not going anywhere? That's right, Pedro. But... But they don't like us here. Look at those people in the street looking at us. They as leaf cut our throats. Uh, leafer even. Only because someone sold them on hating Americans. They're going to try to straighten them out. Hey, uh, who lives here anyways? Probably the only ally we have in town. Huh? Ah, it is the Signor Thurston. That's right, Alberto. Maybe come in. Oh, per favore, please, Signores. Uh, you have uh, come, Signor, to, to hire the boss for return travel to Milano? We're not leaving Chiori, Alberto. So, then you are not frightened by these savage villagers who, who hate all Americanos. I eh? think the Italian people are pretty much like you and me, Alberto. They're not born to hate. But sometimes, if they're frightened badly enough, they can be taught to hate. Thank you, Signor. We shall drink a bottle of vino to your deep understanding. Oh boy, that's the first thing I've heard around here that makes any sense. No, we haven't time. I've got to work fast, and I need your help. What is it you wish Alberto to do? Before I left Milan, I made arrangements for another boatload of relief supplies to be shipped here. I want you to meet that boat up river before anything happens to it. Bring the supplies back here to the relief headquarters with your bus. You can depend on Alberto, senor, for it will indeed prove to my people that the Americanos are their true friends. And you, Senor Thurston? I'll try to prove that Tolini is their enemy. There's Tolini's castle, Thurston, on his own private island in the middle of the Po River. He's got his supply warehouse out here, too? Yeah, the works. You want to ride over and pay a visit? Not yet, Desmond. Cruise around the river for a while. I'd like to study the layout. Why not? I have nothing better to do. Hey, uh, how come you picked me to take this little jaunt with you? Maybe I wanted some more information about you. Oh, huh? like what? Why Cunningham fired you? I told you. He thought I was stealing supplies for the black market. Were you? No. Did he have any evidence? Sure. Some of the supplies that were aboard the last boat to be hijacked. They turned up in my quarters. Who framed you? Tolini? Can't think of a better guess. So you've got no job. The people of Chiori hate Americans, and you still hang around. Why? Teresa? Seen enough, Thurston. Yeah. Might as well head back to the dock. Oh, 
Well, looks like we got a little reception committee for Doc Thurston. Half the village at Shiori had a rough guess. Yeah. We might be in for trouble. Yeah, want to pull out again? No, but if anything happens, remember what I told you. Right. Tie her up, Desmond. I'll see what's going on. Yeah, check. I trust you enjoyed your river trip, Senor Thurston. It was all right, Colini. What's, uh, what's the excitement? In some respects, people here are no different than in your country, Senor Thurston. They, too, can be stirred up into the fury of a lynch mob. Lynch mob, why? You dare to ask that? You murdering American capitalist! Do you dare to ask that? Then the answer I give you is this! Well, oh, that was plain enough. But it's hardly an answer, Teresa. Then allow me to give it to you, senor. I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of Teresa's father, Alberto Rienzo. should be thankful, Senor Thurston, that I am a man who believes in the orderly process of justice. Otherwise, my good comrades of Chiari would have torn you to bits long before this. Oh, sure. Mighty nice of you, Tolini. What happens after you put me in that mud hut you call a jail? Yeah. If my countrymen wish to take the law into their own hands and remove you from it forcibly... I see what you mean. What happened to Alberto Rienza? He lost his life attempting to defend a riverboat bringing relief supplies to Chiari. Where do I come in? With his dying breath, Alberto informed me that you were the leader of the band. The one who had personally dealt him the mortal wound. Naturally, it was my duty to inform the villagers. Mm. Got it all tied up in one neat package, haven't you, Tony? I think I may say without undue pride that the situation remains under my control. With one exception. Oh, and what is that? This. This way, Mr. Thurston. This way. Right over here. This way. All right, Pagon. Let's go. For you, happen to be Jiminy on the spot, eh, Mr. X? Sheer genius, Pagan. Where'd you get the car? Well, I was getting tired of hanging around that jewelry joint, so I hasted it. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I borrowed this jalopsy for a little trip to Milan. And when you saw me coming down the street, you figured you could use a paying passenger. That's right. So how's about forking over on the line, eh, Mr. X? Be glad to, as soon as we make a little detour. Detour? Yeah, back to the dock in Chiori. Mr. X, we risk my neck sneaking back to Chiori to steal this pot pot, and for what? So we could visit a warehouse. Warehouse? Where? On Tordini's Island. Oh, oh, no, oh, no! Get out of this place. What are you poking around in all those boxes for? Just wanted to prove something, Pagan. Hmm? Look at those crates. And they're all marked shipped from Moscow. <laughs> and take a look at what's in them. Flour, sugar, butter. So what? So the packages they really came in are piled up over there in the corner. American packages. All that food's part of our relief shipments. It is? Hey, hey, then the Torlini joker must be the guy who stole all that stuff. Then he repacked it in those boxes so he could give it to the, those people and be a hotshot. No. Congratulations, Senor Zelchnit. You have figured it out perfectly. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Torlini. Think nothing of it. I... Torlini? Oh. Looks like you did some figuring yourself, Torlini. It was not too difficult to find the reason for your exploratory river trip earlier today. And now... That answer is rather obvious. You have come to the end of the road. Do you have all the answers now, Senor Thurston? I got them, Tolini. Good. Then there is no need to delay the execution any longer. Execution? Oh, oh, no. You better listen first, Tolini. To what, Senor? What is there for me to li... That's on. What is it? Your comrade from Chiori. 
The stupid villagers you thought were leading like a herd of cattle. The villagers? That's right. Bill Desmond and Teresa had a little talk with them. They're on their way to examine this private warehouse of yours. I wonder what they're going to think of their wonderful savior from the east when they get a good look at it. No, you're lying. They could not possibly be coming here. Take a look out of the window. See for yourself. And give me the gun. No. <laughs> All right, Pedro. You can climb out of that crate now. Boy, <laughs> what a smucker room, Mr. Rex. Oh, he sure made a mistake trying to look out that window. His mistake was made long before that, Pedro. When he thought he could make suckers out of the Italian people. But, uh, but he did, Mr. Rex. Oh, some of them fell for those phony promises for a little while, sure. Like the people in China fell for them. And in Russia. But one thing's for sure, someday if we work hard enough at it, we can wake them all up, just like we did in Chiori. And now, here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Veronica Pataki, Will Wright, Stan Waxman... Paul Richards, and Joe Duval. Next week, the Middle East, where the peace of the world is threatened by a halfpenny stamp, a third green eye, and Leon Belasco will be along as usual as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return, as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. From the oil fields of Iran to the fertile delta of the Nile, the smoldering coals of ancient hatreds, of militant nationalism, threatened to burst into a fiery inferno that could well be the start of World War III. And who would there be to say whether such a flaming holocaust came into being accidentally or was deliberately ignited as a weapon of destruction aimed at the Western democracies? Time is 9.45 p.m. The place, a dark crooked alleyway near the dock area of Cairo. The furtive figure of a man moves cautiously, hesitatingly, through the black enveloping shadows of the Egyptian night. Why do I do these things anyway? A guy could get his throat cut out here, and for what? A few measly bucks. Believe me, if it wasn't for that, I'd never do it. Where is Uncle Ahmed anyways? He, he said he'd meet me here. Where is he? Where is Cousin Ismail? Oh, where is anybody? Right behind the fender. Who? Oh, oh, Uncle Ahmed. It's so dark for a minute. I thought you were somebody else. Oh. You, you are somebody else. Quiet, Zelschmidt. Hmm? That is the blade of a knife you feel pressing against your throat. It, it is. Listen. There is a certain man aboard the British cruiser Hellenic out in the harbor. A certain Pasha Kent Thurston. He must board the Cairo Port Said Express at midnight. Compartment C3. With him, he must have 100,000 pounds sterling. 
Repeat that. The Kayaport Sail Express. Midnight. Compartment C3. 100,000 pounds. Sterling? You will see that he is there with the money. Otherwise, your life will be forfeit. But, but what if he don't want to go? He will go, Zell Schmidt. When you tell him that with the 100,000 pounds, he will be able to purchase a half-penny stamp. This story of Zellschmidt sounds rather like a weirdy, doesn't it, Ken? Could be a trap, you know. I doubt it, Jim. I have a hunch Pagan and his uncle Ahmed could help us out on this. I think they've done it. And Zellschmidt said this knife-wielding character did mention a halfpenny stamp, but <laughs> is it the one we're after? Well, it has to be. What other stamp could possibly be worth 100,000 pounds? Yes, 20 times that if it contains the data we want. Then how are we to find out? Easy. I'll be aboard the Cairo Port Said Express at midnight. Mm, might take a bit of doing. The Egyptians are very partial to us at this moment, you know. I'll, uh, I'll do a bit of disguise, change clothes, go, go as an Egyptian merchant. <laughs> and I'll wager your throat's cut before you leave the station. I'll let you know how I come out. No, oh, no, no, hold on, Ken. You might be decent enough to wait until I got my hat. I'm going with you. Sure, this is the right car, Ken? Yeah, there's compartment C5, C4. Here we are, C3. Come in, please, gentlemen. Come in. There's more than enough room for all of us. Who are you? My name is Turos, gentlemen. Dimetro Turos. This happens to be a private compartment, Mr. Turos. Or didn't you know? Oh, yes, yes. I was quite aware of that fact. I have been waiting for you, Mr. Thurston, and for Commander Stevens. Well, how do you know who we are? I have connections, sir, but that is not important now. What is? The fact, sir, that I am a philatelist, a stamp collector, and my reason for being here is the same as yours, a certain halfpenny stamp. What stamp is there? Gentlemen, some five years ago, a British intelligence agent managed to infiltrate into a certain organization, a Middle East strategy committee, whose orders came from a city which might well be called Moscow. Am I correct, Commander Stevens? You were saying something about a stamp, Mr. Turos. Yes. That agent managed to acquire quite a fund of information about this committee, such as its concern with the Iranian oil situation, its interest in the anti-British riots in Egypt, and he inscribed it all, every fact, name, place, upon the back of a halfpenny stamp. Oh, come now, Turos. One could hardly write a phone number on the back of a stamp, let alone all that data you're mentioning. As you know, the agent was a specially trained calligrapher, one who could inscribe the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. So? The agent was arrested by the committee and murdered. The stamp disappeared. It is now somewhere in Egypt, avidly being sought by Russian agents, by British agents, by certain Arabian potentates. And by Demetro Turos. Yes, as you say, Mr. Thurston, by Demetro Turos. What's your interest in it? Strictly financial. That stamp is worth a great deal of money to the interested parties I have mentioned. Here, one of my cards. I trust you will visit me one day soon at my home in Port Said. Thank you, gentlemen. Good night. Well, now what you make of that, Ken? One thing's for sure. Our friend Turos is well informed about that hate in the stamp. But he's not the man we came to meet. Oh, uh, what makes you think that? Those bloodstains on the carpet. Bloodstains on the... Yes. Right next to that window seat. What in the world? There's luggage space under that seat. Let's take a look. Yes, indeed. You think he was the man we were going to meet? Yes. And who slipped that knife into him? Turos? Could be... Then Turos must have the stamp. I doubt it. Why? He'd have tried to make a deal with us, or he'd have claimed he entered the compartment by accident. And it must be somebody else aboard the train. It'd be anybody. Yeah. May we come in, gentlemen? 
Oh, you're in. What do you want? I am Major Osman Kanal, Egyptian military police. The men in the corridor are my agents. Do not attempt resistance, please. What's your interest in us? The corpse under that seat makes the answer superfluous. However, you are both under arrest for murder. Raise your hands, please. Ken, Raise can I... them. Better do as he says, Jim. After all, it makes it easier to reach the emergency call. Not for that, if indeed you not... Get the door, Jim. I've got it. What about the Major? Knocked off his feet. I'll make sure he stays that way. <laughs> uh, touch of genius, Ken, pulling an emergency cord. There's certainly no time to mess around with a murder charge, but where do we go from here? Port Said. Port Said? With the stamps aboard this plane, that's where it's headed. The window, Jim. We'll get out that way. Come on! Lovely city, Port Said. Despite the trouble we had getting here. Though I must confess I don't feel one bit closer to that stamp. That's why I want to visit our friend Demetro Turos. He's the only lead we have. Yes, well... Uh, according to the address on his card, this should be his home. Yeah. You go on and contact your agents in town. See if they've learned anything. I'll talk to Turos here and we'll meet at the El Akbar Hotel tonight. Right. Mr. Thurston, welcome to Port Said. Well, I'll be... And surprised to see me, eh, Mr. X? I should have known you were aboard that train last night. <laughs> what did you do? See Toros leave that compartment and follow him here? That's right. It only stood to reason you'd be showing up here, too. So when the tourist character left the house, <laughs> I got in. Yeah. How long have you been here? Only a couple of minutes, Mr. X. Nobody else in the house? No, not a soul. Well, <laughs> what do we do now? Look for a heap in the stamp. The one worth a hundred thousand pounds. Sterling? Yeah. Now, that looks like a den or library over there. Let's try it. Hey, it's, it's blacker in here than my own Zenobia's heart. There's a lamp on this desk. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Ah, some joint, eh, Mr. X? Must be plenty of dough in this damn business. And look at that painting of that cute cookie dancing. <laughs> We're interested in stamps, not dancing girls. Remember? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So, <laughs> where, do, where do we start, Mr. X? I suppose we, uh, we try those albums on this desk. Hey, look at those books. All covered with leather and stuff. Artificial diamonds and stuff. Oh, those diamonds are real, Peg, huh? Oh, sure. <laughs> I knew it all the time. Would they ever put diamonds on a book? That was real. That's right. Then... What are we waiting for? Let's grab those books and scrum out of here. Oh, shut up. Hmm? Find something, Strix? Uh, take a look at this page. What's that to look at? Just stamps. Hate stamps. Hey, hey, maybe one of them's that... Uh, the one that Joker said you should meet him on the train so you could pay him off and, and it's worth almost a half a million bucks. Yeah. Let's check them. But... But how are you going to do that, Mr. X? Why are you going to look for? There are little plastic envelopes. We can see both sides. Look for writing on the back. Writing or... What kind of writing? Uh, uh, any kind of writing. It just... Uh... <sighs> My eyes. What is the matter with... There you go. Mr. X, <laughs> sleepy and sleepy. The lamp of smoke is coming, coming up from the lamp. Drug, being drugged. Got to get out of here. Oh, oh. sure, Mr. X. Got to get... Oh. Hey, get up. Get the lamp. Drugs coming from the lamp. Got to... I got to turn it out. Turn it. Turn
We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Countries like people have their economic ups and downs. And like people, the countries that cut to the roots of their problems with the greatest ease progress the farthest and the fastest. Our own country has become the envy of the world in this respect. And why? Because the better we produce, the better we live. Throughout our history, living conditions have been geared to productivity, improving with industry's vast strides, bringing shorter work hours, more leisure time, and greater well-being to us. And American production has taken place in a setting of liberty, the liberty to work where one desires, to profit from initiative and enterprise. The American way has brought more benefits to more people than any other system in the world. So that's what we mean when we say, the better we produce, the better we live. And now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. It is only a little colored piece of paper, a hop and a uh, stamp, but on its back it contains information that could quench the rising flames of unrest in the Middle East, or could lead to World War III. And now, Ken Thurston is in Port Said, Egypt, searching for the stamp in the home of Dimitro Turos, a search that is suddenly terminated when he and Pagan come under the influence of some strange drug. Uh, uh. So, Thurston Afende, uh. you are regaining consciousness at last. Uh. Yeah. Yes, yeah, looks as a. Uh. Huh? Well, who are you? I am known as Erdry. Does the name mean anything to you? That picture on the wall in Turo's library. The dancing girl. Oh, I am flattered that you recognize me, Afende. Uh. Pagan, where's where Pagan? Your companion is sleeping comfortably in the cabin next to this one. Uh, uh, so we're aboard ship. The Abdullah Bay, anchored in the harbor of Port Said. It is my husband's yacht. Husband? You have already met him. The Metro Toros. That is quite correct. Why bring me here? Is it so difficult to fathom, Nathendi? We are all after the same thing. The halfpenny stamp. No, it still doesn't make sense. Unless you working with your husband, Audrey, or against him. The matter is a pig. Does that answer you? It gives me a general idea, yes. Well, then let me give you more specific ones. On the port side waterfront, there is a cafe known as the Star of Heaven. Tonight, in the Star of Heaven, you may be able to find the happiness stamp that you seek. That's interesting. Anything else? I understand it will be in the custody of one I have heard referred to only as the man with the third green eye. <laughs> well, not very enlightening, is it? Well, it will have to do. I have told you all that I know. Yes, but why? I wish that stamp to be in the hands of its rightful owners, not in the metros. And I intend to make certain of that personally. Oh, how? If you succeed in obtaining the stamp... You will come back here to the yacht with it. Why should I come back? There are two men wanted for a murder committed aboard the Cairo Port Said Express. A certain Major Osman Kemal is in Port Said at this very moment. He might well be interested in the whereabouts of one of those men. Uh -huh. Not very subtle about your threats, are you? There is nothing very subtle about war, first and Effendi. Well... I'll try to be back tonight. Ooh, these characters would cut your throat for nothing, even less, maybe. Why don't we give this place a couple of quick powders? No, not until we find the things we're looking for. What things? I hate Miss Stamp. A man with a third green eye. I don't know what kind of talk is that. Uh, pardon, Effendi, mm. your order. For you, Effendi, best coffee. Black tea and hot. Thank you. And for you, Effendi, Halli milk. Pure and sweet from the cow. Milk? But I ordered a triple scotch. I changed the order. What do we owe you, waiter? Nothing, Effendi. It has been paid for. How do you like that? First free loading I get in six months and I wind up with milk. 
Mighty nice waiter. Who arranged it? The proprietor, Abdul Hafiz Ben. Hafiz Ben? Yeah, that is he standing near the rear door. Hey, Mr. Thurston, that Hafiz Ben joker. He's yeah, the... yeah. Uh, thank him for us, waiter. And uh, here for you. Oh, a thousand thanks, Effendi. May the blessing of Allah... But Mr. X, look at that Hafiz Ben guy. At what sort of turban he's wearing. I see it, Pagan. Huh? A brilliant green emerald. Sure. And it's sitting almost in the middle of his forehead. A guy with a couple of drinks or two under his belt could even think maybe it was... Uh, it was a third green eye, Mr. Zelschmidt? That's right, the third green... Hmm? That a guess, Taurus? Or do you know? I know. I can assure you that Abdul Hafizban is the man with the third green eye. And the man who has the stamp? Quite nice of you to invite me so cordially to join your table, gentlemen. The gun you've got inside that napkin says we haven't much choice. Quite right, Mr. Thurston. Though it is only twenty-two caliber, it would be quite deadly if aimed properly. <laughs> well, sir, shall we indulge in some friendly conversation regarding a halfpenny stamp? You must realize by now that I want it, sir. Want it very badly. And before this evening is out, I shall possess it. Then why waste time with me? My dear sir, it is hardly a waste of time to remove the last obstacle from one's path. <laughs> you will notice that the band is playing louder. The music will shortly reach a pitch where the sound of two shots muffled in this napkin will go entirely unnoticed. Just like that, eh? Just like that, sir. Well, at least there's time for me to finish this coffee. <laughs> my face! My face! Let's have that gun, Toro. <laughs> Let's have it, Toros. I will. Uh, what was that first? Come on, that rear door. Yeah, but where are we going? We've got a date, Pagan. The man with the third green eye. What? Why do we still hang around these joints, Mr. X? The rest of those jokers will be after us any minute. Hafiz Ben's still got that hate in his stamp. And you think he's back here somewhere? He's got to have an office someplace. Maybe this is it. <gasps> oh, Mr. X. Yes. Oh, but, but who? Why? Take a look at his turban. Mr. X. The emerald. The third green eye. Yes. Missing. So the man with the third green eye is dead, Thurston Effende. And the happiness stamp is missing once again. Looks like it, Audrey. Ah, this is too bad. But at least there is one consolation. Demetra did not get his filthy hands on it. Yeah. Well, I've kept my promise. Might as well be going. Well, well, Major. And you remember me, Thurston Effendi? Sure. Looks like you pulled a neat double cross, Audrey. Perhaps it would not have been necessary if you had returned with the halfpenny stump, Thurston Effendi. So you're in on this, too. What about that military police gag? Merely a subterfuge to question you and Commander James Stevens at leisure. Circumstances prevented that aboard the train. Nothing shall prevent it now. What do you think you'll find out from me? The present whereabouts of the stamp. You think I'm the one who killed Hafiz Ben and took the stamp from him? No other explanation will fit the circumstances. Major Cabal, start questioning him. He will tell us where it is hidden quickly enough. Oh, you don't have to bother. I'll tell you where it is. But I want to get something straight first. Huh? What? As I see it, Huffis Ben spread the word that he'd sell the stamp to the highest bidder, and the vultures started gathering around. Touros, who had the money to buy it, and the two of you who sent me to the cafe to get it for you. So? But you didn't figure that one of you would double-cross the other. What do you mean? While Touros and I kept each other busy, one of you killed Huffis Ben and took the stamp. Didn't you, Audrey? What? You are lying. Better not wear such spicy perfume. The scent was still in Huffis Ben's office. Now, where's the emerald? The one that's got the stamp concealed inside. In your purse? No. No, no, stay away from there. No. Okay, Major. It's your move. Sir, you did double-cross me, Audrey. 
I should have known. No, Osman. Put away that gun. You can't shoot me. You can't. I am going to... to... Is everything okay, Ken? It's under control, Jim. Thanks. You heard everything? I didn't miss a word. All very exciting at the end there, and I must say we've run up against as unsavory a character of crew of characters that's ever been my misfortune to me. Who are you to talk, you filthy capitalistic pigs? Someday we will prove to the world who the truly superior peoples are. Oh, sure. You're certainly trying hard enough. Using the double cross. Murder. Even war. Or maybe someday you'll learn that there are no superior people. Only a couple of billion human beings who want to live together in peace. Who pray they won't have to fight to get it. Now, here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lucille Meredith, John Dana, Ed Begley, John Stevenson, and Lou Krugman. Next week, South America. The basin of the Orinoco River, where, believe it or not, a ton of dynamite and one Pagon Zellschmidt produce an explosion that threatens the whole country. Pagon? Leon Belasco, of course. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national... Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. A century and a half ago, a dream was born in the mind of a man. A dream of a country where life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were the birthright of every citizen. And on the day he was elected as his country's first president, he knew that his dream had come true. The man, Simon Bolivar. The country, Venezuela. In the dining room of the Hotel Benita in Caracas, capital of Venezuela, there sits another man with a dream. His name is Luis de la Costa, and he is telling of his hopes and his aspirations to a longtime friend. Uh, just think about it, Ken. Thousands of my people, their villages isolated for centuries, will at last be able to enjoy the benefits of modern civilization. Schools, hospitals, decent homes. It's a wonderful dream, Louis. Ah, but it's to be a reality. When we have completed the Bolivar Waterway. Bolivar Waterway? Oh, you mean your old idea of uh, opening the interior rivers to navigation? See, si, yeah. si. By building a waterway almost 200 miles long. Uh, it's being financed by American interests who would profit handsomely from the iron ore mountains of the interior. But... Someone, some country perhaps, can does not wish that ore to reach your hungry steel mills. Mm. Hmm? Having trouble on the construction, John? Yes, si, si. Break ton of equipment, vital materials lost or stolen. A uh, dam has suddenly collapsed. It, it can tell me, does the name Colenda mean anything to you? Colenda, sure. Freelance international crook, specializing in sabotage. Is Colenda behind your trouble? Uh, I have reason to think so, Ken. That's why I come to you. And the first thing that you should know is... All right, Chris. I'll see what I can do. 
But, Mr. Chief, be reasonable. You've got to tell me where I can find Mr. Rex. Del Schmidt, the answer is no. But he needs my invaluable services. He'll be lost without me. And besides all that... You're you... broke. Yes, no. No, no. Now, what's that got to do with it? Hagan, this is one time you're not going to get in Ken's hair. You're not going to foul up the assignment he's working on, and you're not going to chisel him out of any more slight consideration. Mr. Chief... Now, get Chief. out of my office. But, but... Get out. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you think after all the years we've worked together... Doing things for me. Hello. Hello, Chief. Oh, Ken. Glad Hello? to hear you. Glad to hear from you. How are things at <laughs> wherever you are? Oh. What are you so happy about? I just had a delightful little interview with Pagon Zellschmidt. Haven't enjoyed anything so much in years. But uh, what can I do for you, Ken? Send Pagon down here to meet me. Sure, I'll be glad to. I'll see the... What? I need him in Venezuela right away. Ken, you can't do that to me. You, what do you want him for? Five years ago, he was mixed up with a sabotage ring in Lisbon. Somebody named Colenda was at the head of it. But listen... Colenda's busy down here on the boat of our waterway. I need Pagon to make a positive identification. But Ken... I'll talk to you later, Chief. So long. But, but... <laughs> Might I trouble you for a moment, a moment? Sure, what can I do for you? Well, I'm lost without my dictionary. Positively lost. English, Spanish. Oh, oh well, Spanish, English, that is. And I must find Maria Luisa. Yes, I positively must. Maria Luisa? A boat, sir. Riverboat. Going up the Orinoco to the Bolivar Waterway. Yes, the Bolivar. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm Professor Harkness. Artemides Harkness is the waterway. My name's Ken Thurston, Professor. And the boat you're looking for is right over there. Eh? Oh, it is. well, thank you, Mr. Thurston. Thank you very much. What's your interest in the waterway, Professor? Why, the Lalia Preparata, of course, yes. The Lalia Preparata. <laughs> Saprophytic, that is, you know, yes. Saprophytic. You're looking for rare orchids. Well, that's what I said, didn't I? Yes, well, I'm a botanist, you know. Yes, a botanist. Many rare specimens in the interior. Very many. Wonderful opportunity to travel by water. The Boulevard Waterway, you know? Yes, I, yeah, I know, yes. Yeah. Here's the Maria Luisa. Uh, Maria Luisa? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Are you looking for something, gents? My name's Ken Thurston. This is Professor Harkness. We're looking for the skipper of this boat. You found her, mister, so what? Uh, well, I, I have passage. Uh, there's a ticket somewhere. I purchased it, you know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, Professor. I already got you booked. It's this Thurston I want to know about. You interested in going upriver to the waterway? That's right. It'll be 50 bucks, American, cash in advance. Sure. You glad to... Here you are. Okay. We're shoving off in ten minutes. Stow your duffel below. Duffel? Luggage, Professor. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, lug- oh, of course, yes. Luggage. All right, Thurston, what's the pitch? What's with you in the waterway? Well, that's pretty much my business, isn't it? Not the way I figure. Just how do you figure? You're traveling light. You're no construction stiff. You're going up to the waterway, and that, to me, adds up to a snoop job of some kind. That means I got something you need. Like what? Insurance. What kind? The kind Lua Della Costa needed and didn't have. Oh. News travels pretty fast around here, doesn't it? We were talking about an insurance deal. I suppose I can get over. Sure. Take your time. You'll be okay till we hit the construction job. And after that? <laughs> you name it, pal. Yeah. Well, speaking of names... Betty Corcoran. Corcoran. That's right. What did you think it was going to be? Kalenda? Okay, Thurston, here's the waterway construction job. You buying that insurance? The answer is no, Miss Corcoran. You're a sucker. Why? This job's poison for people on the wrong side of the fence. But there's plenty of dough to be made on the right side. Your side? Colenda's? Well, you got to pay for what I know, mister. And if you don't... First, the construction office. Yeah. Quiet, let's have that gun. Let's, let's have it. Ah, that's better. 
Now, what's going on here? And just what means is it of yours, senor? Let's say I'm allergic to murder. Now, suppose you start talking. I suppose you go to the devil, senor. Wait a minute. Wait. It's possible this... This American represents the financial interest behind the Boulevard Waterway. Am I correct, senor? You might call it that. Si. I am Manuel Florio, government inspector on the waterway. My hot-headed friend here is Jose Martinez, engineer in charge of the construction. Yeah, and this is Ken Thurston, okay. Now let's hear what the fireworks were about. It's really quite simple. My friend Martinez is about to blast the passageway for the new riverbed. I expressed the opinion that he was using an excessive amount of dynamite. Enough to bring the hillside down upon the cut that we have made. By way of answer, he reached for his gun. Wait, you filthy lying dog! Oh, you're Martinez. I... The only thing that's important now is that waterway. Let's go down and take a look at the dynamite charges. I'll be able to tell soon enough. See, with your heavy charge of dynamite, Martinez. And look here. Look. You can see what happened to the canal that was already built, Senor Thurston. Uh, completely buried. Yeah. A couple of million bucks worth of waterway shot. Just like that. Too bad you weren't carrying any insurance, isn't it, Mr. Thurston? <laughs> We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Answer the call. Answer the call for volunteers to help during the Red Cross fund drive. Now is the time to lend a hand to the organization which is always ready with help wherever and whenever it is needed. As a fund drive volunteer, you help to save the life of a wounded soldier through the Red Cross Blood Center. You offer comfort to a crying child, a grieving mother. A good friend, good neighbor, a citizen to be proud of. That's a Red Cross Fund campaign volunteer. Call your nearest Red Cross office and help the Red Cross give help to the helpless. Hope to the hopeless as a Red Cross Fund campaign volunteer. And now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Louis de Costa's dream was about to be realized. A dream of a giant waterway carrying precious iron ore from the interior of Venezuela for America's hungry steel mills and bringing schools, hospitals, homes to thousands of his people in return. And then sabotage struck the waterway. De Costa was murdered. And now a premature dynamite explosion has just buried an already completed canal. Yeah, Thurston, that's what this job should have had, all right. A little insurance to take care of things like that powder blast. You are wrong, Senorita Corporal. What this waterway needs is guns to protect it from its enemies. Or perhaps, Martinez, it needs engineers who will listen to advice regarding an excessive amount of dynamite. That kind of talk won't get us anywhere, Florio, Martinez. The damage is done. Suppose you check, see how bad it is, see what could be done to rectify it. I already know the answer to that, Senor. But you have taken my gun away from me. Oh, that's too bad. I'm afraid our construction engineer is too hard-headed and impulsive for his own good. So since he's got blood in his eye when he looks at you, Florio. Maybe he doesn't like the idea of being blamed for that premature blast. Maybe he figures somebody else is responsible. And just who would that somebody else be, Senor Person? It's your question. Got an answer? If you will excuse me, I shall check upon the damage with Martinez. But... A word of advice first, if you do not mind. No, no, go right ahead. The construction of a waterway such as this is best left in the hands of experts. Amateurs are prone to run into accidents, senor. Possibly even better ones. Hasta luego, senor. Hello, is this the waterway construction outfit? Pagan. That's right, Pagan Zellschmidt. I'd like to talk to... Oh, 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 hello, Mr. Thurston. 
How's everything going there with its waterways and bolivars and stuff? What the devil's been keeping you? Why aren't you here? Sunburn. Sunburn? Sure. Boy, that sun's plenty hot here on the beaches. There are no beaches in Caracas. That's right. Uh, but you ought to see this one here in Miami. Miami. Well, I had a little trouble in the plane, you understand. And by the time I got through explaining uh, to those police characters about that poor, lonely little stewardess, well, <laughs> the plane for Venezuela had already left. Pig wants to help me. If you don't get another plane out of there right away... Oh, oh, don't worry about the thing, Mr. X. I'll be there in plenty of time to put the fingers on that calendar characters for a slight consideration, of course. <laughs> is over onto the other side of the hill. See, that is correct. Around your lines over there. Hey, Sejita. Come along. Looks like you're shifting the base of operations, Martinez. Mind telling me why? Senor Thurston, the accident last night was not as damaging as we feared. It will be possible to reroute the channels, and a simple blasting operation will do it. Like the last one? <laughs> Senor, I agree that the blast was much greater than it should have been. But the extra dynamite was not placed there by me. Nor did it come from our powerhouse. What makes you think that? Because there is a sulfur mine operating back in those hills. Early this morning, I found over 50 empty dynamite boxes near that mine. They still had yellow sulfur dust on them. Anything else? Only this. I understand the controlling interest in that sulfur mine is held by Senorita Perry Corcoran. Just one moment, please. Uh, just one moment. Ah, uh, well, I, I thought I'd never find you. Never? Oh, Professor, what's on your mind? Miss Corcoran. That is, she asked me to give you a message. Oh, yes, a message. What, what, what is it? Well, she would like to see you, I believe. It was about... Oh, those boxes. Oh, my, there are lots of them. What are they, Mr. Thurston? Mm, empty dynamite cases. Dynamite? Are they real? Oh, well, well, imagine that. Empty dynamite key? Well, well, no, well. No, the, the message, Professor, from Betty Corcoran. Oh, yes, yes, Miss Corcoran. Well, she wanted to see you about dynamite. And a man. A man named, uh... A man, oh, dear, 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 what was that name again? Colinda? Oh, yes, 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 that's it. Colinda. She's waiting for you now, Mr. Thurston, at the sulfur mine. <laughs> Betty Corcoran, are you in here? Funny. I thought I saw something move in it. Well, Betty, is that you over... Oh. Uh, uh, are you feeling better now, Senor Thurston? What? Who, uh... Oh, Florio. See, that's quite correct. Uh, what are you doing here? Or do you make a habit of dropping into sulfur mines at odd hours? Professor Harkness informed me as to where I might find you. Before or after I came into this mine. I'm not quite certain I understand your meaning. Somebody hit me, Florio. Right now it looks like a toss-up between you and Betty Cochran. It was neither of us, Senor. What makes you so sure? Because when I entered the mine, you were already unconscious. And I am certain that you cannot doubt Senorita Corcoran's alibi. Why not? Here, I show you. There, it. Oh. See? As you can see, she's quite dead. Senorita Corcoran is dead. That's right, Martinez. Murdered. And now I suppose the work on the Bolivar waterway will come to a halt until her murder is solved. See, si, Martinez. I have placed a telephone call to the authorities in Caracas. Meanwhile, all work on the project will cease. Of course. You could not afford to wait another 24 hours. 
For then we will be ready to blast open the new riverbed and the Bolivar waterway will be finished. I'll get it. Well. Hello, Mr. Thurston. This is Pagan Zellschmidt. Guess who? Oh, so... Where are you calling from now? That's right, Mr. Thurston. I- I'm calling all right from Trinidad. Trinidad? Well, uh, the aeroplane lost a couple of wheels or something, and I got all grounded up here. Hurry up, Pagan, darling. Carmen wishes you to talk. Oh, sure, baby, sure, sure. Pagan, you've got just 24 hours to get, uh, get up here. And so help me if you're even one second late. Mr. Thurston, if there's one thing you can always depend on, you can always depend on a salesman. Keeping busy, Martinez? Oh, Senor Thurston. Looks like you're figuring on setting off a dynamite blast all by yourself. The 24 hours is up. And I intend to see that the Bolivar waterway is completed tonight. Pretty risky, isn't it? What risk, Senor? I detonate the explosive and the river rushes into its new channel. Then there will be nothing that Florio can do. Yeah, if it works out. And why should it not? I just found 30 more dynamite cases from the sulfur mine lying over the hill. Empty. about to have a repeat performance of the last explosion, Senor. That's right, Florio. It's set to go off ten minutes from now. Only this time, without the extra dynamite. I tell you, I know nothing about that sulfur mine dynamite. Yes, but I saw the empty boxes, too, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Thurston showed them to me, so I'm a witness. <laughs> yes, I'm a witness. But for the life of me, I do not know what this is all about, Mr. Thurston. It's simple, Professor. A man named Dada Costa had a dream about this waterway. It will bring a new way of life to the people in the Venezuelan hills. And... Iron ore for steel mills in the United States. Says, what does all this to do with sulfur mines and, uh, and dynamite? Somebody has been sabotaging the waterway to keep that iron ore from leaving here and using the sulfur mine dynamite to do it. A man by the name of Colenda. Colenda? Oh, yes, yes, of course. The man, Miss Corcoran. The one she... Well, before she was... Yes, Colenda. And just who is this Colenda, senor? Have you, uh, have you got a silver coin, Florio? A boulevard or a peso? Why, see, si. see, si, I have one. Here. Thanks. What about you, Martinez? And Professor Harkness? See, si. if you wish. Uh, here you are, Mr. Thurston. But I would like it back. My pension. It's not very large, you know. Yes, it's not very large. You'll get it back, Professor. These coins are all I need to tell me which one of you is Colenda. What do you mean? Colenda used dynamite from that sulfur mine. There was plenty of yellow sulfur dust on the empty boxes. Plenty more in the mine itself. He must have been covered with the stuff by the time he got through. But that means nothing. There is no sulfur dust on any of us. It can easily be washed out of clothing and off the skin. That is right, Martinez. But it can't be washed off silver. Silver? Of course. The chemical action of silver would leave a black coating. It would be... Thurston, look. Look, one of those coins. Sure. This one. Black. Yeah. Colenda gave it to me, didn't you? Professor Harkness. Hello, Mr. Thurston. Hey, gone. You don't have to worry about a thing. Get away from there, you idiot. But this character I'm standing between is Colenda. He's the one who... Oh, 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 oh thank you, salesman, for getting in front of me. Adios, gentlemen. Hey. Hey, what's going on here, anyway? Uh, uh, what, what happened? <laughs> Get away from that door. Yes, lock through the window, Florio. There he goes, into the speedboat at the dock. Oh, it's no use, Martinez. He's getting away. I don't think so, Florio. But you can see for yourself. He's already going down river. They're approaching the new channel where the new waterway will go. That boat, Colenda, where they were, there's nothing. Nothing but. Yeah. That's right, Pagan. Hey, that noise. What is it? 
Well, you might call it the beginning of the Bolivar Waterway. But somehow I'd like to think of it as a dream coming true. Here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Gloria Blondell, Will Wright, Paul Richards, Howard McNear, and Tony Barrett. Next week, the icy wasteland of Alaska, where a deserted weather station holds the answers to a missing top-secret weapon. A man who dies twice. And one of the most unmitigated scoundrels the weather... Yes, that's right. That reminds me. Uh, Leon Belasco will be along as usual as Pagon Zelschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. Now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. The dock area of Yokohama, Japan, looks to be in a normal state of bustle and confusion. But there is nothing normal-looking about the man crouching like a hunted animal behind a pile of packing cases. And then they fix on a jaunty-looking figure approaching the hiding place. And with a move born of sudden desperation, the man leaves his concealment and runs out onto the dock. <laughs> Zellschmidt, huh? You're pig on Zellschmidt, aren't you? You're pig on Zellschmidt. And uh, whom wants to know? I, I know you are. I saw you once in Washington with a man named Ken Thurston. Where is he? You must take me to him at once. Do you hear? Take me to Ken Thurston at once. Oh, oh sure, sure. Please. He's left, will Right now, I've got a Please. heavy date with No, I... no. Hmm? No, listen to me. You can't leave me now. Ken Thurston, I have to see Ken Thurston at once. But... Oh, 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 Thurston. I must see. <laughs> Bundy's right there, Mr. Thurston, in the morgue. Thanks, Doctor. You? you haven't been able to identify him? No, no papers, wallet, laundry marks, nothing. I see. Well, Mr. Thurston, do you know him? No, no, I don't. Never saw him before in my life. Makes it even more strange, doesn't it? This insistence of his upon seeing you. Any scars, broken bones, physical characteristics that might help us? Only that scar tissue on his legs and feet. Frostbite? Yes. Another recent, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, I did notice some peculiar calluses on the thumb and little finger of his left hand. Here. You can see them quite plainly. Yes. All right, Doctor, thanks. Anything else we can do for you? I'd like to use a private office if you don't mind. One with the telephone. Of course. Do you want to call the authorities in Tokyo? No, the Bureau, New York. Okay, Ken. I've got the file right here. But what connection Professor James Abbott could have with the murdered derelict there in Japan, I don't know. Oh, let's see if we can find out, Chief. 
Professor Abbott was working on robot weather stations in Alaska, wasn't he? That's right. Establishing a string of stations throughout the Arctic. All self-operating, not requiring any maintenance personnel. Wasn't there some connection between those weather stations and our radar defense system up there? Right. Abbott was trying to see if he could use the same robot system on our radar detection stations. If he could, it would make our aircraft warning defenses so airtight that... Uh... Oh, but this is the Arctic we're talking about, not Japan. Professor Abbott's missing, isn't he? Sure, has been for a couple of months. All efforts to contact him have been... Wait a minute. You don't think this dead man could possibly be Abbott? He had recent frostbite scars on his legs, Chief. And how many people do you know who play the French horn? The French horn? Yes. Wasn't Abbott a well-known amateur musician? A French horn player? Well, sure. But what's that got to do with it? The dead man had well-developed calluses on the thumb and little finger of his left hand. The kind musicians get. Those who play the French horn. Ah. And there were two Russian freighters in the harbor, Chief. Well, adds up to quite a few items, doesn't it, Ken? Yes. I think I'd better check on them. In Alaska. There isn't much information we can give you about Professor Abbott here, Mr. Thurston. He was working out of the Elmdorf Air Base, wasn't he, Colonel? That's true, but as far as his work was concerned, well, it was top secret. When did you last hear from him? I see. It must have been a little over two months ago. He'd informed us by short wave that he was heading for a new robot weather station up the Naruka River, intended to winter there alone. And no word since? None. We sent out a number of searching parties, didn't find a trace of them. I see. How can I get to the Naruka station? Well, the only feasible method this time of year is to fly in. I can tell you right now, you won't find anything there, but we'll put a plane at your disposal. I think I'd better make this unofficial, Colonel. What about bush pilots? Well, there's Chuck Stevens. He covers that territory all the time. As a matter of fact, I believe he was the one who flew Abbott in that last time. Chuck Stevens? Yes, you'll find his plane at the Anchorage field. I'll have someone drive you out. Well, thanks just the same, Colonel, but I've just got a nasty hunch it won't be necessary. What? Hello, Mr. Thurston. Welcome to Alaska. Hey, Gunnar, I'll be hanged if I'm going to ask you what you're doing here. That's right, Mr. Thurston. So hop into this jalopy and I'll drive you to that Chuck Stevens pilot. <laughs> He's going to fly us out to the Maruka weather station. That's right, Mr. X. I knew you made a big mistake giving me the brush up in Yokohama. So I got the next plane out of, for Alaska. You mean you stowed away? Yes. No, no. Anyways, uh, here we are. The Zellschmidt Stevens Air Taxi Cab Service and Company. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Hello there. You must be first. That's right. You, Stevens? You named it. Your friend Zellschmidt has been spreading the word around Anchorage that you're trying to get some dope about a Professor James Abbott. Thank you, Pedro. Don't think nothing good, Mr. Thurston. That's why I asked him to bring you here. Figured I uh, I might be able to help you. Might have nice of you, Stevens. What do you know about him? Why, well, I flew him up to a weather station on the Naruka River a couple of months ago. It's a pretty lonely spot. To be glad to have company. I guess you haven't heard. Professor Abbott is missing. Missing? That's right. Has been for two months. How come you didn't know? Well, that's simple. I flew over that weather station day before yesterday. And Professor Abbott was still there. the Naruka weather station dead ahead. <laughs> Boy, what a lonely hunk of a place. Nothing but snow and ice and snow. Yeah. You sure you saw Abbott there, Stevens? Well, I couldn't miss. We made arrangements for me to check with him any time I flew near. So I buzzed the place twice. He came out and waved me off. He wouldn't have done that if he was in any kind of trouble. Oh, you better keep those belts tight. There's just a couple of inches of new snow over some pretty rugged ice down there. The landing's liable to be rough. Yep. Well, that 
does it, gents. Now let's go in and say hello to the professor. Notice anything strange, Stevens? Strange? Like what? Well, the professor doesn't seem too anxious to meet any guests. Hey, that's right. I wonder how come he's sticking inside. Suppose we go in and ask him. Hey, it's uh, so quiet out here and and quiet. Uh, like like there was something wrong or something. We'll find out in a minute. See? Nobody home. Hey, maybe he's getting a short beer or something. Oh, sure. Come on. Nobody's home inside either. I don't get it, Thurston. There weren't any tracks in the snow leading away from here. Abbott's got to be around somewhere. You're right. Yeah. Hey. Well. She's got a gun. She's got a gun. Hey, what's the big idea? Stay put, mister. I know how to use this thing. I think she does it that, Stevens. Yeah. Okay. What are you doing here? We might ask you the same question. You might. Only I've got the gun. So what are you doing here? Suppose I said we wanted to talk to uh, Professor Abbott. And I'd say you're out of luck, mister. Why? I just killed him. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Today, throughout the nation, driving conditions remain precarious. Longer hours of darkness, poor visibility caused by ice, snow, rain and fog, and slippery streets call for extra precaution when you drive. Adjust your speed to road and weather conditions. Keep windshield clear of rain, snow, ice and fog. Never slam on your brakes if the road is wet or slippery. Guard against that one accident that might take your life or ruin it. For your own sake, be careful. And now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. An unidentified man is murdered in Yokohama, Japan. And Ken Thurston believes him to be Professor Abbott, a missing meteorologist who had been working on top-secret weather and radar stations in Alaska. But when they arrive at the Naruka weather station, they're met by a girl. A girl who greets them with a gun in her hand and a startling statement. You heard me. You're too late to speak to the professor. I just killed him. Very interesting. Mind telling us why? Anna Cola don't cotton the claim jumpers, mister. Claim jumpers? That's right. I staked out a uranium load back in the foothills. Abbott wrecked my claim markers and put his up. Tracked him down here and I managed to get my gun first. Any questions? Yes. Where's the body, Miss uh, Kohler? The next room. Thanks. Boy, he's better than the macro. Yeah. You know, Miss Kohler, that yarn of yours is pretty fishy. You can check the claim stakes for yourself, mister. And if you look close at Abbott there, you can see he's got his gun half drawn. She's right, Mr. Thurston. That's not what Stevens is talking about. Oh? Then what is he talking about? The dead man. He's not Abbott. Hmm? That's right. He's Ivan Vasilov. Runs a coastal trading schooner out of Anchorage. All I know is that he was trying to run a con game on me, and it didn't pay off. This the man you saw from your plane a couple of days ago, Stevens? Well, those are the clothes he was wearing. I guess I just took it for granted he was Abbott. I, um, I'm sorry for the bum steer, Thurston. Uh, so who cares who he was? He's dead. And this dame done it to him. Well, why don't you do something about her, Mr. Thurston? Sure. Go ahead. Oh, put that thing away, Miss Kohler. The authorities in Anchorage will handle this killing business. If and when we ever get back there. What do you mean, Thurston? Well, take a look outside. Outside? It's a raging a blizzard outside. It's a howl, all right. Looks like we'll be snowed in here for a while. Snowed in? With a dead man and a gun, Molly? Ooh. Oh, Ooh. cheer up, Pagan. While we're here, maybe we'll get a couple of questions answered. What kind of questions, Thurston? What happened to Professor Abbott? And why? Oh, 
I don't get it, Mr. X. Why do you want to monkey around with all that junk and stuff? What's here in this weather tower that can tell you anything? It's not what's here, Pagan. It's what's missing. Huh? What's missing? Abbott's top secret. The heart of the equipment. The robot brain. So it's missing. So what? So now we know why the professor's missing, too. It's over this next little hill, Thurston. I spotted it this morning while snooping around for that uranium claim of Anacola's. What about that claim, Stevens? Well, I didn't find a trace of it. But there... That's what I did find. Ah. A remodeled Russian yak fighter play. Sure. Made over into a nice three-place cabin job. That dead man, Vasilov, must have flaunted in here. Why not uh, Anna Kola? No, no. She came overland in the snow track. I saw it. So, uh, what do you think, Thurston? About what? Oh, now, look, I'm no idiot. Abbott was working on something up here, and it was must have been something big, maybe top secret. So? So maybe he didn't disappear because he wanted to. Maybe somebody was after him for that top secret. Maybe on a cola of a sea law. Or both. You're coming up with a lot of theories, Stevens. What about proof? <laughs> I got a hunch that's your job, Thurston. But I'd sure like to know what's going on in Anna Cola's mind. Gun, really? After all, what kind of a girl must you think I am? Oh, come on, baby. <laughs> Move over a little closer. After all, it's it's cold outside. <laughs> oh, <Pagan. laughs> Oh, can I help it if I am so impetuous? Oh, come on, baby. Oh, but after all, we hardly know each other. Oh, so who cares? When you and me could make such beautiful music together... What say we start tuning up, eh, maybe? Hey, God. <laughs> Mr. Thurston might be back any minute. What would he think? Oh, what difference does it make what he thinks? After all, he takes his orders from me. Does he really? Oh, sure, sure. So, come into Papa's arms. Uh, we got things to talk about. Real interesting things. <laughs> but I think you're so interesting, Peggy. Hmm? Doing such dangerous and exciting work. Oh. W- working for the government and everything. Uh, g- government? Who said that? Why, Mr. Thurston did. He did? Well, of course. He told me all about the two of you. He told me everything. Everything? That's right. How do you like that? He makes me promise not to tell anybody that he's the man called X, and then he goes around to do... (gasps) Thank you, Pagan. Huh? (laughs) For for, for what? For being so sweet and talkative. Hmm? I just got to give you something in return. You do, baby? (laughs) Like what? Like... Yes. Oh. Uh, it looks like we're beating our feet for nothing, Thurston. If Anna Cola did stake out a uranium load around here, the storm's covered it. Yeah. Might as well head back for the weather station. Storm's died down enough now for us to... Hey, what's the matter? Listen. Holy smoke, my plane. First... Yeah, Anna Cola. There it is, Thurston. Starting the taxi. Yeah. It's Anna Cola, all right. L- look at it. Heading right toward us. Jump, Stevens. Quick. How do you like that? The seal off wasn't enough for her. She tried to get us, too. And she's left us stranded out here. Not quite. There's still the sea loves plane. Come on. Let's get back to Anchorage.
Hey, I don't get it, Mr. X. Why all this rushing around Anchorage this way? I've got a little work to do. But you've already done some work. Calling that colonel at the air base and finding out that color cookie filed a uranium claim with that land recorder. And and what are you looking for down here at the docks, anyway? I just found it, Pega. Huh? You found what? Ivan Vasilov's trading ship. But that Vasilov's character is dead. Who's going to be on board now? Suppose you get yourself a short beer while I find out. <laughs> That's the first thing I've heard in Alaska that makes any sense. See you later, Mr. Rex. Welcome aboard, Mr. Thurston. Well, who are you? I merely happened to be the dead man you found at the Naruka weather station. Ivan Vasilov. So, Mr. Thurston, have you figured it out yet? About Professor Abbott, I mean. It wasn't too tough, Vasilov. You wanted the secret of that robot mechanism. So you kidnapped Abbott. Only he escaped in Yokohama and was shot for his trouble. True, quite true, Mr. Thurston. And is that all? Not quite. With Abbott gone, you needed the mechanism itself. So you had to send for an expert. He was the man Anna shot, Naruka. Yes, the poor girl really believed that you were all after uranium. But that does not matter now. What does? The fact that we shall leave Anchorage shortly to rendezvous with a submarine in the Gulf of Alaska. It already has the robot mechanism aboard. What your fate shall be from then on, I I leave to your imagination. I see. Stand fast, everybody. Hey, go. Don't you worry about the thing, Mr. Thurston. We've come to the rescue. Should the first pirate that moves, Mr. Stevens, we'll make them walk the plank afterwards. How'd you ever dream this one up, you idiot? Ha! That's crafted it for you. I meet Mr. Stevens in the docks. We see you bump into this character in the cabin. I risk my life to come on board and save you from worse than death. And then you call me an idiot. Don't take my word for it. Ask Stevens. Stevens? How could you know how big an idiot I am? Because he's the man we've been looking for. The brains of the outfit that killed Abbott. He, he is? Who? Who? All right, Ivan. Give me the gun. You get the ship on the way. Of course, comrade. We will be started. Sure. So, Thurston. You had me figured, too. Hmm? That's right. You knew too much about the landing field conditions at Naruka. That meant you'd been there recently. You identified the dead man as Vasilov when his papers said differently. It all added up to something, Stevens. Now you know what? A one-way trip to you and the radar equipment. But what about me, Mr. Stevens? I, I didn't figure out nothing. Hmm, come to think of it, Zellschmidt, that's right. Sure, sure it is. So I guess I, I just uh, take myself a mosey onto the dock. Hey, Mr. Stevens? Why don't I save you the trouble, Zellschmidt, hmm. by shooting you now? Oh, that's the ticket. Save me the trouble by shooting me now. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> What's the trouble? What's going on out there? I say that Colonel Bishop's men are taking over. Colonel? That's right. I tipped them off that I might run into trouble here. All right, drop the gun, Stevens. All right, drop it. Okay. Okay. Everything all right, Thurston? Yes, thanks, Colonel. And what about this man here? <laughs> I'm dying, I'm dying. Oh, get up, Hagan. It's all over. It is. Hey, how do you like that? It is. Forgetting something, aren't you, Thurston? That submarine with a robot mechanism aboard? <laughs> We're still one. Oh, that. I imagine we'll get a report from the bombing squadron shortly. Bombing squadron? Yeah. The colonel sent one up over the gulf after I called him. Death bomb practice. Death bomb? What? You can't do that. What about international law? International law. Since when did your kind pay any attention to law? What law gives you the right to kidnap, to murder, and start wars? But don't worry about it, Stevens. Those bombers are practicing in the Gulf of Alaska. They won't hurt anything that doesn't belong there. And I'm sure one of your subs wouldn't violate our territorial waters. Or would it? And now, here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Gene Tatum, Will Wright, John Dana, Lou Merrill, and Peter Leeds. Next week, Lisbon, Portugal, where Ken uncovers a plan to kill the North Atlantic Pact 
a dumb waiter who isn't so dumb, and a man who dies four times. And let me assure you, the latter is not Leon Velasco, who'll be along, of course, as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall transcribed as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find... The Man Called X. The news caused little excitement in the papers or on the air. A sentence or two was enough to inform a disinterested public that Dr. Franz Sarli, convicted Nazi war criminal, had escaped from the mental ward at Strasbourg Military Hospital. And then the incident was forgotten. For who was there to know that this unimportant little episode might result in a major European catastrophe? Might result in World War III? Any word about Sarli yet, Chief? Oh, Cam, come in, come in. No, nothing new yet. They've set up a routine search for him. Probably find him heading for the Russian zone of Germany. Maybe they'd better try Portugal. Portugal? Why should Charlie go there? Well, because the heads of the North Atlantic Treaty are going to meet there in Lisbon. I don't get it, Ken. Chief, do you remember what he was working on for the Nazis during the last war? Oh, how could I forget? The deadliest gas ever invented by man, nerve gas. That's right. But we heard about it in time. Managed to grab both Sally and the... Yes, before the Nazis had a chance to use it. Yeah, I know, but what's that got to do with Lisbon? Chief, I was at Sally's trial when he swore that someday he'd kill the man responsible for seizing the gas. You know who that man is? Well, sure. The chairman of the NATO meeting at Lisbon. The man responsible for the entire defense of Western Europe. Ken. Yes. Good Lord. If he was able to release some of that gas at the NATO meeting, he'd kill the heads of defense for every nation that's... Oh, no. I can't believe it. No, there's no reason on earth to think he'd try anything as fantastic as that. This report came in a few minutes ago, Chief. From Paris. Better read it. Sure. David Bonham, Chief Administrative Aide to the Chairman at the NATO meeting, died suddenly this morning while boarding a plane to Lisbon. Cause of death tentatively diagnosed as an epileptic seizure. So what? Bonham was almost as responsible for stopping Zali from using the gas as the man at Lisbon. Bonham had no previous history of epilepsy... And the symptoms of nerve gas poisoning are identical with those of a seizure. Better keep in touch with me, Ken, from Lisbon. I take it, Senor Thurston, you are traveling to Lisbon on business rather than pleasure, eh? You might call it that, Senor Brava. And this uh, business, it would be connected with the Western Europe defense meeting there, huh? What makes you think that? <laughs> the meeting is so much on my mind. It is possible I leap to an unjustified conclusion. Yeah, it's possible. What's your connection with it, Senor Brava? I am an unofficial goodwill ambassador of the Portuguese government, what you might call a press agent. And this meeting is very important from the standpoint of Portugal's public relations. Mm-hmm. How about devoting some of your talent to private relations, Julio? Ill, sir. How could I have been so blind as not to see you get aboard the plane? <laughs> For a most prosaic reason. I did not get aboard until the very last minute. But speaking of the prosaic, I believe that formal introductions come under that heading. Oh, a thousand pardons. May I present Senor Ken Thurston? 
Senor Thurston, the most beautiful and entrancing of all newspaper women, Senorita Ilse Heller. How do you do, Miss Heller? I will do much better, Mr. Thurston, as soon as Julio brings us cocktails. Cocktails, Ilse? They are available now in the lounge. And we can drink to the NATO meeting. Oh, but of course. You will join us, Senor Thurston. I can hardly refuse to drink to Miss Heller's toast. Um, a dry martini, please. With but, uh... an onion, Julio. Well. And I will have the same. Certainly. I shall be right back. May I take Julio's seat while he's gone? That's why you sent him away, isn't it? I am a newspaper woman, Mr. Thurston, after a news or a story. And you think I can supply one? You have before. Contraband smuggling into the Russian zone. The so-called uh, pre-youth movement in Berlin. Hmm. You know quite a lot about me, don't you? My preference in cocktails, my work. What about this trip of yours to Lisbon? Sorry, Osa. You could be making a mistake. Why? No one stops me from getting a story. Even if it is necessary to cooperate with those on the wrong side of the fence. What's that supposed to mean? If I cannot get a story from you, perhaps I can get it from Julio Brava. And if not from him, well, there's always Dr. Franz Sarley. Isn't there, Mr. Thurston? So you believe this Dr. Franz Zahle represents a real danger to the NATO meeting? That's right, Colonel Lesterville. I'm convinced he'll try to murder our men. Our man here. Probably by using nerve gas. It would be not a very discriminatory weapon, would it? If such an attempt were made at the meeting itself, hmm? Yeah. Well, Colonel? Singer Thurston, I have been placed in charge of security for the meeting. I do not take the responsibility lightly... And I can assure you that all necessary precautions to safeguard the delegates have already been taken. I doubt it, Colonel. Sal is brilliant, insane, and he's a scientist. He'll be one step ahead of every move you and your man will make. Then what precautions would you suggest? The meeting will be held tonight at the University of Camelin. Seen? We've got to keep him out of there. Close the building. Keep it closed until the delegates arrive. Meanwhile, make a security search of every room, every corner, every inch of it. Searching for this Dr. Charlie. And perhaps a cylinder of nerve gas. That's right. Such a procedure would require a hundred extra men. Disrupt the work of half a dozen government agencies. All on the strength of your story. No, no, senora. I am afraid that what you ask cannot be... Uh, your pardon. Yeah. A story like this. Un minuto. For you. Oh? Thanks, Colonel. Hello? Hello, Mr. X. Don't say a word about to whom you're talking to whom, but this is Pagan. What? That's right. Pagan Sergeant. Oh, you'd better meet me outside. Boy, have I ever got some red-hot information for you. Information? Oh, sure. All about Dr. Sarley and nerve gases and stuff. That's right, Mr. X. I'm here in Lisbon working for my cousin Ariba. He figured we could make a killing in slightly used uh, second-hand military secrets. Uh, so I was hanging around at another building looking for a sucker when I bumped into her. Bumped into who? Oh, that cute little Sahela cookie. Some tootsie, eh, yeah, Mr. X? And sure he goes for my accent. I'm still waiting to hear where Dr. Zali comes in. That's right. He's coming into that another meeting to bump somebody off uh, with gas or stuff. Did Elsa tell you that? No, no. She only told me where I could call you. Well, then we talked about old Lang time. She interviewed me once when I was in the Clinton Hamburg. Well, I was framed, you understand? And... Pagan, if you don't stop making sense, sir, help me out. But I'm making sense. Hmm. See? Here we are. Where are we? Why, the guy lives who knows all about Dr. Sard. His name is Mendoza, and he's a friend of a cousin of a cousin of Rebus. He, he said he could sell you plenty. Oh, I, I mean, tell you plenty. You were right the first time, cousin Pagan. Well? Don't worry about the thing, Mr. X. Mendoza said we should walk right in if he wasn't home. Uh, he works for the Lisbon Telephone Company, and sometimes he has to go out and hurry up calls, you understand? He... <coughs> oh, Mr. X. Yes. Mendoza? It, it was. Oh, but, but look at him. 
Oh, what could have done that to him? Nerve gas, Pago. Nerve gas. Getting to this university place, Mr. Rex. The meeting ain't started yet. I want to get in and look around before it does. <clears throat> Good evening, Sir oh. Thurston. You were surprised to see the building closed. What happened, Colonel Estoril? I thought over what you said in my office. I could not afford to take any chances, so I ordered the security search made. And? We found absolutely nothing. Neither Dr. Sali nor his nerve gas are inside. What about telephone wires? Telephone wire. Yes. Was any installation work done today? Why, yes. Additional facilities were placed in the meeting hall for the convenience of the delegates. By a man named Mendoza? Your details are most exact, Senor Thurston. You must have something in mind. A building this size ought to have a utilities conduit for telephone wires, gas and water pipes, and electric cables. It has. Big enough for a man to crawl through, maybe hide in? There is an entrance to it at the edge of the ground. We will check it at once. Then you believe this telephone man, Mendoza, found Sally down here while installing the wires today? He had to get his information someplace, Colonel. And somebody killed him with nerve gas. I uh, would agree with your theory, uh, except for one thing. We have come to the end of the conduit. Nothing lies ahead but the basement, which we have already searched most carefully. I am afraid your Dr. Charlie simply is not down here. Maybe not, but he was here. What makes you say that? This dust on the wall. Someone has been writing in it, making strange symbols. Yeah. Alfred Sally sat here doodling while waiting for your security search to end. An old nervous habit of his. As it is of many men. But these symbols are the formula of the nerve gas. And look here. Just below it. 10 p.m. Repeated a number of times. What time is it now? It's uh, 8.45. Are you thinking the same thing I am? I'm thinking that Sally came through this conduit. That he's hiding somewhere in the building waiting to strike. Colonel... We've got exactly one hour and 15 minutes to stop him. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. A young sailor 2,000 miles from home receives a call that his mother is critically ill. He is needed. He has to take a plane to get there. He doesn't have enough money for the ticket. And so he turns to you because your Red Cross is somewhere near him. If he calls you, answer his call. Help him through your Red Cross. Give and give generously through the 1952 Red Cross Fund Appeal. You answer the call of humanity through your Red Cross. And now Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Schmidt. One hour and 15 minutes. That's all the time Ken Thurston has to stop Dr. Tsarley from using his deadly nerve gas. One hour and 15 minutes to prevent the murder of all the men responsible for the defense of Western Europe. And somewhere in the huge rambling building where the NATO meeting is being held, Tsarley lies waiting. Waiting for 10 o'clock, the hour he intends to strike. We cannot possibly make another search of the building, Senor Thurston. The delegates are already arriving. There is not nearly enough time. Then we'll have to concentrate on guarding the meeting hall. You know where it is? Main banquet hall, third floor. Yes. I'll go there now. You round up all the additional guards you can find. I'll meet you later. Take the private elevator. It will bring you to the security point. Oh, thanks. 
Mind if I share the elevator with you, Senor Thurston? Hello, Bravo. What are you doing here? My duties require me to be in many places, Senor, including the meeting hall. May I ride up with you? Sure, come on. I noticed that you and Colonel Estoril seem perturbed. Could I do something, perhaps, to uh, alleviate your concerns? There's a button with a number three on it. You might try pushing it. As you wish, senor. Julio! Mr. Thurston, wait! Wait for me! Oh, the beautiful senorita Heller. <laughs> I will try to stop the car. Go back for her. Oh. Well, that fixes it, brother. Uh, fixes? You've jammed the controls. The elevator's stuck between floors. Yeah. Why, so it is, yes. Now, how could I have been so clumsy as to do anything like that? That's what I was wondering. There was no alarm button, no phone. I noticed that. Let me see. It is now exactly two minutes past nine. What's time got to do with it? Well, if I were a betting man, Senor Thurston, I would say it will take at least an hour before we are rescued. It will be amusing to learn if I am correct, will it not? If we are not released from here before uh, two minutes past ten... Right, brother, that does it. We can reach that top floor now. Oh, you Americans are so ingenious, senor. A pocket knife, some little effort on the iron grill work of the elevator roof. <laughs> and we are free. Disappointed? In a way, in a way, yes. I lose my bet. It took you only 14 minutes. It is now exactly 9.16. Looking for someone, Colonel Estoril. Oh, uh, Senorita Heller, yes. Uh, Senor Thurston was to meet me here. Something important? I'm still after a good feature story, Colonel. Sounds like you haven't had any luck, Ilsa. Senor Thurston. You are right, I have not. Then why not ask Brava about a stalled elevator? Are you serious? No, I'd like to know the truth about it myself. Very well, I will ask Julio. But don't go too far away. We could have other things to talk about. Besides the business of getting stories. What is all this talk about elevators, Senor Thurston? I can wait, Colonel. How are things going here? I have doubled the guards. Every possible entrance is covered. Every person inside that room has been double-checked. I will swear to it that Charlie is not inside. Nor has he any means of getting in there. Well, it's 9.23. We'll know in just 37 minutes if you're right. Are you? Are you? Oh, for... <laughs> Hello, Mr. Thurston. When do we eat? I'm hungry as a couple of bears. What the devil are you talking about? The refreshments inside that meeting place, Natch. Boy, will we be able to tear into a couple of steaks or two? Colonel, is food going to be served by the, to the delegates? If you are Dover, some light wines, yes. Why? How will they be brought into the meeting room? Oh, no, senor. <laughs> Dr. Charlie could not be disguised as a waiter. The food will be sent up directly from the kitchen to the banquet hall by dump waiter. A banquet hall dump waiter can be pretty good size, Colonel. How close is your kitchen to that conduit we found? Why, it is practically in the next room. There is only... See, you're thirsty. Yeah, come on. Where is it, Colonel? Over there, to the right. Look! It is already on its way to the banquet hall. Take hold of that rope and... It has stopped. Yeah, at the second floor. But the banquet hall is on the third. Maybe we were wrong. Maybe it's only just getting on it now. Look, it is going up again. Grab the control ropes. Of course. I, I have... Stop it, senor. But there is someone pulling on the rope from above. Someone is... Watch it. I call upon you to surrender, Dr. Tarly. In the name of the Portuguese government, I demand... We cannot get to him as long as he has a gun, Senor Thurston. You won't have it long. Keep him busy until I join him. Join him? Yes, on the second floor. But, but why are you running to anyway, Mr. Axel? 
A dumb waiter shaft. It opens into that next room. But Dr. Charlie's on board that thing, Mr. X, with guns and stuff. Watch it now. Drop the gun, Doctor. Drop it. Oh. You got him, Mr. X. You got him. Kill. Was kill for revenge. Your king days are over, Charlie. You're all through. No. A young gas. Nerve gas. What about the nerve gas? Ten o'clock. We'll kill. Ten o'clock. We. Charlie. It's. Is he dead, Mr. X? No, unconscious. Oh, well, same thing. He's cooked. Well, I guess we got that thing all cleaned up, eh, Mr. X? Not quite, Peter. Huh? Take a look at that dumb waiter. There's no gas cylinder in it. That means it's still hidden somewhere in this building. So it's hidden, so what? Charlie can't set it off. No, but a time mechanism can. Or somebody working with Charlie. And he said he was going to kill at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? But it's only 9.53. We got plenty of time to find it. We get on with... Oh, oh, Mr. X! Yes. All of seven minutes. Luck, Colonel? None, senor. I, I have examined every inch of that dumb vapor shaft. Wherever Charlie has hidden that nerve gas, it is not in there. Uh. And it is now three minutes of ten. Yes. Brr, give it my goose pimples. Oh, stop shaking, Pedro. Hmm? Not going to do any good. Wait a minute. You are shaking. Oh, sure, it's getting cold in here. Cold? The air conditioning system. Of course. Where's the main unit located? In the tower of the building. But we have no time. We've got one chance. The dumb waiter. The dumb waiter? Sure. But Come on. Oh, I am with you, senor. Thank you, Pagan. We're going. for Charlie to carry out his threat. Release the gas into the meeting hall through the air conditioning system. And now we are too late. Maybe not. But it is only seconds before ten o'clock. We are coming to the end of the shaft. All right, Colonel, here we go. Look! The India duct with the gas cylinder. Hold it. Don't turn that valve. Don't... It's too late. The gas... Hold your breath, Colonel. Let's have that cylinder. Stand back, Colonel. Some of it got into the room. I am all right, senor. You threw it out of the window in time. But look, the one who was going to... Oh. Yes. Looks like Ilsa Heller finally got her story. And it killed her. But I do not understand that beautiful young girl. Why should she do such a mad thing? Some kinds of madness are hereditary. Hereditary? The records show that Zali had a daughter. I see. What a pity. Two brilliant minds that could have done so much for the world. Becoming twisted and warped. Ending up like this. Elsa and Zali couldn't help themselves, Colonel. But there are plenty of others who can. Sane men who deliberately try to stir up revolution and war in order to conquer the world and don't realize they're only destroying it. Oh, Colonel, they're the ones who are truly insane. And now, here again is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lillian Bayef, Will Wright, Gerald Moore, and Robert Boone. Next week, Kanyangika, East Africa, where a trail of terror leads to a blue elephant, and where Pagan sees nothing but pink elephants, and where a man dies only once. Pagan, Leon Blasco, I'm happy to say, still join us, won't you, when next I return, as the man called it. Good night. <laughs>
The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's transcribed story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this has Hal Gibney saying goodnight for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. It began in Denmark during the Nazi occupation in 1943. Later, Singapore provided one of the links in the chain. And then, a ghost town in Wyoming. But the tragic climax was not reached until a dreaded scourge began in Canada, and the sharp staccato barking of military rifles started a savage and ruthless slaughter. Yeah, I've seen the reports, Ken. Over 1,500 head of cattle already destroyed. Nobody knows how many thousands more will have to go before they get under control. There's nothing else they can do, Chief. I know. The minute foot and mouth disease gets a start, it spreads like wildfire. And the only answer is to destroy the infected cattle. You'll stop to think what would happen if it hit the United States? Oh, major tragedy. Millions of dollars washed down the drain. A beef shortage that could last for years. But I guess we don't have to worry about that right now. Chief, you ever hear of a ghost town in Wyoming by the name of Morton? Morton? Why, no. Should I have? Better read this wire. Hmm? Came in from Washington about ten minutes ago. Ah. Department of the Interior reports Hereford Steer found dying in Morton, Wyoming. Diagnosis confirmed as foot and mouth disease? Yeah. Ken. How, how is that possible? They've got it under control in Canada. This town of Morton must be a thousand miles south of the border. How could the virus have possibly gotten down there? Pretty interesting question, isn't it? Hmm. You wondering about sabotage? I'm wondering what Dr. Carl Blomquist is doing these days. Blomquist? The Danish scientist? The expert on diseases of cattle? Yeah. He was suspected of collaborating with the Nazis in biological warfare experiments. Sure, but it was never proved. Matter of fact, he's been living in the United States for some years now. That's right. I just checked on him. He's running a small cattle ranch about 50 miles outside of Morton, Wyoming. What's the nearest airport? Cheyenne? No, oh, don't bother, Chief. I've already got my ticket. Sure, I reckon we can fix you up with a charter plane, mister. Where are you figuring on flying to? Up around Morton. Morton? You sure that's where you want to go? Any reason why not? Well, it's none of my business, mister, but Morton's a ghost town. Nobody's lived there for over 50 years. Except maybe Jim Saunders. Saunders? Yeah, that's him out there. Gassing up that plane on the parking strip. He lives around there or somewhere close by. And maybe he'll fly you out there. But why not ask him? Yeah, I think I will. Thanks. Sure, sure thing, mister. Glad to help. Hello there. You, Jim Saunders? So what if I am? Well, they tell me you're flying out toward Morton. Yeah, what's it to you, Mac? I'm looking for a lift out that way. Oh, sure. Another government snoop. One lousy cow gets foot and mouth disease, and you think a Russian A-bomb fell on the joint. Go peddle your paper someplace else, Mac. I'm flying out there alone. Have it your own way, Saunders. I can get another plane. Yeah, but if you do, Mac, don't come anywhere near Morton. You get that? Don't come near Morton. Why not? What are you afraid of? I'm not afraid of anything. 
You hear? I'll kill any guy who calls me yellow. I'll kill him. Take it easy, Jim. Now, take it easy. This knucklehead here called me yellow. <laughs> it's a laugh, huh, Bill? Guy who's thrown lead from Buzan to Heartbreak Ridge, and he calls me yellow. Why, that dirty low Jim, down... Jim, stop it. Stop it right now. Okay. Okay. Get the plane ready. I've got the supplies. Better start loading them aboard. Yeah, okay, I'll load them. Just remember what I said, Mac. Stay away from Morton. I'm sorry. Jim's a little ill. He's had some pretty rough sledding in Korea. Yeah, I guess he has. How are you, Bill? All right, Ken. Wyoming's pretty strange territory for you, isn't it? What makes you say that? The last time we met was in Singapore, 1949. The bar at the Queen's Hotel. Yeah, I remember. We had martinis with an onion. Uh huh. We also had a little discussion about some Far East military secrets you were buying and selling. That was in 1949. Oh, there's still an open market in 1952. Oh, what would that have to do with Wyoming, Ken? That's what I was wondering. You can stop. My slate's clean. Bell Castino's gone legitimate. I'd like to believe that. You can. All right, Bell. We're ready to go. Be right there, Jim. What about him, Bell? Jim Saunders? I told you. He's sick. Yeah, but what's your connection with him and the town of Morton? I live near there. He's a friend. Come on, Bell. Let's scramble. Goodbye, Ken. It was nice seeing you again. Wyoming's a big place, but maybe we'll run into each other. Yeah. Maybe we will. Man, don't look like you had any luck with Saunders, mister. No, I didn't. Well, I reckon we can find you another plane. <laughs> I knew it was a queer one, but I figured you might have had a chance. Maybe you would have said if it wasn't for all that scientific stuff he's loaded aboard. What scientific stuff? Oh, all them test tubes and glass bottles and laboratory stuff. That's what he's packing along to Morton with him. Sure is queer. Can't rightly figure what he'd want with junk like that in cattle country. <laughs> Can't figure it at all. Tower from NCX-327... Request clearance for takeoff. Over. NCX-327. Runway's yours. Scramble any time. And wait, hold it. This guy just came in here. Hey, hey, you can't do that. Hey, you, help, you. Help, Mr. Thurston. This is Bacon's Elspeth. Don't take off yet. Wait for me. Wait for me. you like it for you, I got in time, eh, Mr. X? That's a matter of opinion, Pagan. Oh, sure. I knew you'd be glad to have my invaluable services. That's why Mr. Chief sent me up down here after you. You mean you conned him into it? Uh, yes. Uh, no, uh, oh, Just, Mr. Uh, what do you know about what's going on here? <laughs> what a question. Well? Hmm. Nothing. That's what I thought. Pagan, wait, 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 please. I, I know just what you're going to say, Mr. X. Please, don't say it. Don't. But, but before I'm through, I'll... I'll help you plenty with all this little sick cows with the hoops and the mouse and, 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 and everything for, uh, for a slight consideration, of course. Okay, Pagan. End of the line. I don't get it, Mr. X. I thought we were going to that ghost town. What's this place? Dr. Carl Blomquist Ranch. Blomquist? Hey, hey, I remember him. He was a big scientific shot in Denmark or someplace. Uh, always making good experimental stuff. Yeah. So what are we going to see him for? To learn what he can tell us about foot and mouth disease. We are? But, uh... What's yeah. going on? Watch it. That tall grass. Quick. We gotta get out of here. We gotta get out. Yeah, that's going to be kind of tough. The shots came from the top of that mesa. Must have a scope sight. 
The minute we move out of this grass, you'll have us. But if we stay here, he'll pick us off like a couple of sitting bulls. Well, be down <laughs> if he doesn't get us before then, we'll be in the clear. But, but... <laughs> Look, Mr. X, why don't we just get into that airplane and go back to Cheyenne? Maybe that character with the rifle is still hanging around. I came out here to ask Blomquist some questions about foot and mouth disease, Pago. And I got a few more to add to the list. What kind of questions? We land a plane practically in the front yard. Somebody uses us for target practice. And nobody's come around to see what the fuss is all about. Hey, hey, that's right. Hey, maybe the Germans deserted and everybody took it on the land. That's one of the things I want to find out. Look in the bunkhouse and the outbuildings. I'll check the ranch house. Then come back here and let me know what you find. But but it's dark out there, Mr. X. <laughs> oh, go on. Okay, okay. Ah, what a mishmash just because I'm crazy talking. Around somewhere. You better stop right there. Well, sounds like you've got something to back up that argument. I have. A 30 out 6, and it's pointed right at you. Oh, wait a minute. You're not Doc Blomquist. That makes only one of us who's surprised. And you wouldn't be if you had a light on. Thanks. Well, nice rifle you've got there. You always use a scope sight for close work like this? I'll ask her questions, mister. Who are you? My name's Ken Thurston. Thurston, sure, sure, it had to be. Why? Because I'm Matt Taylor. Is that supposed to mean something to me? It should. I'm the man who's going to kill you. Well, at least it's nice to know it. At a time, any particular reason why? Yeah. For infecting my cattle with foot and mouth disease. Just like you did them up in Canada. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. To almost everyone, the response to suffering or distress is the instinctive desire to do something helpful and to do it quickly. Your Red Cross is that same merciful impulse magnified many thousands of times. The Red Cross does roll up its sleeves and go to work for the helpless and wounded. Through the Red Cross, you help the injured and homeless in the desperate hours of emergency, and later in the rebuilding of their lives and homes, you help to provide blood and blood plasma to our civilian hospitals. You are the Red Cross, and through the Red Cross, you assist your neighbors next door or across the nation every day of the year. Answer the call of humanity. Give and give generously through the 1952 Red Cross Fund Appeal. And now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. When a steer is discovered in the ghost town of Morton, Wyoming, infected with a dreaded foot and mouth disease... Ken Thurston, suspecting possible sabotage, flies to the ranch of Dr. Carl Blomquist, Danish expert in the diseases of cattle. But when Ken investigates the apparently deserted ranch house, he's stopped by an armed man who threatens to kill him for a most unexpected reason. That's right, Thurston. I'm going to kill you for infecting my cattle with foot and mouth disease, just like you did them up in Canada. Very interesting. I suppose you've got proof for that statement. Well, proof enough for me. Like what? Thirty head of my cattle quarantined this afternoon. A broken hypodermic needle I found out on the range. Blomquist's phone call. What phone call was that? When I heard him make on the party line saying you were coming out here about the virus. All adds up, Thurston. Yes, only I got a different answer. Yeah, but mine is the one that counts. You can't weasel out of it, Thurston. One squeeze on this trigger and you... <laughs> What the devil? Who are you? Introductions later. Hello. What? Sounds like a roaster, eh? 
Who's the joker for the rat? Let him wait, Big. I'm not bothering you. Me? Why should anything be... Who? Oh, Who? Oh. oh, Mr. X. The Dr. Blomquist. What about him? He's out in the barn. Dead. Blood all over. Right, Mr. X, I went looking around in the barns and things like you said. And when I turned the light on the displays, uh, that's what I found. Yes. It's Blomquist, all right. Oh, but, but who would want to do such a thing to him? And, and why? Take a look at those storage bins back there. Hey, now look at all that junk, Mr. X. Tubes and glasses and jars and glasses and tubes. Yeah, look here. The stuff inside this beaker looks like a culture of soup. It does? Why should anybody cook soup in the barn? To get a concentrate. What? Pagan, I'd be willing to bet that Blomquist was developing the virus of foot and mouth disease in here. You collect your Ooh. pitch in? Yeah. Hello, Bill. Thought you flew to the town of Morton with Jim Saunders. I did. Then what are you doing here? And how do you know about this culture? That's easy, Ken. My name isn't Belle Castino anymore. It's Mrs. Carl Blomquist. Well, if the show and you're spinning is straight goods, Thurston, I guess you got an apology coming. And I deserve that sock on the jaw. Now, let's say you jumped to conclusions a little too fast, Taylor. Uh, it sure looks like it, all right. What with Doc Blomquist being the skunk I was really after. Uh, sorry, ma'am. It's all right, Mr. Taylor. You're still jumping too fast, Matt. Uh, I am. But you just said that Mrs. Blomquist here admitted that stuff in the doc's lab was foot and mouth virus. That's right. But my husband wasn't deliberately infecting cattle with it. He was trying to develop a vaccine that would wipe out the disease. Oh, I don't know. Maybe that poke you give me rattled up my brain some, Thurston, but I still don't see foot and mouth jumping all the way down here from Canada by itself. And you can't get around that dead steer they found at Morton. On my 30 head, the inspector's got in quarantine. I think you're right, Taylor. Somebody deliberately infected those animals with the virus, but it wasn't Dr. Blomquist. Uh, what makes you so sure? Well, the fact that he was murdered. Of course, it's obvious. Carl found out who was really responsible. And he was killed to make certain he wouldn't talk. Oh, okay, then. Who was it? Care to answer that for him, Bill? Huh, I'd be happy to if I could, but I'm afraid that... Oh, still thinking about Singapore in 1949. I was thinking that for a recently bereaved widow, you show a surprising lack of grief. Mm. How long were you married? Two weeks. Where were you married? Still as brilliant as ever, aren't you, Ken? Where, Bill? Yes, you're right. In Canada. I don't get it, Mr. X. You practically put the finger on that luscious lollipop, Bel Castino, and then you borrow this, this rattle trump truck from here to go visiting ghost towns. What do you want to learn in this Morton joints anyway? How oh, that steer got put in mouth disease. Why Jim Saunders wants laboratory equipment in cow country? Who killed Carl Bumpquist? Look, Mr. X, if that Jim Saunders catches us monkeying around his laboratory, he's liable to blow our heads off a couple of times or two. Okay, Pagan, I've seen enough. Let's get out of here. You mean you found out something? Yeah. Why Saunders wanted all that lab equipment? I bet he's cooking up some uh, some of that virus soup. No. His interests run more to rocks. What kind of rocks? Oh, you wouldn't know. Carboniferous dolomite. Huh? Hey. Hey, there's Saunders' airplane up there. Yeah, that's why he wasn't around when we came calling just now. Believe me, I like it better that way. I... A bomb, Mr. X. He's starting to drop a bomb. That's no bomb. It's attached to the body of the plane by a cable. But it looks like a bomb. If it's not, what is it? It's a magnetometer. A magno who? Let's get back to the ranch. I've got work to do. You're 100% right, Ken. The geological survey's checked right down the line. 
mine. But how you ever figured that one out, I'll never know. That's all important now, Chief. Any other reports of foot and mouth disease come in? Uh, not so far. The Lord only knows what'll happen in the next 24 hours. You won't have to wait more than two. What do you mean? What's going to happen in the next two hours? It's already happened. The sun's gone down in Wyoming. Oh, believe me, Mr. X. This ain't a fit night out even for cows. Look at them moving around out there and, and, and making funny noises. There's a storm coming up. Thunder and lightning always make cattle nervous. Taylor will be lucky if his stock don't stampede. Sure, just what I said. <laughs> so why don't we stop hiding this, these rocks and go back to the ranch house? We can wait there for whatever we're waiting for. This is the only part of Taylor's herd that's not under quarantine now. Whatever's going to happen tonight will happen right... Yeah, listen. So what? Another cow coming up to get a little company. That's a horse and rider, you idiot. Quiet now. Mr. X, whoever it is has stopped right in the middle of all those cows. Yeah. Hey, what's that spray gun thing there? Hypodermic for cattle. Loaded with the virus of foot and mouth disease. It is, but but it's going to be used on those cows. It's, it's going to... All right, hold it. You're all through, Saunders. Drop the hypo and get away from those cattle. So it was you I saw when I flew over Morton today. I suppose you've got it all figured out, eh? Sure, Saunders. Oil. Oil? But the foot and mouth and the, the, the soup, what, what's got to do with the oil? The dolomite samples and the magnetometer said there was oil under Taylor's ranch. But Saunders wanted it all for himself. Wanted to drive Taylor out. Bromquist and his virus provided the answer. Sure. You hadn't stuck your nose in. There'd be enough infected cattle here by morning to clean off the entire range. They're still going to be. Don't shoot, Saunders. The cattle will stampede. <laughs> you won't stop me now. The cattle, Saunders. You've started a stampede. Get over behind these rocks before it's too late. He's, he's trying to run away from them, Mr. Rex. Yeah. They're on all sides of him. And, oh, look. Look. Mr. X, he... He didn't make it. Yeah. He learned his lesson, Pega. He learned that there's a deadlier virus than foot and mouth disease. A thing called greed. And now, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Lucille Meredith, Will Wright, Herb Vigran, Lamont Johnson, and Bob Griffin. Next week, the jungles of Malaya and a search for a man who doesn't deserve to be called a man. Rather, a monster. And, no, I don't mean Leon Belasco, although he'll be along as usual as Fagon Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. The story is written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. truck lurches slowly along a rough, muddy road somewhere in the jungles of Malaya. The driver keeps glancing warily at the masses of steaming vegetation on either side. And perhaps that is why he doesn't notice the rounded bit of brass buried in the road ahead. Chief. Well, Ken, you still in Shanghai? That's right. Good. Better catch the next plane out of there for the Philippines. We're all ready to crack down on that black market ring. Sorry, Chief. I'm going to Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur? Well, for heaven's sake, why, Ken? Padang Nipa is dead. How did it happen? A cholera epidemic? No, a landmine. Murder? Sure. And I suppose they got two birds with one stone. Blow up a truckload of medical supplies at the same time. That's and... right. Ken, there hasn't been enough medicine getting through to the villages in the cholera belt to handle 10% of the cases. And Padang was the only man who could get that through. You'd think those gorillas would want to help their people instead of blowing up and hijacking their medicines. Not when they need that epidemic for propaganda purposes. Not when they can accuse the British and the Americans of using biological warfare against them. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about it? Try to stop them. Alone? Got any other ideas, Chief? Welcome to Kuala Lumpur. Hello, Pagan. Pretty small world, eh, Mr. X? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Bet you're plenty surprised to find me here, all right, huh? Why should I be? I sent you a while to meet me here. You did? Hey, hey, <laughs> that's right, you did. Yeah. What have you found out for me? Well, uh... Don't look now, Mr. X. But look over there and you'll see a taxi cab. Tell the driver Pagan sent you. Then what? He'll take you to a joker who can give you all the information you want about who is stealing medicine and how and stuff. <laughs> For a slight consideration, of course. Okay, I'll try it. Hmm? Meet me at the Baru Hotel in two hours. <laughs> you bet, Mr. Thurston. I'll be there, Jiminy, on the spot. Yes. You uh, wish a number one taxi, Mr. Yes? That depends. On whether you know where to take me. Oh, Chenyong, no, all Kuala Lumpur. He take on about Mr. Anywhere. Oh, where you wish to go? Suppose I leave that up to you. To Chenyong? That's Pagan's suggestion. Ah, ah, so, so. Honorable Mr. Dale Smith, yes, yes. Well, Chen Yung take Mr. Where he wish to go, yes. Uh, please allow Chen Yung to assist you, Mr. Hey! Oh, oh. sound, it'll be your last, understand? Okay. Now, who are you? I, I am John Nipa, Mr. Thurston. John Nipa? Padang's son? Yes, uh, that is right. What are you doing aboard this sampan? Your friend, Sasmith. He saw Chang Yong strike you down. He followed you here, then told me about it. But I did not expect to find you free. I just got rid of the ropes before you came in. Now, let's get out of here before Chen Yung comes back. So, 
Chen Yong is one of the guerrilla leaders. It is so, Mr. Thurston. He controls the territory to the north of Sai Wing, my father's village. Could it be dangerous for him to visit Kuala Lumpur unless the stakes were large enough? Eventual control of Malaya is quite a large stake, Mr. Thurston. And the cholera epidemic is made to order for those like Chen Yong. Yeah, that biological warfare gag is a pretty strong propaganda. The villagers swallowing it? My honorable father could prevent that as long as he was alive. But now... Yeah. Where have you been getting your medicines? Uh, we have been buying them from Mr. Stanley Thompson. Thompson? Uh, an importer of medical supplies. A wonderful friend of our people. Even if we have no money to purchase, we still receive the medicines. Good. Take me to Stanley Thompson. What are you going to do, Mr. Thurston? Deliver a supply of medicine to the hospital at Sai Wing. Uh, by yourself? Well, why not? But that will only give the guerrillas another opportunity to destroy a shipment. And to kill you, as they did my father. You know something, John? You may be right. <laughs> I must say, that is quite an order you've given us, Mr. Thurston. Quite an order. One would almost think it was for a hospital rather than an individual purchaser. It is for a hospital, Mr. Thompson, the one at Sai Wing. At Sai Wing? Oh, I assure you, you must be joking, sir. Why? There's a cholera epidemic, isn't there? Well, yes, of course, but the, the risks involved, the danger. At least wait until you see what uh, success Dr. Timbloff has. Dr. Tembloff? Oh, yes, the head of the hospital at Sai, but... Just a moment, Mr. Thurston. I'll get the doctor for you. Dr. Tembloff, would you mind uh, coming in here for a moment, please? What is it, Mr. Thompson? Oh, there's a gentleman here, a Mr. Thurston. He's also ordering supplies for the hospital. Ordering supplies? What right is he to order supplies for... May I ask what your interest is in our hospital, Mr. Thurston? Maybe I just don't like cholera epidemics, Dr. Tembloff. I understand you need those supplies pretty badly up there. Exactly. If you wish to help, cancel that order and allow me to see that the supplies get through. From what I hear, you haven't been too successful so far. You will not be either, Mr. Thurston, if one is to judge by the company you keep. What's that supposed to mean? I refer to John Nipa. What about him? He's an idealistic fool, as his father was before him. What would you have had them do? Turn their country over to the guerrillas? Why not? What difference does it make what kind of government rules a land? Communist, fascist, democratic. They're all the same. People die from disease under all of them. They can die in concentration camps, too. Only if they are fools and concern themselves with things that are none of their affair. Like freedom? Or medical supplies. Do not make a similar mistake, Mr. Thurston. One can also die from other things in Sai Wing, besides cholera. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. Friends, unless we start preparing now, in a few years our public schools will be as behind the times as the Little Red Schoolhouse. Because of the huge increase in our birth rate during and after the last war, it's estimated that by 1956, there will be some 7 million more children in elementary schools than there are now. We must start preparing at once. More equipment will be needed, textbooks, playgrounds, and above all, more elementary school teachers. To help assure your child a proper education, join and work with local groups and school boards. And for free information about how people in other communities are improving their schools, write to this address. National Citizens Commission for the Public Schools, 2 West 45th Street, New York 19, New York. And now, Act 2 of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. Using a cholera epidemic as the springboard for propaganda about biological warfare, guerrilla bands in the Malayan jungles have been seizing medical supplies intended for the disease-ridden villages of the interior. And now, Ken Thurston has arranged to take a shipment of medical supplies into the village of Sai Wing. Oh, 
Oh, why don't we go back to Kuala Lumpur? After all, once you've seen one hunk of a jungle, you've seen it all. And once you've seen a man dying of cholera, Pig, huh? you never want to see it again. Yeah, but I don't want to see myself dying, neither, Mr. X. We can't get nothing if that Chang Yang knocks us off with boobies and traps and, and, and things. And I'll give you eight to five. He's waiting for us somewhere in this jungle right now. I'll let you in on a little secret, Pig, huh? That's one bet I think you'll win. Ooh. Okay, pig on jump. The truck is a little damaged, Chenyon. The boxes of supplies barely touched. Ah, so, so. That is good, good. Take them to our headquarters at Rafa. And the white men who ran into the jungle as we opened fire? I uh, have no concern, Batang. They will be available when we want them for the execution. What a life. First I get all shot at. Now I'm stuck in the jungle a couple of million miles from nowhere. My Uncle Ahmed warned me there would be days like this with you. Oh, cheer up, Pega. Not as bad as it seems. Oh, sure, sure not. <laughs> Suppose all of a sudden the jungle will come to an end. And somebody will come driving along the road to give us a uh, pick-me-up and... Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, we did find a road. That's right. And there's that lift you were talking about. Mr. Rex, did the John Nippon somebody coming this way in a couple of horses and buggy? Mr. Thurston, you are all right? The bandits did not harm you? Uh, no, uh, we're okay, John. We heard the shooting as we were en route, Mr. Thurston. Really, you had us quite worried. Well, thanks for the solicitude, Thompson. What are you doing out here? Well, naturally, I could hardly have helped learning of your plans. Your rendezvous here with the young Mr. Nippa. And inasmuch as I feel a rather, well, personal interest in the medical supplies, I persuaded him to allow me to come along. Plans, rendezvous. That's simple enough, Pago. I asked John to take this plantation boat to Sai Wing with the medicines while we played decoy for Chen Yung. You, you mean there wasn't any medicine on, on, on board the truck we were driving? That's right. John's got them hidden away in his cart. Now we're going to take the supplies into the hospital at Sai Wing. And what of Mr. Thompson and me? Do you wish us to accompany you there also? No, you brought saddle horses along right back to Kuala Lumpur. Get in touch with the authorities. Tell them the guerrilla headquarters are in the village of Rasa. They'll know what to do. But Rasa? You seem a little startled, Thompson. Why? Well, no reason, actually, except that, well, if you are right, it might mean the end of a good deal of the trouble out here. Yes, Mr. Thompson. Thanks to Mr. Thurston, it would seem the end is at hand. <laughs> Wait for me here, Pig, huh? I go to the hospital and check. <laughs> what a joker. Where could I go in a dump like Sai Wing? May I ask what you are doing in Sai Wing, Mr. Thurston? I'm afraid I didn't take your advice very seriously back in Kuala Lumpur, Doctor. You mean you brought medical supplies? That's right. You fool. Well, that's hardly the reaction I expected. I am attempting to operate a hospital, Mr. Thurston. We are faced with a raging epidemic. It is my duty to my patients to obtain the drugs necessary to cure them, wherever those drugs are obtainable. Yeah. So you make a deal with the gorillas. They give you the medicines you want, and in return, you let them take what they want. Your patients, the village of Sai Wing, all of Malaya. Why not? I have no enemies, but disease. Sure, lock yourself in your ivory tower. Refuse to admit what's going on in the world. But someday it's going to catch up with you. 
It would seem to have already caught up with you, Mr. Thurston. Well, Chen Young, so you decided to take over Sai Wing instead of returning to Rasa? Yes, Mr. Thurston. Nothing can prevent us from attaining our goal. After the failure of your infantile attempts to obtain military assistance should prove to you. What's that supposed to mean? Your friends, John Nipa and Stanley Thompson, have already been apprehended by my men. As soon as they arrive here, we shall see that certain long-delayed executions are no longer delayed. I tell you how sorry I am, Mr. Thurston. I feel as though I... I've let you down somehow. As though I... Oh. If you would remain still and quiet, Mr. Thompson. Mm. I could treat this leg of yours with less pain. Mm. She's right, Thompson. Take it easy. You've got nothing to reproach yourself uh, for. Yes, but I feel that I have, sir. I... I couldn't do much during the last war. Home guards, you know. I lost a son, the RAF. Oh. Just without here, but I thought I might help a bit. My medicines, delivering your message to the military and all, and... Well, I guess I've just... Oh. Oh. I've just flubbed it. No, Thompson. You haven't flubbed anything. Sure, that's right, Mr. Thompson. So maybe me and Mr. Thurston are all tied up here and cling. That Chang Young can't do anything to us, but... But shoot us. Uh-huh. That's all I can do now, Mr. Thompson. There is a bare possibility that I can save your leg. But it will require a good deal of treatment. And you'll have to... I regret the interruption, Doctor. But it's time for one of the prisoners to stand trial on charges of treason. Not wasting any time, are you, Chen Yong? Oh, do not be alarmed, Mr. Thurston. It is Mr. Thompson we are after now. Thompson? There's nothing too low for your kind, is there? But that is impossible. The man is sick. He is in no condition to stand trial now. Unfortunately, my dear Doctor, we have already convened the... Uh, Court. Our time is too valuable to waste. Take him along. Stop! I forbid it! This man is a patient of mine. I will not allow you to remove him from here in his present condition. I give the orders, Doctor. Please, I, I don't mind, Doctor. Let them do what they want. There's nothing to fear, really. Not as long as you can stand up and face the enemy. Recognize him for what he is. <laughs> I mean, that sounds a bit mixed up and foolish, I guess, but... Oh, goodbye, Mr. Thurston. Mr. Selsmith. Doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Thompson. Take him away. They took him. My patient. They promised. They would not interfere with my hospital. But, but they... They took him. They... Oh, oh Mr. Thurston. What price ivory towers now, Doctor? This cannot make amends, Mr. Thurston. But perhaps in some small way it may help. If you will hold out your hands, I will cut the ropes. It is, Pela. The armored jeep the doctor told us about. So what? There's a guard alongside. We can't get to it. Nothing like trying. Come on. <laughs> All right. Let's get aboard. What's up? The jeep, what is happening? For the prisoners now escaping, shoot them, you hear? Boy, 
Why, some classy stuff, eh, Mr. Hex? Nothing like riding back to Kuala Lumpur in comfort, I always say. We haven't reached Kuala yet. Oh, sure, sure. But from now on, there is nothing but easy sailing. You have been falling off, Mr. Turtle. This is the end of the rope. You seem pretty sure about that, John. John? This machine gun starts. I have a right to be. Mr. Rex, it's John Nipa. But why is he standing in those bushes pointing the gun at us? Because he's one of Chen Yong's finest assistants. And dirtiest spies. Assistants? Spies? But, but, but... I will prefer putting it another way, Mr. Thurston. Uh, let us say that I am a loyal, patriotic citizen of the People's Republic of Malaya. There we go again. But do make no sense, Mr. Rex. He was helping us and his father, Padang Nipa. What's a little thing like murdering a father, Pagan? Well, it might be a benefit to the state. My father was a traitor to his people. Oh, sure. He sold them out by devoting his life to their welfare. Betrayed them by trying to bring them food, medicine, peace. So not me nothing. We do not see the sentimental theory. All there is the reality. Yes. Like that gun you're holding. All those planes flying overhead. Planes? That's right, John. British planes. Contacted by this jeep's radio. They're carrying twin cargoes to Sai Wing. Soldiers to take care of Chen Yong and his men. And medicines for the cholera. If you want realities, John, take a good look at them. All right, Mr. Wilson. I have a look at them. No, it is your turn to face reality. At my gun. Chad, he's going to shoot. He's going to shoot. Keep your head down, Pagan. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm dead. I'm dead. I, I... Hey, hey, what happened to John Nipa? Let's take a look. <laughs> Mr. X. No. It's unconscious. You live to face trial and koala. Oh. Well. Well, I guess that... Winds things up, hey, Mr. X? It doesn't wind anything up, Pega. Why not? We took care of him and Chen Yang. There'll be no more cholera inside wing. Not the cholera I'm talking about. It's another disease. The disease that infected John Nipa, Chen Yong, a lot of others. We've got to find a cure for it, Pega. Before it destroys the world. Now, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Gene Tatum, Will Wright, Howard McNair, Robert Boone, and Tony Barrett. Next week, the Desert of Death in Afghanistan, where Ken Thurston runs into one of the most vicious characters he's ever known. Quite apart, that is, from Leon Belasco, who'll be along as Pagan Gonzalesmith. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. The story is written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Herbert Marshall as The Man Called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find The Man Called X. The time is shortly 
after midnight. Somewhere in the U.S. zone of Germany, an army transport plane has taken off from a secret air base and with throttles wide open is roaring through the moonless night, roaring toward the east, toward Czechoslovakia and the Iron Curtain. Ken, you can't do it. You're signing your own death warrant. Maybe. What else can you call parachuting into Czechoslovakia, trying to work your way into the Yakimov uranium mines? Look, Chief. Johan Van was an old friend. The reports from Prague say he's been sentenced to slave labor in those mines. I ain't going to try and get him out. I know how you feel about Van, but Ken, you're too valuable a man to throw your life away like this. No man's life is as valuable as freedom. And Johan Van is one of the leaders of the Czech underground, one of the men who's trying to keep freedom alive. Sure he is, but they... Pilot's warning signal? Yes. Yes, we're... Over the forest outside of Carlsbad. You won't reconsider? Sorry. Be seeing you, Chief. So long. Good luck, Ken. That's the latest glorious pronouncement from Moscow. The news. Read up the news. The news. A copy of the Klausbad Zeitung, please. Yeah, I'm in here. The Zeitung. Thanks. Here. Danke schön, ma... This is kind you gave me, mein Herr. It has the face of Jean Masaryk on it. That's right. But these coins have all been recalled. They are forbidden by our government since Masaryk was... Since our former president died. Yes, and I understand there's still a demand for them, for um, private circulation. Well? The Grunwald Pottery Mills, 79 Selinstrasse. Purchased from 1980 in Moravian China. Offer the coin in payment. Thanks. Thanks very much. The news, the news read of the latest great message from Moscow. Here you are, mein Herr. Our finest examples of Moravian china. And I warn you, they are very expensive. Yeah, I imagine they are, Fräulein Grunwald. Would this be enough to pay for them? Who sent you? The news vendor on the Leninstrasse. What do you wish? A way to get into the Akimov uranium mines. You wish to arrange the escape of Johann Werner. Do I? Only five of our leaders possess coins like that. Johann Werner is one of them. Also, he is imprisoned at Yakimov. So? First, we must give you a new personality. That of Hans Obdahl. Hans Obdahl. Registration cards, police permits, ration cards, everything. And then? You will go to the Hradic Mineral Bath for three days. At exactly two o'clock, you will bathe in pool number seven. Upon one of those days, somebody will contact you. How will I know when it's the right person? When you enter the Yakimov mines. <laughs> ah, it is pleasant in the mineral bars. Do you not find it so, my hair? Yeah, very pleasant. Yeah, yeah. One rests here. Relaxes. Hey, help, darling. You know me? <laughs> no. <laughs> we have never been introduced. I am Anton Gora, by the way. Yeah, Gora. But I make it a habit to inquire of the attendants as to the names of the other bathers. It always makes for an opening to a conversation. Yeah, I guess it does at that. And now that I have opened the conversation, I can bring up the subject of... Uh, the Yakim of uranium mines? What makes you think I'm interested in them? Our files, of course. By the way, I'm associated with the secret police. Yeah? Our files are most explicit in the matter of Hans Opta. Very interesting. Someone tip you off? You misjudge her, my friend. Fräulein Grunwald's intentions were of the best, but she could hardly be aware that certain members of the secret police have infiltrated the underground movement. Uh, and now what? You wish to enter the Akim of Mines, Herr Optal. I will see that your wish comes true. You may have the opportunity of spending the rest of your natural life there. But, but I don't want... 
want to go behind no iron curtains, Mr. Chief. Honest, I don't. Del Schmidt, you're going into Czechoslovakia. But, Mr. Chief... Ken Thurston's been missing for four weeks. All our regular sources of information have drawn blanks. Now it's going to be up to you. But I can't find out nothing about what's going on in Czechoslovakia. Don't give me that. You've got cousins mixed up in every dirty racket in the world. You'll find plenty of them called that. Hoops? What? What was that? The pilot's warning signal. Hey, hey, what did you open that door for? Because you're going to jump. Jump? Oh, no. You've got a parachute. Hoops? There's your signal. Jump. But, Mr. Chief. Del Schmidt. It's your right Have you been in Yakimov now, Herodo? Four weeks. Three days, son, of you. I lost count. After the second year. Yeah, I get what you mean. Obdo, you have inquired at the grapevine concerning the whereabouts of a certain man here in Yakimov. I think perhaps I can help you. How? Leave your barracks two hours after dark. The third shift will be entering the mines. Join them. I can't get back into the mines, son, of the guard will stop me at the checkpoint. You do not have to enter. Just this side of the checkpoint is a tool shed. In there you find the man you seek. Vanna. Who is there? It's Ken. Ken Thurston. Ken Thurston? Oh, Ken, 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 my good friend. Oh, how glad I am to see you. How, uh, but what are you doing here in Yakimov? I came to get you out. Oh, no, no. This is sheer madness, Ken. You have given up your own life for the sake of mine. There is no possible way to escape. I spent four weeks and three days here trying to prove otherwise, Johan. I think maybe I've succeeded. What do you mean? You have found a way? Could be. But we'll need somebody to help us. Uh, Sarnoff. Sarnoff will do anything I ask. Good. Then with luck, we'll be free and cows barred by tomorrow night. So, Comrade Sarnoff, they expect to be free in Carlsbad by tomorrow night. That is right, Comrade Gora. That is why this man, Obdo, wished to contact Berna to assist him in his escape. Very interesting, very interesting. It proves my wisdom in giving Obdo enough rope to hang himself. Huh? Let us visit him at once. Well, they are desperate, comrade. They will know I am a traitor. They will kill me. You alarm yourself unduly, comrade Sarnoff. Or did I neglect to inform you that at the end of the visit, they will both be dead? We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. The United States needs the best qualified young women in our nation to do an exciting, interesting job. If you're a high school graduate between the ages of 18 and 34 with no dependents under the age of 18, you may be able to qualify for a career in the armed forces. If you can meet the qualifications, if you're above the average in intelligence and ability, learn the advantages of joining the armed forces now. And now Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Velasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. A sentence of life imprisonment in the uranium mines of Yakimov, Czechoslovakia. That is the result of Ken Thurston's desperate attempt to help Johann Werner, Czech underground leader, to escape from those mines. However, they make plans to break out not knowing that the secret police have been tipped off as to their intentions. Uh, 
Did you see that can guards heading for the tool shed? Yeah. Somebody's tipped them off. But who could it have been? Our friend Sarnoff was the only one. Ken. Yeah, who else? Lucky we got out of that shed in time. Lucky? What difference does it make now that they know there is no longer any hope for escape? Is there any way we can get into the mine without being stopped at the checkpoint? Uh, yes, there is one, an, an old exit shaft near the tailings. Good. Let's head for it. But, Ken, what good will it do us to go into the mine? It's our only hope of getting out of it. I still do not understand. They leave the mine for the rail yards on this look for this gravity switchback. Then they've made up the into freight trains and hauled into cars. Oh no, no, it is no good, Ken. They search every square inch of those trains before they leave the yards. They don't empty the ore cars to search them. You mean we should bury ourselves beneath the ore? That's right. But we could be crushed to death, perhaps suffocate. What do you think will happen if Anton Goro gets his hands on us? Ah. So, Herr Sir Schmidt, you have come to Carlsbad looking for a certain uh, friend of yours. Yeah, you said it, baby. So how's about coming across with information or stuff, baby? The name is Fräulein Grünwald. Oh, sure, I know. You already told me, baby. So what about this nameless friend of mine, Mr. Thurston? Hmm? What makes you believe we know anything about him at the Grünwald pottery mills? Listen, I got plenty big shot type connections in Carlsbad, see? Yeah. They tipped me off that he came to visit here with you, see? Hmm? Yeah. So you better spill plenty before I give you a couple of degrees or two. Yes, perhaps I had. Well, your friend did come here. Mm. We sent him on to the next station. <laughs> we have heard nothing from him since. Uh, that's a pretty kettle, if I ever heard one. Now, where is this next place? The Hradek Mineral Baths. Hmm? If you wish to learn about your friend, go to pool number seven. Be in the bath at two o'clock for three successive days. Oh, no, no. One of our people will contact you there. Okay, okay. No sacrifice too great, I always say. <laughs> See you later, baby. Anton, this is Ilsa. Oh? I have just sent a uh, visitor to the bath. His name is Terschmidt. He's looking for the other one. And listen, Anton, the other one's true name is Thurston. Thurston? The one we suspect of being the man called X? Exactly. <laughs> it has paid as well to play our little waiting game, Anton. Has it? Of course. If we had turned him over to the NKVD four weeks ago, they would have got all the credit. Now, we turned the man called o X over to Moscow. I'm certain the rewards will be most generous. I do not like to disillusion you, Ilsa. But Thurston has already made his move. Both he and Werner are missing. Missing? You fool! How could you have allowed that to happen? Why be so alarmed, Ilsa? If they do succeed in escaping from Yakimov, they must head for Carlsbad. Ah, yes, of course. Mm. Mm -hmm. And as I said, Anton, I'm certain the rewards from Moscow will be most generous. <laughs> Slowing down, Ken. We've reached the Carlsbad yards. Let's get off. Uh, uh, Carlsbad. I have never hoped to see it again. We're not out of the woods yet. We've got to find a safe place to hide out. Uh, then there is but one place for us to go, one person whom we can trust. You mean Ilse Grunwald? Yes. Oh, 
Tom, I, I do not believe it. I can hardly believe it myself, oh, Ilse. To see you free, out of the mine. Uh, oh, it is like a miracle come to pass. You can thank Ken Thurston for having brought it about. Oh, and I do thank you, Herr Thurston. Well, now, let's see. We will arrange a hiding place in the Bavarian forest. A new headquarters, headquarters from which Johann can guide the destinies of our people. I'm afraid that won't do. What? I do not understand. It is Ken's opinion that I must leave the country. Leave? Czechoslovakia? Oh, no, Johan, that is impossible. Why? Well, he is needed here too badly to give our people strength, hope for the future. He is needed for that on the outside, too. Where he won't be stymied by the secret police, where he can tell the whole world about the situation here. But, but we would have to get you safely across the border. How could it be done? Where would you go? The U.S. zone of Germany, just across the border from the town of Cheb. Cheb? There are military installations there. It is the worst possible place to attempt a cross. Not for military men, Ilsa. Get us army officer uniforms, official credentials. We take the train for Cheb, midnight tonight. Look, baby, I'm tired of taking baths all the time. What are we going to go out and paint up the town anyway? Well, if you will do me a little favor, Pagan, I think we can have some fun tonight. Hey, now you're talking. Go to this address. A man by the name of Anton Gora will be there. Just tell him that the two packages he's looking for will be aboard a train to Chev this very night. <laughs> So far, so good, Ken. In one hour, we will be in Cheb and make good our escape across the border. It uh, yeah, looks like it, Johan. Oh, you sound a bit doubtful, my friend. Why? I'm wondering about Ilse Grunwald. How far we can trust her. Ilse? Well, surely you are not serious. Well, she sent me to the minimal baths and Anton Gora showed up to arrest me. But she did not know that the secret police had killed our contact there. That Gora had taken his place, she explained all that. Can she explain what Gora's doing aboard this train? What? Yeah. Ah, good evening, my friends. Do you mind if I share your table with you? No, no, come out of here. Ah, thank you, thank you. Well, gentlemen, I trust you find the accommodations of our military train satisfactory. I would not wish you to be uncomfortable on your journey to Chab, Mr. X. Oh. Mr. X. It was the babbling tongue of a charmingly obnoxious aide of yours. Hagan Zellschmidt. Yes. We found him most amusing. I'll bet. By the way, he has flown to Cheb with the lovely Ilsa in the mistaken belief that he will help you to escape from Czechoslovakia tonight. I am afraid the wait at the airport will be a long one for him. Yeah. So what goes now? Oh, it is quite simple, Herr Thurston. I shall see to it personally that the two of you make your way safely to the German border. You mean you will help us escape from Cheb? Oh, sure. That's where his guards will shoot us down. Ah, you realize my plan then, Mr. Thurston. It's pretty obvious. The man called X is killed wearing a Czechoslovakian army uniform ah. while helping a traitor cross the border into the United States zone. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a beautiful yarn for your propaganda machine. Exactly. You will be a cause célèbre. Proof to the entire world that your country is fostering war, spreading internal dissension and conflict within the borders of our uh, peaceful nation. Yes. There's only one thing wrong with it, Gordon. Huh? It's not going to work. Oh! All right, Johan, to the platform of the car. Yes, I'm with you, Ken. This way. And now what? We jump. Oh, it is no use. The whole countryside will be alerted. We will never get through the forest now. But you can't go through a wall. You've got to go over it. Come on, jump. But I don't get it, baby. You said we were going out in the town tonight. What are we doing in this Cheb airport joint? I'm waiting for word from Anton Gora as soon as his message reaches me. We, we will be able... Fräulein Gruenwald, please report to the commandant's office. Fräulein Gruenwald, report to the commandant's office at once. There. That must be Anton's message now. Wait for me here. I'll be right back. But, baby... Wait for me. Okay, okay. <laughs> How do you like that? Leaves me out here in the cold, hanging on to a couple of bags. Boy, what a time I've been having. No Mr. Thurston, no smooching, no money. 
Believe me, I'll be plenty glad to get back to the good old USA States. Okay, Peg, now let's go. Oh, Mr. Ed. Yeah, come on. But where are we going? Back to the United States. But, but how? Keep walking over to that plane. We're flying out of here. Plane? That's an army job. They've got guards for those things and stuff. That's keeping off a couple of headaches in the hangar. You found him, Ken. Yeah. Get aboard, Pega. But the cute cookie, Ilza, we got to wait. She, she'll be right back. Oh, you bet she will. The minute she runs, we're the ones who had her page, not Gora. Huh? Get aboard. It's okay, okay. Uh, hurry, hurry, Ken. They will be on us any moment. I have already had a call from the control tower regarding our intentions. Are you there? What are you doing there? It is Gora. Yep. Close the canopy. Stop that. You hear? Stop that. Please. Hold on to your hats. I'm dead. I'm dead. Oh, quiet, you idiot. We're out of range. We'll be in the U.S. zone in 15 minutes. We will? Hey. <laughs> hey, how'd they like that? I did it. I got you both out of Jackson. Oh, sure. Yes. Yes, we are out, Ken. And I am leaving my beloved country, perhaps forever. You'll be back. Oh, you forget. It is in the hands of dictators. My people are enslaved. Don't take my word for it, Johan. Take a look at history. And a man who once said that no nation can exist, half slave and half free. That goes for the world, too. You'll be back. Now, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Veronica Pataki, Will Wright, Lou Merrill, Harry Bartell, and Bob Griffin. Next week, an ancient Byzantine Bible and $10 million force Ken to make a dangerous voyage that parallels the one made by Noah and his ark. Fortunately, there's only one Pagan Zerosmith aboard, played, of course, by Leon Belasco. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. The story is written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying goodnight for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.